Chapter 1241 Business Group In Midsummer, the beautiful city of Root is almost surrounded by greenery. Although the century-old mountain city has been baptized by several wars, it still stands on the single peak of the Root Mountain Range in the northern Terrapagan region. Superior. Although the modeled city wall records the vicissitudes of history, it also shows that after being devastated by several wars, this place has not undergone several large-scale repair projects. Serdak walked under the green shade of the city wall. Malakam and a group of other merchants from the White Forest Plain surrounded Serdak. This city has a long history, and the buildings here have a strong atmosphere of Terra Pagan culture everywhere. It is the gate to the Ganbu Plain of Ritz City, so it is also the only way to the Ganbu Plain. So among you, if anyone needs to run business here, it can be said to be a good choice. Sia walked in front of everyone and introduced the city of Root to these merchants from the Belan Plain. Malakom not only nearly doubled his business group this time, but also brought seven business groups from the Belan Plain. The bosses of these business groups usually have good personal relationships with Malakom. I heard that Malakom saw some business opportunities in Root City. So he followed Malakom and ran here to make money. This is also the reason why Serdak is willing to take time to take these merchants to wander around Root City. Malakom followed Serdak. The Thunder Rhino Caravan he brought this time will transport three dismantled furnaces. The Thunder Rhino Caravan Camp is stationed outside the city. Every morning, there are nearly nine meters high. The Thunder Rhino passed through the city gate and loaded boxes of goods onto shelves in the steel workshop demolition area. In the evening, these Thunder Rhinoceros will leave Rith City according to a dedicated route. These Thunder Rhinoceros will be on standby outside the city and will not return to the Belan Plain until all the Thunder Rhinoceros shelves are filled with supplies. This time, Malakom brought countless Belan specialties according to Serdak's request last time. Of course, these goods were not just for Malakom alone, but for him and seven other people. The business groups jointly raised these supplies. The business group set up camp outside the city in a manor owned by Serdak. This manor was close to the southern wall of Root. A large amount of supplies were almost all covered with tarpaulin. And the goods were stacked together like a hill. Several business partners were chatting in low voices in the back. They were observing the city carefully. The prosperity here was even far less prosperous than Wilk City. The modeled ancient city walls and uneven stone roads were covered with moss and moss growing on all sides. Ivy. The slums look very crowded. The streets are full of children who can't even wear pants. And shabby wooden houses are built on top of many buildings. How are the sales of the goods you brought these days? Serdek walked to a house and asked Malakom. When he raised his head, he happened to see several nobles walking out of the dirty alley and quickly boarding a magic caravan. Then the magic caravan quickly turned around and left at the intersection not far away. Malakom also watched this scene silently. Then he turned his head and said to Soldak with a smile. Cloth and copper and iron utensils are very popular here. Almost all local business groups purchase them in large quantities. And the prices offered are higher than we expected. It's just that some of the porcelain we brought didn't sell well. Those who can afford the porcelain are local nobles. Obviously, there is no shortage of exquisite porcelain in their homes. But the sisal, a specialty from the south of the Bailin Plain, is very popular. We should bring more. In general, the profits gained from this trade are still very considerable. Even without the freight of the furnace, you can still make a profit. Several merchants are also willing to go to Ruth City to make money, purely because of the good personal relationship between Malakom and Serdek. And they will not worry about anyone here embezzling their goods. For merchants, even if a certain trade involves buying at the same price and selling at the same price, at most they will lose some wages and travel expenses. Losing a little money is completely affordable for them. What they are most worried about is that their goods will be misappropriated. Sometimes when such things happen, merchants will go bankrupt. The trade routes opened by merchants do not actually refer to the road under their feet, but the relationships they have established along the way, so that goods can reach their destination safely and be sold very smoothly. In the Bena province, there is no shortage of business opportunities anywhere. The geographical gap makes the prices of many products vary greatly. Merchants rely on transporting these materials to make profits. For businessmen, it is more important to obtain the protection of local powerful people so that their business can proceed smoothly. If Serdak wants to revitalize the economy of Ruth City, he naturally cannot rely on the local nobles. He hopes that more business groups will come to Ruth City to do trade. Serdak led the group of people out of the alley near the city wall, stopped at the entrance of the alley and said, If you are willing to come to Ruth City to do business, I don't guarantee that all of you can make money. 
This requires your personal vision, strength, and luck. But what I can guarantee is that you should have the right to do business in Ritz City. Our rights and interests can be fully guaranteed, and we will not be oppressed or exploited by local forces. The merchants who followed Serdak around the city had relaxed expressions on their faces when they heard what Serdak said. One of the businessmen stood up boldly and asked loudly, Prince Soldak, do you have any restrictions on the business projects of the business group in Ritz City? Serdak thought for a while and then said, Slave trading is prohibited here. Other than that, there are no other restrictions in Ritz City for the time being. When this group of businessmen heard Soldak make such a promise, their private conversations became even more heated. After sending away Malakom's group of merchants, Soldak turned and returned to the foot of the city wall, where Luke and Charlie were waiting. Soldak put his hands on Luke and Charlie's shoulders and asked them both, Have you checked the damage to the walls in this area? Luke nodded and said proactively, Well, the city walls in this area are very damaged, and it will take a lot of work to repair them. Are you interested in taking over this project? Soldak continued to ask, Duck, will it have a bad impact on you? If we follow you around to do projects? Charlie asked worriedly. Serdek waved his hand and said, Of course not. I hope you will do these things. And I also hope you can help me figure out the specific costs. Every year Root invests a lot of maintenance costs. But it doesn't seem to have much effect. Sample. Next. Make a written report based on the damage to the ground you inspected and submit it to the logistics department. There is no need to rush this matter. You only need to rest the ground on the steps and the city wall first. I got it. Charlie breathed a sigh of relief when Soldek said this. Chapter 1242 Road Construction It is said that Mickey Mend, the commander of the City Defense and Security Brigade, was so angry that he smashed his favorite crystal wine glass when he heard that the number one construction engineering team of Makuzo successfully won the bid and took on the task of repairing the Leite city wall. This also means that the city wall repair project is completely out of the control of the city defense and security brigade and becomes the responsibility of the logistics department. Of course, the logistics department is only responsible for the bidding and acceptance of the project. If you want to get the money after completing the task, you need the signature of the financial officer Kurt Ladier. As a result, the procedures for the city wall repair project have become extremely cumbersome and the engineering team needs to advance funds in the early stage of the project and everything needs to be inspected and accepted before the project funds can be obtained. This harsh condition alone almost shuts out the vast majority of newly formed engineering teams. Just as Serdak hoped, the Makusu first construction engineering team has now grown into a large group of more than 3,000 craftsmen. The two talkers on this construction team are none other than Charlie and Luke. These two young men who came out of Wall Village have been struggling since the beginning of building the Wall Village Reservoir. Later, Charlie took the craftsmen out to build villas for the nobles of Alinsa City. Luke led a large number of cobalt slaves to build cement roads in Wall Village, and at the same time managed the sulfur mine in Pussy Mountain. In three years, they have accumulated rich management experience, and now they have become the bosses of the first construction engineering team in Makuso. Not only did they build the underground drainage system of Makuso City and repair the city walls, they were also responsible for leading the repair and reconstruction of the residential areas in the city. Now Soldak has recruited their brothers to Root City, initially for the renovation project of the restaurant square, the resettlement project of the slums, etc., and now he wants to entrust them with the repair of the city wall. Although the two brothers still wear linen clothes and live in a rented house in a civilian area, the savings they have accumulated in the past few years are enough to allow them to live a better life. Charlie manages a total of 10 engineering teams and Luke manages five engineering teams. These engineering teams have a large number of experienced craftsmen. Both of them were also officially awarded knighthood by Serdak. In fact, this city wall repair project is not a necessary project for the busy number one construction engineering team. But Soldak intends to use his own people to set a benchmark in the matter of city wall repair. In the future, city wall repair projects of the same scale will at least know the specific cost. Instead of the commander of the city defense and security brigade slapping his forehead and casually fill in the numbers and send them to the financial officer, Kurt Latte. It is for this reason that Soldak put Charlie and Luke in charge of this matter. Today, the urban construction and commerce of Ritz City are completely in the hands of Soldak, and the restaurant square has gradually become familiar to the residents of Ritz City. As the second batch of steel furnace parts is gradually shipped out of the city, the steel workshop has freed up most of the land to build the restaurant plaza. Charlie quickly built a model room in the restaurant plaza. 
This model room accommodates a total of nine restaurants with different styles. Even the interior decoration of the restaurants was designed and constructed by the first construction engineering team. Although these nine restaurants have not officially opened yet, they have attracted a large number of visitors. These buildings were all designed by Baron Martino himself, incorporating some of Soldak's bold ideas. And now they look particularly unique. Suddenly, the lease contract of the restaurant plaza was snatched up by businessmen. On the day the Magic Guild law enforcement team arrived at the manor, the bearded Edgar sent news from Utipias. The Magic Guild law enforcement team determined that there, and the report had been sent to the Magic Guild headquarters in Bena City overnight. Although Serdak's letter was sent first, the Magic Guild should have a way to get the report to arrive first. Marquis Dickens, the governor of the Terrapagan region, received the letter from Soldak two days before the House of Representatives in Bena City. This meant that Count Dickens had sufficient preparation time. This matter was of great significance to Terra. As far as the Pacat area is concerned, the impact is wide-ranging. After all, it is a black magic research institute hidden under everyone's nose. Ever since Lord MacDonald was captured back to Bena City, and the Ganbu Plain was successfully recovered by Serdek. These black magicians have already been in the Ganbu Plain for a long time. There is no place for it. Black magicians are also wanted everywhere in the Terrapagan area. Unexpectedly, Count Penny would hide members of the Black Magic Hermitage in his manor. Since this matter also had strong support from the Magic Guild of Red City, Marquis Dickens was also worried that this matter would affect him. So he immediately sent people to find Count Penny. However, after the messenger who was responsible for delivering the letter arrived at Earl Petunia's manor, he discovered that the manor had dismissed all its servants two days ago, and no one knew where Earl Petunia had gone. So this incident was determined by Marquis Dickens as Earl Petunia's absconding in fear of crime. In this way, Earl Petunia became the remnant of Lord MacDonald and also bore the mark of a rebel. The Bena Province House of Representatives defines rebels as follows. Any territory fought against and recaptured from rebels will be implemented in accordance with the 433 Land Distribution Law. This is equivalent to Serdak's heavy armored infantry regiment capturing Count Penny's Euzipia's Manor. Therefore, a large area of territory around the Euzipia's manor that originally belonged to Count Penny was inexplicably assigned to Sir Duck's name. Of course, including this manor, Serdak becomes the new owner of this land, which also means that the intercity boundary line north of the Ruth City Iron or area will continue to extend for 10 kilometers to the north. Judging from Aphrodite's investigation over the past two days, although the land around Euzipia's manor is not fertile, it is not as barren as the two small towns in the Iron or area. The reason is also very simple. Although this manor is separated from the city of Rip by the crisscrossing mountains of the Iron or area, there is a smooth road to the north of the manor that leads directly to Constantinople. And the road to the west leads to Collins City. Which means that although it is adjacent to Ruth City, due to traffic problems, there is actually no connection between them. But in terms of straight line distance, Euzipia's manor and Ruth City are relatively close. This also gave Serdak a very bold idea. He stood in front of the map as if studying the mountain roads of the abandoned mining area, in order to be able to continuously transport iron or to Ruth City. The abandoned mining area and Ruth City a light track was once laid between the special cities for the passage of mine carts. Now this road is almost abandoned, but the roadbed is still intact. If this road is rehabilitated and the mountains between the abandoned mining area and the Utipia's Manor are opened up, then Ruth City will be completely connected to the Utipia's Manor. Then from Ruth City, the road to Constantinople would also be shortened significantly. To this end, he called Baron Martino into the office, and the two studied for a whole day. Then Baron Martino decided to go to the abandoned mining area to conduct an on-site inspection. After all, this involves various matters related to the expansion of Ruth City to the north. Chapter 1243 Euzipias Earl Petunia and his cronies fled in fear of crime. Although they took away a large amount of jewelry, gold coins and magic crystals, they left behind several manors and large tracts of territory. This countess was born into a very prestigious noble family in Collins City and inherited the title from her father. Although she is a female, she has also led her family's private army to participate in playing wars. And with the bravery of her family's army, she has not spell out the count's identity herself. Earl Petunia had many lovers when he was young, and her husband was a declining nobleman. Such an unequal status made it impossible for him to restrain Earl Petunia. This was also the main reason why their couple finally broke up. The middle-aged Earl Petunia suddenly changed her character. She gave up her arrogant and luxurious life, and then ran to the manor to live a secluded life. Some people said that Earl Petunia's life had settled down, 
no one expected that in one of her most remote manners, she would actually support this group of black magicians to engage in academic research. If in normal times, Count Petunia's behavior would be judged as supporting the Black Magic Monastery at most, and would be blacklisted by the Magic Union. The House of Representatives in Bena Province would not be so boring as to punish a countess for this. But it was not a good time for Count Penny to catch up. The aftermath of Lord Macdonald's collusion with the Black Magic Monastery's independent Ganbu Plain had not yet subsided. Her research institute was exposed, let alone that she was just an earl. Even if her last name was changed to Newman, she might not be able to escape from this kind of thing. Soldak didn't expect that Count Penny could be so decisive, abandoning such a large property, and then embarked on the road to escape. Serdak personally rushed to the Uzipia's manor and took over all of Count Penny's properties here. In addition to the manor, there were also large areas of land, mountains and forests, two rivers and a not-so-big lake, because yeah, there are more than 600 farmers living in Scipio's Manor. And they all rent Earl Penny's land. The crops on these lands are not yet mature. But the land has changed owners. So this time Hathaway and Beatrice also came to Eusipia's Manor with Soldak. They are responsible for taking over the property. While Serdak needs to patrol this new territory. At the moment Hathaway and Beatrice arrived at Eusipia's Manor and stepped out of the magic caravan. Aphrodite stepped into the gate of the void ending this long summoning that lasted more than a week. Journey of. The carriage stopped in the courtyard that originally belonged to Penny in the manor. This courtyard occupies almost a quarter of the entire manor, and is located in the corner of the manor near the cliff. These houses are surrounded by four domed watchtowers. Unfortunately, due to the long time flies, and some grass grows between the rubble on the walls and roof, desolation is the biggest feature of the entire yard. Although Hathaway and Beatrice were mentally prepared. When they stepped into the courtyard, they couldn't help but cover their mouths with their hands. The grass in the front garden has grown to the height of a person. And even many trees and bushes have been swallowed up by the grass. This place is more deserted than we imagined. I would rather stay in a tent for one night. Beatrice whispered to Hathaway. The group of people walked to a statue in the yard. Soldak used the broad sword in his hand to cut off some grass in the crevices of the rocks. At this time, the coachman had already pushed open the door of the house. The dust on the door was puffing, floated down, and immediately sprinkled on the coachman's head. This house is located in the northwest corner of the manor. The front yard has been completely abandoned. The back wall is actually built directly from the edge of the cliff. Many windows have semicircular terraces. From the terraces, you can just see the stone cliff below. Hunting grounds. Now the heavy armored infantry regiment led by Edgar is stationed under the cliff. The furniture in the living room was covered with linen and dust was everywhere. Hathaway and Beatrice could only ask the maid to follow them and lift up all the loose skirts with lace. The house was so dirty that it was almost impossible to stay there. Dak, how many days are we going to stay here? Beatrice asked worriedly. Hathaway took Beatrice's hand and told the maid behind her. Go outside and ask someone to gather all the farmers in the manor. A maid quickly saluted and walked out of the courtyard. Hathaway rolled up the dusty curtains, opened the window, and saw the rolling mountain scenery in the distance and then said, When I have people clean this place up, it will definitely be a nice mountain villa. Come on, let's go see where the place is to sleep. Apart from being dusty, these rooms have no other drawbacks. And the terraces with mountain views are the best feature of the place. Not long after, the maid came in and said that all the farmers were waiting outside the yard. The farmers also heard that the manor had a new owner. When they saw the magic caravan arriving here, they all ran back from their fields waiting for the call of the new owner of the manor. After Soldak checked the house, he left the manor with Gulitum and a few cavalrymen. He needed to look around along the boundary markers of the territory. Hathaway asked people to open the gate of the house. She and Beatrice stood at the gate of the house, looking at the farmers who were gathering in a hurry. She waited for a short while before walking to the front and facing the gathering. Hundreds of farmers at the gate of the house said, The land, forests, mountains, rivers, and lakes here now belong to Count Serdek. You will also rent these lands from us in the future. I hope that your harvest on this land will be enough for your livelihood. But you don't have to worry. The land rental fees here will remain the same. In addition, I must explain that in my manner, I do not want to see theft, fighting, fraud, or grabbing other people's property. If someone punishes these regulations, as long as they reach my ears, I will not be polite. Drive him out of the manor. For maids, a gardener and a craftsman are needed here. 
The mate only works here as long as we are here. Gardeners and craftsmen usually only need to come here once a week to trim the grass and trees in the garden. Repair the grassy stone steps. Damaged walls and roofs. Etc. Who among you wants to come? Hathaway looked at the farmers and peasant women in front of him. Everyone was relatively new to Hathaway. And they didn't know what to do for a while. So they were all hesitating. I need someone to clean this place for me. Anyone who is willing to work can be exempted from the land rent at home. Hathaway said this casually. And there was some commotion in the crowd. Then a group of women scrambled to squeeze out of the crowd. Dragging their daughters with them. They looked at Hathaway longingly at the foot of the steps and expressed their willingness to work for Mrs. Hathaway. Hathaway selected four young girls and then selected ten peasant women and ten farmers who looked very strong and let them enter the house. The farmers are responsible for cleaning up the weeds in the yard and the peasant women are responsible for cleaning the house. These twenty farmers and farm women were only temporarily hired to clean the house and Hathaway planned to select a gardener suitable for managing the garden among these farmers. As for the four young girls, they are the maids here. They can usually live at home. Only when Hathaway and Beatrice come here for vacation will they come to the house to do things. After a day of cleaning, ten peasant women and seven maids clean the living room, kitchen and four bedrooms on the second floor. At night, Hathaway also used the kitchen in the house to prepare a very good meal. Dinner. Cernak came back very late. The two-headed ogre Gulidum returned to the house and found a large iron pot filled with soft-boiled beef and potatoes. His fatigue was instantly eliminated. He praised the cook's craftsmanship and thanked Hathaway for preparing it. Sumptuous dinner. Soldak tied the war horse in the stable on the west side of the yard, and the coachman quickly gave the horse water and fodder. At night, the stars shone in the night sky of Eusippia's Manor, and there was a noisy chirping of insects in the forest. Sardak looked at the rough front garden that had been cleared. The smell of earth was everywhere and some weeds were piled up in the yard before they could be cleared out. Chapter 1244 Summer Night On a quiet night, there is no hustle and bustle in Ruth City, and no city lights can be seen. To the people living here, Count Petunia is just a name. They know that she is the owner of this mountain, but few have seen her real face. Therefore, the Lord has changed here, and everyone only cares about the land lease fee. It will change whether the new lord will take back the land that everyone depends on for survival. And for other things, everyone doesn't care so much. The farmers in the manor went to bed very early. They hardly lit candles at night, and every house looked dark. At night, except for the patrolling police officers, there were almost no other pedestrians on the streets of the manor. Looking around, only the military camp and the courtyard in Serdek had lights. The bathroom in the house was very beautifully built, just like a large indoor swimming pool. There were even very comfortable lounge chairs next to the swimming pool. During the day, it took a lot of time and manpower to clean this bathroom, but the effect was still very good. Now the pool is filled with clean water, and Sardak can even swim twice in the pool. Without Thea by his side, Soldak was still willing to swim laps in the pool. Putting back on the magic pattern structure, Sardak walked into the separate dining room next to the living room. Ghoul item had already eaten more than half of the beef stew in the big iron pot. He and Nauhar were eating at the same time, with both hands with a large spoon. This stew is very soft, so it is eaten very quickly. On Soldak's plate was an exquisite pan-fried cutlet. It was a wise choice to take Hathaway and Beatrice with him on this trip to Eusippia's Manor. At least three meals a day became more convenient. It was extremely exquisite, with a basket full of white bread and a glass of sweet wine as red as blood beside the plate. If it were Cernak himself, he would probably have eaten gruel made from military rations and luncheon meat. Or he could have brought back a white radish from the field outside the manor, cut it into thin slices, and put it into the pot. Hathaway and Beatrice had already finished dinner, and the two of them sat at the dining table just to stay with Soldak for a while. What's the border situation like in this territory? Hathaway asked Soldak. In fact, she was a little amazed at the speed of Serdak's territorial expansion in order to allow Serdak to be successfully promoted to the title. Marquis Luther transferred him to the Bellan Plain to station in Doden Town. Marquis Luther's original idea was to hope that Serdak would use the power of the Luther Legion to the town of Doden expanded northward, occupying the land of Invercargill Forest and occupying two mines. Serdak's performance in Doden Town was also quite good. He successfully occupied Invercargill Forest without resorting to the power of the Luther Legion. Then Serdak occupied the Plain of Ganbu which was something no one expected. 
It is precisely because of this that Marquis Luther took out the dowry prepared for Hathaway in advance. Only by controlling Ruth City can we fully control the Gonbu Plain. Hathaway originally thought that Serdak would be very busy because of the reconstruction of the Gonbu Plain and the revitalization of Ruth City. But he did not expect that Ruth City has now found an opportunity for development. She glanced out the window. It is said that Earl Penny's territory can extend the border of Ruth City 10 kilometers to the north of the tower. The territory owned by Serdak is actually still expanding. It is estimated that many Marquises in the Bena province may not have as much territory as Serdak. Soldak cut the stake open with a knife. And the blood inside the stake immediately oozed out. He couldn't get used to this kind of half-cooked fried meat before. As his physique continues to change. Now he feels that this kind of fried meat with blood in it. The taste is delicious enough. He spread some black pepper sauce on the steak and sprinkled some herbs before taking a big bite. Serdak swallowed the fried meat and then said, It's not bad. There is no damage to the surrounding boundary monuments. I just need to change the words on them later. Duck, how big is this land? Beatrice asked curiously. Soldak put his finger into the water glass, dipped some water, and drew a shape of a pig kidney on the dining table. He said to Beatrice, This territory is roughly shaped like this. It is a long and narrow area, and slightly curved territory. Most of it is mountains, and only here on the Ezipia's estate are some fields. By the way, you must have never imagined that there is actually a small town in this territory. It is further north, about seven or eight kilometers away from here. That town is called Hammond. There are not many residents in the town. I guess Count Petunia should have the title of mayor. But in fact, the manager of the town is someone else. Serdak described it vividly. Hathaway asked, Did you go to the town? Soldak nodded and said, I just went to the town to buy some food. I checked that the order in the town was okay. So I didn't disturb the local nobles. Then he paused and said, However, I also made preliminary inquiries. The trading houses in the town are all from Collins City. And I went to check outside the town. The road conditions on that road are very good. As long as the mountain road leads to Hammond Town here. By widening it, and building a road from here to Celia Village. We can connect Ruth City and Collins City. When his interest arose, Serdak didn't care that it was on the dining table. The dining table was big enough anyway. He spread a parchment map on it. The map already had a path marked with red lines. This is the route map that he and Baron Martino spent two nights discussing. Perhaps in the near future, this road will appear in the mountains of the abandoned mining area. It's not that easy to carve out a road through these mountains. Right. Hathaway said worriedly. Marquis Luther had been training her as his successor for some time. So she had some experience in territorial management and construction. Serdak raised his head, smiled and said, There will definitely be some difficulties. But I think we can overcome them. After eating the main course, Soldak also drank some sweet wine. The nights in the mountains are particularly cool and there are not so many mosquitoes. Hathaway and Beatrice accompanied Soldak to enjoy the cool air on the terrace. They both changed into pajamas. But now they felt a little cold. So they asked the maid to get back the knitted shawl. Dak, can you take us to see the Black Magician's Research Institute below tomorrow? Beatrice came up from behind Soldak, wrapped her arms around Soldak's neck, and said in disgust said. Serdak readily agreed. No problem. But it's just a big cave with just a lot of rooms built inside. Which is actually very boring. Hathaway was sitting on the wicker chair opposite him. Turned to look over and asked. I heard that a group of black magicians cultivated a giant tree in the age, L realm there. Serdak nodded and admitted. Well, that tree can not only suck human flesh and blood, but also absorb human souls. Those black magicians just want to cultivate that big tree. So they go around capturing mountain people. They think that Lia village has been forgotten by the world. No matter what happens there, no one will care about it. Recently, things have been a bit too unscrupulous. So the flaws have been exposed. Hathaway added. There are magicians from the law enforcement team coming to visit you today. Serdak didn't seem surprised. He asked casually. Did they say they had anything to do with me? Beatrice interjected. It is said that I want to buy some wood from you. Soldak nodded and said. I understand. I will deal with this matter tomorrow. Hathaway turned over and lay sideways on the wicker chair. She looked at Soldak with a faint look and said. Dak, I heard that the higher the level of the warrior the stronger the strength and the less likely it is to get pregnant. Um, is there such a thing? So what should I do to increase the success rate? Night. Manor. Terrace. A cool mountain breeze blew, blowing the gauze on the white arms. 
Chapter 1245 Return to the City After Count Penny fled in fear of crime, the private army of the Lord of Yespia's Manor was in an embarrassing situation. Logically speaking, they should be regarded as rebels. But when the heavy armored infantry regiment occupied the manor, these private soldiers of the Lord's wisely chose to give up resistance, allowing Serdak to take over the manor very smoothly. Currently, the question before Serdak is how to deal with these nearly a thousand private armies of lords. In recent days, many private troops have secretly left the military camp one after another, and less than half of the lord's private troops are left in the camp. Serdak was not prepared to incorporate them into his lord's army. These lord's army had weak fighting will, and he could not trust these soldiers on the battlefield. So the day after Serdak completed the survey of the territory near the Euzipia's manor, he began to remove the garrison in the manor. He gave each soldier here a traveling fee and sent them home. Serdak only left a 15-member security team in the manor. This security team was not only responsible for maintaining the security of the manor, but also regularly inspected the boundary markers of the manor. At noon, Serdak received a group of magicians from the law enforcement group. The leader of the magician was Arbok, the head of the law enforcement group of the Root Magic Union. This is a middle-aged magician. He has fluffy black hair and piercing eyes. It can be seen that he has strong spiritual power. Magician Aberk brought a total of seven magicians to Yetsipia's manor this time. They have been staying here for three days. Yesterday, they heard that Suldek had arrived at the manor and came to visit him. Unfortunately, Su Erdek went to inspect the boundary line of this territory and failed to see him. The magicians walked through the courtyard, which was still fragrant with earth, and walked into a living room, only to see Serdak standing by the window of the living room, looking at the sea of trees among the mountains in the distance. Serdak turned around, raised his hand and made a please gesture to these magicians. These magicians all learned the etiquette of the elves, placing their right hands on their left shoulders and lowering their heads slightly. Magicians continue to use this way of saluting, probably because their spells evolved from ancient elvish language. Your Majesty Count Serdak, the great lord of the Ganbu Plain and the hero of Makusuo. I am very happy to see you here. The head of the law enforcement group, the magician of Burke, said respectfully to Serdak. Serdak suddenly realized that he was standing in front of this group of ordinary magicians and he was actually able to assume the posture of a superior. Magic of Burke, I'm glad to see you too. Is there anything I can do to help? Serdak asked with a smile. Serdak walked to a set of sofas in the living room and motioned for the magicians to sit down and talk. These magicians all looked particularly young. When they looked at Serdak, they almost all looked at him with admiration. You have already done us a great favor by informing us of what is happening here in advance. It should be our duty to eliminate these black magicians. I would like to express my gratitude to you on behalf of the Ruder Law Enforcement Group. A Burk magic the teacher said solemnly. At this time, a maid came in from outside with a tray, placed eight cups of black tea in front of the magicians, and then stepped back. Then there was a chat, mainly around the abandoned mining area and the Utipia's manor. Magician Arbor felt that the conversation was almost over. So he asked Serdak, I heard that you chopped down a tree of desire in the research institute? Soldak put down the teacup in his hand and replied, It does happen. When we attacked this research institute, we paid a very heavy price. A total of 35 infantry soldiers died under this tree of desire. Sorry, this is really unfortunate news. Magician Aberk quickly lowered his head. Serdak sat on the sofa, stroking the leather hilt of his broadsword and said to the Arbok magician, It is the responsibility of every soldier in the Green Empire to prevent the H, L demons from entering the Roland continent and it is also our honor. The magician of a bird showed a sincere look and said, Your Majesty, can you sell us some of the captured branches of the Tree of Desire and Blood Crystals? We are willing to buy some from you at the market price. Maybe you don't know much about it. These magic materials, in fact, this kind of wood-type monster material is very rare. It has hallucinogenic and blood-sucking properties, and it is an important material for making illusion-type magic circles. Although Serdak didn't understand the value of the Tree of Desire, he had a succubus beside him, which made him even know how many wives King Amazdan had. That's why he had people dig out the roots of the Tree of Desire from under the altar. Soldek smiled gently and then said, I really don't know much about these, but if you want to buy them, I am still willing to sell some. As for the price, we will follow the materials like Bena City, determined based on the average transaction price in the past two years. After chatting for a while, the group of magicians left the manor. Serdak agreed to sell them the materials of the Tree of Desire, which made them very happy. 
but without any friendly price. They were very disappointed. You must know that this rare wood type Warcraft material is in the magic market. It is very expensive. Even this group of magicians, who are never short of money have to make careful calculations if they want to buy it. After having afternoon tea, Soldak took Hathaway and Beatrice to the cave entrance at the foot of the manor. The heavy armored infantry regiment led by Edgar the Bearded has been stationed here. The black magicians hanging on the crosses at the entrance of the camp have disappeared. And there are only about 20 wooden crosses standing there. Now they are connected to ropes by some soldiers. And some clothes are hung on them, turning them into a clothes drying yard. There were several large iron pots propped up at the edge of the camp. Steaming broth was boiling in the pots. And several club bones of unknown beasts were protruding from the large pots. Many heavy armored infantry were basking in the sun in the camp. And the entire military camp was full of life. There were some swords and shields on the weapons racks in front of the tent. And someone was using grease to maintain the weapons. Almost all the heavy armored infantry here knew Serdak. When the soldiers saw Serdak and Gulitam leading people to the camp, they all stood up and saluted Serdak. Hathaway and Beatrice followed Soldak, looking around the military camp curiously, and the two maids followed them quickly. Serdak just passed through the camp and did not stop in the camp, walking into the entrance of the cave at the foot of the mountain. You need to light a torch along the way to the entrance of the cave. The wind blowing from inside the cave blew the flames on the pine branch torch loudly. Serdak held the torch high and stood in the cave. When you speak, you can even hear the echo. The cave has been cleaned very clean. In some specially open stone rooms. Only some wooden tables. Chairs. Beds and the like are left. The valuables have been looted by the soldiers of the heavy armored infantry regiment. Serdak remembered that there were some books about black magic and religious beliefs on the wooden shelves against the cave wall. But now they have been completely emptied. Entering the second spacious cave, the altar inside has been completely dismantled. And the ruins of stones are piled up like a hill. Several magicians from the law enforcement group are still doing the final search work in the cave. And magic is still lit around them. Lamp. Generally speaking, valuable things are kept very secretive. Seeing Serdak walking in. These magicians also saluted Serdak. Soldak took Hathaway and Beatrice around the ruins of the altar first. And also described the battle scene in detail. Soldak rarely talked about the scenes on the battlefield. And the two women hearing that this tree of desire actually sucked dozens of meters of heavy armored infantry soldiers into mummies in an instant. His face became a little unsightly. Serdak took the two of them around the deepest dungeon of the research institute. The ventilation in the dungeon of the cave was even worse. Originally, there was a strong stench inside. Right at the entrance of the dungeon. A group of people couldn't help it. Cover your mouth and nose. There are no special torture instruments in this dungeon. The black magicians imprison the captured civilians here just to feed blood to the Tree of Desire. Normally, they do not torture these civilians in other ways. Hathaway and Beatrice only stood in the dungeon for a short time before running out. At this point, the visit to the mysterious Black Magic Monastery Research Institute has been completed. This time Serdak came in person to formally take over the Azipia's Manor. When the Lord Army here is completely dispersed, Serdak will to return to Ruth City. Bearded Edgar's heavy armored infantry battalion also plans to evacuate Euzipias one after another. The soldiers of these heavy armored infantry regiments will be divided into three groups and return to Makuso City. Hathaway and Beatrice decided to stay at the manor for three more days. They probably wanted to clean up the courtyard of the manor so that they would not have to continue the current cleaning work when they come back next time. On the way back to Ruth City, Gulitam sat on the shelf of the magic caravan and shouted to Soldek, This Lord Penny is such a good person! He actually gave you such a large manor. Soldek sat in the carriage and looked out the window at the mountains from time to time. After receiving Baron Martino in the small town in the abandoned mining area, the group returned to Ruder City. Malakom's Thunder Rhino caravan stayed in Ruth City for a week, and almost all the Thunder Rhino shelves were filled with parts from the steel workshop. One morning in early July, the caravan slowly set off amidst the melodious sound of horns. These hill-like Thunder Rhinoceros finally left Ruth City in the manor outside Serdek City. The most that was left was puddles of poop that were larger than a double bed. These thunder rhinoceros excrements were almost piled up into a hill in the manor, and countless flies and dung-moving insects gathered on the dung hills. According to Soldak's request, these excrements were piled up by a group of farmers to form a dung wall more than 3 meters high, 10 meters wide, and 200 meters long, probably to avoid the stench. This dung wall was covered with even with a layer of plant ash and fine sand sprinkled on it. The stench could not be concealed. The housekeeper in the manor suggested to Soldak 
that he hire some people to remove the dung wall. But Saldek said, Just pile it there. It will still sell for a good price next spring. Chapter 1246 Lively Market Although the businessman Malakom left with his Thunder Rhino caravan, several Balan Plain merchants, who came to Rut City with the caravan chose to stay. They decided to look for business opportunities in Rut City and rented shops to open businesses here. For this reason, these merchants also went to Makuso City in the Ganbu Plain to investigate the market there. Since the Ganbu Plain has been implementing a tax-free policy for merchants in the past year, it has attracted a large number of merchants to enter Makuso. Although Makuso's tax revenue is almost zero, a large number of merchants have entered the Ganbu Plain which has greatly it has stimulated local economic development to a great extent. As Makuso City gradually prospered, Makuso City's one-year tax holiday has ended, and some businessmen without competitive advantages began to look for other ways out. Therefore, a large number of business groups came to Liyite City. It was under this circumstance that the catering plaza developed. Since Ruth City is the portal exit of the Gumbu Plain in the Daglin Empire, all materials from the Gumbu Plain entering the Daglin Empire need to pass through Ruth City which occupies a unique geographical advantage. Many businessmen are optimistic about the geographical advantage of Ritz City. So they are willing to establish trading houses here. These businessmen on the Belan Plain have also seen this. These businessmen all have their own trading companies in the Belan Plain. If they can open a branch of the trading company in Ritz City, it will be equivalent to combining two planes. When connected in series, you only need to complement each other to bring you considerable benefits. Especially since they were able to build a network with Count Zerdek. They heard that Count Serdak was still a great lord in the Belan Plain. So they were even more interested in establishing a trading branch in Lutz City. As the second phase of the restaurant plaza project started, more and more restaurant owners in Ritz City could not sit still and went to the property management office of the city hall to apply for a lease agreement. Some others ran from Makuso restaurant owners who arrived also joined the fight. Almost on the morning when the restaurants in the second phase of the dining plaza were open for leasing, the lease agreements for these restaurants were sold out. Several restaurants leased to the first phase of the dining plaza have been opened one after another in recent days. Charlie led nearly 500 craftsmen from the first construction engineering team to build the square in front of the restaurant square and the two lanes into a garden style of an aristocratic courtyard. These restaurants look like they are hidden in this gorgeous garden. Charlie even spent great efforts to transplant 12 ginkgo trees that were over a century old from outside the city and planted them in front of the restaurant plaza, forming a clear isolation zone from the street. These century-old ginkgo trees were not easy to transplant. First of all, the trees are huge. If it were not for the help of the Thunder Rhinoceros from the Malacom Merchant Group, these giant trees would not be able to be transported to the city. Another crucial problem is that the transplant cannot survive. A ginkgo tree of such an old age has a huge root system. Once it is dug out of the soil, it means that the ginkgo tree has died. However, this is not absolute. For some wood magicians and druids, as long as they have enough original life. They can transplant these giant trees into a new environment and bring them back to life. Yes, a deal was made between Serdak and the Aberk magicians of the Ritz City Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group. He used 10 pieces of tree heart from the Tree of Desire in exchange for 10 bottles of diluted liquid of original life. Then Serdak bought a bottle of diluted liquid of original life worth more than 40 gold in the magic market, used on these 10 giant ginkgo trees. Just overnight, all these trees came to life. This is the largest sign at the east entrance of the restaurant square. Behind these ginkgo trees is a huge outer corridor. A huge arched corridor composed of 48 Roman columns is hidden behind the trees. There are actually hundreds of long tables and chairs in the corridor. These tables and chairs are not only free for tourists to use. There are round stone plates with clear water flowing every 20 meters. This clear water can be drank directly. In other words, even if people do not choose to eat in these restaurants and bring their own bread, or baked wheat cakes. They can still have a full meal in the square. The construction of such public facilities with free water supply in slums immediately caused a sensation in Ritz City. Currently, even in civilian areas, there are only six such water supply facilities. Not only is there a water supply facility, but a public toilet separated by men and women is also built on one side of the restaurant square. On the day, the first phase of the restaurant square was officially opened. The entire square was crowded with citizens. The crowds forced the second phase of the square to be suspended. After three days, this square is also very lively. After Hathaway and Beatrice returned to Ruth City from Eusipia's Manor, they heard that the restaurant square was very lively at night. So they asked Soldak to take them for a walk. 
in a square where civilians and businessmen are the main consumer groups. You cannot wear aristocratic clothing. Even if you wear aristocratic badges and walk in it, you will look out of tune with the surrounding environment. Just imagine, a nobleman walks into the dining square, and civilians and businessmen have to avoid him in order to avoid offending. Then a big circle will be formed around him. In such a lively square, it will look like it's an animal show in a circus. So Soldak asked Hathaway and Beatrice not to wear noble badges or cumbersome noble clothing. The two took out the tight leather armor they often wore in the Swordsman Academy and became two a heroic female swordsmen. Sia is also wearing a black robe and looks like a magic apprentice. But she really doesn't even have the badge of a magic apprentice. Serdak also rarely took off his magic pattern structure. Put on his very old salamander leather armor again. Got rid of the two-headed ogre ghoul item. And arrived in a magic caravan. In the shopping street of Root City. I randomly found an ordinary magic caravan and arrived at the restaurant plaza at dusk. The streets around the entire restaurant square have almost become the most congested area in Root City. The magic caravan moved forward at a high speed on this street. On the last stretch of the road, the three ladies, who had already been a little impatient, simply jumped out of the carriage and walked quickly towards the restaurant square on the sidewalk with constant flow of people. Many girls on the street are wearing the attire of female swordsmen like them, but few of them hang swords on their waists. At most, the wooden handle of the dagger can be seen outside the calf boots. Of course, there are also some girls wearing long skirts and crowded in the crowd. Sometimes it is inevitable that others will take advantage of them. At this time, the importance of male companions is shown. Usually these male companions will stand on the outermost edge. And two or three people can surround the female companions in the middle. However, Serdak seemed a little embarrassed here. He was the only man in the team. And Gulitam, who usually followed him in action, was left behind by him. Because Sia was wearing a skirt. Everyone hugged her in the middle. While Soldak and Hathaway were on the left and right sides. The ladies squeezed into the crowded dining square with a mixture of apprehension and excitement. When everyone really squeezed into the crowd, they discovered that there were no dishonest people at all. Although the square was a bit crowded, no one would crowd into them. Everyone would try to avoid physical contact as much as possible. It's not as chaotic as the rumors say. Beatrice held Thea in one arm and Hathaway in the other. Looking around in the crowd, Serdak stood on the other side of Sia, and the four of them entered the restaurant square with a crowd of people. As people walked in, everyone found that almost all the nine restaurants were full of diners. And there were even long queues outside several restaurants. Hathaway had no intention of entering the restaurants to eat, but instead was interested in the mobile stalls in the square. I became very interested and tried to buy a little of everything I saw. The delicious ones will be shared with Beatrice and Sia. And the unpalatable ones will be thrown to Soldek. Shia is a picky eater and only eats fish-related foods with lighter seasonings. This kind of food requires high-quality ingredients. So there are almost none in the food stalls. So after wandering around, Shiyaya ate the least and Serdak ate the most. At the end of the day, there were still a few paper bags of snacks left in our hands. But we had finally seen the bustling dining square, and everyone returned to the castle contentedly under the moonlight. Finally, when discussing why everyone did not encounter those people, Hathaway and Beatrice both said, that the quality of the citizens of Ruth City was pretty good, and it was not as chaotic as the maid said. Soldak, who wiped his wet hair with a towel, walked out of the bathroom and said to them with a smile, They just like to find some excitement, squeeze in the crowd, and take advantage of those ladies. They are not blind. How can they attack a girl wearing crystal lion leather armor? Hathaway and Beatrice looked at each other, stretched out their hands and blocked Soldak's mouth. Chapter 1247 Daily Life in the House of Representatives. Entering July, the Bena Military Department issued a notice to the lords of various plains in the Bena province. Duke Newman and the Bena Legion have been fighting in the Warsaw Plain for the seventh year. The Bena Legion stationed in Handanar County of the Warsaw Plain needs to be rotated again. The lords are unwilling to send private armies to fill Warsaw in the bottomless cave of the plain, since it is impossible to mobilize enough troops from the Bena province. The remaining part must be divided among the plain lords. When Serdak got this military notice, he realized that he was now considered a great lord of the Ganbu Plain. So this problem was placed directly in front of Serdak. The lord's private army in the Ganbu Plain had just been formed not long ago. At this time last year, the military headquarters transferred 20,000 heavy armored infantry soldiers from the Ganbu Plain. Now the total number of troops supported by Serdak in the Ganbu Plain is just over 20,000. 
but these 20,000 troops are scattered to various towns. Among them, the number of troops garrisoned in each town did not even exceed a thousand. This notice from the military department requires each of the 17 subplanes under the Bena province to prepare 5,000 soldiers to rush to the Warsaw Plain. When he saw this transfer order, Soldak felt dizzy. He sat in the study, rubbing his forehead with his hands, and waved away the guards beside him. When he was the only one left in the room, he took out another letter from Marquis Luther, who had arrived in Luther City at the same time. Private letter. Dak, I imagine you must be sitting in your study worrying about this. The military recruitment of troops to the Warsaw Plain, this time was signed by Duke Newman. So the replenishment of troops, this time is completely irreversible. I know that it is very difficult to mobilize 5,000 soldiers in the Ganbu Plain. My suggestion to you is that you can use the new recruits who have served in the military this year and then select experienced veterans from various military camps to serve as captains to form a brand new infantry corps. In addition, you can also share it with other noble lords on the plane, so that you can easily gather a new army. Soldek scratched his hair. He knew what Marquis Luther's suggestion meant. It was to form a cannon fodder regiment. The 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment was originally a cannon fodder regiment. After four years of fighting in the Warsaw Plain, no one in the entire Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment could come back alive. The only soldier who returned to Helanza alive was there was only one of him. He scratched his head a little, closed his eyes, and thought for a long time. On the contrary, Serdak did not feel any psychological pressure because he shared the recruitment of troops with other noble lords. Sia pushed the door open and walked in holding a sheepskin book, and said to Soldak, Dak, the magic caravan is ready. Soldak pinched the corners of his sour eyes, rubbed his face hard to show a relaxed smile, and said to Thea, Okay, let's go! After getting on the magic caravan, he felt the carriage vibrating and shaking as the wheels rolled over the stone road, which made Soldak feel upset. What happened? Sia sat opposite him in a shark pattern dress and asked curiously, the military department issued a recruitment order, and 5,000 troops will be mobilized from the Ganbu Plain. The destination is the Warsaw Plain. After speaking, Soldak turned his head out of the window. Sia sighed lightly and did not continue. The magic caravan drove past the door of the city hall and slowly stopped in front of the door of the House of Representatives. Dozens of carriages have been parked in the square in front of the House of Representatives. The carriage drivers are hiding in the shade of the carriages. Some are closing their eyes to relax, while others are chatting in the shade. Serdak got off the carriage and walked up the steps to the chamber of the House of Representatives. A group of lords were sitting in the hall, discussing the recruitment order issued by the military. Obviously everyone had their own news channels, and they learned about the news no later than Serdak. The lords were talking loudly about the defeat of the Warsaw Plain in recent years, and the crowd was excited for a while. It seems that the noble lords expressed great dissatisfaction with this recruitment order. At this time, some congressmen hurriedly walked in from outside. Everyone knew that Soldak did not like the congressman in the audience. Being late, the congressman who stepped in on the timeline had to walk a few steps quickly. When all the members were almost there, Soldak walked up to the rostrum, put down the manuscript in his hand, raised his head, and looked around at the noble members. And suddenly the hall became silent. Then Serdak tapped his fingers on the table, and the air in the entire council chamber seemed to freeze. There are six things that need everyone's resolution this time. Soldak began to speak. The members of the House of Representatives secretly communicated with their eyes below. And they were all a little curious. There were really a lot of things that needed to be voted on today. The first thing is that the noble lords of Ruth City are not allowed to have any dealings with black magicians. Serdak's eyes became extremely sharp. He looked at the members in the Parliament Hall and continued. I reiterate again. I don't care what transactions the nobles of Ritz City have with the Black Magic Monastery in private. But don't let me get the hang of it. Otherwise, I won't be as soft-hearted as the Archon of Collins City. Even if I abandon my territory and flee to other plains, I will send people to capture everyone and hang them on crosses to bask in the sun with those black magicians. Serdak waited for a while and saw everyone at the council table looking at each other. And no one raised any objection. After waiting for a while, some members raised their hands one after another, with their palms pointing upward to express their approval. If someone took the lead, other members would follow suit. And the first resolution was passed smoothly. Serdak waited for a while and handed a parchment document to a clerk. This document required the signatures of all members of the House of Representatives. Then he lowered his head again, looked at the manuscript and continued. 
The second thing is about the relocation of abandoned iron mine areas. I want everyone in the House of Representatives to actively cooperate with this initiative. I know that some of the members here have some territories in the abandoned mine areas. I ask you to guide the people in the territories. Residents need to move out of dangerous areas. Part of the cost of the relocation process will be solved by the financial department of the city hall. And the other part will be raised by themselves. Before Soldak could finish speaking, someone on the council seat immediately stood up and objected. Sir Speaker, I have some opinions on this matter. Our Jowett family owns half of the mountain range in the abandoned mining area. Since the iron ore in the mining area was mined out, this territory has not produced any output. For for our family, this territory has become a huge burden. And the residents there do not pay us any taxes every year. But now your decision requires us to help them move out of our own pockets. I think this is unfair. The congressman looked very young. After he said these words, he was also a little excited. And his fair face turned red. Soldak stood in front of the rostrum and listened carefully to his speech before asking other congressmen. Congressman Jowett raised this question. Is it common for nobles who own territories in abandoned mining areas? The congressmen in the audience were a little stunned for a moment when they saw that Soldak didn't say anything. But then, they immediately reacted and stood up one after another and said, Yes, that's it. Sometimes when disaster strikes, we even have to subsidize the civilians. That's right. This will cost a lot of money. In the past few years, we have been fighting wars and supporting the economic construction of Makuso City. How can we, the lords of Leite City, have any extra money to give to the civilians over there? Build a new home. Sir Speaker, our Glenn family does not have this budget this year. There were actually seven or eight members of Congress who stood up and complained about this matter. Saldek knocked on the table to calm everyone down, and then said, Then I have a compromise plan. These abandoned lands are a burden to you. Then, as the governor of Ritz City, I will expropriate part of the land from you. I guarantee that this part of the land will only be used for construction of civilians. The resettlement area will definitely not be too big. As long as the land is requisitioned, Ruth City will compensate the lords with a certain amount of compensation. At the same time, the requisitioned land will become a public area and will not separate your territories. If, if you can actively cooperate with this matter, then the resettlement costs for the civilians in the abandoned mining area will be borne by the city hall. What do you think? The congressmen in the audience couldn't help but look at each other. And someone bravely asked, Sir Speaker, does this need to be voted on immediately? Serdak waved his hand and said, Of course not. I will give everyone a week to think about it. If this plan cannot be implemented, we must consider the issue of the lords who own territories and the abandoned mining area bearing part of the relocation costs. After saying this, Soldak continued, The third thing is to formulate a code of conduct for the nobles of Ritz City. Currently, a large number of business groups enter the Ganbu Plain through Ritz City. In order to avoid unnecessary conflicts, I need the House of Representatives to formulate a lawful code of conduct, not only for the common people, but also to restrain the nobles. After Soldak said this, the council hall immediately fell silent again. However, Soldak did not let the MPs vote on this proposal on the spot but gave them some time to discuss it. Then the fourth and fifth proposals began to be announced. It was not until the sixth proposal that the nobles in the House of Representatives became silent. Soldak continued, The sixth thing is about the military headquarters issuing a recruitment order, which requires the Plain Lords to provide a certain number of troops to the Warsaw Plain. The Ganbu Plain and Ruth City are an indivisible whole. So I need you to pass the noble recruitment order of Ruth City. Hearing what Soldak said, almost all the members in the Parliament Hall stood up. Chapter 1248 The Nobles in the City How can this work? Under Sir Dak's sharp eyes, the congressmen did not have the courage to continue speaking. Once they reject the military recruitment order, these nobles will be destined to miss glory for the rest of their lives. Being able to become members of the House of Representatives means that their family has a place in Ritz City. Therefore, the more times like this, the more difficult it is to express one's position easily, especially since this recruitment order was signed by Grand Duke Newman. And Serdak is the great lord of the Ganbu Plain. Everyone knows the current predicament of the Ganbu Plain. Serdak's inclusion of Ritz City is considered a helpless move. Everyone should show up and vote. If you are willing to accept the call, or feel that this matter has nothing to do with you, you can express your attitude. Serdak said calmly, and after speaking, he glanced around. Sir Speaker, do you know how much of the army recruitment quota we, look, need to share? 
The person who had the courage to speak at this time was Senator McMillan of the Ludwig family. Finally, someone was willing to continue talking about this topic. Soldak felt that Senator McMillan was very knowledgeable. So he said calmly, Blue-Eyed City will have a quota of 1,500 warriors. On to everyone. The congressman took a long breath and felt that this number was not very large. After all, the population phase of Red City was here. Senator McMillan asked again, Sir Speaker, how should the quotas for recruiting soldiers be allocated to everyone? Soldak took a deep look at McMillan and felt that there was usually a lack of such a person in the House of Representatives who was willing to sing along with him. According to the number of residents, for every 200 residents in the jurisdiction, one new soldier will be recruited. In addition, according to the number of soldiers in each private army, as long as the private army of each lord exceeds one squadron, one veteran will be selected for recruitment. Serdak continued to explain. After some private calculations by the congressman, they discovered that a town of 5,000 people only needed to recruit 25 new soldiers. This number was far smaller than the number of new soldiers enlisted for military service every year, which made it easier to handle. And it is not unacceptable for a squadron to select a veteran. Many noble lords' private armies only have one or two squadrons, which means they only need to select one or two soldiers to be recruited. I am willing to accept military recruitment. Some members expressed their views immediately. The Macmillan MP also raised his hand in the crowd and shouted, The Ludwig family is willing to accept the call. After he said this, other members of Congress also expressed their agreement with the proposal. Serdak didn't even expect that the sixth resolution would be passed the easiest. In this way, he could successfully recruit 1,500 warriors in Root City. And then, there would be only 1,500 soldiers in the Ganbu Plain. 3,500 heavy armored infantry warriors need to be mobilized. Of course, a large part of these warriors will also be allocated to local nobles. So the actual number of troops that Serdak needs to send will not be too many. The noble lords of Red City were resistant to this recruitment order, and Serdak felt that this was understandable. After all, no one wants this kind of thing to happen to anyone. Once in the plain of Warsaw, this kind of cannon fodder army basically sends out as many as they can without returning. This means that each lord is destined to pay a pension from his own pocket. Regarding the relocation of residents in the abandoned mining area, Soldak actually does not want to move both towns out of the abandoned mining area. In that case, even if the city hall's treasury is completely emptied, it will not be enough to cover the relocation costs. The purpose of Soldaki was to build a road in the iron mining area of Ritz City. After all, this road needs to pass through the territories of several nobles. Once someone blocks it, the road will probably be at the border of the territory. The line goes around in such a big circle. He doesn't want this. If Serdak only mentioned building roads, this matter would definitely be resisted by the nobles in the House of Representatives in Ruth City, who would want their territory to be split in half by a north-south highway. Of course, the nobles must not be willing to spend money. The original idea of Earl Lake Cushing to move the residents of the abandoned mining area to the outskirts of Ruth has been delayed for several years and has not been realized. In fact, it was this group of House of Representatives who lawmakers are obstructing. Building this road is not easy. Not only does it have to pass through the territories of more than a dozen lords, but it also has to overcome geological disasters such as collapse and cracks in the abandoned mining area. If you want to build a decent roadbed, the money is not a small amount. That's why Serdak came up with this idea, proposing to let the nobles who own the territory in the abandoned mining area bear a certain amount of relocation costs. So he was destined to not agree. When the city hall proposed to carve out a piece of land from their territory, for the resettlement of residents in the abandoned mining area. Not many people would object. In fact, Serdak just wanted to use the land to build roads. Serdak I feel that this road is destined to become a prosperous trade route. As long as some warehouses are built on both sides of the road, there should be businessmen willing to rent them. Of course, these mining area residents do not need to completely relocate to Ritz City. After all, if so many people relocate, they have to consider livelihood issues. Once this road prospers, it is estimated that it will feed many people in the surrounding area. This is the way Soldak thought of for the residents of the abandoned mining area to get rich. After the nobles of Ritz City gradually understood Serdak's temper, they finally understood that as long as he did not do anything that touched the bottom line and everything was in accordance with the rules, the consul was still willing to be reasonable. Next, various forces in the city began to make moves, and everyone was eager to establish a good personal relationship with the consul. 
after presiding over several House of Representatives meetings. Saldek also found that he still needed some supporters anyway, so that he could smoothly implement certain new policies. In order to seek more supporters, Serdak also wanted to contact privately some nobles of Rith City who offered olive branches. During this time, Hathaway received letters of visit and invitations from nobles in the city and the castle, which could almost fill the basket usually used to hold bread for some old families in the city who want to restore their former glory. The most convenient way is to catch the high-speed train of Serdak. So many families secretly select some capable members of the family, young people, trying every possible means to push these young people to Serdak's side. Of course, there are also nobles who want to introduce their daughters to Serdak. So the dance becomes a social activity that Serdak must participate in. Hathaway carefully selected a few worthy invitations to the ball from these invitations and placed them in front of Soldak. Count Morinod of the Ludwig family invites you to attend the summer night dance held at the manor over the weekend. As far as I know, the Ludwig family is a newly rising aristocracy in the city of Lutter. This the branch family does not have much background. But they just seized the good opportunity and established many industries in Ruth City. Hathaway pointed to the signature on the invitation and said to Soldak. Soldak patted his forehead and remembered the congressman named Macmillan. And then said to Hathaway, I know the surname Ludwide. And his family still has a seat as a congressman in the House of Representatives. So? Do you want to try to contact their family? After all, we also need supporters in Ruth City. Hathaway put down the teacup in his hand, sat next to Soldak and said with a smile to him. Soldek nodded and said, I am deeply impressed by the member of parliament named Macmillan Ludwig in their family. I would like to get in touch with him. By the way, have you finished handling the matters at Yazipia's manor? Soldek asked Hathaway. Hathaway smiled and asked, When will we go there for vacation again? Soldek thought of his road construction plan and replied with a smile. Just wait a moment. When I open the road in the abandoned mining area, then we can take the magic caravan directly to the outside of the manor. The three of them were sitting on the terrace on the top floor of the castle, from where they could overlook the night view of the entire city of Ruder, Nanchung district, which was originally the darkest place in the city at night, has now become the liveliest place in the city due to the completion of the restaurant plaza. The restaurant plaza has also become brightly lit at night, and even the surrounding streets have some bright lights. Wall lamp. Magic caravans line up on the street. Chapter 1249 Noble Ball the magic caravan that Serdak was riding in slowly drove into the front courtyard of the manor and stopped steadily at the fountain filled with people. As members of the Ludwig family, almost everyone stood by the fountain of the manor to greet him. Around the front courtyard of the manor, a group of nobles from Ruth City were also standing on both sides of the steps. The nobles wore gorgeous attire to greet the consul of Ruth City. The two elders of the Ludwig family stood at the front. One of them was Senator Macmillan's father, Anurin Ludwig, and the other was his uncle. Llewellyn Ludwig, Congressman Millen was only standing in third place. It was obvious that Congressman Macmillan was the second in line of succession to the family. Welcome, Lord Archon Soldak. I am a Nellen Ludwig. Soldak strode forward, took the initiative to shake hands with the old count, who was already gray-haired but full of energy, and said, Thank you to the Ludwig family for the invitation. Count Anellen, please, Lord Consul. Anellen Ludwig smiled slightly and said very respectfully. Soldak held hands with Hathaway and Beatrice and walked up the steps to the hall. They were both wearing exquisite low-cut evening gowns, revealing a large area of snow-white and delicate skin on their chests. Setting off the delicate collarbones and the thin white necks make the two of them look noble and elegant. The guests in the manor focused on the three of them. The men focused on Hathaway's delicate face and Beatrice's plump chest. The ladies looked at the heroic Soldak, who was wearing fiery red leather armor with expressions of admiration on their faces. I heard that Lord Serdak is a great knight. He is really strong. In the corner behind the crowd, among a group of female relatives huddled together, someone held a small folding fan, covering her lips and whispering in praise. Another rather bold voice said, Carrie, what do you think it would feel like to lie in his arms? The companion quickly reminded her carefully and joked, Hey, you are already married. Why don't you have sex here? Do you know that you look like Anyashi's Persian cat in heat now? That bold voice said with a tone of conqueror. Jiali, do you think Mr. Serdak will like my type? Relationships are like going to a shoe store. How do you know if the shoes fit if you don't try them on? Doesn't fit? Hello. In the noisy dance hall, no one seemed to notice the conversation in the corner. There were many more women attending the ball than men. They wore beautiful dance dresses 
and gathered in several groups in the hall. It seems that only this kind of occasion can show their youth and vitality. When chatting, they will always show delicate smiles from time to time. Some people are bold and hot, while others are reserved and shy. Everyone on the scene is immersed in the cheerful music. At the invitation of Count and Ellen, Soldek and Hathaway danced an opening dance with Count and Ellen and his wife. And the ball officially began. Serdak danced with Beatrice again, then went to a rest area in the corner of the dance and sat down. Count Anyering quickly introduced several nobles around him to Serdak. These few this nobleman is also quite prestigious in Rit City. Everyone is talking about some major events that happened in the Terrapagan area. Serdak easily joined the conversation of several people. Hathaway and Beatrice also sat down among a group of ladies. It's just that the ladies around them are almost all middle-aged ladies who can't retain their youth. And the rouge on their faces always falls from their wrinkles every time they laugh. They work hard to create topics and cater to Hathaway and Beatrice asked them if they were used to the climate in Ruth City, which was much behind the prosperous Venice City. In fact, the two of them wanted to chat about young people's topics with the young noble ladies around them. Sia, who was wearing a shark pattern dress, walked away from Soldak angrily, seeming a little unhappy that he didn't invite her to dance. She sat by the fountain and gently fiddled with the water with her hands. Several goldfish in the pool always circled around Sia's fingers in the water. Several young nobles were attracted by Sia's beautiful blue eyes and came over to invite her to dance. Sia turned around and refused to pay attention to them. The young nobles thought this was very interesting and stood around with playful smiles to pester her. This move of the young nobles immediately frightened the officials in the city hall. And someone immediately ran over to drive those young people away. Soldak chatted with Count Anurin for a few words. When he saw Hathaway and Beatrice surrounded by a group of ladies, the smiles on their faces were so forced. He started fighting with everyone. After saying H. Lo, he gracefully left the rest area, walked to the group of ladies, and pulled them out from the crowd. Look, I knew Dak would definitely find a way to rescue us. The round-faced Beatrice was always so optimistic. Hathaway also glanced at Soldak gratefully. This is a dance for nobles. If you don't have the idea of dancing with other noble ladies to communicate with each other, this kind of dance is actually quite boring. And everyone likes to talk in circles. And every word is so careful. Not only are they worried about what traps others have made in the previous sentence, but they also think that the words they say must be appropriate. Serdak actually gained nothing from participating in this dance except getting to know more nobles of Ruth City. It was the first time for everyone to meet. And they were all cautiously testing each other. So there was no real content in the conversation, which made him a little disappointed. Soldak was about to find two pieces of pastry to eat when he saw Senator Macmillan and his wife approaching with wine glasses in hand. Senator Macmillan said with a smile, Lord Archon, if you feel a little tired, please go to the VIP lounge upstairs to take a rest. Soldak glanced at Hathaway and Beatrice, saw their interested expressions, and said, I'm really tired and want to take a short rest. Please follow me. From the lobby to the upper floors. The stairs are designed like huge SH. LS spread out. Even the handrails of the stairs are ironwood and laid with gold patterns. Which is very luxurious. Walking up to the second floor and passing through a corridor. You can see landscape paintings hanging on the walls. The guest rooms on the second floor are suites. The semi-open living room can see the dance floor in the lobby on the first floor. And you can clearly hear the melodious music. There is a dessert shelf at the door of the bedroom. Earl Macmillan invited everyone to sit down. And the waiter brought drinks and exquisite snacks. There happened to be a cheerful rhythm coming from downstairs. The Silver Moon Elves always compose the most moving melodies. Lord Soldak, do you like the music of the elves? Macmillan said with squinted eyes. He seemed to like this style of music very much. Oh, I don't usually have the opportunity to come into contact with elves. And I don't know how to appreciate music. But I was lucky enough to hear the songs of the Naga Banshee twice. Serdak said. This reminded him of Samira. This half-elf archer who seemed to have no musical talent at all. And then he thought of Sia's singing. Which sounded really deadly. Counselor Macmillan thought that what Soldak said was a joke. So he smiled in agreement and said. The family has been trying to expand its territory in recent years. But there are only a few mountains around Ruth City. And there is no suitable land at all. So they plan to expand to the plain and seek some resource-rich areas. Territory. Serdak pondered for a moment before saying, Do you want to develop on the plain? But in those open plains, the rich lands are basically occupied by lords. And such rich territories are rarely sold to outsiders. The rest are ordinary lands and barren lands. Let's just talk about the Ganbu Plain. 
there are still a lot of barren mountainous areas left. But the rich lands are basically invisible. Moreover, the Ganbu Plain is a completely occupied plain, and there is no room for development. If you only want rich lands, you will probably have to form a private army to occupy unknown areas in other undeveloped plains. Counselor Macmillan asked Soldek. Isn't there any rich land that can be purchased directly with magic crystals? It should be possible. But it requires patience, Soldek said. Serdak's words were a little vague. Because the lords who were willing to sell the rich land should be nobles, who were extremely embarrassed. They will not sell this type of territory unless they have to. Unless they are defeated in the plain war, and continue to receive a high pension. Counselor Macmillan originally wanted to ask Serdak if he was willing to sell some of the rich land on the dry cloth plain. Now it seems that Serdak has no intention of selling the territory at all. So he can only ask. Lord Archon, do you have any good recommendations? Soldak thought carefully before saying. I haven't come into contact with many planes. As for the unexplored planes, I've only come into contact with the Bailin and Maka planes. I personally think these two planes are very good. Bailin has a lot of ranches. Maka have large forests. And both have large unexplored areas. When talking about this, Serdak was reminded of the Wazimra city that was covered with Tyro trees. Mrs. McMillan was sitting next to Hathaway and chatting secretly. She didn't know what topic was discussed. Hathaway and Beatrice actually listened attentively. Senator McMillan asked again, Lord Soldak, I would like to ask you where you bought the armor weapons and horses in your army from. Serdak said directly without thinking. There is a large trading house in Constantinople that sells armor products in large quantities. As for weapons, I found a random weapon store in Venice City. If you want to buy war horses, I personally recommend that you go to the Belan Plain, where there are a large number of ancient boss who buy war horses. After saying that, I remembered one thing. I also have a large pasture in the Gombu Plain, and the war horse resources are very abundant. Where's the scaled horse? Senator McMillan asked in a low voice. Serdak laughed dumbly and replied, Scaled horse? I guess you have to go to the western province to take a look. Hearing what Soldek said, Senator McMillan couldn't help but show a trace of disappointment in his eyes. Lord Archon Soldak, do you have any channels to purchase the magic pattern structure? Even if it is purchased at a premium, we can sit down and talk. Counselor McMillan asked Soldek again. I have, Serdak said calmly. Congressman McMillan's eyes lit up. He couldn't wait to interrupt Soldek and asked hurriedly, Can you? Serdak waved his hand and said, That trading market is very special. The currency circulating in the market is unidentified black magic crystals. Unless you have enough unidentified magic crystals. Congressman McMillan sighed again. And then said, The family's business has been doing pretty well in the past few years. They have accumulated some capital. And they want to use the accumulated resources to purchase some territories or form a private army. Go to a certain plane to open up a new territory. I heard that you have a garrison stationed in the Belan Plain. And you have also opened up a territory in the Belan Plain. Invercargill Forest in the White Forest Plain. Serdak answered. Counselor Macmillan leaned forward and said with a longing look on his face. If possible. Our Ludwig family hopes to form an army of lords to enter the Belan Plain and follow you to open up the Belan Plain. The purpose is to open up territory. Serdak did not expect that Senator Macmillan not only wanted to learn from him about his experience in forming a lord's private army, but also set his sights on the Belan Plain. Thinking about the territory occupied in the northern part of the Belan Plain, there is still an ally next to it. It is better than the situation where the neighbors are some ghost-striped red ants and rock birds. After thinking this, he said, There is nothing wrong with this. But since it is a coalition of lords, each of them is responsible for their weapons, equipment, logistics supplies, including post-war pensions. Moreover, when opening up new territories, it also depends on combat merit. The newly formed new army is not it will be a great harvest. If you have sufficient funds, I suggest you recruit some mercenary groups to increase your combat power. Now that we are entering the Belan Plain, the beast tide that occurs once every 10 years has just ended. The northern region of the Belan Plain has ushered in a new round of 10-year development period. There is a vast three rivers plain to the east of the Thorny Mountains. Even if it is an area for development, the Anya Swamp to the west is also good land. If you want to develop in the White Forest Plain, now is indeed the best time. Counselor Macmillan hesitated for a moment, then asked, I would also like to ask you, Mr. Archon, is Bailin the next plane you plan to explore? I do have such a plan. When things here come to an end, 
I will prepare to continue exploring northward along the Invercargill Forest. Soldak admitted frankly, but did not go into too much detail. Congressman McMillan obviously got a satisfactory answer, so he was ready to end the conversation. He waved to the butler guarding the door. The butler immediately understood and led two waiters to place a magic sealing box in front of everyone. Counselor McMillan took the initiative to open the magic box. Inside was a piece of cloth with a blue magical luster. Then he said very sincerely, These two pieces of moon cloth are for Mrs. Hathaway and Beatrice. I hope you, Lord Consul, will accept Madam's gift. Chapter 1259 Sitting on the magic caravan, Serdak squinted his eyes. There were no lights in the car, and the watery moonlight shone in from outside. The street lights on the street followed the magic caravan moving forward, like fireflies constantly swooping back. Hathaway and Beatrice may have gotten up too early in the morning. After attending the ball, they boarded the magic caravan and fell asleep on the sofa. Soldak, on the other hand, thought over and over what Senator McMillan said. As analyzed by Hathaway, the Ludwig family can be regarded as a new force that has just emerged in Reuter City. Their family business even spreads across the province of Benna. If Congressman McMillan had not taken the initiative to talk about the family business, Sir Dak didn't even know that there was such a conglomerate hiding in Ritz City. At present, the Ludwig family cannot keep up with the development speed of the family industry. Whether it is the development of the family's territory or the formation of the Lord's private army. After all, the first two complement each other. Only when the territory continues to expand and the number of residents in the territory continues to increase can more private armies of lords be recruited. Only by establishing a large enough private army of lords can they obtain a larger and richer territory. The Ludwig family seems to have reached a bottleneck in its development. Their family has accumulated enough wealth, but it lacks the background of a noble family. For a time, it is impossible to convert money into private armies and territories. Therefore, the Ludwig family is currently extremely there is an urgent need to establish a private army and enter other dimensions to open up more territories. Only in this way can the family's heritage be gradually enriched. But under the current situation, plain wars frequently break out in the Green Empire. On the surface, it seems to be a good time for the Lord Army to establish its merits. Actually, various planes were frequently lost. And the lords of various provinces did not even dare to send private armies to the battlefield easily. For the lords, war is indeed the most profitable industry. Nothing can bring in money faster than war. But the biggest prerequisite is victory. A complete victory can achieve the greatest result. And a miserable victory will not be too much of a loss. But failure in the war means losing a huge gamble and losing even your underpants. Therefore, the local lord armies simply could not bear a few defeats. It is precisely this embarrassing situation that the Ludwig family needs to face. If they need to expand their territory, they must form a lord's army. However, the newly formed lord's army has no combat power at all. It will be a waste if they enter the battlefield rashly. They needed to give a leg up to the lord army they were about to form. It was under this premise that they approached Serdak. Along the way, Serdak figured out that the real opportunity for him to form an alliance with the Ludwig family was based on his being an outstanding commander and a second-level knight. The most important thing is that has a very dazzling record. That's why the Ludwig family dared to place their bets on Suldek this time. Once the Lord's Alliance is formed, the Lord's private army of the Ludwig family will join Suldak's army and obey Suldak's command and dispatch. At the same time, in Ruth City, the Ludwig family will also full support to Suldak. Only in this way can we share the fruits of Suldak's victory when the war is won. On the way back to the castle, Suldak was even thinking about the future development of Ruth City. Suldak felt that he had focused all his energy on Ruth City recently and he had only returned to Makuso's city for so long. Although the Ganbu plane had entered a healthy development, he should still be concerned. One time, he thought of the Ganbu plane, and then of Makuso. The one-year tax exemption will also end this month. Sir Dagju will return to Makuso city to formulate this year's taxation plan for the Ganbu plane. It depends on the development of industry, agriculture and commerce there. Moreover, the military recruitment order must be carried out and he still needs to bring back 3,500 soldiers from the Ganbu plane. Thinking of the Warsaw plane that he seemed to never want to think about again, Suldek's squinted eyes seemed to be a little moist again. After returning to the castle, Serdek locked himself in the study and sat on the stone platform by the window, his feet suspended outside, looking up at the clear moonlight outside the window. The study is on the side of the rock cliff, and outside the window is a cliff hundreds of meters high. 
He held a glass of ale in his hand and gently shook the ice cubes in it. The ice cubes hit the glass and made a clanking sound, letting the ice mix with the wine flow down his throat and into his stomach. He felt much more relaxed. Cernak felt a little homesick. So he began to try to call Aphrodite. And then with some drunkenness, he boldly jumped out of the window. Outside is a cliff hundreds of meters high, which looks like a bottomless abyss under the cover of night. As the summoning circle appeared under his feet, a purple void gate appeared in front of him. The moment his body fell downward, Serdak fell headlong into the void gate. The weightlessness in the void caused his body to temporarily lose control. It was during this gap that Serdak fell out of the void gate. The next second, he fell firmly onto the stone floor of the lava mine. The wine glass in his hand also fell to the ground and turned into several pieces of broken glass. He looked as embarrassed as he wanted. Hey, why did you change your appearance this time? Aphrodite squatted next to Serdak and teased him in a low voice. Serdak was lying face down and simply turned over to lie on his back. Then he smiled at Aphrodite and reached out to pinch her smooth face. This night, when it was almost dawn, Serdak brought a bag of red crystals to visit the red dragon Izer, so that the red dragon who put his head into the secret room of the treasure to sleep opened one eye and said calmly. Serdak asked, Dak, do you know how long it has been since you came to see me? I thought you were about to forget me. Serdak sat down opposite Izer and the blazing flame sprayed out of the red dragon's nose just hit his face. How is that possible? Israel, how are you doing in Istanbul? Serdak said. The red dragon Izer shook his huge dragon head and said helplessly, It's not bad. As long as you don't meet those enemies, your life will be quite comfortable. Looking at the look in the red dragon's eyes, Serdak knew that its life was not going so well. After sitting down, stuff a large piece of red crystal into the innermost part of the red dragon. Israel was chewing the biscuit-like red crystal. Her expression became slightly brighter, but she was still lying there motionless, appearing to have no energy. Chapter 1251 Helens's Sudden Change When Serdak said he wanted to go back to Wall Village to have a look, the succubus Aphrodite also said she wanted to go back with him. Ever since the two broke through that relationship, Aphrodite seems to have become a different person. This succubus became a little clingy. She and Serdak rode two ancient bullen horses along a straight, and flat cement road paved with volcanic ash. A thick layer of volcanic ash fell on the concrete road, and two ancient bull and horses galloped across the road, making the entire road dusty. But when they were about to arrive at Val Village, Aphrodite asked Serdak to enter the village alone. She waited on a hillside outside Val Village. When she lived in Val Village, she often stayed alone. A man is sitting on the hillside looking into the distance. Serdak rode along the bank of the artificial drainage channel dug by the cobalt slaves and walked towards Wall Village. On both sides of the drainage channel, some simple wooden houses could be seen, where some wanderers lived, inside the wooden house. Walking a little further inside, you can see the free market derived from outside the village entrance, which looks like a market. Mayor Bright actually built several rows of two-story buildings around this lively market. The noisy market was filled with a dazzling array of goods. Serdak even saw some life-related products in the market. Magic Rune Board this made him a little surprised. When did the living standard of Wall Village reach such a high level? People could actually afford such light luxury items. Serdak could actually see some adventure groups near the two-story buildings around the free market. He knew that this was the northernmost point of Paglos Mountain. But no adventure group had been willing to come here before. The road to the market was a bit crowded. So Soldak could only lead the horse and follow the flow of people. The villagers of Wall Village saw him riding back alone and everyone who knew him greeted him familiarly. When he passed the dead tree in the village, they found that a stone monument had been erected next to the dead tree. Wall Village is clearly written on it. Serdak walked through the gate next to the dead tree. The inside of the village and the free market were like two different worlds. It seemed very quiet here. The streets were cleaned and tidy. Drainage culverts were built on the streets. And there were rows of two-story buildings. All of them are connected to water pipes and the spring water flowing from the top of the mountain is directly connected to the homes of every villager. This project plan was indeed originally designed by Soldak, but he did not expect that the old village chief, Uncle Bright, would actually realize it step by step. Looking up, you can see the reservoir hanging on the top of the mountain. The five dams give people a very strong visual impact. Some old people in the village were sitting in the shade at the street corner. When they saw Serdak, they didn't react at first. By the time they recognized him, Serdak was already walking along the street, got home, knocking on the large painted iron door. 
A familiar reply came from inside, followed by the sound of light footsteps approaching from far away. Natasha pushed the door open, poked half of her pretty face out of the door, and looked at go to Serdek and stand outside the door. Her big shining eyes blinked, and then she looked up at the sun in the sky. Her beautiful eyes were full of surprise, as if she was asking, Why are you back at this time? Serdak smiled, opened the door calmly, and then stretched out his arms to Natasha. Natasha was a little excited and happy. She quickly took off the apron from her waist, threw it aside, and quickly stepped forward and rushed into Soldek's arms. Soldek put his arm around her waist and turned her around, finding that her waist was still so slender. Isn't it a little strange why I came back at this time? Serdak asked in a low voice against Natasha's earlobe. Hmm. Natasha snorted softly from her nose. Soldek said to her affectionately in a particularly low voice. I miss you so much. So I couldn't wait to run back just to see how you were doing. Natasha could no longer resist Soldek's sweet words. Hugged Soldek tightly. Buried her head in his neck. And spoke to him affectionately. We are living a good life. That is. People in the village always have to salute when they see me. And they don't communicate like before. As if we are becoming more and more distant. Hearing Natasha say this. Serdak could only sigh softly. And he would not change anything about it. That's because you have become nobles. But they are still commoners. This is inevitable. Serdak said casually. When I walked into the yard. I saw little Peter standing in front of the training wooden man. Sweating profusely. Practicing chopping. Moreover. The wooden sword in his hand could already make the sound of breaking the wind. Soldak let go of Natasha and strode towards little Peter. Little Peter seemed to feel something and turned around suddenly to see Serdak standing there. He walked across the courtyard toward the practice field. Duck, you're back. Little Peter put the wooden sword back into the scabbard on his waist and then ran quickly towards Soldak. Like a cheerful deer, Soldak grasped little Peter's waist with both hands and lifted him suddenly above his head. Every time Soldak saw little Peter, he would see how well he was practicing his sword skills. Now little Peter's teacher is Knight Danila. Although this uncle is only a knight, he is enough to become little Peter's teacher. Serdak could see that Danila taught very carefully. It had been a long time since he had seen little Peter. This time, Serdak found that he had grown up a lot, and his body even had the ability to control power. Come on, Peter. Let me see the results of your latest practice. Soldak put little Peter down, reached out and pulled out a wooden sword from the wooden stand, took two steps back, and assumed a defensive posture. Little Peter was very excited and pulled out the wooden sword from his waist. He first took a stance and held the wooden sword firmly, and then took a step forward. At the same time, he controlled the wooden sword with both hands and slashed forward. This is an offensive move that Peter is most familiar with, and the posture is very standard. Serdak raised his wooden sword and easily blocked little Peter's attack. In this attack, Serdak not only felt Peter's use of power, but Serdak could also feel that there were other relatively disordered elemental auras in Peter's body. If Serdak wasn't a second-level warrior with strong mental power, he probably wouldn't be able to sense those elemental auras. Soldak immediately pulled little Peter to sit down on the bench next to the training ground. Because in the Green Empire, the status of magicians is much higher than that of combat workers. If little Peter has talent in magic, he would rather have little Peter learn magic. Then he injected a trace of sacred power into little Peter's body and carefully explored the naturally formed elemental aura in little Peter's body. Although it is very weak, it is concentrated near the forearm. Although little Peter cannot sense these elemental breaths yet, they do exist. Once little Peter can sense this elemental breath, and add to it with the right guidance, he can easily become a magic swordsman. But what Soldak has in mind right now, is not just to make little Peter a magic swordsman. He even hopes that little Peter can become a magician. Natasha didn't have any idea in her heart. So Soldak was going to discuss it with old Sheila. Natasha saw Soldak and little Peter struggling on the practice field. So she returned to the villa and started to ask the cook to prepare a heartier lunch. Soldak took little Peter and ran to old Sheila's room. At this time, old Sheila, who was obviously getting older, was lying on the wicker chair. She was a little sleepy again, and there was another layer of age spots on her face. Little Peter ran over and called softly twice in front of old Sheila. It seemed that only little Peter's voice could wake up the sleeping old Sheila. She raised her eyelids with difficulty and saw that it was little Peter wearing leather armor calling him, with a soft look in her eyes. Then she saw Soldak standing behind little Peter. She was slightly startled, almost having the same look as Natasha. Why are you back? 
It's just that old Sheila's eyes seem purer and more direct. Soldak found a chair and moved it next to old Sheila. Then sat down and said to old Sheila, I promise that I will come back to see you every once in a while. Old Sheila waved her hands weakly, matching her weak eyes. Soldak then understood what old Sheila wanted to say. It's not necessary. I know you are busy. Rita and Natasha are taking good care of little Peter and me here. Old Sheila said breathlessly. Soldak hurriedly sat down next to old Sheila and sent the power of holy light in his hand into old Sheila's body. Old Sheila seemed to be in good health, but her body was a bit old, and the functions of all the organs in her body were probably reduced. Although the power of holy light is a healing power, it has little effect on old people like old Sheila who age naturally. No need to waste your efforts. I know my body. Old Sheila said looking at Soldak. Soldak withdrew his left hand, held little Peter in his arms, and said next to old Sheila, I found that there are traces of magic elements in Peter's body. If he is properly guided, he may be able to become an outstanding person in the future. The magician, when old Sheila heard what Soldak said, her slightly squinted eyes suddenly widened, and she stared at Soldak hopefully. Soldak nodded to old Sheila, and then said, A friend of mine in Helensa, Lance, happens to be an excellent magician. I can entrust little Peter to him and ask him to help him now. He carries out spiritual guidance and then learns meditation, so that he has a greater chance of becoming a magician. Old Sheila wanted to sit up, but her arms were unable to support her body. She tried but failed in the end, and could only lie down on the wicker chair helplessly. Sernak immediately said, I am going to let him participate in the magic awakening ceremony at the age of 12. If he is lucky enough, he will be able to awaken the magic pool in his body, so that he can become a magician noble. Even if you can't awaken, it doesn't matter. You can just go to Jean John Academy. Soldak added another sentence. Old Sheila nodded to Soldak, indicating that his decision was okay. Soldak stroked little Peter's head happily and whispered to him, Peter, you must study hard when you get to the city. From now on, this place will belong to you, the whole deserted land. Although old Sheila was somewhat prepared, she was still shocked by Soldak's words. She stared at Serdak with wide eyes. Natasha walked in with a fruit plate and her eyes were red as if she secretly wiped tears at the door. Sardak smiled calmly and said, When you see my territory, you will know that the territory here is the smallest. While the family was having lunch, Rita and Daniela also ran over from next door. When Sardak met Rita this time, she was already pregnant. She was wearing a loose dress. The night Daniela was cautiously by her side, and the table was filled with joy. After hearing the news that Sardak had returned from outside, the old village chief Uncle Bright came to Serdak's house in the afternoon. Soldak had just taken a shower when Natasha told him that Mayor Bright was waiting in the living room on the first floor. Soldak quickly ran down, greeted Chief Bright and said, Uncle Brett, why are you here? Bright village chief pulled Soldak and said to him, Let's go to your study to have a chat. Soldak understood immediately and took Mayor Bright to the study room that he rarely used. Fortunately, this study room was often cleaned and there was no dust at all. The old village chief Bright waited for Soldak to close the door before saying, I heard a new news in Helensa City. What happened to Aranza City? Sernak asked immediately. The old village chief, Uncle Bright, immediately approached Soldak and whispered, Countess Darcy of the Christie family is seriously ill. Her husband, Baron de Cuny, wants to become the acting consul of Helensa. Now he and the Christie family the quarrel was very tense. And now the whole city of Helensa knows about it. Why didn't anyone write to tell me? Serdak asked with a surprised look on his face. Village Chief Bright sat back on his chair, poured himself a cup of tea and drank it in one gulp. He put down the teacup in his hand before saying to Soldak, If it hadn't been for your sudden appearance this time, we would have thought that you hadn't come back from the battlefield. Charlie wrote last time that you went to the battlefield. They wrote several times but never mentioned you. Serdak quickly admitted, Yes, I just returned to Ruth City last month. I came back directly before I had time to write a letter. Uncle Brett also sighed. Speaking of which, that brat Charlie hasn't written to me for more than two months. He doesn't remember to write when he's not busy. He doesn't have time to write when he's busy. There's always a lot in his mouth. Reason. Soldak did not wait for Uncle Bright to finish speaking, but interrupted him. He stood up and walked towards the door and said, I'm going to Helenza City to have a look. Chapter 1252 Helenza Storm In Oak Ridge in Midsummer the forest is like a forest of oak trees. Those dark green leaves are connected together. 
making the forest airtight. It had just rained, and the mountains were full of newly formed streams. The climate in Hilanza in July is humid, and some ferns will grow in Oak Ridge. In the past, the villagers of Wall Village often went into the forest to pick these ferns back, and then boiled them in water in a large pot. Then dried them in the sun, and they will become very good dried vegetables in winter. Even if the living standards of the villagers in Vol have improved, and they no longer rely on these dried vegetables to survive the long winter, there will still be villagers who go to the mountains to pick these bracken. In the past two years, the old village chief, Uncle Bright, has sent people to widen this mountain road almost every year. Now, except for dangerous passes, this mountain road can now allow two four-wheel carriages to run parallel. Serdak still remembers that when he first returned to Wall Village, the villagers had to walk through deep and shallow snow in the winter and run into the mountains to pick up the remaining tree rice. At that time, almost every household did not have enough to eat. Serdak talked to Aphrodite about the days when he first returned to Wall Village and the two rode horses side by side on this mountain road. I still remember the days when I first came back. There were almost no pedestrians on this mountain road. During the time when he was studying at the Helensa Night Academy, Serdak also met a group of bandits here, and he even rescued them in a straight man's way. Miss Hoyle's life. Nowadays, almost all the people traveling on this mountain road are four-wheeled trucks. As the free market at the entrance of Wall Village becomes more and more prosperous, Many merchants are transporting various supplies from Alinsa City. With so many adventure groups coming to Wall Village, are there always some inexplicable people running into the territory? Soldak pulled the reins and asked Aphrodite beside him. She did not wear the mithril mask, with a hint of intoxicating charm on her delicate face. She smiled at Soldak and said, Almost rarely, they can see the boundary markers at the border. And besides touching their knees near the volcano, there is nothing but volcanic ash. What can they do here? and they also know that it is the territory of Earl Soldak. There is a sulfur mine in the territory. The mine supervisors patrol along the boundary markers every day. So basically no one will be willing to wander in your territory. Serdak asked her. Would it be boring to live alone in the mountains? Aphrodite smiled slightly and then said. How could it be one person? There are so many cobalt slaves and overseers from Wall Village over there. The two climbed over the last mountain ridge, and the city of Holanza finally appeared in sight halfway up the mountain. Seeing that the city in front of him was still the same as before, Soldak felt very emotional. This mountain city hidden deep in the oak forest had hardly changed in the past few years. Into the familiar mountain city. When passing the city gate, Serdak also met a group of guard camp knights. The officer leading the team on horseback was also a familiar face. However, few of these young guard camp knights knew Serdak. When they saw the count badge on Serdak's chest, they immediately pulled the reins of their horses and asked the cavalry to stop. All guard camp knights, the knights were all giving a military salute to Serdak. Serdak also responded with a military salute in a formal manner, then rode his horse and walked over, smiling at the guard battalion officer at the front of the team and asked, Why haven't we seen each other for so long that we have forgotten all our old friends? Are you Count Soldak? Jasper looked at Soldak in surprise. At this moment, he didn't know what to say. Dak, when did you become an earl? Serdak laughed and said, it was almost this time last year. Jasper, congratulations on your finally being promoted to a squadron leader. Jasper had a wry smile on his face. When he and Carl competed for the position of squadron leader in the guard camp, it was because Carl took the position of squadron leader away from him with the help of Serdak. Unexpectedly, Serdak would become an earl in just two years after leaving Helensa. Soldak's friendship with Jasper was very average. So he asked him, Is Carl in the city? Jasper immediately replied, Yes, but he is off today. I guess you should know where he is. I know. Thank you. Soldak nodded to express his gratitude. After entering the city, Soldak checked into the hotel in Garden Square as usual. When I came to the square garden, I found that the low shrub wall in the garden pond had been removed at some point. Now there is a small light yellow flower planted in the flower pond, which makes the area of the garden square look much more open. There were a few more vendors on the street, but the hotel was still the same. Serdak walked around the main entrance and rode into the backyard. Looking through the arched door, he saw the boss Cohen and the groom were cutting hay in the yard. The wall the stables nearby were actually crowded with horses. Boss Cohen raised his head and glanced at Soldak. But in his busy schedule, he didn't even notice the noble badge on his chest. Showing an honest smile, he said to Soldak, Dak, leave the horse here. After hearing this, 
Soldek agreed, handed over his and Aphrodite's two horses to Boss Cohen, and then took Aphrodite to the reception hall on the first floor of the hotel. Mrs. Cohen, the proprietress, saw Serdak and Aphrodite walking in from the outside. She was surprised at first. She couldn't wait to get her plump body out of the chair, and her white chest even moved back and forth in the thin gauze dress. Shaking, but when she saw clearly that the noble badge on Serdak's chest was shining with golden light, and Aphrodite's mithril mask behind her, the silver cup filled with ale in her hand shook violently, dropped to the ground. The ale spilled on the counter, and she hastily wiped it with a rag. Lord Earl Dark! After Mrs. Cohen said half a sentence, she immediately realized something was wrong and immediately changed her words. Soldak didn't even stop. He walked directly to Mrs. Cohen, gave her a big hug, and said kindly to the somewhat helpless Mrs. Cohen, Mrs. Cohen! Long time no see! Then Mrs. Cohen's movements became a little shaky. She felt like she was a little drunk. When climbing the stairs, she even didn't know which foot to take first. It's still the room on the top floor. The room is clean and tidy, and the windowsill of the attic is full of flower pots. Mrs. Cohen opened the door to the room and gave the key to Soldak. After confirming that they did not need afternoon tea, she went downstairs. Serdak saw that there was only a large double bed in the room, so he laid down on it. Aphrodite opened the window, smiled and said to Soldak, I have always suspected that this is the place where Mrs. Cohen secretly dates with her lover. Only when you come will you take out the key and open this room. But now it seems that it should be an ordinary VIP room. The succubus, who was in a good mood, gave Mrs. Cohen a very fair evaluation. When I came to the magic guild in Halanza City again, I discovered that this magic tower, which was as hollow as a shopping mall, looked so old. When Soldak reported Lance's name, he almost didn't have to wait too long. Lance hurriedly ran down the stairs, rushed into the reception hall on the first floor, and came to the magic tower. There were a lot of people doing things at the side. So he avoided the crowds and quickly ran to Soldak. The two hugged each other tightly and were always extremely happy to see each other as old friends. Duck, you're back. Lance knew that Serdak had been recruited into the big battlefield. So he was so surprised when he saw Serdak this time. After all, it was known as the tomb of the second turn strongman. Well, Lance, how have you been lately? Lance pulled Soldak to sit down on the sofa in the corner and Serdak took the opportunity to ask. Not bad. Have you seen Carl? Lance forced a smile, and then asked Soldak. Not yet. I heard that he had a day off today, so I didn't go to the guard camp to look for him. Soldak said. Lance rubbed his hands in embarrassment, and then explained to Soldak in a low voice. Actually, Carl has been resting for several days. To be precise, he has been suspended for a while. Serdak looked surprised. Although Carl was only a noble baron, the casement family behind him was considered a prominent family in Alinsa City. Even if he made some minor mistakes, he should not be suspended. What's going on? Serdak asked with confusion. Lance continued to whisper. Mrs. Mariana Christie is no longer responsible for managing the affairs of the Christie family. Carl was also targeted. So he was suspended. Lance said in his tone that this involved an internal struggle within the Christie family. It was obvious that Mrs. Mariana Christie had been seized of power. Moreover, in order to attack Mrs. Christie, her lover Carl was also implicated and even suspended from his duties in the guard camp. Where is Carl? Take me to find him, Saldak said with a gloomy face. He clearly remembered that when he came to Alensa's city alone, it was Carl who was the first to reach out to him. He should be hiding in the tavern now, Lance said and stood up. Serdak also stood up with Lance. The two walked out of the magic guild and found a magic caravan on the street. Serdak tied the horse to the back of the magic caravan, and the two boarded the car. He introduced to him the recent situation in Alinsa City. In fact, when Marquis Bernard Christie was seriously ill, Marquis Bernard couldn't wait to give up the position of Marquis to Darcy Christie. Darcy also hurriedly took the position of consul of Alinsa City. Bernard when the Marquis de Marquis was alive. No one among the nobles in the city dared to stand up against Darcy Christie. In the past two years, Marquis Bernard's health has been deteriorating. Last winter, he finally failed to survive the harsh winter and ran to see the Statue of Liberty. After the death of Marquis Bernard, Darcy Christie's life in the city of Valenza was not so easy. The nobles in the city were unwilling to hand over Valenza to Darcy Christie's management due to various distrusts. In order to convince the nobles in the city, Darcy Christie did everything herself. Although she worked very hard every day to handle Valenza's daily work, 
there were still several mistakes. In order to make up for the mistake she made, Darcy Christie collapsed in infinite anxiety and excessive fatigue. In this way, the nobles felt that Darcy Christie did not have the ability to manage a city. At this time, someone in the Christie family took the opportunity to gain power and remove Darcy Christie's power within the family. And Darcy Christie's long-lost husband suddenly appeared in Helensa City. And his second wife turned out to be a widow of the Dunstan family, a great nobleman in Benna City. Because Darcy's husband was from the Dunstan family. With his support, he actually wanted to become the governor of Helensa City this time. Serdak was a little stunned when he heard this. He didn't expect that the management of Helensa City would be so rotten. The magic caravan stopped at the door of the tavern. The tavern also had a closing sign, and the door was closed. Lance took Soldak in the back door in a familiar manner. There were almost no lights in the pub, and all the windows were closed with wooden boards. So the room was very dark. There was only a candle lit next to the bar. Carl sitting side by side with Mrs. Christie on a high stool. The proprietress of the pub was drinking with the two of them. Hearing the footsteps, Carl looked back drunkenly. Lance led the way. Carl recognized Lance at a glance and asked him, Lance, why are you here at this time? Don't you have some important experiments to do today? Lance moved his body away, revealing Serdek behind him, and then said to Carl, Look who I brought here. Dak, are you back? Carl shook his head first, then felt that he was not awake enough, rubbed his eyes hard, and then asked doubtfully. Soldek walked up to the drunken Carl, hugged Carl tightly, and then said to Carl, Yes, I'm back. He took a wine glass from Carl's hand, and then asked Carl, you can drink the wine later. Come on. Tell me first. Who stopped your position? Let's go talk to him. Hey. Duck. When did your temper become so bad? Carl patted Soldak hard on the back and motioned him to sit down first. It'll be great if you come back. Otherwise, I'm going to write to Selena to see if he has any news about you. There was a relaxed look on his face. And he put a hand on Soldak's shoulder. Said with a relaxed expression. Then he turned to Mrs. Christie and said, now that Soldak is back, Mariana, you don't have to worry about Darcy now. Let Dak go and treat Darcy. How powerful is his holy light technique? All injuries can be saved. Chapter 1253 Tavern The lights in the pub were dim, but Carl rarely smiled. Seeing Carl's friends arriving, the proprietress lit up a few more magic wall lamps around the bar, making the area around the bar even brighter. Mrs. Mariana Christie's face was slightly red, and it looked like she had drunk a lot of wine. Carl seemed very happy to see Serdak return to Aranza. He put his arm around Serdak's shoulders and sat in front of the bar. He asked the landlady to open a new barrel of ale, and the two drank a lot of it. Cup, how was your harvest after coming back from the big battlefield this time? Carl asked Soldak and punched him in the chest. Serdak smiled and replied, It's okay. Carl asked with some worry. I heard that this kind of transfer order happens once every once in a while. There should be a long rest period and the battlefield is not as dangerous as the rumors. Soldak took a sip of the slightly bitter ale and said to Carl. He vividly described the Silver City and the King Kong Gate to everyone, which immediately made everyone in the tavern scream. Serdak said that it had been more than two months since he came back from the battlefield, and he had been handling affairs in the city hall there in Ruth City. This time he returned to Wall Village to visit relatives, and then he stopped by Helensa City to see it. Look at everyone. After hearing that Soldak said that he had become the governor of Ruth City, Carl was also sincerely happy for his friend. Is everything going well in Ruth City? Carl asked Soldak. It's not bad. Soldak sat on a high stool, holding a wooden ale glass in both hands. He picked up a few ice cubes from the ice bucket and put them into the glass. He raised his head and smiled at Carl and said, The only thing is the deputy speaker of the House of Representatives, who opposed me has been sent to a military court in the province of Benna. So you have become the real manager of Ruth City? Carl asked with his eyes widened and envy on his face. Serdak nodded slightly and said, At least in Ruth City, I have the final say in everything. Mrs. Mariana Christie asked in disbelief. The nobles over there did not boycott you together. Soldak did not deny it. He just knocked on the table gently and said, There will be some who are unwilling to cooperate, but they will be convinced by me soon. Looking at his determined look, Carl knew that Serdek had firmly grasped the situation in Ruth City. Then he thought of the current messy situation in Helensa City, stretched his worried forehead, and said to Serdek, he said, It's great that you can come back. I'm afraid you don't even know that Darcy is sick and very seriously ill. As our friend, I hope you can go see her. 
Carl put forward tactfully. Request. He knew that Suldak and Darcy dated for a period of time in the Night Academy. But they could not get together later. However, Carl didn't know what kind of emotion Suldak had towards his ex-girlfriend. And whether he would become a mortal enemy like other couples before they got together. I want to know what happened during this time. Isn't the Christie family firmly in control of Alensa City? Why did Darcy become seriously ill? Soldak asked Carl with a serious face. He hesitated to speak. Turned to Mrs. Christie and said, Mariana, tell me. Mrs. Christie showed a trace of unconcealable hatred in her eyes. Drank all the wine in the glass. And then suddenly asked Soldak, Dak, can you help me kill that guy Dakuni? Faced with Mrs. Christie's sudden question, Soldak was a little stunned and didn't know how to answer it for a moment. Mariana! Carl put his hands on Mrs. Mariana Christie's shoulders, moved her hard to face him, and then said to her, Listen, the affairs of Darcy and Acuni are their own business. I think Darcy doesn't want you and others to get involved in her relationship. As her relatives and friends, we need to consider how to get her out of her current predicament, rather than helping her cut off all grudges with a sword. Mariana then weakly put down the empty wine glass and said feebly, During the period after Bernard's death, the nobles of Alanza City lost their trust in the Christie family. The main reason is that there have always been conflicts within the Christie family. There is a group of people in the family who are constantly removing power from Darcy's supporters. By the time Darcy reacts, Darcy has already lost the support of the family. Serdak nodded. He knew that this was probably the real reason why Darcy could not control the city of Alensa. After all, the Christie family had deep roots in the city of Alensa. If there was full support from the family, even if there were voices of opposition, such a large-scale attack would not be possible. Wave. In the final analysis, it is still internal strife within the family, which gives outsiders an opportunity to take advantage of it. In addition, many noble lords in the city are also very dissatisfied with the fact that Bernard gave up the position of consul of Alensa to Darcy. Mrs. Christie continued, The main reason is that Darcy promulgated some new policies in the city without waiting to stabilize the situation in the city. These new policies have touched the interests of most of the nobles in Alanza. Almost all the noble lords. Everyone wants more oak woods. Darcy believes that the oak forest can only bring a good income to the nobles every year and cannot change the lives of the common people in the suburbs. So she is ready to issue a restriction order on the oak forest. Mrs. Mariana said a little feebly. Obviously, she did not approve of Darcy's approach. But she was also Darcy's staunchest supporter in the political situation of Alenza City. So her heart was full of contradictions, and even felt a sense of powerlessness. Serdak didn't expect Darcy to be so bold, and asked with some admiration. So her approach was resisted by the nobles of Alensa? This is just one of them. But it has become an opportunity for the nobles in the city to unite against her. Mrs. Mariana Christie said with a wry smile. There are also issues about the property rights of Phonic Manor and Hoyle Manor. The nobles wanted to add this part of the land to their own territory and everyone had been arguing about this for several years. But Darcy supported the idea of dividing this land into the public land of Alensa City. When talking about these things, Mrs. Mariana Christie showed a look of helplessness. It can be seen that she also thinks that Darcy does not have the ability to govern Alensa City. Please help me arrange to meet Darcy first. Serdak pinched his eyebrows with his hands. He didn't expect Darcy to do something so radical. Moreover, one of her biggest problems was that she ignored the uneasy factors from within the family which was why she was finally pushed to the cliff. Mrs. Mariana Christie nodded, then waved to the two maids hiding in the corner, asked them to come over and said, Go and prepare the carriage for me. I want to use it now. Yes, ma'am. The maid agreed. Mrs. Christie said to Soldak, I will go to the castle to see Darcy first, and then I will find an opportunity to arrange for you to meet. It seems like she won't be able to see Darcy anytime either. Mrs. Mariana Christie left the tavern in a hurry. Serdak has not expressed his opinion and has been listening quietly. He felt that the reason why Darcy fell ill was partly due to internal factors within the family and partly due to external factors. Her power in the city of Valenza was emptied out and the family also lost most of its resources. It was completely suppressed. Isolated Archon. If she hadn't fallen ill at the right time, I'm afraid she would have been kicked out by now. It wasn't until Mrs. Christie left and everyone sat down again in the corner of the tavern that Soldek asked Lance. What's the attitude of the Magic Guild towards this? To be honest, the magician nobles are happy to see the internal strife between the traditional noble forces of Alensa. Lance answered without any concealment. Soldek nodded and asked Lance. 
Do you have a chance to persuade the Magic Guild to side with Darcy? Lance shook his head quickly. Soldek asked Lance, who was sitting aside. If I write to the two great wizards Harper and Morrison, will their influence change some of the opinions of the magicians here? You actually know the two great mages Harper and Morrison. They are considered two of the top six giants in the law enforcement group of Bina province. If there is their support, of course the Helensa Magic Union will fully support Darcy. Lawn, C said excitedly. Okay, leave this matter to me. I think I can convince them, Soldek said, without waiting for Lance to ask how Serdak knew these two giants. Serdak asked Carl, Is it that basically all the nobles in Helensa City are against Darcy? Carl nodded without hesitation and admitted, that's almost it. Then he added, You also know that for those members of the House of Representatives, there are always some people who don't care about the essence of the matter. The choices they make are often to stand on the opposite side of political opponents. So Darcy still has some supporters. Serdak was speechless again. In fact, he knew Darcy's character very well. She seemed a bit unruly and domineering when she was young. However, she encountered some setbacks after graduating from the Swordsman Academy. During her time teaching at the Helensa Knight Academy, her sharp edges were completely polished. Character. But in the final analysis, she is still a girl with an upright character. So Soldak believes that she can do such a thing of betrayal and separation. Serdak didn't have any worries about treating Darcy. In fact, he hopes to help Darcy cure her mental illness. Or at least help her to find a new path in this desperate situation. Thinking about the friends he had made in the city of Helensa, it seemed that apart from Carl, Lance and Tax Collector Bird. There was no one else. From the relationship with the military department of Bina Province, Serdak suddenly thought of the Goss family in Aquamarine City. If Captain Mond, Goss hadn't promoted him to a knight, I'm afraid he wouldn't have had a chance. Come to this point today. Captain Mond Goss should be in the Bina military system. So it probably won't be difficult to find a reason to visit him recently. Serdak was thinking in his mind how to help Darcy find some firm supporters in Helensa through various relationships. They saw Tax Collector Bird and Miss Hoyle walking into the tavern. Now Miss Hoyle had become Lady Bird. When they walked into the tavern, they found that there was one more person here than before. Tax Collector Bird saw Soldak sitting in the corner, strode over to him, and the two hugged each other tightly. Then Miss Hoyle also curtsied to Soldak, and then everyone sat down. Dak, when did you arrive? Tax Officer Bird asked excitedly. It can be said that he gained the most from his last trip to Bena City. In some ways, physical strength often represents his mood. Serdak said casually, I just got here today. How have you been recently? When friends get together, it's inevitable to reminisce about old times. The political situation in Helensa City has little impact on small nobles like Tax Collector Bird. However, after Miss Hoyle inherited the family property, she became Viscount Hoyle. Now she has settled in Helensa City, and the family territory has been completely let go. It was precisely because Darcy dealt with a large piece of the rich territory of the Hoyle family that the nobles in Highland City became increasingly dissatisfied. Then everyone talked about Darcy and Miss Hoyle, who had become Lady Bird, also expressed great concern. She said to Soldak, I just visited Darcy yesterday. Now she is ill. It's almost to the point where I'm better than, and I eat almost nothing and can only drink some sugar water every day, and I'm already extremely thin. Serdak lowered his head and sat there silently. The friends in the tavern kept talking, but they seemed to have never noticed that there was a succubus sitting silently in the shadows in another corner of the tavern. Aphrodite sat in the corner without saying a word. Her hair was tied up high to cover the devil's horns on her head. She was wearing a magician's robe and hiding in the shadows. She actually completely merged with the shadows. Only Serdak occasionally glanced this way. Aphrodite didn't drink any alcoholic beverages. She just supported her chin with her hands and listened to their chat in silence and gracefully. Then we talked about Darcy's husband, Baron de Cuny. Everyone basically had no impression of him because he has always been a little transparent existence in the Christie family. And since Darcy's marriage, the two of them have the relationship has never been good. And there were several quarrels when they were newly married. Not long after that, Baron de Cuny left the city of Valenza and disappeared for a long time. No one thought that his second wife was from the Dunstan family. Now that Baron de Cuny has the support of the Dunstan family, he actually wants to seize the management rights of Alinsa City from the Christie family. This is something everyone something I definitely didn't expect. Chapter 1254 Meeting Darcy Again When Mrs. Christie's carriage stopped at the door of the tavern again, 
Soldak and Carl had been sitting in the tavern for half the night. She walked into the tavern angrily and quickly. The two maids just followed her and helped her hold up the long skirt. This complicated palace-style skirt was very strange. The upper body looked extremely cool and exposed her breasts. The large expanse of snow-white skin above. Some designs even exposed the shoulders. But the long skirt below is so luxurious that you can't wait to use the entire cloth on it. The long skirt is like a peacock's tail. Same. In order to highlight the narrow waist and large breasts. This kind of long skirt uses restraints to push almost all the fat from the abdomen to the chest. And even breathing requires small sips of inhalation. Mariana bit her red lips. Her face looking even uglier than before she left. After sitting down, she angrily rebuked. Bernard was too soft-hearted at the beginning and took these guys into the castle. But now he is it so hateful that they stood up against Darcy together. What's wrong? Can't you even see Darcy now? Carl sat next to Mrs. Mariana and poured her a glass of ice water. Lady Mariana said with a cold face. They locked Darcy in the innermost part of the castle. Now even if I want to go in for a visit, I have to go through several gates. And each door is guarded by a dedicated person. They don't give me any permission at all. Give me the chance to see Darcy. Lady Mariana said angrily. Do these members of the Christie family want to put Darcy under house arrest? Lady Bird sat aside and asked Lady Marianne. Mrs. Mariana rubbed her somewhat swollen temples and said. That's what they did. And they openly announced that this was to protect Darcy. Miss Hoyle, who became Lady Bird, sat next to her and said, I heard that Dakuni has been waiting for the news of Darcy's death. Once the news of Darcy's death is announced, Dakuni will announce his successor as the ruler of Alinsa City. Official. Mrs. Mariana's eyes were a little cold, as if she had lost her last hope for those relatives in the family. And she said with a decisive tone, So no matter what, the family does not hope that Darcy will die at this time. Or even if it does happen, he is dead, and it is estimated that the news of his death will not be announced in a short time. Only when Darcy is in this state can they legitimately take over the government affairs of the Helensa City Hall until they can completely control the situation in Helensa. Soldak was also very speechless about this kind of thing happening in the Christie family. But after thinking about it, this kind of thing seemed to be common among aristocratic families. What's the news from Dakuni? Serdak asked. He knew that Mrs. Christie would try to find out as much new information as possible when she went out this time. And what she hated most now was Darcy's husband, Baron de Cuny. Sure enough, Mrs. Christie responded immediately. It is said that he has been hiding in the Winster Manor outside the city. But no one has seen him moving in the manor. It should be the information given by the Christie family's intelligence system. Soldak thought in his heart. I will check on Darcy tonight. Soldak put down the wine glass in his hand and glanced at Aphrodite in the corner calmly. The succubus rolled her eyes feebly, and gradually disappeared into the shadows as she approached the virtual form. Seeing that Soldak was preparing to sneak into the Christie family castle, the magician Lance took the initiative and said, How about I use a magic pot to send you in? Serdak smiled slightly, facing the castle that was also brightly lit at night. The magician flew in on a jade handle. It was undoubtedly a moth flying into the flame. Forget it. Actually, I have a better way, Soldak said. He didn't tell this group of friends exactly how to do it, and he couldn't tell them clearly. I have a contract partner who can reverse summon me, so he simply avoided the topic. Well, I hope you can bring us good news tomorrow. Lance stood up with a yawn and said to Soldak. Tax collector Bird also put his arms around his wife, Miss Hoyle, and said to her, It's getting late. We should go home. Obviously, he was confident when he said this and Miss Hoyle was immediately ready to say goodbye to everyone. Although Mrs. Christie still wanted to communicate with Soldak. Carl put his arm around her shoulders and said to her, For the rest, let's wait until Dak meets Darcy, and then we can sit down and talk together. In this way, Soldak and a group of friends said goodbye at the back door of the tavern, and then rode all the way back to the Plaza Garden Hotel. Aphrodite stood on the spire of the bell tower opposite the Christie family castle silently thinking about the best way to sneak into the castle. The transparent insect wings spread out behind her were constantly vibrating, keeping her in a semi-floating state. Apparently, the pair of wings transformed from the life magic pattern peeled off from the queen ant's body allowed her to make up for the part of the strength she had lost before. Her body seemed to be hidden in a mist, becoming a little ethereal, as if a gust of wind could send her into the sky above the castle. She sneaked in through the back door of the castle, and the wings on her back allowed her to easily climb over various obstacles. 
This back door was the entrance and exit passage for the chefs and servants in the kitchen of the castle. It was also where all kinds of daily necessities entered the castle. This was the main entrance. There are two guards in total. And the vision of the two watchtowers at the back can also cross cover this side. But for Aphrodite, it is still easy to avoid the eyes and ears of these people. She first quietly flew up to the watchtower, faced the night guard who was patrolling left and right, and used her charming eyes to confuse him. Then she hid in the shadows and used magic to create an illusion to paralyze the two guards. Quietly entered the Christie family's castle. Then the illusion dissipated, and the two guards were really unaware of it. On the contrary, the guard on the watchtower woke up from the charm. He felt as if he was extremely sleepy and dozed off instantly. At this time, he suddenly woke up and shook his head vigorously to keep himself awake, and then continued to look at him, looking towards the lighted courtyard behind the dense tree wall opposite the castle. Just now, he clearly saw the figures of the female family members flashing through the windows in the courtyard through a gap. This kind of peeping made him feel extremely excited. He stretched his neck as much as possible to look out. But even so, he could no longer see the beautiful scene just now through the gap between the tree walls. The guard wiped his eyes hard and tried to climb higher up the watchtower to see if he could get over the hateful wall of trees. And Aphrodite, the instigator of this incident, had already entered the back door of the castle and walked quietly into the maid's room. Not long after, when she walked out of that room again, she had become the only slight difference in the appearance of a maid is that she holds a headscarf on her head. She held the tea tray in both hands, lowered her head slightly, and walked silently through the long side corridor to the first floor of the main castle, and continued along the stairs to the second floor. She was not familiar with the environment here, and did not even know which area of the castle Darcy lived in. But this did not affect her walking around the castle. She was looking for heavily guarded places, and then deliberately changed direction when the guards noticed. There were four guards and a captain at this gate. After the captain spotted Aphrodite, he chased her and shouted, Stop! Why are you running around so late? Who asked you to deliver the midnight snack? Aphrodite stopped obediently and moved her body close to the stone pillars of the corridor, forming a blind spot for the door guards. Seeing that Aphrodite did not resist or escape, the other guards did not follow. Only the captain looked Aphrodite up and down, leaned close to her ear and asked, What's your name? And who asked you to deliver the midnight snack? His nose seemed to want to press against Aphrodite's neck and smell her fragrance. A faint sweet scent immediately reached his nose. Then, although the captain was still standing there with his back to the guards at the door, his eyes were a little distracted. Aphrodite opened her purple eyes and asked him with a smile. You must know where Darcy Christie currently lives, right? The captain nodded slowly. You will also tell me, right? Aphrodite's eyes were like the deep night sky, containing countless stars. The captain nodded again, then looked at the top of the tallest tower behind the castle, and said in a whisper-like voice, Miss Darcy is lying in that room now. Aphrodite stared at him and said to him, You will forget about me when you wake up. You are just strolling here. The captain repeated, Yes, I'm just here for a walk. Until Aphrodite's figure completely disappeared from the captain's eyes. The captain's body trembled suddenly, and then he woke up with a confused look on his face. He wiped his mouth habitually, and faced the four people at the door with his head held high. The men walked away. When Aphrodite landed silently in the shadow of the terrace, she looked through the blocked curtains towards the lighted room. Darcy Christie's room is very large. In addition to a large bed surrounded by curtains in the middle, the washing area, study room, living room, etc. are almost integrated into one. There are not only four maids keeping vigil inside, but also two female swordsmen wearing light leather armor holding long swords in both hands. The two are sitting on the sofa in the rest area. There is a chessboard on the coffee table. It seems that the two female swordsmen are the scholar is playing chess. Aphrodite propped her hands on the window sill and peered inside for a while, then retreated quietly. Then she stood on the dark side of the spire's roof, silently reciting the incantation of Sleeping Cloud. A huge eyeball appeared on top of Aphrodite's head, and the magic pattern formation emerged under her feet. A black mist-like aura spread to the surroundings after the end of Aphrodite's spell, and all life enveloped by the black mist aura instantly fell into a deep sleep. Sensing that there was no other movement around her, Aphrodite quietly climbed over the window and got into Darcy Christie's room. She passed over the female swordsman who fell in front of the chessboard, and even rearranged the fallen swords beside them, and then came to the side of the maids to make their sleeping postures more elegant 
so as not to fall in the wrong posture, being suffocated to death by some part of his own body. She even glanced at Darcy sleeping on the bed, then walked to the bookshelf, casually selected a book, sat down on the chair next to her, and then began to summon Serdak. Serdak walked out of the void gate and found himself in a huge bedroom. The circular room looked very luxuriously decorated. Aphrodite was sitting on the chair next to the bookshelf. She was holding a thick book, but her eyes did not fall on the book. Instead, she stared at Suldak and complained. How can you do this in the future? Or think of other ways. Look, I summoned you to Wall Village, and then accompanied you to Alinsa, and now I want to summon you to your lover's boudoir. Don't you feel embarrassed? Feeling that the people around him seemed to have fallen asleep, Serdak sat opposite Aphrodite, patted the back of her hand and comforted her. I will try to avoid such embarrassing situations in the future. This situation is special. I need to your help. Besides, she is already married. And I am also married. The relationship between me and her has long been gone. Now I am just entrusted by my friends to come over to see if I can help her. Soldak quickly asked Aphrodite explained. It's just that his rhetoric seems very weak. And even he himself has a hard time convincing him. He could only stop. Shut his mouth and no longer defend. Scratched his head in embarrassment. And then began to look at the room. This room was almost bigger than the living room of an ordinary person's villa. The round room was in Serta. Cause eyes look familiar. That seems to be the case in Hathaway's bedroom. This made Cernak feel that all nobles seemed to like to use the tower as a place of imprisonment. He walked from the bookshelf to the sofa in the rest area. The two female swordsmen were sleeping soundly on the chessboard. Swordsmen would only pay attention to spiritual training after the second round. So they only had the strength of the first round. It's just that its coordination and balance are outstanding. But it resists Aphrodite's mental attack. Soldak walked silently towards the big bed where Darcy was lying. When he walked to the bed and rolled up the curtains, he saw the emaciated woman lying on the bed. Judging from her appearance, it's hard to think of the heroic red-haired swordswoman from the past. She just pursed her lips slightly with a hint of stubbornness, letting Soldak know that she was Darcy Christie. The current leader of the Christie family is in a bit of a miserable state. Not only are they betrayed and separated from their relatives, they are even in danger of losing their lives. Serdak sat down next to the bed and reached out to touch Darcy's thin arm. He could clearly feel the weak vitality in her body. As a light group bloomed with dazzling light in the palm of his hand, the entire curtain of the big bed was illuminated by the light. Passing through the brocade quilt on the bed, the light ball sank into Darcy Christie's chest. And as Suldek whispered, Darcy, wake up! The eyelids of the thin-looking woman on the bed trembled a few times. And then she opened her somewhat dull eyes. Chapter 1255 Arrangement Soldak, is that you? This was the first thing he said when he woke up. For some reason, it made Serdak feel a little sad. Soldak felt that if he choked at this time, it might make the atmosphere even sadder. So he suppressed his sadness and forced a smile to Darcy. He nodded to her. But he couldn't speak out. He was afraid that when he spoke, his voice would be trembling. Soldak sat on the chair next to the bed and gently patted the back of Darcy's hand trying to calm her down. However, he saw that she was struggling to sit up with some joy. I thought I would never see you again in this life. But I didn't expect you to still come to see me. Can you help me sit up? Soldak controlled his emotions and lowered his voice. Dashi, how do you feel now? I feel better. Darcy Christie took a deep breath and then turned her head slightly. When she looked around, she found that there was no maid standing nearby. And then she asked in surprise. How did you get in? Did they make things difficult for you? Darcy's eyes then fell on the noble badge on Serdak's chest. And then she said with a sudden look, Oh, you are already an earl. So should I call you Earl Serdak? She wanted to reach out and touch her hair, and said with some embarrassment, I'm sorry, I must look ugly now. During this period, she raised her brows from time to time, and Serdak knew that she was trying to hide the pain in her body. He has treated so many patients. How could he not understand this little trick? Soldak decided that he could not continue to waste any more time and should help her recover from her injuries first. So he said, Darcy, I have heard from Carl and Lance about your situation. I will help you treat your illness when I come here this time. Well, don't worry. Helensa City will continue to be in the hands of the Christie family. Darcy nodded. The girl who was struggling in such adversity finally shed two lines of tears in front of Soldak. Serdak bent down and scraped the tears from her face with his fingers. A faint holy light came out from the tip of his finger, 
and he gently touched Darcy's forehead. Her eyelids were a little heavy, and she tried hard to resist, but she still fell asleep. At this time, Aphrodite stood up from behind Serdak. She pursed her lips and said nothing. There were some emotions in her eyes, but her happiness and anger could not be seen. Serdak silently set up the sacrificial altar, and the blue flames emitted a faint light in the room. After Serdak recited the prayer, the two-faced and four-armed demon appeared in the center of the temporary altar. He lowered his head and pulled out a magic sealing box from his magic belt bag and took out a demon warrior's head and opened it. A layer of oil paint was painted on the ferocious face, and the two demon horns were still on it. Serdak raised it high and began to pray to the face of God. A beam of light fell from the roof. Tyrants! Holy shield! Blessed body! Shield of blessing! The double blessing effect fell on Darcy Christie. Then Serdak blessed himself with the eye of truth. He began to check the status of the blood vessels and meridians inside Darcy's body and found that the blood circulation in her limbs was not smooth. She had been lying in bed for a long time and her body functions had declined. Although she was an excellent first-turn swordsman before, her body became very weak after being on the hospital bed for so long. Serdak also found that some parts of her back were already red. Swollen and ulcerated. No matter how bad Darcy is. She is still the leader of the Christie family. Unexpectedly. She is imprisoned here by the opposition forces of the family. And her situation becomes so embarrassing. It is estimated that even Mrs. Mariana Christie has never thought that Darcy's body, lying on the bed at this time, would have to endure such torture. The holy light in Serdic's hand waxed and waned as his emotions lurked. He tried his best to stabilize his emotions and tried his best to maintain a steady flow of holy light spells, healing the wounds on Darcy's body. Aphrodite folded her hands on her chest and looked at the haggard woman on the hospital bed. Her dark purple eyes seemed to be able to see Darcy's soul. There was some uncertainty in her purple eyes. She waited for a while before looking at Sue. Erdak said, The cause of her illness should not be physical. If you really want to save her, you may have to deal with her mental illness. Serdak put down his right hand, extinguished the holy light spell turned to Aphrodite helplessly and said, I only have the holy light technique to heal diseases and save people. How can the holy light cure her heart disease? Aphrodite shook her head and said, You are a second level powerhouse, a paladin of Ruth City, and a great lord of the Ganbu Plain. So now you have this ability, unless you are afraid of getting into trouble. Soldak spread his hands and said, Why didn't I realize that I have so many names now? In fact, you have already taken the first step to help her. Aphrodite sat down by the bed. At this time, Darcy Christie was already showing signs of waking up. The succubus placed her hands on Darcy. Christie wiped it on her face and let her continue to sleep. What have I done? Serdek asked. You helped Darcy seek support from the magic union. But this is far from enough. Aphrodite said to Soldek. You also need to help her find more supporters. Just like you took down Ruth City. Like the city hall and the house of representatives. Find a way to get the nobles to stand by Darcy's side, even if they are not so willing. But at least they must clearly support Darcy. You mean to let me lead troops to capture the city of Alanza, and then use force to make them surrender? Serdek asked. Aphrodite rolled her eyes. Serdek had never noticed that her eyes could be so flexible. Of course it can't be like this. You were born in the guard camp of Alanza City, so you can get the support of the guard camp through your previous relationships. Aphrodite pursed her lips and said, Serdak was a little confused and asked curiously. Carl has been suspended. This shows that the Helensa City Guard Battalion does not support Darcy. How can I change their minds? Aphrodite spread her hands and said to Serdak. So this is the problem that needs you to solve. She added before Soldak could speak. Moreover, you need to gain the support of other great nobles in Helensa City. Serdak felt that Aphrodite had given him some impossible tasks. So he said directly, How do I know the other great nobles in Helensa City? Captain Mon Goss of the Goss family once awarded you the title of knight. How can you say that their family has nothing to do with you? So you can look for them. Aphrodite approached Serdak and said to him whispered. But the problem is that after I returned to Helensa City, I only visited their family once. And I was blocked from the door at that time. Serdak still remembers being rejected for that visit. Aphrodite smiled and whispered. So this is the problem that you need to solve. She once again did not wait for Soldak to speak and then changed the subject and said, Count Fornak is your friend, so you have to seek his help and ask him to help you and introduce to you the old friends he knows. When Serdak heard what Aphrodite said, he became even more speechless, 
and asked Aphrodite. You said that if I call Count Fornak out of the world of the dead, I will accompany him to visit those old friends in the city. Will it scare those old nobles directly into their coffins? Aphrodite looked like a fool, and then said, You just need to use Count Fornak's favor to visit them. As for how to convince them, I think there is more than just favor. Do you think you need something else? What? Soldak was brought into her rhythm by Aphrodite, and he thought carefully for a while before he understood. Okay, when you say that, I suddenly know what I want to do. Immediately afterwards, Aphrodite continued, As for this, Count Darcy needs some cronies to stay by her side. If she no longer has the kind of cronies who can protect her, I can help you inform Samira and the others, and I have a way to get her to set off immediately and return to Halanza from the Belan Plain. Serdak felt that at this moment. He had been clearly arranged by Aphrodite. Chapter 1256 Challenge In the morning, the sun shines on the mountain city of Alinsa. Standing on the top of the bell tower, you can hear the cry of the mountain eagle. The city of Alanza has changed from quiet to noisy. The deserted streets at night are filled with small merchants and hawkers. Civilians hurried out of their homes and began a day of hard work. This is the life of most civilians in the city. Many people are used to buying half a portion of wheat cake smeared with jam on the street and eating them while walking. The nobles also have to start planning how to expand the family's industry. They need to prove themselves in order to gain corresponding status in the family. They were sitting in the magic caravan, with slightly swollen eyes and sluggish expressions. Some of them even dozed off, drinking refreshing black tea while sitting in the carriage. Serdak was walking on the central street. Not far away was the guard camp headquarters building. Aphrodite was not with him. He looked through the dazzling sunlight at the roof of the headquarters building above the tree canopy and took a deep breath. He sighed and strode towards the guard camp. The knights from the guard camp walked into the gate in twos and threes. Serdak also walked quickly among the crowd. The guards at the door wanted to stop him. But when they saw the noble badge on Serdak's chest, the guards immediately hesitated. Just as the guards seemed hesitant, Soldak had already entered the guard camp headquarters building. And he even greeted a few familiar faces on the way. After all, he had rescued many knights from the guard camp. Although most of them could not call out their names, those knights were at least willing to wave to him with a smile. Miss Flora was wearing a decent uniform and was holding a parasol in her hand. Just as she was walking up the steps, she suddenly found a familiar face beside her. She opened her eyes wide and looked at Suldak. Said, Dick, why are you back? Shouldn't you be stationed in a border town on the Belen Plain now? I have a short vacation for the time being. So I'm back. Sirdak said vaguely, so you are just here to visit us? Miss Flora asked curiously. Yes, that's exactly it. Soldak agreed. The two walked into the guard camp headquarters building side by side. And the receptionist standing at the front desk took the initiative to stand up and salute Flora. Miss Flora is the personnel manager of the guard camp. When Sirdak joined the guard camp, Flora personally handled it. Now that the two meet again, they can naturally chat casually. After reaching the second floor, Miss Flora signaled that she was going to the end of the corridor. Soldak stopped and pointed to Viscount Emmett's office opposite, indicating that he was going to visit Viscount Emmett to catch up with the past. Miss Flora seemed to have something to say to him, but she didn't speak until the two separated. Soldak walked to the door of an office. The sign on the door clearly read, Office of the First Captain of the Guard Battalion. Soldak stood at the door, knocked on the door, and then opened the door and left. Got in. He sat in Viscount Emmett's office for a long time. In fact, it was not easy to convince this evergreen in the Helensa guard camp. Viscount Emmett was quite prestigious in the city of Helensa. He did not want to offend other nobles. So Soldak persuaded him for a long time. Only then did Viscount Emmett reluctantly nod. Walking out of Viscount Emmett's office, Soldak let out a long breath. As Carl said, Viscount Emmett is considered a supporter of the Christie family, and he is also a young nobleman promoted by Marquis Bernard Christie. Now Soldak has proposed that he can support Darcy, although Amy Viscount Tay hesitated for a long time, but finally agreed. When Soldak came to the Guard Battalion headquarters, his second goal was to meet the Guard Battalion Commander Solon Aldington, originally Captain Soron. He has now become the Commander-in-Chief of the Guard Battalion. It must be said that the Aldington family in Helensa City is still very powerful. After knocking on the door, Serdak pushed open the outer door of Chief Sauron's office. The assistant inside raised his head and stared at Serdak, his eyes falling on his chest. And then he immediately recognized Serdak. 
Her eyes lit up, and she smiled at Soldek. Is G. Sauron here? Sirdek asked. The assistant quickly replied. Yes, Captain Soldak. Have you been promoted to Earl recently? I will report it to you immediately. I have to say that the title of nobility is really a good stepping stone. Soon the assistant walked out of it, and behind him was Chief Sauron in uniform. He was still strong and strong, but he had lost his sharpness in front of Sirdek. Chief Sauron smiled gently and said to him, Dak, why are you back? Shouldn't you be stationed in the Belan Plain? I'm back to visit my relatives this time. I stopped by to see you, Soldak said casually. Chief Sauron smiled a little reluctantly. He saw the noble badge on Sirdak's chest and invited Sirdak into the chief's office very politely. As soon as Soldak sat down, he said straight to the point to Director Sauron, I came to see you this time because I hope you can stand on Darcy Christie's side and be able to unswervingly stand by Darcy Christie in the future. Support her, I hope, sitting on the chair. Chief Sauron smiled unnaturally, waved his hand to Soldak, and said, Dak, how long have you been away from Valenza? You know that the city of Valenza here is no longer what it was when Marquis Bernard was in office. The nobles of Valenza city are now scattered like a plate of sand. You do you know how many prom invitations I've received just this week? How many people are trying to win over me? Now that Archon Darcy's power has been almost eliminated and she is terminally ill, how could I still put my chips on her? This is not in the interests of the Aldington family. After speaking, he shook his head again and again and added, This is impossible. What do you think the city of Alanza has become now? Soldek sat opposite Commander Sauron and asked unceremoniously, feeling that there seemed to be some change in Sirdak's tone. Captain Sauron was slightly startled. Then his eyes fell on Sirdak's chest again. His expression became somewhat relieved. And then he laughed and explained, Marquis Bernard has left and all the nobles who once attached themselves to him are now unable to gather together as before. The Christie family alone is divided into several factions. Darcy Christie currently belongs to the anti-power faction and is no longer able to control the Christie family. The people who control the Christie family now are her two uncles Ryan Christie and Piero Christie. Ryan controls the Christie family's business. Piero controls the Christie family's lord army. And her brother Duanmu controls all the Christie family's manor territories. None of these Christies support Darcy, which is why our female consul of Valenza City is in a dilemma. It is the best outcome for her to be able to lie peacefully on the hospital bed now. Chief Sauron rubbed his hands and rang the bell at hand. The assistant outside pushed the door open, ready to accept Captain Sauron's call at any time. Captain Sauron stood up directly, smiled and said to Sirdek, I know your purpose. Dark. But now in the city of Valenza, the situation is very complicated. So I can't promise you this. Sirdak leaned back on the sofa and did not stand up. Under the watchful eye of the assistant at the door, Soldak took out a pair of silk white gloves from his pocket, with a faint smile on his face. He threw the gloves on Chief Sauron's desk and said, I challenge you. Sauron Aldington, I think you are contemptuous of the Archon of Alanza City. In order to defend the power of the Green Empire Archon, I challenge you. Chapter 1257 Fierce Battle Dak, you, Chief Sauron pointed at Sirdak who was sitting safely on the sofa, with a ferocious look on his face. Soldak picked up the teacup, poured himself a glass of water, and drank it in one gulp, and said to Chief Sauron, I need a guard battalion that will support Darcy unconditionally. I can't do it, Sauron said this resolutely. So I need you to give up your position, Soldak said without hesitation, and after the smile disappeared from his face, his body continued to swell. Many muscle groups showed obvious outlines under the tight-fitting leather armor and the aura of a strong man on his body was constantly rising. He was not wearing a magic pattern structure. After the upper leather jacket was broken by the bulging muscles, three inscriptions were actually exposed. The magic pattern on the body. At this time, two magic pattern structures lit up with magical halos. Sirdak guessed that it was the magical power of one of the magic pattern structures that allowed Chi Sauron's muscles to continue to grow. In addition, he had strong the person's aura continues to rise and it should have some connection with the magical power of another magic pattern construct. Chief Sauron glanced contemptuously at the white gloves on the table, held them in his hands, and his voice became extremely cold. If I don't agree, duck, those white gloves you threw over were not a joke. Were they? Yeah, Soldek said calmly without raising his head. Chief Sauron walked to a bookshelf and lifted the magic pattern cloth on a wooden figure from the shelf, revealing a magic pattern structure that had been wiped clean inside. 
The somewhat panicked assistant at the door quickly ran over and skillfully helped Chief Sauron put on this gorgeous magic pattern outfit. When Chief Sauron took the black double-edged sword on the bracket on the wall in his hand, his aura had gathered to its peak. He placed the double-edged sword in his hand across his chest and fiercely raised the sword. A ball of sword energy erupted from the ground like a blazing flame. Okay, I also want to see what kind of abilities you have after being promoted from knight to earl in just a few years, Chief Sauron said coldly to Serdak. After saying that, he stopped waiting and raised the two-meter-long black double-edged sword above his head. The sword was steaming with flaming sword energy, and the killing energy rushed directly from the tip of the sword to the ceiling. Almost in the next second, the big sword suddenly showed three sword shadows and slashed towards Soldak. Serdak hurriedly kicked the coffee table in front of him with his foot as his other hand fumbled from the key point of the space. Serdak had a gothic shield on his right arm. Serdak raised his shield to meet him. A layer of silver light appeared on the shield instantly. The black double-edged sword struck down instantly, and Gerda's shield immediately erupted with a dazzling silver light, and three torrents of sword energy all hit the shield. Holy shield! Although the shield protected Serdak within it, the destructive power of the three sword shadows was extremely strong. It immediately shattered the sofa where Serdak was sitting, and the remaining sword energy turned into air waves and rushed outward. Two windows in the chief's office were smashed. Broken glass and splinters of wood flew out and scattered all over the floor. Soldak quickly ran to the window, jumped from the third floor to the front yard of the guard battalion headquarters. Chief Sauron glanced at the white gloves on his desk and followed behind with gritted teeth. One step, two steps, three steps. Each step is full of momentum. Both hands grasped the black double-edged sword at the same time, and the whole person turned into a white light, chasing behind Serdak, and the black sword slashed across the shoulder towards Serdak's shoulder. Serdak held the broadsword in his hand. At this time, he no longer retreated. Instead, he stopped and turned half a circle with the inertia of the shield. The broadsword suddenly collided with the black double-edged sword. The two swords suddenly erupted into the sound of gold and iron. Soldak took a few steps back again almost crushing the stone floor in the front yard of the guard camp headquarters with every step. He fell into the flower bed awkwardly and even hit a shrub wall. When a group of knights from the guard camp saw Chief Sauron jumping down from the building with a double-edged sword, they all drew their swords and chased after Serdak. Chief Sauron raised a hand and shouted with an angry face. You all stop. This is a duel between our counts. No one is allowed to participate before the winner is determined. At this time, Serdak also held a sword and shield in his hand, covered with leaves, and climbed out from behind the low shrub wall. Many knights in the guard camp knew Serdak, and when they saw that he was actually dueling with Commander Sauron, they all stood there in shock. Commander Sauron had the upper hand twice, and he couldn't help but show a trace of contempt on his face. Is this your ability? If it's just these, it's not enough to challenge me. Dark. As he spoke, the magic pattern structure on Chief Sauron's body also lit up with complex magic patterns. And Chief Sauron's speed increased dramatically. A halo of light shone on and off under Serdak's feet. The orange halo was like a burning flame. And the shield in his hand seemed to be coated with a layer of mithril. Commander Sauron's momentum rose to its peak. He rushed toward Serdak and jumped up far away. That was a distance that was absolutely impossible to perform a jump slash. But just when he reached the highest point of his jump, a giant silhouette suddenly appeared behind him. And then as Chi Soran shouted loudly, the giant's shadow instantly became extremely solid. And the giant happened to appear at the feet of Chi Soran. The giant stretched out his hands to grasp Chi Soran's ankles, rounded his arms suddenly, and threw Chi Soran in his hand. And the direction of the throw happened to be Serdak's side. Commander Sauron was like a cannonball holding a giant sword in both hands, flying towards Serdak. Serdak did not dodge or dodge. He held his shield in front of his chest in a defensive posture, facing Commander Sauron's broken army, and the broad sword in his hand also shone with holy light. Just when Chief Sauron struck the double-edged sword on Serdak's shield, Serdak and the shield were almost thrown away by the sword, and Serdak crashed into the flower pond again. There was cheering all around. When Serdak walked out of the flower bed again, the atmosphere around him began to become particularly solemn. He looked very embarrassed, but he was not injured. On the other hand, Commander Sauron threw two moves, and the power in his body seemed to be drained out. However, he was still riding a tiger at this moment. He obviously had such a big advantage. So there was no need to stop. But these stunts were too draining on him. Big. 
The black sword in his hand once again erupted with countless sword rays. And the sword rays were like mountains wrapping towards Serdek. But those are just countless sword lights. In the reign of sword light, Commander Sauron actually jumped up. And between the light and shadow of the sword light, he jumped high again. This time, Chief Sauron was almost integrated with a double-edged sword in his hand. While Serdak was dashing left and right to avoid the rain of arrows, he silently slashed down on Serdak's head. Countless sword rains fell. Serdak held the shield in his hand and was unable to dodge in the rain of swords. Seeing Captain Sauron rushing over, the shadow of an angel once again appeared behind Serdak. The pair of flawless and smooth wings surrounded the strong holy light that could almost completely purify people. The moment Chief Sauron fell down, the angel suddenly spread its wings and completely enveloped Serdak in them. The big sword slashed down again, only to smash the angel's shadow. There were some feathers of holy light filled with holy aura scattered around. Serdak, however, held the broadsword in his backhand and inserted the sharp blade into Chief Sauron's belly. He took a step, drew his sword, and released the white-hot sword light. Almost in one go, Captain Sauron threw his head back and fell down amid the exclamations. At this moment, Suldak put away his broadsword, squatted next to Chief Sauron again, and said to him, You will probably lie in bed for half a year. I hope someone in the Aldington family will be willing to help you. Inject some resources into your injury, so that your injury can be healed quickly. Chief Sauron was lying on the ground with a pale face. He kept coughing up blood from his mouth. There were actually five mountain passes of different depths in his chest and abdomen. Dak, you use force to force me to give up this position. There are so many nobles in Alinsa City who oppose Darcy. How can you beat them one by one? Soren lay on the stretcher and asked Serta with a lonely look on his face. Ku asked. Of course not. Saldak said firmly. Then he took out a piece of magic parchment from his body and said to Chief Sauron. This is a recommendation letter for you to recommend Emmett to the City Hall to replace the commander of the Guard Battalion. You can write it yourself. So that you can at least maintain your last bit of dignity or you can wait for me to ask Darcy to write a new one. Appointment Letter Chapter 1258 Visiting Goss Manor Probably none of the knights in the guard camp expected that Commander Sauron would fall like this on the dual field. There were five more bloody holes in his body, and his stomach was almost completely cut open by a broad sword. The blood dripped from his body and spread out in a large area on the stone floor of the front yard. Obviously before this, Commander Sauron always had the advantage in the duel. Chief Sauron's face was pale, and his eyes were a little distracted. He printed his handprint on the parchment with difficulty with his blood-red fingers. Just when everyone thought that Chief Sauron would die from this, Serdak squatted next to Chief Sauron, put the dripping intestines back into his stomach with his hands full of blood, and then used the holy light technique to continuously fill it. Entering Chief Sauron's body, he used needles and threads to resew the wound on Chief Sauron's stomach and rescued him from the ferry of the River Styx. This is the headquarters of the guard battalion. Although the duel was too sudden and the battle only lasted a short time, many knights still came together, seeing Chief Sauron lying in a pool of blood, and the murderer Soldak was the one who treated the sick and saved people. Everyone was at a loss. Moreover, according to insiders, Chief Sauron and Serdak are dueling. According to the laws of the Green Empire, as long as the two parties reach an agreement, the winner after the battle will be protected by the laws of the Empire. In other words, Serdak Duck will not bear any criminal responsibility for this. Serdak stood up, wiped the blood on his hands with a white silk handkerchief, and calmly ordered the knights of the guard camp next to him. Hurry up and bring a stretcher over and send Chief Sauron home. The guard camp suddenly became a mess. The knights in the guard camp looked at Serdak with hostility, but no one dared to stand up and take action against Serdak. Only a few of Chief Sauron's cronies found a stretcher and carried Chief Sauron onto a magic caravan. They stared at Soldak with complicated expressions, and finally left the guard camp headquarters in the magic caravan. Soldak thought there would be a chaotic battle, but he didn't expect that the knights in the guard camp of Alinsa City were so cowardly. Or maybe they obeyed the instructions of Chief Sauron and restrained their emotions and did not take action. During this process, Soldak had been standing quietly in the courtyard of the guard battalion headquarters. The yard was full of onlookers. Even Miss Flora from the Human Resources Department was on the steps. She stood at the back of the crowd and looked at Soldak in surprise. She recalled that in the morning, she and Soldak walked into the headquarters building chatting and laughing. How could he actually have a duel with Chief Sauron in the blink of an eye? It wasn't until he pulled Commander Sauron's carriage away that Viscount Emmett walked out of the headquarters building of the guard camp to clean up the mess. 
as the number two figure in the Helensa guard camp. This Count Emmett was in the competition for the candidate for the commander-in-chief. It was given to Sauron because Chief Sauron received the full support of the Allington family when he ran for chief. Compared to Sauron, this Count Emmett is more supported by the knights in the Helensa guard camp. Aren't you guys all idle? Disperse. Seiko, aren't you going to go on duty? Olkathan, what are you doing here? This Count Emmett stood on the steps and shouted to the crowd of onlookers. Scolded. Captain, Sernak injured the commander. Captain Emmett. This Count Emmett looked at the knights surrounding him with some dissatisfaction. Pointed at their foreheads. Stood in front of the steps and read loudly. Chief Sauron and Count Sernak just resolved a dispute through a duel. This is a tradition that has been continued by the nobles. When there is a conflict between them, the nobles will not expand the conflict and will not provoke wars between lords. They fight duels in the most gentlemanly way. Therefore, whether it is Chief Sauron or Sernak, whether they are the winner or the loser, they are worthy of our visit. Dear, Soldak walked up the steps and handed the blood-stained parchment to Viscount Emmett. He felt that it would be better to say less at this time. So he turned around and walked through the crowd in the yard, leaving the guard camp headquarters in full view of everyone. Of course, the fact that Serdak was able to walk out of the guard battalion headquarters unharmed does not rule out the intimidating power of a second-level powerhouse. However, the root cause, Serdak believes, is that most of the Helensa guard camp the knights have never experienced battle, and they lack the bloodiness to long for battle in their bones. When Serdak left, there was still an orange flame-like halo under his feet as the halo under his feet kept twisting and beating. Some knights in the guard camp even curiously asked the captain around them privately. Boss, what is that under Sernak's feet? It should be the advanced halo of a second turn knight. I'm not sure. The knights around also started talking about this matter. The knights of the guard camp in the yard watched Sernak leave. That afternoon, a notice was delivered to Carl. And Carl resumed his original position. That night, a group of elite guard battalion knights, led by Carl, entered the Christie family castle fully armed, although they were blocked by the Christie family guards outside the inner courtyard. No one expected that during the confrontation between the two sides, duh, who had been bedridden, with Sis Christie was actually sitting in a wheelchair and was pushed to the high terrace on the top floor of the castle by Lady Mariana. Darcy openly announced on the terrace that the guard camp knights had received her summons and entered the castle, although the Christie family has always circulated that Darcy Christie is about to die of illness and the guards in the castle are the personal guards of Darcy Christie's uncle, Count Piero Christie. But in this case, these guards failed to hold Carl back. This pair of guard camp knights rushed into the castle almost arrogantly and directly occupied the high tower where Darcy Christie lived. Mrs. Mariana also brought several maids around her and began to take care of Darcy's food and daily life. The news that Darcy was gradually recovering also spread throughout the city of Holanza overnight. After Serdak left the guard camp, he left Alinsa and returned to the Ruth City Hall to handle some official business. Then he returned to the castle to have dinner with Hathaway and Beatrice. Then he took Sia and hurriedly left the castle. Although Hathaway felt that Suldak seemed a bit mysterious these past two days. She only knew that he was busier than usual these past two days, and seemed to be troubled by the recruitment order issued by the military. At night, Serdak passed through the void gate again and walked into the room on the top floor of the Garden Hotel. Aphrodite was wearing a long black skirt, sitting in front of the dressing mirror, wearing a pearl earring on her head. Her skin was not fair, but her figure was extremely voluptuous, and the long skirt almost exposed most of the skin on her back. On the outside, the scars on her back were covered up by the magic tattoo, and they looked like a delicate and symmetrical wing tattoo. She combed her long hair up so that she could cover the devil's horns on her head. In the past, she was used to wearing magic robes that covered her whole body and rarely wore such shoulder and backless long dresses. Now she wears some light makeup on her face and uses foundation to change the color of her skin, making her skin look like natural pearl white. Then stood up, turned around, spread out his hands, danced the black dress in front of Soldak and asked, What do you think? Very beautiful. Serdak felt that if he didn't boast at this time, he would probably be killed by Aphrodite using a spell. After hearing Serdak's praise, Aphrodite contentedly picked up the magic robe from the side and covered the exquisite long skirt inside. She was going to take care of Darcy Christie tonight. As for why she had to dress up so beautifully, she also to put beautiful clothes under the magic robe. Serdak thought it would be better not to ask. Serdak is going to visit the Goss family tonight. 
the Goss family has given a clear response to the letter of visit he handed over during the day. This is the second supporter Soldak is preparing to win for Darcy. The Goss family has fallen from the top nobility to the second echelon in Helanza City. The main reason is that the private army of the lords of the Goss family was almost completely destroyed in the Warsaw Plain. And the family's vitality was also severely damaged. However, Mond. Earl as still follows Archduke Newman. So the reputation of the Goss family in Helanza City has plummeted. But there is no lack of opportunities for the family to revive. For Suldak, Count Mon Goss is his guide. If Count Mon's Goss had not granted him the knighthood, I am afraid he would not have had the opportunity to enter the guard camp, let alone be defeated by Lou Marquis. They noticed. The horse that Serdak was riding stopped at the entrance of a gorgeous manor in the northeast corner of the city. Being able to have a mansion like a manor in the Helanza Mountain City shows the profound heritage of the Goss family. Serdak jumped off the carriage at the door walked to the big iron door, and showed his identity. The guard at the door immediately opened the door. The hired carriage left directly at the gate. A carriage belonging to the Goss family drove out of the manor, followed by a group of attendants. Young Moron Goss walked out of the carriage, wearing a brand new leather armor. But it was not a magic pattern construct. He jumped out of the magic caravan, and smiled faintly when he saw Serdak. Loron looked much more mature than three years ago. He was still a noble baron. When he saw Soldak, he took the initiative to salute and said with a smile, Count Soldak, long time no see. Soldak was deeply impressed by him. Loran Goss, Cole Norton, Hathaway Luther, Beatrice Cafello, and Darcy Christie all graduated from Burnett High School, a classmate who graduated from the Swordsman Academy together. He has a very good relationship with Cole Norton, and he even invited Cole Norton to be a guest in Helensa City. But now the Goss family cannot be regarded as the top nobles in Alinsa City. And they are even less able to squeeze into the aristocratic circle of Benna City. Cole Norton is doing well in Benna City now. Together with Edie Newman and other aristocratic sons, he can run around in Benna City. In addition, the power of the Norton family has been growing in recent years. A few steps away from the Goss family. Yes! I remember when I first met you. We were in Hendonar County. Serdek stretched out his hand to Loran and said to him with a smile. Loron asked Soldak to get on the carriage, and the two of them talked and laughed all the way into the manor. In order to welcome Serdak, the Goss family spent an afternoon carefully preparing, and they obviously paid special attention to Serdak's visit. Soldak walked into the magnificent reception hall of Goss Manor, and saw a row of oil paintings hanging in the semi-open corridor on one side of the hall. Almost all of them were the heads of the Goss family. From the oil paintings, it can be seen that almost each generation of Earl Goss wears the swordsman's magic pattern. Loran Goss stood aside and introduced to Soldek. Each generation of the Goss family has been an officer of the Bena Legion, and the family's private army has always had a formal establishment in the Bena Legion. I heard that last year. You successfully regained the Ganbu Plain and gathered 20,000 heavy armored infantry regiments from the Ganbu Plain to support the Warsaw Plain. Many people in the Bena Legion have heard of your name and know that you have been there. Silently support the Warsaw Plain War. Serdak was speechless. He had never thought about supporting the war in the Warsaw Plain. If possible. Of course, he would hide as far away as possible. Otherwise, who knows if you will meet an old face and recognize his identity immediately. Chapter 1259 Count Fornax List Although the Goss family is currently in decline, it still belongs to the nobles in the circle of the Bena Legion. And it can be regarded as holding the Newman family tightly. It is the most loyal support of Duke Newman. As for why the Goss family settled in Highland Sashen City, Soldak felt that this might be a macro strategy for the Newman family to rule the Bena province. Although at present, the Goss family continues to fade out of the top aristocratic circle of Valencia. The rise of their family only requires the victory of one war. It is a pity that the Bena Legion wasted six years in the Warsaw Plain. So this is also the fundamental reason why the Goss family failed to recover. Serdak is the actual controller of the Ganbu Plain. Not many nobles in Alinsa City know about this. But the Goss family should be the ones who know the most details. They even know that Serdak is currently returned safely from the battlefield. For a second-level expert, Have you ever been to a big battlefield? Is of great significance. The strong men who have returned from the big battlefield have advantages that ordinary strongmen cannot match in terms of personal combat power or weapons and equipment. The Bena Legion has been trapped in the Warsaw Plain for such a long time. Serdak is nothing to judge. But he just doesn't want to be involved in this matter. As a plain lord, before the call of order, at the request of the military department, 
He sent an army to the plain of Warsaw. This is probably the most that Serdak can do at the moment. And he really can't complain about this. A war that has been ruined by the Bina people. The Goss family obviously has some connections in the military. They know that the big man standing behind Soldak is none other than Marquis Luther, who is currently in the limelight in the Bina province. This is also the reason Soldak came to visit this time. Visit. The main reason for the Goss family's positive response. After passing the corridor filled with portraits, everyone sat in the living room, and the feeling of alienation was obviously much smaller. After all, Soldak and Loron were of the same age, and they had some military topics with each other. So when the maid served fruits and refreshments, the atmosphere between the two was very harmonious. After chatting for a while, Serdak explained the purpose of this visit. This time I returned to Helanza City and found that many places in the city have changed. Especially the current situation in Helanza makes me even more worried. When I was in Helanza City, Marquis Bernard took care of me. There are many. So I took the liberty to come to visit this time. I also hope that the Goss family can stand on the side of Darcy Christie the daughter of Marquis Bernard. And if necessary, we can also reach some contracts. Soldak said directly, After all, Miss Darcy is the successor designated by Marquis Bernard. Seeing Lawrence's silence, he added another sentence. Laurent Goss is indeed not as impetuous as he was when he was young. Now he has become calmer and said to Soldak, My Lord Earl, I am not excusing myself from the Goss family. But now the nobles in the entire city of Valencia have some opinions on Consul Darcy. She has touched the interests of most nobles. So everyone has stood up against her. Even if the Goss family is now willing to accept the olive branch offered by Archon Darcy. What's the use? Soldak didn't expect Loron to say such words. It seemed that he had really matured a lot. Soldak nodded and then said, Of course I know this. Although I can't decide anything for Consul Darcy. I can guarantee that the interests of the nobles who stand by Consul Darcy, will be best protected. In addition, I will continue to persuade other wealthy nobles. Everyone gathered together to repeat the past glory of the Christie family. As for the current alliance of nobles in Helanza, I don't think the relationship between them will be as unbreakable as a rock. If it really needs to be solved by force, I will not hesitate to send troops northward. Baron Loran Goss's eyes were a little uncertain, and he was obviously unable to make any decision. But then a housekeeper suddenly walked up to Loran bent down, and whispered into his ear for a while. Baron Loran Goss's expression relaxed, and he said to Soldak, Lord Earl Soldak, if you can convince other nobles to gather around Consul Darcy, as long as our power can resist other allied nobles in the city, the Goss family promises to stand by Darcy Christie. Around. Okay. It's a deal. Soldak stood up, shook hands with Loran Goss and said, I hope we can become partners in the trenches. This is what the Goss family is happy to see. Loran Goss responded with a smile. Serdak knew that it was impossible to get any promises from the Goss family during his first visit. But the current harvest was more good news than bad news for Serdak. Back in the hotel room, Aphrodite was not there. And Serdak prepared some black tea and nuts and placed them on the coffee table in the room. Then he blew the bone whistle in his hand. At night, the shrill whistle penetrated the room and spread to the silent street. But no one seemed to hear it. The sound simply made the soul tremble. Perhaps it was because Count Thordak had become more powerful that the phalanx in Soldak's hand exuded an inexplicable powerful aura. A door stained with blood and rust suddenly appeared on the wall. The door was suddenly pushed open from the inside. Countless skeletal arms stretched out from the mist. As if they wanted to drag everything in this world back to the door. Inside, those skeletal arms will be burned to varying degrees when they come into contact with the air of this world. Among these hundreds of bones and arms. A ghost wearing a tattered black cloak flew out from inside holding a lord's scepter. When his body approached the door, those big bones and hands shrank back. Count Fonak's body continued to overflow with the power of his soul. He flew out of the door, and his movements immediately became very elegant. The translucent skeleton under the black cloak is almost entirely made of soul power. The appearance in life is gradually fading. However, when Count Fornak saw Soldak, the soul fire in the eye sockets immediately burst into splendor. Count Fornak's appearance during his lifetime was like a thin film in the air, floating out from the ghost's body, with a soft smile on his familiar face. The ghost's body overlapped with Count Fornak's shadow. Only when Count Fornak made some movements did the familiar face appear. Dak, you are finally willing to take the time to treat me to afternoon tea. Earl Fornak picked up a cup of black tea, sniffing the fragrance floating on it and said, Recently in the Bone Wilderness, 
There are always I met those giant white bone worms. So I took a lot of supplements. And it would be very good to have a cup of afternoon tea to balance it out. This one is really fragrant. Soldek also took the opportunity to ask. Count Fonak. How is your life in the underworld recently? Count Fonak smiled cheerfully. The ghost holding the scepter looked a bit ferocious. But his voice was very soft. Not bad. Thanks to you last time. This gave me an extra helper. Serdak knew that he was talking about the apprentice of the kit magician. Now my ghost army has begun to conquer the bone wilderness. Expanding its territory every day. Count Fonak said proudly. And it seemed that he also needed someone to talk to. Then Count Fornak floated to the window. Pushed the window open with his hand. And let the night breeze blow into the room. Is this the city of Alanza? Count Fornak showed some nostalgia on his face and asked Serdak in surprise. Yes. Soldak nodded and admitted. Count Fonak asked again. Did you encounter trouble this time when you came to Alinsa City? Soldak quickly explained. To be precise, Consul Darcy Christie encountered some troubles. When I was in Alinsa City, I received a lot of care from Marquis Bernard. So since I encountered such a thing this time, just prepare to help Darcy. Count Fonak immediately asked. Is there anything that needs to be done? Serdak pondered for a moment and then said, I need your support. If you still have some old relationships in Helensa City, please give me their contact information. I want to persuade a group of nobles to support Dakane. Count Fornak nodded and said cheerfully, I know. Although I don't like Bernard very much. I don't dislike his beautiful red-haired daughter. Oh, her name is Darcy Christie. Right. Yes. Serdak replied. Count Fonak nodded and said, I think you'd better find a piece of paper to record it. I will pick out the names of some nobles who still owe me favors and have not repaid them. If you can find them, and if they are willing to return the favor, they will probably gain something. It didn't take long for Soldak to get a list of Count Fornak's friends. It seemed that Count Fornak really made a lot of friends when he was in the city of Valenza. The whole parchment is almost filled with names. Chapter 1260 Visiting Atherton Count Fornek sat on the sofa in the room and listened to Soldek say, I encountered something a few days ago. In the abandoned mining area of Ritz City, the guard camp received a missing person case. The knights of the guard camp sent to investigate at the time did not find anything. Later, I asked Avro D went to investigate and met him in the mine. Of course, we found out later that this necromancer was not the mastermind of this incident. But this necromancer was a very strong person. Count Fornek asked curiously, Oh, I want to know how strong she is, Serdek said while sorting out the list. Her body is constantly turning into corpses, but she is still living strong. Hearing Soldek say this, Count Fonak was a little surprised, because he knew how painful it was to become a corpse. Not only would the body suffer endless pain, but as the body continued to become stiff and cold, psychological problems would arise. The despair and distortion are the most deadly, and it is easy for people to get lost. Count Fonak sighed. A necromancer who is constantly turning into corpses? This is really rare. Having said that, becoming a necromancer itself involves some forbidden spells. So what? Serdek raised his head and smiled, threw one into his mouth, and then said, I think maybe you can exchange some experiences in this area with her. Fornak put his hands on the sofa, raised his head, and said casually to Soldek, I'm not as free as you think, but facing those skeletons all day long is indeed boring enough. Next time when you see her again, you can call me out, and we can sit down and chat together. Maybe what I know will inspire her, even a little bit. Seeing that Count Fornak did not rule out meeting strangers, he said, Okay, that's a deal, but I don't know when I can see her again. Soldak compiled the list left by Count Fornak, and before dawn, Count Fornak once again opened the bloody door to the underworld. The two of them saw countless skeletal hands protruding from the bloody door at the same time. Count Fornak turned around and waved to Soldak before walking in with ease. His body penetrated it like water, and then disappeared. Gone. The blood-stained bloody door was closed again, leaving no trace on the walls of the hotel. The list was placed on the table. Soldak saw the name at the top of the first row on the list. Then he took out a quill pen and drew a horizontal line under the first name. Mike Atherton. Soldak remembered that there seemed to be a noble named Atherton in the Helensa guard camp. But he did not expect that this noble had some relationship with Count Fonak. Atherton Manor. Mike Atherton is old. He was so old that he even had to sit in a wheelchair. He was pushed out of the room by the maid every day and basked in the sun under an olive tree in the back garden. 
This huge olive tree carries almost all of his childhood memories. Now that he is old, he has almost forgotten many things. Only those things from his childhood can still be recalled. Under the sun, on the green grass full of flowers, a boy was running happily. His squinted, cloudy eyes became a little blurry at this moment. He prayed that he could be summoned by the Statue of Liberty as soon as possible and return to the embrace of God. Instead of having to endure the torture of this disease every day, he was somewhat fed up with this. Life. The maid fed Mike Atherton some water regularly and asked him in a low voice if he planned to retreat to the shade of the tree. Earl Michael Atherton shook his head feebly, and the two maids could only step back helplessly and hide themselves under the shade of a tree. A well-dressed old butler walked out of the manor. He slowly walked to Earl Mike Atherton and reported to him against his ear. Sir, there is a guest outside who wants to visit you. Mike Atherton looked at the butler blankly. He had not seen a guest for at least two years. The old butler knew the inquiry in his eyes and quickly replied. He has a token of Count Fornak's lifetime. It seemed that the three words phonic made old Mike sober up. And he actually nodded. Although he was speechless, Mike Atherton was very conscious at this time. He even remembered some of the time he and Earl Fornak traveled to the imperial capital. They even communicated with other provinces in the imperial capital. The young nobles had a fight and later offended some royal families that they could not afford to offend. If Count Fornak hadn't met the nobleman at that time, and everyone got help from that nobleman, maybe everyone would have died there. He felt a little dizzy in his mind. Every time he thought about the past, the sleepiness in his mind came out in waves like a raging tide. He wanted to shake his head to clear his head, but unfortunately he couldn't. The housekeeper withdrew and took Soldak into the back garden after a while. Serdak felt that the nobles living in the city seemed to like to decorate their manors very luxuriously. The same was true for this Atherton Manor. The manor was very lively. When walking through the hall, Serdak even saw a group of young people gathered around an organ, listening to a beautiful girl playing the organ. The female relatives in the manor looked at Soldak curiously. They had not received any notice that guests were coming to their home today. At this moment, everyone was very curious when they saw the housekeeper leading a burly knight into the back garden. Some people even followed secretly from behind. When Soldak came to the back garden, it seemed much quieter. There were almost no people in the back garden. Then he saw an old man sitting in a wheelchair under an olive tree in the garden. It looked like it seemed that even taking a breath is very laborious. He must be the kind of person who has half his foot in the coffin. Serdak was seen crossing the lawn and approaching the old man. The old man waved his hand weakly to Serdak. Soldak walked over, sat on the chair next to him, and then asked, Are you Earl Mike Atherton? The old man nodded, his lips trembling. But he couldn't speak. Serdak did not expect that the old man would be like this. Although he was a little helpless, he could only accept the fact. He briefly checked the old man's condition. Basically, the functions of all parts of the body were degraded. So even if he used the Holy Spirit light magic can only temporarily alleviate his condition. Serdak stretched out his hand and pressed a ray of holy light into the old man's forehead. Earl Mike Atherton immediately felt the power filling his body, and his rusty limbs began to have some awareness and response. The butler also stared at Soldak with a surprised look on his face, and then looked at Mike Atherton as trying to raise his arm. Master, you can actually move your hands! The butler shouted in surprise. Mike Atherton also noticed changes in himself, and he felt that his mind became very clear at this moment. Young man, who are you and where do you come from? Mike Atherton asked in a hoarse voice. He hadn't spoken for a long time, so his voice was a little dry when he spoke. At this time, the maid quickly brought the water glass, gave Mike Atherton a sip and said. Serdak replied, I am Serdak, the consul of Ruth City. I came to visit you this time, and I also brought you this. As he spoke, he took out a magic dagger and laid with three red, green and blue gems from his magic belt. The magic dagger was very old, and even some of the inlaid gold patterns had peeled off and the three gems it also seemed dim. When Count Fornak handed the dagger to him, Soldak was thinking for a while. How did a ghost bring this dagger with him? The old man didn't even hold it in his hand to identify it carefully, but asked excitedly, When did you see Fornak? A long time ago. I helped Count Fornak with some small favors, so he gave me this dagger. He also said that if I encounter trouble in Helensa City in the future, I will take this dagger to Atherton. The family pays a visit to Earl Michael Atherton. Soldak said. It seemed that the holy light gave Earl Mike Atherton a second spring. And he could even move his hands at this time. What trouble did you encounter? Do you need my help? Mike Atherton asked Soldak. 
Soldak immediately said. My friend Darcy Christie encountered some problems in the city of Valenza. She needs the support of some local nobles. So I took the liberty of asking you. Mike Atherton's eyes fell on the badge on Soldak's chest. And he asked doubtfully, Darcy Christie? What is her relationship with Marquis Bernard? Soldak replied, She is the daughter of Marquis Bernard, inherited the title of Bernard Christie, and is currently the consul of Alenza City. Mike Atherton frowned again. He also knew nothing about the current situation in Alenza and didn't understand how the Christie family ended up in this situation. Go and call David. I need to understand the situation in Alenza City. Mike Atherton ordered the butler. Yes, sir. The butler responded, immediately sending an attendant out behind him. At this time, Mike Atherton said with some emotion, I am getting older, and I rarely hear news from the outside recently, and I know nothing about the things outside. So can you tell me what happened in Helensa City recently? What happened? In fact, Serdak didn't know much about the recent situation in Helensa City, so he could only casually say some things he knew clearly. When Mike Atherton heard that there was something wrong with the transition between the old and new members of the Christie family, he couldn't help but sigh and said, I need to understand the current situation in Helensa City before I can reply to you. Okay, then I'll take my leave first. Soldak heard that old Mike Atherton could not give a reply in person, so he could only say goodbye. Chapter 1261 Persuasion In the hall of Christie's castle, Darcy was sitting in a wheelchair, her eyes falling on the leather sofa in the hall. Lady Mariana stood behind the wheelchair and looked at Darcy's thin face. Lady Mariana's heart was full of regrets. She had misunderstood Ryan Christie's lies these days and thought Darcy was receiving treatment in the castle. But she didn't. Unexpectedly, he would be placed under house arrest in a tower. On the leather sofa. In addition to Viscount Emmett and Baron Carl Casement, who are the new commanders of the Hellanza Guard Battalion, there are also a group of generals of the Knights under Darcy, which Bernard handed over before his death. The army given to Darcy can be regarded as the most elite bodyguard group of the Christie family. It was previously ordered by Darcy to go to the family plane to quell the rebellion. Now the main knights are still contained in the family plane. Sitting in front of Darcy Christie were the five captains of this knight corps. They were wearing uniform standard magic pattern structures and were sitting on the sofa without saying a word. Darcy, as long as I take the cavalry regiment back to Alinsa, it will only take a week for us to reshuffle the city of Alinsa. Viscount Cullum, the leader of the 1st Cavalry Regiment, looked murderous said. Darcy shook her head and asked Viscount Cullum. Uncle Cullum, has the rebellion in the Oman Plain been completely suppressed? Well, not yet. Viscount Cullum touched his big nose and replied awkwardly. If it weren't for the rebels restraining the cavalry regiment, their five regiment leaders would not be the only ones returning to Holanza City this time. Darcy's voice was still a little weak when she spoke, but the question she raised was very sharp. Then you must know what it means for the Night Legion to withdraw from the Oman Plain? Viscount Cullum looked at the four regiment commanders next to him and said bravely, The front facing the rebels will collapse, causing the Plains counter-rebellion army to collapse. Darcy nodded slightly and said seriously to Viscount Cullum, Amon is not the plain of Christie's family. Since we have formed an alliance with other families, we must shoulder my responsibilities. Otherwise, why should we occupy that place? Territory. So I do not agree to withdraw troops from the Oman plain. Viscount Cullum said with some reluctance, but the situation in Helensa is already in dire straits. I'll take care of it. Trust me. Darcy Christie waved her hand and said firmly to Viscount Colum. Lady Mariana and Carl looked at each other, and they saw the persistence in Darcy's eyes. The high-spirited Miss Darcy seemed to be back. Aphrodite, who was standing in the shadow of the window sill on the second floor of the hall, also snorted softly. She didn't understand what Cernak liked about this red-haired woman. She had an ordinary appearance and an ordinary figure. Could it be because of her red hair? After two days of contact with Darcy Christie, Aphrodite finally figured out what was wrong with Helensa City. In fact, after Darcy became the consul, she carried out land reform on the vacant territory of Aranza City. She preferred to incorporate this part of the territory into the public territory of Aranza City and then use it as the public territory of Aranza City. In the name of the city, it can be leased to civilians which can improve the living standards of civilians in Helensa City. However, as soon as the order was promulgated, it encountered strong resistance from the nobles, and the re-enclosure of the land did not go smoothly. The nobles acted secretly. Because of territorial disputes, many nobles blatantly questioned Darcy, 
and the members of the House of Representatives were almost all nobles from the city of Valenza. Darcy's law offended almost all the members, so much so that none of her subsequent proposals in the House of Representatives could pass. Although Darcy is the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the power here is completely evaded by the members. These setbacks once made Darcy think that she was not capable of serving as the governor of Valencia City. She felt that no matter how hard she tried, she could not do it well. She also had a stubborn character who was unwilling to cater to others. When dealing with official duties, offended many nobles who were friendly to her. Later, even the elders and younger brothers in the family no longer supported her. Only then did Darcy realize that the problem was with herself. Some things were caused by her own insistence. Unfortunately, when she found out, it was already irreversible. Long-term insomnia and anxiety made Darcy sick. Later, I heard that Baron Armand de Cuny Bulwer married a wife in the city of Pena. He didn't even do the most basic etiquette before the wedding. Not only did he not inform her, but after hearing that he was sick, he even after running to Alenza City to watch the excitement, Darcy finally fell ill and fell ill on the bed. It was at this time that Darcy's two uncles, Ryan Christie and Piero Christie, actually took control of Christie Castle and imprisoned Darcy in the castle. They wanted to take control of the entire Christie during this period. Family. Unfortunately, they had just reached the last step. And before they could fully control the Christie family, the critically ill Darcy Christie came back to life from the hospital bed. On the same day, she was still conscious. A team of guard battalion knights was mobilized to enter the castle to protect her. Safety. So that all their subsequent methods will fail. In addition, the Knights of Christie, who were originally sent to deal with the rebellion on the family plane, finally realized that something was wrong. This army was the direct army of Marquis Bernard. When Marquis Bernard handed this cavalry regiment to Darcy, it was also in order to allow her to fully control the Christie family. The five captains of the cavalry regiment secretly came back from the Oman plane. Just to understand the situation here, the leaders of the cavalry regiment wanted to withdraw their troops from the Oman plain to stabilize the situation in Helanza City. But Darcy refused. Obviously, she pinned part of her hopes on Serdek. It was precisely because of this that Aphrodite let out a cold snort. She has already sent the message to Doden Town. It is estimated that Samira should be on her way back to Helanza. Aphrodite would like to take a look. This half-elf beauty heard that Serdak was in love with his ex. What kind of attitude will a person have if his old love is unforgettable? Thinking of this, Aphrodite's black-purple lips slightly raised in a sexy and alluring arc. In the past few days, Serdak has basically been dealing with official business in Lut City in the morning. In the afternoon, he will go to Alensa City and start visiting these people and Fonak one by one according to the list given to him by Count Fonak, a nobleman with whom Earl Ku has some connections. Although these nobles did not expressly express their support for Darcy Christie, at least, they would not oppose her during this period. Everyone wisely stayed on the sidelines. Many nobles have keenly sensed that something is not normal in the Christie family recently. Ryan Christie and Piero Christie, who had frequently participated in various noble activities recently, suddenly disappeared in the past two days. And they unexpectedly disappeared in the past two days. She began to have frequent secret meetings with Darcy's husband, Baron Armand de Cuny and they would also convene some MPs from Alensa City to hunt together in the manor on the outskirts of the city. It was obviously planning some big event. Regarding the current situation of the Christie family being torn apart, the nobles of Alensa City were even more happy to watch from the sidelines. Therefore, when faced with Serdak's invitation, most nobles did not directly agree, and some simply refused. However, due to his status as a second-level knight, he spoke very tactfully in front of Serdak. Darcy Christie has little ability and is not worth following. Chapter 1262 Aphrodite's Expectations During the recent period, the nobles in Alanza City have seen a big show in the city. After the death of Bernard Marquis of the Christie family, Darcy Christie failed to establish enough prestige in the family. What followed was that the Christie family began to fall apart. The three most powerful branches were Darcy's, an interest group formed by two uncles, Ryan and Piero. In addition, Duan, Darcy's half-brother, does not agree with Darcy's status in the family and has been hiding in a manner outside the city. Serdak frequently visited the nobles in Alanza this time, hoping that they could support Darcy Christie. Only half of the nobles expressed their willingness to support Darcy in front of Serdak. But most people had a negative attitude towards Darcy's new policy. Serdak sat in the magic caravan and pinched the corners of his eyes tiredly. This was really a mess. He had just received a message from the Knights of the Carl sent guard camp. 
asking him to return to Christie Castle as soon as possible, and he knew that there might be a new change in this matter. Hurrying back to the castle, the originally heavily guarded Christie family castle became extremely deserted because Darcy's two uncles had moved out. There were not even a few servants left in the hall. Darcy and Lady Mariana were sitting in the living room, with only a few maids standing behind Lady Mariana. Darcy was sitting on the sofa wearing light leather armor. Her face was sallow. Saldak knew that her condition had only improved slightly. If you want to recover, you need to rest for a while. Miss Hoyle happened to be at the castle too. Serdak walked up to the crowd and asked, What happened to call me back in such a hurry? Ryan and Piero must be crazy. They actually teamed up with outsiders to deceive their own nieces. Mrs. Mariana shed tears as she said this. Lady Mariana obviously never thought that her brothers, whom she trusted so much, would do such a thing. They united two-thirds of the members of the House of Representatives, and they jointly proposed to convene a recall meeting of the Hellanza Archon. Carl added standing aside. Sitting on the sofa, Darcy closed her tired eyes, as if she was exhausted by these things. When will the recall meeting of the House of Representatives be held? Soldek asked Carl. Next Monday morning, Carl replied. That is, the day after tomorrow, Carl nodded, and a strange officer standing next to Carl stood up and said, Miss Darcy, I think we should mobilize the troops from the Oman Plain to return to Holanza at this time. As long as we can control the nobles in the city, they will not dare to openly express those decisions. Serdak turned his head and glanced at the middle-aged officer. His idea was in line with Serdak's temper. Soldak, how have you been contacting the nobles in the city recently? Is there any good news? Carl asked impatiently when he saw Soldak walking in. Serdak took out a piece of parchment from his arms and said to Carl, Here is the list of nobles who are willing to stand on our side. Carl, Mrs. Mariana, Miss Hoyle and others all came together and began to count the nobles on the list. However, the expressions of the three people at the end of the count were still solemn. Mrs. Mariana said, In this way, even if all the nobles choose to wait and see, the nobles are all willing to support us, and less than half of the MPs can stand on our side. Since they openly held a recall meeting, more than two-thirds of the members should be willing to support them. Miss Hoyle also sighed. On the contrary, Darcy, who was sitting on the sofa with a very calm face, chatted to Soldak about what happened to the Christie family in the past few days. Ryan and Piero, Darcy's uncles, had hurriedly moved out of the castle the morning before yesterday. And then, they came together with Armand de Cuny. In the past few days, they have united with most of the noble members of the House of Helensa to prepare for a recall meeting. They decided to remove Darcy from the position of governor of Helensa at this meeting, and then re-elect the governor of Helensa City, the new consul. Serdak did not expect that the other party was also actively preparing, and currently counting the number of members who are willing to support Darcy. It is not even one-third of the total members of the House of Representatives. Unexpectedly, the current situation would be so bad. Serdak had a headache looking at this list. Darcy Christie had gone through so many changes. But she was very open-minded. She smiled at Soldak and said, It's not a big deal. If the Christie family cannot take charge of Valenza, then I will move to the Oman Plain, where one-seventh of the territory belongs to the Christie family. Don't be discouraged. There will always be a way. Soldak sat down opposite Darcy Christie and comforted her. I'm not ready to be a qualified consul. I'm not prepared at all. And he left in a hurry. Darcy covered her face. Her voice was full of sadness. She was like a bird hiding in the bushes wounded deer. Soldak didn't know what to say. He didn't expect that the death of Marquis Bernard would hit Darcy so hard. Darcy Christie covered her eyes with her hands and rested her head on the back of the sofa. Her nose was red and her voice was full of nasal sounds as if she had just cried. He has many thoughts. He told me at that time that it would be very difficult for aristocratic people in power to do something for the common people. Even a little bit. I didn't quite understand it at that time. He has the highest decision-making power in Helensa City. If he wants to do something, how can he not be able to do it? Now I know how difficult some things are. This may be the price of growth, but this price is a little too high for Darcy. Soldak thought in his heart. Dak, are there any other Helanza nobles that you haven't been able to visit? Aphrodite supported the railings on the second floor with both hands and leaned towards the hall on the first floor and asked. Serdak pointed to the red line names on the list, raised the list, shook it towards Aphrodite, and said, They are all here. Almost all those with red lines don't want to see me. Aphrodite pursed her lips with a demonic smile on her face. 
but her face was hidden under the mithril mask, and others could not see her expression at all. Only Serdak could feel that Aphrodite's heart seemed to be about to move, and her body was shaking uncontrollably. It was not that she was nervous at all, but that there was an uncontrollable excitement deep in her heart. Yes, she's excited. Just when Serdak had this idea, he heard Aphrodite smile and say to Serdak, This time it's my turn to meet them. I believe they will be willing to listen to my advice. Chapter 1263 Removal The succubus walked into the night wearing magic robes. Even Serdak didn't know how many people listened to Aphrodite's advice that night. In fact, the charm that Aphrodite is best at is itself an advanced hypnosis. It can make people lose their mind and instantly fall into a hallucination. However, this is only a primary charm. An advanced charm is lurking in deep memories. Can be triggered by certain conditions, such as hearing a certain ringtone or seeing a specific item. The spell of charm will take effect without the user knowing it. The succubus Aphrodite, who successfully advanced to become a second level magician, calls herself a magician. However, Serdak has never noticed where Aphrodite has become stronger and is still lazy every day. Look, had it not been for Aphrodite's initiative to persuade these noble counselors this time, Serdak would not have thought that Aphrodite still had this ability. While Serdak was busy dealing with the recruitment of troops from the Ganbu Plain in Ruth City, the recall meeting of the House of Representatives in Haranza City was also held as scheduled amidst heated discussions. In the Parliament Hall of the House of Representatives, Darcy Christie wore a bronze magic pattern structure and walked slowly to the podium. Although she had a hard time walking, she still insisted on walking up. The Parliament Hall then became quiet. The members who were whispering and discussing now all focused on Darcy. Darcy's two uncles, Ryan Christie and Piero Christie, were sitting on the podium behind Darcy. Darcy's voice was always tough. And she said casually, I heard a few days ago that you were going to remove me. Darcy Christie lowered her head and looked around with a self-deprecating look. She found that wherever she looked, the congressman looked away and looked away with some guilt. Darcy smiled very freely and said, For me, the biggest regret during my tenure was the failure to incorporate the vacant land into the Helensa public domain. She raised her pointed chin and said, You may think that I am just acting willfully. In fact, I have always wanted to raise the living standards of civilians in Helensa to a higher level. You may also think that this has nothing to do with the nobility. In fact, there is a great relationship between the two. Because only when the living standards of the people of Valencia are improved, the living comfort of our nobles will increase rapidly. The nobles have always been the owners of the vast majority of the land. Many nobles would rather have their territories abandoned than lease these lands to the impoverished commoners. In my opinion, this approach will neither enrich your wallet nor increase your reputation. Darcy likes to speak straightforwardly. And this time, she finished speaking in one breath. There is only one thing that needs to be voted on at this meeting and that is to remove me from my administrative position as Archon of Alinsa. In order not to delay everyone's lunch, voting has officially begun. After saying that, Darcy asked the service staff in the audience to push the voting box up, and then she took the lead in putting the prepared letters into the box, and then walked back to the middle of the podium. Her two uncles looked happy and sat in the corner of the podium, looking at Darcy from time to time. Darcy, on the other hand, looked calm and did not even take the initiative to examine the voting members. The MPs moved very quickly. They lined up in front of the podium in the Parliament Hall and put their votes into the box in the order of their actions. Everyone did not communicate with each other. They just threw the votes into the box and quickly returned to themselves. Seat, for fear of getting into any trouble. It is not until the last member puts his vote into the box that the second step of the members' voting is completed. And the next step is to count the votes. For this kind of removal of the city's consul, the number of votes cast by the members must be greater than two-thirds of the total number of members. Then the meeting to remove Darcy can be considered successful. Obviously, Ryan Christie and Piero Christie were full of confidence in the members' vote to remove the consul. They sat on the edge of the rostrum. And from time to time, members of Congress came over to greet their brothers. On the other hand, Darcy was just sitting alone on the speaker's seat, her face so calm that there was almost no emotion at all. The two clerks responsible for counting the votes, under the supervision of four supervisors, took out all the envelopes from the ballot box and cut them open one by one with a peeling knife. The contents inside the envelopes were quite simple, and only two words were allowed to be written, agree or disagree. Agree means that the voting nobles agree to remove Darcy Christie from her position as consul. Oppose is just the opposite. 
It is to oppose Darcy Christie's resignation as consul. As the first envelope was opened, the words agree were clearly written inside. When the clerk blocked everyone from reading the word, the congressman at the scene became excited. After opening ten envelopes in a row, only one objected. These data were clearly recorded on a blackboard by a clerk. At this time, discussions began to occur in the conference hall. As the second batch of ten envelopes were opened, the clerk standing next to the blackboard was slightly stunned. He stood in front of the blackboard and turned around, getting close to the envelopes and opening the contents. His face was full of incomprehension. However, this clerk can be regarded as an upright person. He just checked whether the ballots were authentic. Then he found no problems and wrote the data on the blackboard. After tearing open ten pieces of letterheads, he found that they all contained objections. At first, the congressman present did not think it was a big deal. When the clerks counted the votes, it was one-sided, and almost half of the congressmen chose to oppose the removal of Darcy. Almost all the members in the Parliament Hall stood up. They looked at the blackboard in front of the podium in disbelief and whispered in their mouths. Ryan Christie immediately answered, What's going on? Didn't we agree that we would push Darcy Christie off the stage together? When did you change your mind? I didn't. Didn't those opposing votes come from you? A group of congressmen stood in the corner, and everyone was even a little panicked. Even Darcy, who was sitting in the speaker's seat, looked confused at this time. She didn't understand how her supporters could become so numerous. Seeing that the number of votes against the removal was increasing, Darcy thought of Serta, Graham and Aphrodite's efforts during this time. You don't need to think about it to know that this matter must have something to do with them. Darcy was sitting on the speaker's chair, looking coldly at the stunned members. After the clerk took out all the envelopes, Darcy Christie slowly stood up from her seat. At this time, the conference hall was as noisy as a vegetable market. Chapter 1264 Welfare When Darcy Christie walked out of the hall of the House of Representatives, she was still a little confused. The removal of Parliament seemed to have ended in a farce. She looked up at the grey sky, feeling no joy at all. The other MPs were still arguing behind her. The noise seemed to burst the roof of the Parliament Hall. Everyone was speculating that the other party was secretly supporting Darcy. So there were not many MPs who voted for the recall. The congressmen are all doing their job. But the other party is playing tricks on them. Obviously they are secretly supporting Darcy Christie. But it makes it seem like she has always been isolated and helpless. This seems to be able to find those who are really on the opposite side of Darcy Christie. This method is really cruel. When these congressmen boarded the carriage, sat on the sofa of the carriage, closed their eyes and thought quietly, everyone felt that there was a fear of being dominated lingering in their hearts. And they really began to feel the fear. There should have just been a vote against recall in Parliament. The key point is that only a few people voted in favor. As long as the elimination method is used to identify those supporters, Darcy can find out who voted against it in private. Archon Darcy is still very controlling in Alanza City after all. How will she deal with us opponents? The members of the House of Representatives in Alensa City began to be afraid. But now that the matter has been done, the first thing that everyone thought of was the three initiators of this matter, Ryan, Piero and Acuni. These three people were the closest people to Darcy. Her two biological uncles and husband actually conspired to push Darcy down from her position as consul. I believe you as a ghost. The congressman sitting in the carriage burst into foul language. However, the congressman knew in their hearts that at least the relationship between Baron de Cuny and Darcy, as husband and wife should now exist in name only. So the congressman wanted to go to the manor where Baron de Cuny lived to find out what was going on. The deputies rushed to the manor outside the city in a magic caravan. And there was even a traffic jam at the gate of the city. When everyone hurried to Baron de Cuny's western suburbs manor, they found many magic caravans parked at the entrance of the manor. Each of these congressmen had some doubts in their hearts. But they could not tell others at this time. In short it is. Someone asked other members, What did you vote for just now? The congressman opposite smacked his chest loudly and said loudly and firmly, Of course it is a yes vote. I support the removal of Consul Darcy. Can he vote for anything else? I'm afraid the people next to me won't hear. The MPs who were in the audience were smiling on the surface, showing expressions of appreciation and relief. But he was scolding in his heart. I believe you are a ghost. The deputies walked into the western suburbs manor. The yard is a bit desolate. The vegetation in the yard has not been pruned for a long time. Now, if it is roughly pruned, it can no longer create a beautiful shape. Even the low shrub walls are in sections. And occasionally there will be a dead branch and leaf. In the hall on the first floor of the manor, 
Ten guards from the Dunstan family at the door looked at the counselors in the room with vigilance. As long as Baron de Cuny pointed at a member of the parliament. They would swarm in and arrest them all and torture them. Baron Dacony and his second wife, Miss Dunstan, were sitting in the chairs at the front. They looked coldly at the gathering of more and more Helensa members in the hall. Baron Dacuny suddenly stood up and walked away. He went up to a high platform in the hall and shouted to the congressman in the room. I'm very sad. You hypocritical guys. I don't know how many Darcy supporters are hidden among you. And I don't know what your purpose is for coming back at this time. Do you just come here at this time to watch my show? Of? Think about what you promised me before. And what kind of promise I gave you. But how did you do it? How did you do it? How many of you have broken your promise to us? After Baron de Cuny heard the news that Darcy had not been dismissed, his spirit collapsed. He seemed to have forgotten that in front of him were a group of noble counselors from Alinsa City. No matter how low their status was, their titles were all viscount or above. But he is only a baron. Although he is attached to the big tree of the Dunstan family, there is no reason to blame these MPs. Ryan Christie and Piero Christie also hurried to the western suburbs manor. As soon as they entered the hall, they heard the roar of Baron de Cuny inside. Ryan Christie sat in the living room without saying a word. On the sofa, several members of Congress hurriedly came over. One of them, a middle-aged nobleman wearing a white robe with almost no hair on his head, sat next to Orion and said to him confidently, Ryan, we have been old friends for so many years. You should understand my character. I swear this matter has nothing to do with me. I have even been praying that one of you or Piero can become the ruler of Valenza. Official. Ryan kept silent. Obviously, because of the voting data, he determined that among the congressmen currently gathered in the manor in the western suburbs, there were also many spies of Darcy Christie. All of this was a trap set by Darcy. The real purpose is to expose the opponents hidden in the depths as soon as possible. I have to say that Darcy Christie won beautifully this time. How do you want me to believe you? You or you all voted in favor. But who voted against it? Could it be that the two clerks were cheating? Ryan Christie's voice was not loud, but his tone seemed extremely irritable. Only then did his brother Piero Christie ask Darcy's husband, Baron de Cuny. De Cuny? What did you say? De Cuny pulled his messy hair with his hands and pulled off his tie with a look of dejection. He had even prepared his dress in the morning. After he planned to successfully remove the parliament, he would stand at the gate of the House of Representatives to admire Darcy. Christie looks defeated and decadent. It's a pity that not only did he not wait for the scene to appear, but the problem he is currently facing is also quite serious. What he has to face is Darcy Christie's next revenge. Baron de Cuny could only spread his hands and said helplessly, What do I have in mind? If so, then I'd better go back to Benna City and live there for a while. Yes, Baron de Cuny has begun to think about quitting. At this time, a woman's voice came from the stairs. Didn't you say that you want to run for the consulship of Alensa City? I have already written a letter to my brother, telling him that he must support you. At this time, you can already want to back down? So what if we don't leave? Do you think she will let us stay comfortably in Helensa? Baron de Cuny turned to the middle-aged woman and asked. The middle-aged woman was 11 years older than Baron de Cuny. Although her face had exquisite makeup, it was still difficult to hide the wrinkles and traces of time on her face. The surname de Cuny was the surname of her previous husband. But his husband died in the Plain War. In order to preserve her part of the de Cuny family's property, she went through a lot of trouble and married a man. Only by hiring a young baron and letting the baron inherit the surname de Cuny can he successfully retain this wealth. This time she and her husband, Baron Adman de Cuny, came to Helenza City for vacation. Only when they arrived in Helenza City did they find out that her husband had a wife before that. And this wife had a good background and was a seafarer. The heir to the Christie family. The leader of Lanza City. And also the governor here. When they heard that Darcy was terminally ill, the couple planned to take over the city of Valenza. Unfortunately, before they could take care of all aspects, Darcy Christie actually came back to life. Baron de Cuny avoided the MPs in the hall and came to Mrs. Dunstan. He put his arm around her slender waist, pinched his big nose and said, You don't know Darcy. She doesn't have a good temper. And it's hard to listen to other people's opinions. When things calm down in Helensa City, she will take revenge on us as long as she has free hands. Ryan and Piero have gone too far. They are also Darcy's uncles. How can she still send them to the gallows? But I am different. Now she probably wants me to die early. Just like me, that's what she prays for. So why do we continue to stay here? After hearing what Baron de Cuny said, 
Mrs. Dunstan was also a little hesitant. The MPs in the hall are like headless flies. Surrounding Earl Ryan. Hoping that he can come up with a solution. Darcy returned to the Christie family castle in the magic caravan. After getting off the carriage, she got back into the wheelchair. Aphrodite was lying on the grape trellis on the second floor terrace taking a nap. The maid pushed Darcy over. And Aphrodite opened her eyes and turned over lazily. How did you do it? Darcy was full of curiosity. Aphrodite yawned. She wore a mithril mask on her head. So the expression on her face could not be seen. What? Aphrodite asked. Darcy Christie said. Convince those congressmen. Aphrodite immediately waved her hands and said. I can't convince so many congressmen at once. With a smile hidden under the mask. Aphrodite continued. I just gave them a little psychological hint. When they sign the voting form. As long as they think agree. Then they will definitely write it. Objection. And no matter how they look at it. They can't find out what they wrote wrong. Unless someone else can review it for them. So you asked those congressmen who opposed me to vote in support of me? Darcy asked Aphrodite. That's pretty much it. It's a kind of hypnosis. This kind of hypnotic effect can only last for two days. Next time they want to vote you out. I won't be able to do anything about it. So you have to take advantage of these few days to master the sea as soon as possible. Lanza City. Aphrodite sat up and said to Darcy. I know. No matter what happens in the future. I still want to thank you now. Darcy showed a hint of disappointment on her face. Aphrodite changed her position to make herself more comfortable and continued to ask Darcy. Have you ever thought about how to manage Alinsa in the future? Darcy spread her hands and said helplessly. My father has been asking me this question for almost 20 years. So you already have the answer? Aphrodite continued to ask. Darcy shook her head and said, You have also seen that the nobles of Alinsa collectively oppose my answer. And the common people did not buy it either. Aphrodite stood up and pushed Darcy to the railing of the terrace where she could just see the entire back garden. And then she asked, Okay, let's not talk about this. I mean, how do you want to clean up the current mess? Darcy asked Aphrodite. What would you do if you were me? Aphrodite replied very casually. Then kill a few until everyone surrenders. Darcy looked surprised and said to Aphrodite, But they have nothing wrong. Murdering nobles is against the laws of the empire. The best that nobles can do is to resolve disputes with duels. But that's up to them. Just be willing to take on the challenge. Aphrodite glanced at Darcy. And then said, I heard Dax said that you were in charge of the intelligence agency of Valenza before. How difficult is it to catch their little tail? Darcy narrowed her slender eyes and looked at Aphrodite. Aphrodite walked out from the gauze curtain. Serdak was dealing with the backlog of official business at his desk. He raised his head and glanced at Aphrodite. And then asked, What was the final result of the recall meeting held today? by the House of Representatives in Alinsa City. She sat opposite Soldak and helped him organize a pile of documents neatly, and then said lazily, Okay. Miss Darcy was not dismissed on the spot. But this kind of thing we can't hide it for a few days. We have to resolve this matter completely. I'll talk to Darcy when I have time. I think she's recovering well. With that said, Soldak picked up the quill again and began to review the documents. By the way, Tomorrow, I am going to go to the Ganbu Plain to issue recruitment orders. Do you want to go to Makuso City with me? Serdak asked. Aphrodite shook her head and thought for a while before saying, I'd better help you keep an eye on what's going on in Hail Ansa. Don't worry. You can deal with the affairs of the Ganbu Plain. In a few days, we will take Hail Ansa down. Saw's trouble is completely resolved. Oh, tell me what good idea you have. Serdak asked curiously. Darcy is preparing to plan a big benefit for those nobles. Aphrodite took off her mithril mask. She lay on the sofa and said with a smile to Serdak. Serdak was reading the documents with his head lowered. And he didn't even see the fierceness in Aphrodite's smile. What a great benefit! I'm really curious about what Darcy has prepared for the nobles. Serdak lowered his head and said. Chapter 1265 Calm Down Samira arrived in Halanza City in mid-July. From Doden Town in the Belan Plain to Wilk City and then through the portal into Benes City. Take the magic airship from Benes City to Alinsa. Normally, the journey takes about 20 days, but Salsa it actually took Mira only 11 days to reach Haranza. This includes the special passes issued by the military department, as well as the strength of the second-level powerhouses themselves. It only took two days and two nights for Samira and Gary Decker to ride their magic-patterned military horses from Doden Town to Wilkes. Then, they entered Benes City directly through the portal and then took the fastest train. 
a group of magic airships arrived at Halanza City. After Samira found Aphrodite with Carrie Decker, who came to Alenza for the first time, the three of them lived in the Christie family castle together. In fact, not only Darcy Christie, but also Soldak was a little confused as to why these three subordinates were so positive about Darcy. Serdak was busy processing the recruitment orders issued by the military. He needed to meet with the lords of the towns in the Ganbu Plain in Makuso City every day. Sometimes he even had to meet with seven or eight ways a day. He was extremely busy every day. Didn't care about Darcy's affairs at all. I thought that my three subordinates and Darcy would not get along well with each other. Because these four women are all considered to be mavericks. But what Serdak never expected was that they got along so well. Very good. The day after Samira and Gary Decker arrived in Halinsa City, Darcy Christie gave a large gift package to the Joyce family, a wealthy and aristocratic family in Halinsa. 300 guard battalions. The knights surrounded the manor outside the city of Joyce's family at night. Samira, Carrie Decker, and Aphrodite sneaked into the manor at night and took away the two black men who had been secretly funded and trained by the Joyce family. The magician caught it and hung it on the cross at the door of the manor. The two black magicians were exposed to the sun for a whole day before they were accepted by Captain Lance, the law enforcement team of the Helensa Magic Union. Then the Joyce family was surrounded by guard battalions. After the Battle of Terrapagan last year, the Bena Province military headquarters discovered that Lord MacDonald had rebelled against the Bena Province and openly declared the independence of the Gampo Plain. The Black Magic Monastery took the opportunity to open the connection channel and let in hundreds of thousands of low-level the demon army is trying to completely occupy the Ganbu Plain. It was under such circumstances that the military issued a decree to arrest black magicians. Within the territory of Bena province, all black magicians were heretics. This time, two black magicians were found in the Joyce family. Therefore, the military will be directly involved in this matter to investigate how deeply the Joyce family is involved with the black magic monastery. At the same time, Joe Earl Ace's status as a Helensa counselor was revoked on the same day. At this time, Darcy, the consul of Helensa, should have come forward to deal with the military, or simply made a guarantee to restore Earl Joyce's freedom. Then Earl Joyce could smooth the relationship in private and pay a fine to settle the matter. Thing. However, this Count Joyce once pointed out in public in the Parliament Hall of the House of Representatives that Darcy Christie did not understand government affairs at all. He was also one of the main initiators of the proposal to remove Darcy from the position of consul. So Darcy did not come forward. The next morning, Count Joyce was taken to the magic airship flying to Bena City. It is said that if convicted, Count Joyce will face three to five years in prison. It is said that the prison in the military department located in a demi-plane in a space-time gap. For all prisoners, entering there is the beginning of a nightmare. This was the first big gift package that Darcy and Aphrodite gave to the nobles of Alenza. Suddenly, the nobles in the entire city of Helensa chose to collectively silence themselves overnight. Then Darcy gradually gathered the power of the Christie family into her own hands. Although the two uncles, Ryan and Piero, were hiding in the manor outside the city, it only took Darcy half a day to find them out, and even took back all the power in their hands without any effort. As for Baron Armand de Cuny, he was so frightened that he took his second wife and ran back to Bena City in despair. He was afraid that if he ran half a step slower, he would be intercepted by Darcy and lose his last bit of face. At the end of July, Darcy replaced a series of important positions such as the finance officer of the city hall, the logistics director, and the commander of the city defense and security brigade with a group of trustworthy subordinates, so that the situation in Helensa City could be completely stabilized. During this time, younger members of the Atherton family, the Goss family, served in the town hall. After Serdak completed the military recruitment task, he gathered 5,000 heavy armored infantry soldiers and sent them in 10 batches on magic airships to the military headquarters in Bena City. He turned around and paid attention to Alinsa City. At that time, Darcy once again regained control of the city of Alinsa. Samira and Gary Decker also returned to the Bailin Plain at the end of July. The succubus Aphrodite returned to Pussy Mountain on the other side of the wasteland. Samira and Gary Decker did not stay in Bena City, but entered Wilk City directly through the portal. The two retrieved two magic pattern military horses from the stables of Wilk City, and then left Wilk City and headed north along the river. In the summer of the White Forest Plain, the rivers have abundant water, the grass grows almost to waist height, and a large number of horses can be seen in the distance. On the way, while chatting with Samira, Gary Decker asked her, 
I don't understand. You and Aphrodite don't have any good impressions of the woman named Darcy at all. But why do you still try your best to help her? Salmira held the reins with one hand, turned to Gary Decker and asked, If we don't help her, do you think someone will step forward to help her? When passing by the river, you can always hear the sound of frogs jumping into the water. It's just that the water and grass along the river are dense. And I don't know how many are hiding in it. Of course, the captain will definitely come out to help. Isn't it the captain who called us to here? Gary Decker replied without thinking. This is our reason. Samira paused, smiled and winked at Gary Decker. You guys want to share more of the burden for the captain? Gary Decker asked curiously. Unexpectedly, Samira said. That's not the case. Aphrodite and I just hope that the captain can come here as little as possible. We don't want the two of them to meet often because of this matter. And then the old relationship will rekindle. After saying that, Samira whipped the magic pattern army horse hard on the buttocks. And the army horse immediately ran out like an arrow from the string. Hearing what Samira said, Gary Decker was so surprised that he was almost speechless. No wonder Samira traveled day and night to get back to Helensa. It turned out to be because of this. Gary Decker was riding on a magic marked warhorse and shouted loudly. She raised her whip and chased Samira, who was running in front. Chapter 1266 Garden Feeling the cool wind in the night, Soldek picked up the water glass and took a sip. His eyes fell on Makuso City's annual report again. Who would have thought that Makusuo City did not have any tax revenue this year? It only relied on auctioning the restored buildings in the city and renting out shopping mall shops. These two incomes alone actually gave the Makusuo Finance Department a surplus. Especially the three commercial streets in Makusuo City are now being speculated to the point where every inch of land is worth a lot of money. This statement means that Serdak no longer needs to pay out of his own pocket to subsidize Makusuo City's difficult financial situation. Sia was sitting on the sofa opposite holding her chin in her hands, looking at the street lights on both sides of the central square. She pursed her lips slightly. After a busy day, she could not be seen to be tired at all. Serdak's reflection could be clearly reflected in her eyes, as bright as stars. There were many caravans lined up around the square, and the carriages of these caravans were almost full of supplies. The portal would not allow these caravans to pass until after early morning. Each truck was covered with a tarpaulin, and it was impossible to tell what was inside. The coachmen were either washing their horses or sleeping on the roof of the freight cars. There are also some people squatting under the street lamp. There are square grids drawn on the stone floor and some stones placed on it. It seems that they are playing chess, leading the central square. You can also see that the alleys next to the central square are full of newly opened hotels. The restaurant plaza in Ritz City has been popular in the city for nearly a month. The third phase of the project has just begun to lay the foundation. Businessmen who run restaurants go to Charlie almost every day, hoping that Charlie can complete the third phase of the project as soon as possible. Soldak put down the report in his hand. He was in a very good mood now. During the previous period, what he was most worried about was that the reconstruction of Makuso City would be a huge hole that would never be filled. With Serdak's economic situation, it would be difficult to maintain it. But now it seems that after just a short period of time, it will be a huge hole. The Ganbu Plain, which has a one-year tax holiday, has basically realized its own profits and losses. And it is very likely that there will be some surplus. He raised his head and happened to see a caravan passing by the magic caravan, with a group of slaves sitting in the last carriage. Although the slave trade is prohibited in Ritz City, it is still legal for nobles to own slaves, which has spawned many purchasing agents. Soldek knocked his head and said with a smile to Sia, I heard that you bought a group of Naga slaves in Bina City a few days ago? Sia withdrew her gaze, looked at Soldak and asked in surprise. You know all this? Serdak smiled slightly. Beatrice told him this last night. Occasionally, after doing some exercise, they would lie down and talk about trivial matters in life. Of course, Serdak said. Then have you ever thought about how to resettle these Naga slaves? As expected, Thea had already thought of the next plan and said casually. I will send them directly to Bella Norma Lake on the Sai Roman Plateau and let them stay there for a while. Serdak didn't expect that Sia actually kept her word. She had said that she would send the redeemed Nagas to live in Lake Bellanorma. Soldak said to her again, I think it's better to think carefully. It's okay in summer. But in winter, the lake over there will freeze. Sia rolled her eyes and muttered to Soldak. Didn't I come here the same way when I was at the Doden River in the cold winter? Serdak thought to himself, You were living downstairs in the wooden house at that time. And Zigna and Nika also added a heating device under your bathtub. 
so it was not cold at all. But he didn't say that. Instead, he changed the topic and asked Sia. Okay, then when do you plan to give them their freedom? Sia said matter-of-factly. Of course they have to wait until they make enough money to redeem themselves. And of course, they have to earn a traveling fee for themselves. You know, taking a magic airship to Chien City is very expensive. Yes, as long as they can save enough money. I will comply with their wishes and let them leave. When the carriage passed through the shopping street, it saw that there were some mobile taverns in the square at the intersection. Most of these taverns have several wooden carts with large wine barrels stacked in a Z-shaped shape tied to the cart. The stall owner only needs to find an empty place to stop the cart and pull out a few wooden boards to enclose a small activity area. Even a simple mobile tavern. Most mobile taverns only appear at night. And they mostly sell ale and low-alcohol free wine at very cheap prices. Next to these mobile pubs, there are often fish, chips, barbecue stalls, etc. Many people gathered on the street. A group of young civilians sang and danced in the square. The sound of music could be heard far away. Some girls were invited to dance in turn. And the atmosphere was extremely hot. Seeing this made Sia want to jump off the carriage and join the dancing crowd. Returning to Liyai Castle from Makuso City, he saw the butler and a group of servants waiting on the steps. Soldak stepped out of the carriage and asked the butler, Have you received an invitation recently that you can't refuse? The butler replied, I received an invitation letter from Count Kurt Lanier this morning, saying that he wants to invite you to their manor outside the city for a weekend vacation. Oh! Serdak stopped in surprise and asked in surprise. Did it say anything else? The butler quickly replied, We also invited two ladies. Soldak nodded and walked into the castle hall. Hathaway and Beatrice also happened to come down from upstairs at this time. Soldak took the invitation from the butler, and the two maids helped him take off the magic pattern leather armor and hang it on the wooden shelf in the living room. Hathaway took the linen shirt from the maid and helped Soldak change it herself. Treasurer Kurt invited me to the dance this weekend. Do you want to go with me? Soldak asked Hathaway in a low voice. Is it appropriate for us to go? Hathaway asked Soldak with a smile. Is there anything appropriate or inappropriate? Soldak said, turning to the housekeeper and saying, Then agree to him. After all, he is the financial officer of Ritz City. If I reject this invitation, I guess no one will be willing to invite me in the future. Congressman McMillan and Baron Martino have been here for a long time and have been waiting for you in the study. The butler continued. Soldak nodded. He knew this. He came back so early just because he wanted to have a good talk with Baron Martino. Baron Martino has completed the preliminary exploration work on the road from Ritz City to Hammond Town and is now officially preparing for it. There are preliminary ideas for raising funds for this road. Funds will be raised from various businesses in Reuter City. And Reuter City Hall will use commercial building land on both sides of the road as compensation. This news had been revealed a few days ago. And I didn't expect that there were so many people responding. Now, many businessmen in Ritz City and Makuso City send people to wait at the door of Ritz City City Hall every day. And almost all of them want to participate. No one knows better than these merchants what changes will be brought to Ritz City after this road is connected. That is equivalent to closely connecting Constantinople, Collin City and Reuter City. And the two small towns in the abandoned mining area of Hammond and Reuter City will also be renovated due to this road. Benefit. Serdak changed into casual clothes and walked quickly to the study without even having time to take a shower. Senator McMillan and Baron Martineau, who were sitting on the sofa drinking tea, saw Soldak walk in and quickly stood up to greet him. Soldak sat on the sofa opposite them, picked up a planning document about the road, and told Congressman McMillan, This is a road construction plan. I need you to propose it at the Monday regular meeting of the House of Representatives. Come out, and I'll push the lawmakers to vote it through. Councillor McMillan took the plan and said quickly, Okay, I will read it carefully several times when I get back. Then he put down the plan in his hand and assured Soldak, I will contact several other congressmen who have a good relationship with me and let them take the lead in standing up to support me. Soldak knew that McMillan was very familiar with this kind of parliamentary process. So he nodded and said, That's fine, but you don't have to worry too much. This matter will not involve the treasury savings of the finance department. So I think the resistance won't be too great. Now everyone is focused on the success of the restaurant plaza. Although some nobles are not interested in road construction, they will not stand up to obstruct it. After saying that, Soldak turned to look at Baron Martino and said, In the past few days, you have been busy with the restaurant plaza and the resettlement building in the slum area. Recently, 
You have helped me survey the area where this road passes. After so long, I think it's time for me to fulfill my promise to you. I can't even remember what promise you made to me. Baron Martino said with a puzzled look on his face. Soldak sat next to Baron Martino, patted him on the shoulder and said to him, Have you forgotten the promise I made to you when I was in Doden Town? That one day, we will bring those architectural models in your showroom to reality. Baron Martino looked at Soldak with wide eyes, not knowing what to say for a moment. Serdak smiled and said to Baron Martino, Next, I will try my best to build the Ganbu plane and strive to turn it into a leisure plane suitable for tourism. So Makuso City should have a landmark building. I think the hanging garden model in your showroom is very well designed. Chapter 1267 Lack of Money Like Haranza, Root City is also a city built on a mountain. However, relatively speaking, the mountain of Root City is smaller. The city almost surrounds the entire mountain and is not built on the mountainside like Halinsa. This hill limits the size of Lut City, unless it expands to the plain at the foot of the mountain. Lut City can only be so big. The biggest feature of this city is that the city is divided by the originally built city walls. The entire city is divided into five sections by terrace-like city walls. There are city walls between each section. However, there are dozens of city gates between these city walls, so vehicles can flow through Lut City unimpeded. It is divided into five major areas, slum area, workshop area, civilian area, commercial area, and aristocratic area. If you expand Root City, the city will be like a fan shape. The farther you go to the foot of the mountain, the larger the land it occupies, and the less it will be valuable. The nobles almost all live on the top of the mountain. Serdak's castle happens to be on the top of this mountain. The back garden is completely suspended outside the mountain. The entire platform is fixed on the top of the mountain by the huge root system of 16 ancient trees. It can be regarded as the best in Ruth City. A wonder. Of course, Serdak did not want tourists visiting his castle to visit his own swimming pool or bathroom. So what else is worth visiting in this city? Apart from the model ancient city walls, there are actually no monuments to show off here. However, Soldak remembered that in Baron Martino's showroom, there seemed to be a huge corridor suspended on the city wall like a garden. The entire corridor was white. This corridor that spanned the entire city wall was completely made of dozens of meters high. It is composed of Roman columns and forms a round arched sky above the head. Countless vines can be hung from the roof of the building, completely wrapping the huge cloister. This huge arched cloister built on the city wall will give people a strong sense of emptiness. And the city wall of Earth City is built from the foot of the mountain to the top of the mountain. If it is on the top of the mountain, this feeling will be stronger. That's why he proposed such an idea to Baron Martino. He wanted to build an almost miraculous building in Ruth City to attract travelers from the entire Bena province and even the Green Empire. Obviously this wild idea shocked Baron Martino. For no other reason. Are you going to build a hanging garden? Do you know how much it will cost? After Baron Martino heard Soldak's idea clearly, the first thing he said was to talk about money. Yes, this is the reality. Because the amount of this project is really too large. Currently, the quarries around Ruth City cannot dig out stone pillars that meet the conditions. If you want to find these stone pillars, you have to open new quarries in the mountains. Secondly, you must also consider the transportation problem. Even if you have Thunder Rhinoceros, if you want to transport these stone pillars outside the mountain, you must also build a road suitable for Thunder Rhinoceros to walk on. Just these preparations will probably take you more than 10 years. Martino planned to pour cold water on Serdak and let him calm down. He felt that Serdak must have been a little nervous after becoming the great lord of the Ganbu Plain. Serdak shook his head and said, Perhaps we can change our thinking. We can use a bridge structure built with volcanic ash cement and panels to connect the stone pillars and arched cloisters. You probably don't know that in the deserted land, my there is almost nothing in the territory except volcanic ash everywhere. When this road is connected, I only need to organize a huge transport fleet to transport bags of volcanic ash to Ruth City and then pour the city's huge cement stone pillars on the spot. Serdak felt that it was not possible to express his thoughts just by dictating them. So he picked up a pen and drew huge stone pillars erected against the city wall. Just like this, Soldak said to Baron Martineau, The stone pillars painted by Soldak look very much like the cement piers under the high-speed railway in the previous life. They have no aesthetic feeling, but they appear to be extremely ingenious and strong in structure. Do you think that if you build such high round arched domes with Pozzolana cement, they will not collapse in the event of an earthquake? Baron Martino continued to question. 
Serdak drew a huge cement pier on a piece of parchment, and then began to analyze the structure inside, explaining as he drew, You can also weave steel keels inside, and let the cement cover the dense steel frame, so that it can resist earthquakes. The thought almost rendered Martino speechless. Looking at the drawings hand-drawn by Serdak, without Serdak's explanation, the lines on these parchments would be like random scribblings of a child. But now, in the eyes of Baron Martino, these drawings brought him a flood of inspiration. He just listened quietly, and did not even want to say a word to avoid interrupting Serta. Cuz thoughts continued until Serdak finished drawing the last piece of parchment, and the entire study was almost covered with messy parchment. Martino, however, carefully sorted out these drawings, as if he had harvested countless treasures. Dak, I think you are an architect with bold ideas. Baron Martino finally couldn't help but praise. Serdak glanced out the window, and the city of Root was hidden in the beautiful night. I just hope that one day in the future all Bena people will know that there is a beautiful lit city in the Talapagan area of Bena province just like they know Bena city, Serdak said. Baron Martino held a thick roll of drawings and stood on either side of Soldak with Senator Macmillan. The two of them followed Soldak and looked out the window. Baron Martino said, I will recreate a model according to your idea. However, such a huge hanging garden is almost more difficult than building the entire city wall. Although this can save a lot of construction costs. But it's still a huge expense. How are you going to solve this construction cost? Soldak turned around. Glanced at Senator Macmillan. Baron Martineau. And the butler at the door of the study not far away. And asked. What do you think is the most profitable industry in the Green Empire? The middle-aged housekeeper immediately stood up and answered. In my opinion. If you own several mines you should be able to make a lot of money as a mine owner. This may be the most profitable industry at present. Baron Martino thought for a moment before saying, With a frequent occurrence of plain wars, I think the richest people at present are those lords who own large pastures and fine stallions. I think raising military horses should be the most profitable at present. Industry, Senator Macmillan said with a smile, If we have a large number of elite troops, we should be able to gain greater profits by exploring unknown areas of the plain. Soldak nodded and said, Congressman Macmillan is right. The most profitable industry in the Green Empire is war, which is more profitable than any monopoly industry. However, opening up unknown areas has the lowest return rate. We it's the areas that are known to be fertile that need to be opened up. So next I'm going to continue to expand northward in Belan. While Ruth City was undergoing urban construction in full swing, Serdek had already begun to summon the lords of the Ganbu Plain and began to introduce the rich northern area of the Belan Plain because during the battle with the demon army in the Ganbu Plain, Serdak established good cooperative relations with several other lord armies. So this time Serdak proposed a battle plan to form a coalition to attack the northern area of the Belan Plain, and it was quickly approved by the noble lords behind these lord armies, in addition to the several lord armies in the Ganbu Plain that had close cooperation in the past. The noble lords in Ruth City also wanted to take a share of the battle to open up the plain. Among them, the Ludwig family's new private army of lords was the largest in number. Of course, Serdak himself also mobilized nearly 10,000 heavy armored infantry soldiers from the Ganbu Plain. This time, the coalition forces from the Ganbu Plain went to the Belan Plain, bringing a total of 50,000 lords' private troops. Of course, the armaments and supplies of these armies need to be paid for by the lords themselves. The lords' army does not need to consider logistical issues, because this army since the day of its birth, there has been a fully functional business group accompanying the army. The reason why Serdak submitted an application to the military department for this expedition to the Belan Plain is also very simple. The territory located in Invercargill Forest is always on the edge of the nest of ghost-striped red ants. And these ghost-striped red ants threaten the lives and property of the residents in the Soldak territory at all times. Therefore, Serdak proposed to the military this time to completely eliminate the ghost-striped red ant nests in the Dark Worm Valley so that the northern residents of the White Forest Plain can have a better life. Marquis Luther did not expect that Soldak would take such a big step. However, since Soldak had this idea, Marquis Luther, as the young leader of the main war faction, would not fail to support it. The application was almost submitted to after the military department. It was approved immediately. Serdak has also begun to actively prepare for the war in Ruth City. When the news that Lord Serdak was preparing to enter the Belan Plain reached Ruth City, the radicals and conservative factions in the entire Red City immediately fell into a fierce dispute. The conservative faction headed by some established noble forces immediately pointed out many drawbacks of this expedition. Two consecutive years of war almost emptied out the city of Rut and Ganbu. 
after a year of rest. The city regained some vitality. And now Lord Serdak has actually begun to form a coalition to fight in other dimensions. This is undoubtedly a serious blow to the local economy. In fact, the conservative starting point in looking at the problem is still good. But some are conservative in thinking. What they often focus on most is maintaining existing vested interests. And then, they will continue to develop step by step. In sharp contrast to the conservative faction are the radicals in Reuter City. They actually think that this is their opportunity. Being able to take the express train of Count Serdak may allow the family to develop rapidly. However, since it is a plain war, there are huge risks. Victory will bring an overnight fortune. Failure will not only involve the entire army, but it will also severely shrink the family industry. It was amid such constant disputes that the Gambo Alliance army formed by Serdak himself was assembled in Ruth City. Chapter 1268 Before the Expedition Probably because Serdak controls a powerful army of alliance lords. No matter what policy Serdak implements in Ruth City recently, as long as it is not too excessive, these noble lords in Ruth City will, will not stand up and raise an objection. Even if Serdak wanted to build a road in the abandoned mining area, when the nobles heard that the city hall would not have to pay a penny, they immediately passed a resolution to build the road. And the lords who own the abandoned land in the abandoned mining area are also very generous. Serdak set aside some land from their territory for road construction. And each of them only received a symbolic gold coin. They didn't care at all that the road would pass through the territory and divide the territory into two. Some lords think that it would be good to pass through the territory. At least this road can lead directly to Ruth City, making it easier for residents living in the territory to enter the city. The first construction engineering team of Makusuo transferred 500 cobalt slaves this time. This group of cobalts built a felt shed outside the city and began to build the roadbed. The convoy from Wall Village transported the first batch of volcanic ash from Pudu Mountain, a deserted land, and it has been laid near the city gate. After watering, the volcanic ash formed a very strong cement pavement, and according to Serdak's requirements, this kind of the cement pavement will be separated by thin wooden boards every three meters. It is said that this can prevent the pavement from freezing and cracking when winter and summer alternate. Luke naturally became the commander-in-chief of this road construction. Although this road has not been built, it has been divided into countless roadside areas by 73 trading houses. In the future, construction will be done on both sides of this road. Some material warehouses and stores. The nobles in the city do not have a keen sense of ways to make money like the businessmen. And they do not realize what changes this road will bring to Ruth City after it is repaired. In fact, Luke's construction of this road started in both directions. In the small town of Hammond, just north of Yazipia's Manor, Another road construction team composed of cobalt slaves was also working intensively to build this road. Here there are obviously more four-wheeled carriages. However, it is precisely the problem of insufficient transportation capacity that limits the construction speed of this road. Serdak left Ruth City in a magic caravan. He first inspected the coalition camp outside the city, then ran to the road construction site to chat with Luke, and then took the magic caravan to finance Officer Cole, the manor of Tay Lady. Count Kurt Latte was lying on a wicker chair on the terrace on the second floor. In the living room, two butlers were leading the servants to clean. This place would become a huge dance floor at night. So all useless furniture had to be moved to the warehouse behind. Inside, several wives of Count Kurt, the financial officer, gathered together and sat not far away from Count Kurt to play cards. The ladies were very excited to have a grand ball in the manor. And the young people in the family were also summoned back by Count Kurt even if they just showed their faces in front of these nobles and officials. It would be a good thing for them in the future. Some benefits. The main reason why Earl Kurt held this ball was to show his loyalty to Soldak. Yes, that's what he thought. He is one of the few nobles in Lut City who supports Earl Lake Cushing. Because he clearly knows that Lut City needs to make some changes after being baptized by the flames of war. At least it cannot be mentioned by others. That is, I know, I know. That is the main city of Lord Macdonald's rebellion. Ruth City needs a new look to change the Bena people's perception of this place. Many times, other areas in the Bena province collectively refer to the area of Ruth City as Tanon. In fact, there are also some meanings of wild land that are not stated literally. He and Earl Lake Cushing also tried some new measures, but those measures either failed or could not be implemented. Earl Kurt is considered a supporter of the former consul Earl Lake Cushing. So he serves as the financial officer of Reuter City. During his tenure, he has not met any other competitors. The nobles all know that there is no money in the treasury of Ruth City. 
But today is different from the past. Soldak was in charge of Ruth City, which immediately gave Ruth City a new vitality. Earl Kirk currently holds financial power, and he also knows that if he wants to keep this position, he must become the most trusted person around Serdak. However, without a certain amount of time to get along and experience some big events together, it is difficult to establish this kind of trust, unless an alliance is formed to allow the family lord's army to join Serdak's army. But at present, the Lady family does not have a formed lord army at all, and cannot join the Lord Serdak army. So he is always worried that his status will not be guaranteed. I have been suffering from insomnia recently, and in my dreams, I am being pulled down from the financial officer's chair. The incident where Earl Lake Cushing hid in Benes City a while ago also made him a little uneasy. He was worried that Earl Cushing's loss of Soldak's trust would also affect his position as financial officer. A group of young people from the family gathered in the garden. Among the men and women, a tall and outstanding young girl was among the crowd. She was wearing an apricot dress and had golden hair. She looked like a beautiful white swan in the crowd. That was Count Kurt's niece Seda Laddie. Kurt wanted to introduce his niece to Soldak, but he had always struggled with a lack of such an opportunity. This dance was a perfect opportunity, and he didn't want to miss it. Before leaving for the expedition, Soldak decided to attend the dance held by finance officer Kurt Leyer. After all, during the time he left Ruth City, Financial Officer Kurt held the key to the vault. Soldak still needed to win over this financial officer. If there was no suitable candidate, Soldak would definitely an outsider would not be placed in such a crucial position. Unfortunately, neither Hathaway nor Beatrice is a suitable candidate for financial officer. In fact, the most suitable person is Selena. But she doesn't want to come to Red City no matter what. The carriage stopped, and Soldak opened his eyes and looked out the window. The gate of the manor of the financial officer Kurt Laddie's family was very grand. The guard saw the badges on both sides of the magic caravan and took a look inside. With one glance, he asked the coachman to drive the magic caravan into the manor. After entering the manor, the magic caravan drove along the corridor in the front yard for a while before arriving in front of the courtyard inside the manor. There was a large carpet spread in the middle of the grass in the yard, and the magic wall lamps all around were lit. The buildings in the manor also looked very gorgeous. A group of people stood on both sides of the steps, waiting for Serdak to get off the carriage. When Soldak stepped off the carriage, finance officer Kurt Lady was already waiting in front of the magic caravan. A group of city hall officials gathered around him. Soldak stepped forward to greet these officials. Treasurer Kurt stood at the front and introduced the century-old history of this manor to Soldak. The beautiful Zeta has also been arranged to stay with her uncle. She knows that the protagonist tonight is this young knight. He is not only the consul of Ruth City, but also in charge of the entire Gonbu plain. Count Kurt wanted to introduce his niece to Soldak several times, but Soldak was always surrounded by noble lords. The expedition is about to begin, and everyone hopes to know the specific combat mission of Count Soldak in the Belan plain. Unfortunately, Serdak was tight-lipped about this. Even the other lords who participated in the battle remained silent and did not say which area they would expand to after entering the Belan plain. It was not until the end of the ball that Count Kurt, the treasurer, introduced his niece Seda to Soldak. She is so young and beautiful. Her eyes are full of admiration for the strong. And her beautiful and delicate face seems to be able to satisfy any man's vanity. It's just that Serdak is not in the mood to pay attention to Miss Seda at this time. There were countless official matters waiting to be dealt with around him. If it were not to appease Count Kurt, he would not even want to attend this ball. The third phase of the Restaurant Plaza project has begun. And hotels and supporting facilities in the surrounding areas also need to be gradually constructed. In Soldak's view, the catering plaza should not only have free drinking fountains, but also have public toilets and public areas for vendors to set up stalls. In addition, magic caravans cannot be parked casually on both sides of the street, and a dedicated area is needed. These must be planned around the dining plaza. Although the planning designer is Baron Martino, Soldak also wanted to add some of his own ideas to the planning of the restaurant plaza. In addition, the first batch of resettlement houses and slums have also begun finishing work. Next, the city hall will gradually relocate other slums, and the construction of the second phase of resettlement houses will begin as soon as possible. This is a major issue to solve the livelihood of people in slums. Problem. Serdak takes it seriously. As the project on the resettlement house gradually got on track, Luke had already stepped aside and mobilized the cobalt slaves from Wall Village to build roads outside Ruth City for the construction of cement roads. These cobalt slaves were a group with a large number of building materials. 
road builder with road experience. But here's the most ironic thing. Although Serdak enforced the law prohibiting slave trade in the Ganbu Plain, he still owns nearly 1,500 cobalt slaves. And the number of this group is gradually increasing by 200 every year. Probably the largest slave owner on the Ganbu Plain. When the dance was about to end, Soldak took the magic caravan and left Count Kirk's manor in advance. Miss Seda didn't even get a chance to say goodbye to Soldak. Thea sat on the magic caravan, angrily scolding financial officer Kirk for his bad intentions at the ball. She must truthfully tell Hathaway and Beatrice what she saw at the ball. Listen. Soldak sat across from the carriage and ignored her nagging. He casually said to Thea, Tomorrow, the Lord's Army Alliance will march towards Benis City. Chapter 1269 Makusuo's Summer Night 50,000 lords are heading to Benis City. If they want to take a magic airship, Serdak needs to recruit at least a hundred magic airships. Not to mention Ruth City. Even the entire Bena province probably doesn't have that many magic airships at the moment. Therefore, these armies can only enter Bena City by land, without an order from the military department. This army cannot even pass through other city territories. Moreover, this lord's army was followed by a huge business group that was almost equal to the number of the army. The biggest disadvantage of the lord's army in the form of this alliance is the loose military discipline. The soldiers are okay. At least, they will not do anything out of the ordinary. However, the Lord's army seriously lacks restraint on the middle and high-level officers. Occasionally, some officers will send their families into the army. The merchant group traveled with the army. So some tents in the merchant house were like a second home for these officers. This kind of bad habit can be seen everywhere in the Lord army. But it cannot be effectively managed. However, Serdak has no time to care about it now. When they get to the Bell End Plain, I believe Andrew, Samira, and others will give them a good education. Class. The camp was broken up early in the morning, and the leading troops of the army lined up to set off. It wasn't until the afternoon of that day that the last archer battalion at the Ruth City military camp left the camp. Serdak did not set off with the army. He would leave Ruth City on a magic airship half a month later and arrive in Bena City in advance to join the Lord's army. During this period, he not only had to give detailed explanations of the government affairs of Ruth City, but also handle the government affairs of Makuso City. Makuso City has now resumed normal taxation. Due to the large number of adventure groups and business groups gathering in the city, fiscal revenue has exploded this month. I believe there will be a relatively smooth transition period, and taxation will gradually decline to a stable state. However, although Makuso City has restored taxation, the city hall still provides these business groups with some additional compensatory policies. For example, the same batch of goods will not be taxed every time it is traded, but will only be levied once. And the transaction tax will be levied the amount is extremely low. Only materials that pass through the portal will have a 5% customs duty, and so on. The officials of Makuso City resolutely implemented Soldak's ideas and revitalized commerce to drive the local economy. And they also tasted great benefits from this. In fact, only the city hall had no financial revenue during the one-year tax-free period. And the residents of Makuso City benefited greatly from this matter. The first benefit is that during the period of urban economic recovery, the employment rate of urban residents has remained extremely high. This is obviously a loss of revenue for the city hall. But it makes the entire city better. Although the biggest profits were made by the businessmen who brought capital into the market, new vitality sprouted throughout the city. And those living in the ruins of the city found their way back to life. Serdak has now become a new generation of heroes in Makuso City. Every time he rides a horse and walks in the streets of the city, once he is recognized, he will be watched like a star. People will stand on both sides of the street. Applause to Serdak. So now, every time Serdak goes out, he will take the magic caravan in the city hall. In just one year, Makusuo City has undergone earth-shaking changes. It was rare for Serdak to have time to wander around Makuso City and he was only accompanied by a small team of guard battalion knights. The magic caravan stopped in front of the clock tower in the square under the cover of night. The clock tower had become a ruin during the war, and even the giant bell on the roof was extremely damaged. Now that Suldak returned here, he found that the entire bell tower had been completely renovated. The reliefs on the wall surface of the bell tower had been restored in great detail. The giant clock with four dials above his head was in the four directions of 036 inlaid with moonstone. People can clearly see the direction of the pointer even at night. The clock keeper guarding the bell tower opened the door of the bell tower. Serdak took Sia to the top of the bell tower. The accompanying knights from the guard camp were waiting below with yawns. 
They followed Serdek and walked around the city. After half a day, if it were normal times, these guard camp knights would have been able to go home and rest. Serdek stood on the top of the bell tower, facing the cool night breeze and admiring the night view of Makuso's city. After walking out of the bell tower and seeing the tired expressions of the knights in the guard camp, Soldek simply waved his hand and said, Okay, you all should leave. Thea and I will just take a walk here. The knights in the guard camp hesitated at first. But when they saw that Serdak insisted on doing so, they dispersed. The magic caravan was still waiting on the street of the square. And Soldak dismissed the coachman again. Then he and Thea walked down the street like this. The city has recovered very well. Although I have not seen the prosperous Makuso city before. I think Makuso now will be more vibrant than ever before. Serdak sighed and said that the deepest memory in his heart was the dilapidated city that was riddled with holes by cavemen. Thea didn't speak, just stayed by Soldak's side silently. The original city wall of Makuso City has become the city wall of the inner city, and the large slum area outside the city has been included by a brand new city wall. The entire city of Makuso City has almost tripled its size than before. The city's main streets are brightly lit, forming crisscrossing lines of light at night. Serdak did not wear the advanced magic pattern structure, but changed into a set of ordinary guard camp training leather armor. And the distinctive broadsword and gothic shield were also put into the magic waist bag. Sia is also wearing a black robe. From the appearance of the attire, she looks like a magic apprentice. But she does not have the badge of a magic apprentice. The two left the clock tower and walked through the city square into the noisy streets. Makuso was also particularly lively at night. The opera house in front seemed to have just ended. Crowds of people poured out of the opera house and headed straight for the magic caravan parked on the street. In an instant, Serdak and Sia were surrounded by a sea of people. If they want to pass through here, they can only slow down and move forward little by little with the crowd. Some young people walked out of the opera house. Their faces still unable to hide their excitement. Apparently they were infected by the beautiful melody. And they couldn't help but discuss it after they walked out of the opera house. A familiar figure stood among the young people. She was wearing a long white dress and long silk gloves on her arms. Her golden hair was pulled back highlighting her exceptionally tall white neck, walking down the steps of the opera house. Zeta had already seen Serdek, who was hit by the crowd and stranded in place. He always seemed to be followed by that beautiful lady with long green hair, whose eyes were as clear as lake water. Even Zeta was moved by them. But at this time, Zeta couldn't help but cast his eyes on Soldek, especially when she knew that the simple knight in front of her was the great hero of Makuso City and the great lord of the Ganbu Plain. The aura around Serdak suddenly became brighter and dazzling. Serdak felt someone watching him, and turned around to find Miss Zeta standing among a group of young people. Just across the street, although there are many pedestrians and traffic, it is difficult to conceal the tall and outstanding Zeta. Seeing her looking over, Miss Zeta smiled and nodded at Soldak with some embarrassment, and secretly waved her little hand. It seems that he saw Zeta greeting people. The friends around him seemed to be asking Zeta in a low voice and Zeta was also explaining in a low voice. Serdak didn't want to stay on this street anymore, so he squeezed out of the lively opera house with Sia. Although Sia wanted to listen to an opera, they came at the wrong time. The next opera was at midnight. It's still a long time before the game starts. What? When you see that young girl from the lady family, you don't even go over to say H, Lo? Sia teased. I think she has a good impression of you. Seeing that Serdak wanted to defend, Sia added again. Don't underestimate the intuition of a Naga spellweaver, Serdak said helplessly. I can't show anyone who has a good impression of me. I have to show it. How many people are there in the entire Makusuo city? Can I show it? Sia snorted softly. I thought you would particularly like fresh and young souls, Serdak explained speechlessly. I don't have such a special hobby. Speaking of this, I think it is necessary to go to Celia village in the abandoned mining area to visit Ms. Naomi and Fauna before leaving Makuso. Oroka hopes to meet this undead warlock. As they talked, they walked around the opera house. This was an auction house. It was completely opposite to the opera house. It was very lively during the day, but very deserted at night. The building of the auction house is extremely grand. And even there is a small square at the entrance. There were six three-meter-high stone statues erected in this small square. The six stone statues with different postures formed a circle. In the middle was a stone statue with three H, L dogs. Only then did Serdak realize that these were six figures. Scene of heavy armored infantry warriors besieging a three-headed H, Lound. 
Obviously, the artist was a bit exaggerated when making the statue. Facing a three-headed H, L dog. Not to mention six heavy armored infantry soldiers. Even sixty heavy armored infantry soldiers may not be able to defeat it. When Soldak was about to pass through, he heard a young voice saying impassionately, If I were given another chance to do it again, I would be like them. Holding a bloody knight sword and cutting off the head of A.H., L. Dog. He should be a young and passionate young man. Serdak continued to walk forward and happened to see Miss Zeta and her group of young friends again. Unexpectedly, they did not leave in the magic caravan, but ran to the auction house and continued to hang out. Soldak felt that he should walk over and say H, low to Miss Zeta. When he came out and greeted Zeta politely, there were several hostile looks from among the young people. Soldak understood the young man's psychological feelings at this time very well, and he didn't pay too much attention to it. So he hurriedly left with Sia. Zeta, however, looked at the direction Soldak left. Days for a long time. The young man on the side said something jealous. But Zeta smiled and said nothing. Everyone first chatted about the opera, and then talked about the recent Makuso Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment's expedition. Several young people were thankful that they had not yet served in the military. If they had served in the military, they would probably have to go from the Ganbu Plain at this moment. Fighting in another dimension would be the most unlucky thing. Zeta suddenly found that his interest was waning, and he didn't even want to say another word. Looking at the empty streets, I could only sigh softly. Chapter 1270 Well of Souls There are many problems left in the abandoned mining area outside Ritz City, because many caves are dug underground. Precipitation will quickly seep into underground rivers. The large-scale land desertification in the abandoned mining area is very serious. Most of the land here is not suitable for farming. Even the land that used to be there as many areas of scrubland are gradually turning into wilderness, where only thorn grass can grow. In addition, these mines are crisscrossed underground, like huge ant nests. Every year, dozens of collapse events occur in the abandoned mining areas, and there are even ground fissures in some places. Earl Lake Cushing believed that two years ago, this area is not suitable for habitation, and residents of villages and towns here are recommended to relocate outside Ritz City. Unfortunately, Due to the huge relocation costs, this matter has been put on hold until now. In the valley full of gravel and gravel, there are thorny grasses everywhere that will sting people when they touch your clothes. Even in the middle of summer, the color here is still yellow here and yellow there. It was green and the wind blowing was moist and hot. A group of cobalt slaves were just wearing linen overalls and holding picks and iron drills in their hands. They were cleaning the roadbed here. They use wooden boards to divide the square grids of three meters by three meters on the roadbed, and then fill them with card loads of volcanic ash cement. After filling the grids, they need to smooth them, wait for them to dry naturally, and then use red thatch or reed poles. Cover it with a woven straw mat and water it once every morning, noon and evening to allow the road surface to fully maintain its health. Only after half a month can a qualified road surface be formed. In fact, in the deserted land, they were not so particular when building roads at first. After experiencing the first winter, many of the roads built had cracks, and some of the cement became brittle. The old village Uncle Chom Bright began to pay attention to these issues. Now, these cobalt slaves already have a very comprehensive set of road construction technology in their hands. 500 cobalt slaves are distributed in an area nearly one kilometer long, but they have to wait for the four-wheeled carriage that transports volcanic ash from the deserted land. Although many transport teams have been added recently, the transportation capacity is still insufficient. The cobalt the slaves slowed down their work and waited for the four-wheeled carriages to arrive. Luke and Serdak passed by the construction site, and the cobalt slaves knelt down and saluted. Nearly two kilometers of road have been built on the edge of Ritz City. This is the southern starting point of the road. He smiled at Luke and said, I heard you gave this road a very good name. Luke was wearing leather pants, a leather vest, and a sun hat on his head. His exposed skin was tanned by the harsh sun. Hearing Soldak ask this, he smiled and said, The southern golden road is so big. Fei Zhou transported volcanic ash from a deserted land. Which makes me think that the gold coin spent can reach this long road. Uh-huh. Almost. Soldak also smiled. He put his hand on Luke's shoulder. And the two walked along the construction site for a while. Soldak stopped and said, With this road, the Terrapagan area can be completely connected and supplies from the Ganbu Plain will continue to flow throughout the entire Terrapagan area. Luke, who came out of Wall Village, had seen some of the world, and said disapprovingly to Soldak's words, Isn't it the same before? 
The Gombu plain delivers sufficient nutrients to the entire Tarapa. Serdak shook his head and said, But the transportation problem has always existed. As long as this road is opened, the distance from Rut City to various cities in northern Tajikistan can be shortened by at least one-third. I heard that the geological conditions here are very special. There are often collapses, ground cracks, and faults. Luke said with some concern, That's why I ask you to build this road. Because you are the professionals. And you think why I put so much effort into pouring the entire road into Potsalanic cement? I am just worried that this road will be affected by the local geological conditions. Influence. And the magicians invited from the Magic Guild this time usually live in the Magic Tower and are not good at communicating with others. So you have to be more proactive and maximize their value. This is the right approach. Their utmost respect. Toldak said to Luke. Serdak has loaned 12 magicians to the Root City Magic Guild. These magicians will jointly use some large-scale Earth Group magic to change the geological conditions near this highway. I know that I will have a good relationship with these magician nobles. Luke finished and smiled proudly. After leaving the road construction site, Serdak took the magic caravan and continued to move forward. The road in the abandoned mining area was rugged and difficult to walk. The magic caravan did not arrive at Celia Village until the afternoon. Looking at the desolate scenery in front of him, in the small mountain village, there were only two houses with faint green smoke coming out of their chimneys. But just outside the mountain village, next to a broken wall, Serdak actually saw a team of kobold slaves. It seemed that the road construction team was sent out to explore the area where the road passed. Serdak remembered that this road did pass by Celia village. Since there are kobold slaves here and there are outsiders in the village, Naomi will definitely not live in the village. Serdak also gave up the idea of entering the village. Further inside, there were no roads suitable for the magic caravan. It would be more convenient to ride on horseback. This time when they came to Celia village, Serdak was fully prepared. The group of people rode horses into the mountains outside the small village. Serdak took Sia to the abandoned mine in the deepest part of the abandoned mining area. And sure enough, he found a skeleton squatting silently at the entrance of the mine. It looked like a white skeleton lying at the entrance of the cave. But if the soul fire flickering in the eye sockets proved to Serdak that it was a skeleton, it is difficult to describe this kind of skeleton. The bones on its body completely subvert the mechanics. They are all spliced together without any adhesive. But they can form the shape of the human skeleton and walk around very freely. They are afraid of light, but will not evaporate immediately in the sun. I just heard that when these skeletons are in the sun, the consumption of soul fire will increase exponentially. Seeing Serdak and Sia walking closer, the skeleton came to life and stood at the door of the mine. The light blue soul fire in the eyes kept jumping, and the lower jaw kept opening and closing. It was like talking to Serdak. The clicking sound was a bit creepy. Okay, please take us to see your master, Ms. Naomi. Soldak stepped forward and said to the skeleton, regardless of whether he could hear it or not, the soul fire in the skull's eyes jumped suddenly, and he actually turned around and walked into the mine. After walking dozens of steps, it stopped in front and turned back to look at Soldak and Sia. Serdak was led by this skeleton, and he walked and stopped all the way until he reached the depths of the mine. Serdak saw a bright light coming from the cave, and then he was sure that he had arrived at Naomi's residence. This mine is connected to the original cave. The cave is very spacious. Serdak still remembers that there is a shaft in the cave that leads to deeper underground. With a faint light, Serdak discovered that the cave was actually filled with skeletons. It was just that the skulls of these skeletons lacked the fire of soul. They were just pure skeletons. Naomi, who was wearing tattered linen clothes, was sitting by the well. Several skeletons were picking up some complete bones from the mine, and they were piled into a big pile beside the well. Good afternoon, Lord Archon. Naomi raised her head, revealing her zombie-like face, and said in a hoarse voice, Good afternoon, Naomi. Soldek responded, and then he moved closer to the shaft. There was a smell of decay and corpse odor coming from the shaft. It was not known how many dead souls were buried under the shaft. He took two steps back, then stopped and said, I'm going on a long trip this time, and it may take a few months. So I came here to see you before I leave. Naomi said nothing. As cold as an ice cube, Serdak continued, Remember what I said at the beginning? I know a friend who is also very proficient in necromancy. Now because you are studying necromancy, your body is constantly turning into corpses. I told him about this a few days ago. He is more interested in this matter and wants to see your current situation. With his understanding of necromancy, 
He may be able to solve your problem. Naomi looked at Soldak in surprise. And after a while she said in a stiff tone, Thank you for remembering this promise. Soldak saw the confusion in her eyes, but continued, If you don't mind, I'll call him over. Whatever you want, Naomi said casually. Serdak made a gesture to Sia, and Sia followed behind. She spread a prepared tablecloth on the stone table, then placed a set of silver teacups and teapots on the tablecloth, and even a silver candlestick with room for three candles was placed on the table. After everything was ready, Saldak blew the finger bone whistle. Although no sound was made, the skeletons with soul fire around him were trembling nonstop, and their soul fire was like a strong wind. Among them, it is possible to be blown away by the wind at any time. Naomi's eyes also widened, and she covered her ears with a painful expression. As a blood-colored door emerged on the stone wall, the door was pushed open by countless skeletal hands inside. These skeletal hands were scrambling to climb out, but it seemed that there was a kind of restraint in the air that could only allow them to escape from the door. Stretch out half of your skeletal arm. Count Fornak's figure appeared again in the bloody door. Soldak and Thea were already accustomed to this. However, Naomi, who saw the ghost for the first time, subconsciously drew a picture in front of her with her fingers. Magic circle. Count Fornak glanced at Naomi, raised his broken arm, and shot out a black light, which immediately dispersed the magic circle drawn by Naomi. Chapter 1271 Well of Souls 2 After Count Fornak entered the world of the dead, he quickly became a lord of the undead world with the power accumulated in Fornak Manor. His body was originally in the form of a void ghost, but now after a long period of accumulation, he has an upper body skeleton and a gray broken cloak. Many ghosts hold a huge bone scythe in their hands. But Count Fornak is a scepter. He usually and Sue when Erdak met. Count Fornak always transformed into his original human appearance. Sitting next to Serdak and talking. This time, he appeared in the cave completely as a ghost lord. A black light shot out from his fingertips. Quickly dispersing Naomi's condensed magic pattern array. Count Fornak. Please stop. This is Ms. Naomi. I want to introduce to you. Serdak stood aside blocking Count Fornak, and shouted to him. Only then did Earl Fornak regain his senses, as if he had regained consciousness from a lost state. He looked around vigilantly, and finally his eyes fell on the shaft, and asked Serdak, Dak, where is this? Why can I feel countless imprisoned souls here? Soldak quickly explained, This used to be a mine, but it is now abandoned. It is now Ms. Naomi's current residence. Count Fornak ignored Ms. Naomi, and flew directly to the shaft. In Soldak's eyes, he didn't find anything strange about this shaft. But Count Fornak almost stuck his head into the well. And he even said to Soldak in a serious manner, From this well I feel a strong soul power inside. And there is also resentful spirit and death energy trapped in it. What is at the bottom of this well? Soldak looked at Ms. Naomi with a blank expression. Naomi had already recovered from the extreme shock. She never thought that Serdak's friend would actually be a lord of the undead world. And he could enter the rolling continent at will. So far, I have only found these skeletons here. In addition to some waste ore, there is nothing else. Ms. Naomi walked over slowly and pointed at the skeletons around her casually. Said to the three people, Can you tell us the story of what happened here? Soldak asked Naomi. He pointed to the stone table with a tea tray and asked a few people to sit there. Ms. Naomi stopped at the mouth of the well, looked inside with some nostalgia, and then said in a hoarse voice, Thirty years ago, my husband died in this mine. Like many people in the village. He was also a miner in this iron mine. Later, the mineral deposits in the mine were completely hollowed out. And there was only this one. Iron ore can also be found in the mine. And almost all the miners in the mine gather in this mine. And everyone takes turns entering the mine to dig for the iron ore inside. Not long after, the mine experienced a collapse. And many miners died inside. Including my husband. The mine closed down because of this. After the mine was completely disbanded, I thought about digging my husband out of the mine. I used to come here occasionally to clean up the abandoned mine tunnels. This was a long time ago. It was also at that time that I met a lingering resentful spirit on the edge of this mine. Just when I thought I was settled, it actually asked me to help him collect his bones and asked me to put them away. He is buried there. As she said that, Ms. Naomi pointed to the left corner of the cave, where there was indeed a tombstone. She slept there and she probably never woke up after such a long time. Ms. Naomi introduced the tombstone to several people, just like a hostess introducing her neighbor. Then he pointed to the bookshelf on the other side of the wall and said to Soldak, 
These books are all left behind by it. And the spells I learned are all recorded on them. Count Fonak appeared next to the bookshelf the next second. He opened two books at random and put the books back on the bookshelf very gentlemanly. Then he said, This wraith should have been a necromancer when he was alive. Have you ever tried to enter this mouth? Isn't it in the well? Naomi replied calmly. I tried, but the death energy inside was so severe that I couldn't penetrate it at all. My body turned into a corpse because of repeated entries into this mine. Later, I asked them to go down and touch the bones for me. Naomi pointed to a few skeletons standing aside burning the soul fire. Count Fonak nodded, floated to the well again, and explained to Naomi, This is the well of souls. There are too many wrong souls imprisoned here. The death energy here has even reached the point where the essence of human beings has condensed. There is no way to enter this well. But the undead can. I'll go down and see what's down there. After saying that, he saw him floating directly into the well. Soldak and Naomi waited above for about a quarter of an hour before they noticed that Count Fordak floated up holding a light green gem. The emerald reflected his empty face green. There is a precious soul stone here. Count Fonak looked a little excited and then said to Naomi, This soul stone will greatly help me increase my strength. So I stay here got it. After saying that, the soul stone in his hand disappeared instantly. His tone was so matter of fact. But he then said, As for your corpse transformation, I think it was due to exposure to too much dead energy inside. This dead energy invaded your body and eroded your body into a half zombie. In your current state, I guess you don't need to eat now. Right? Ms. Naomi nodded absently. Count Fonak added, If you are slightly transformed into a corpse, Dark's holy light technique can purify the abnormalities in your body. You only need to be weak for a few days to recover. But now most of your body has been completely transformed into a corpse. Transformation. Once purified by the power of holy light, you will turn into a wisp of smoke and disappear quickly. Hearing what Count Fornak said, Serdak realized that Ms. Naomi's physical condition was so bad. Then how can we save her? Soldak asked Count Fornak. Count Fornak smiled and shook his head, and then said to Soldak, I think your use of the word rescue is inappropriate. We can think about it from another angle, such as looking at now from the perspective of an undead. Me. It is not so much that there is something wrong with her current body. It is better to say that her current life form is changing and she is transforming her flesh and blood body into the body of the undead. She only needs to wait quietly until her soul completely breaks away from this broken body. That's when she regains her freedom and new life, Serdak said with a surprised look. You mean that death for us is exactly rebirth for Naomi, so that she can become an undead? Count Fonak corrected her. She is an undead noble. As long as she is not unlucky, she is very likely to have a small piece of land of her own in the undead world just like me. Soldak looked at Count Fornak speechlessly, and then at Naomi, who had a calm face, and said doubtfully, So if we save her now, it will prolong her pain. It is better to save her earlier. End your life, and go to the world of the dead to find a happy life? Ahem. This is indeed the case from my point of view. Count Fornak admitted. Soldak hesitated for a moment, and turned to Naomi and asked, Naomi, what do you think of this matter? The necromancer thought seriously for a while, and then said, me? I don't know. I haven't found his bones yet. I originally planned to find his bones. Even if it was a skeleton. After we got married, I originally planned to go out for a walk and see the beautiful world outside. But unfortunately, he died before this promise could be fulfilled. Count Fornak floated in front of her and asked her, So your wish is to dig out your husband's bones, give him some soul fire, and make him a skeleton without memory and thinking ability to accompany you around the world? Well, that's pretty much it. Naomi nodded and admitted. Sernak and Sia looked at each other. Sure enough, only the undead can understand the undead. Count Fornak looked at the dark wellhead and asked Naomi. Then what I want to know is how can you tell that the skeleton is your husband's? Naomi closed her eyes and put her hands on her chest and said, I remember his smell. I can feel him lying underneath. Count Fornak said with some embarrassment. But his body has completely rotted underground. How can there be any smell? The tibia of his right leg was broken. And there will be joints in the leg bones. Naomi added. Count Fonak nodded and said. If you say so, my thinking becomes much clearer. Saying that, he got into the shaft again. Chapter 1272 Skeleton Resurrection. After a lot of effort, there was a huge earthquake from the bottom of the well. Followed by the sound of soul screaming. And a lot of dust from the bottom of the well spewed out from the mouth of the well. 
Naomi's cave was filled with the smell of rotting corpses. And the cave was filled with dust. Soldak took out masks from his magic pocket and gave them to Naomi and Thea. This linen cloth masks are a must-have for the villagers of volume as long as they enter Pudu Mountain. Everyone will wear such a dust mask to prevent excessive volcanic ash floating in the air from being inhaled into the lungs. But Naomi just held the mask in her hand, tossing it curiously, pointing to her mouth and nose, and explained to Soldak, I don't need to breathe anymore, and I don't have any sense of taste or smell. Even the pain sensation is extremely weak. Serdak doesn't know whether this is a good thing or not. In some special environments, having this kind of physique is certainly more suitable for survival. But if you return to human society, this may be the saddest thing. There was no scent, no salt to taste, and the body looked like a magical prosthetic leg from Oriana's magic puppet shop. Sia was extremely uncomfortable with this dusty environment. She quickly drew a magic circle and condensed three transparent bubbles to wrap the three of them. After waiting for a long time, the shaft stopped spitting out the foul-smelling stone powder, and a dead skeleton was dug out from the shaft by Count Forneck. However, the right arm of the corpse and the wrapped shoulder were made of broken bones. Count Forneck laid the corpse flat on the stone platform, turned to Naomi and said, When he was found, the bones in his shoulders had already been crushed by boulders. It should have been caused by the collapse of the mine tunnel before his death. Naomi didn't look at the arm pieced together with broken bones. Her eyes fell on the tibia with obvious joints. She even reached out to rub that part. This should be a scene that can only grow after the calf is broken and healed. Because the two broken bones were not aligned correctly when the bones were originally connected. Some bone spurs grew after the seam healed. Naomi could not see any sadness. The body of Naomi's husband was placed on the tablecloth on the stone table. As for the silver tea sets, Thea had put them away again. It was obvious that they were not in the mood to drink at the moment. Tea. Naomi climbed up to the stone platform and lay side by side with a flat skeleton. Her stiff face showed no expression, but her cloudy eyes showed grief. But no tears were shed. She glanced at the skeleton with soul fire burning in the eye socket next to her, and the skeleton immediately came closer. Naomi reached out and removed the clavicle, shoulder blade, and upper arm bones of the skeleton's shoulder, and replaced them on her husband's damaged right arm. In this way, the corpse was considered to be a complete skeleton. Naomi then took some bone powder from the shelf next to her. The bone powder was scattered on the stone platform along Naomi's fingers, like sand paintings, forming a strange magic array. Just when she was about to recite the incantation to give the skeleton the fire of soul, Fawnak on the side stopped her with words. The skeleton you resurrected is just a low-level skeleton driven by the fire of the soul. You have to give it a seed of wisdom, and it will open up to primary wisdom one day in the future. If you can peel off a trace of soul, perhaps primary wisdom will sprout. When you are there, you will still carry that trace of memory in your soul. Count Fornak floated on a plate and said to Naomi. Naomi's eyes lit up and she curiously asked Count Fornak. Is this an advanced skeleton summoning technique? Count Fornak nodded and said. Yes, I happen to be studying this aspect of magic recently. So I can provide you with some help. With a glimmer of hope in her eyes, Naomi asked eagerly. If you wake him up, might he have his own thoughts? Count Fornak nodded. If I peel off a piece of my soul to him, will he have some memories that originally belonged to me? Count Fornak nodded again and said, In other words, his appearance in your memory will become part of the fragmented memory after he awakened his primary wisdom. Count Fornak put his head in front of Naomi and asked her seriously, Do you want to try it? The only price is that you will suffer great pain when your soul is peeled off. Of course, you have no five senses. I said this pain is on a soul level. I'm willing to try. Naomi said without any hesitation. Count Fornak nodded. This time he started to prepare again. He even took out a few pieces of gray-white crystal stones and arranged a huge array of five or six meters square around the stone platform. The entire array was painted with a light blue dye. The flow of magic became more and more intense in the hands of Count Fornak. Finally, the magic circle was arranged and the entire cave became ghostly. Count Fornak asked Naomi to lie next to her husband's skeleton, and then walked to the well. He snapped his fingers on the edge of the well with pure white finger bones, and a light blue flame ignited on his fingertips. He put his finger that lit a small ball of blue flame to the side of the shaft, and suddenly the entire mouth of the shaft was ignited by the blue flame. To Serdak, the shaft felt like a huge stove, with blazing blue flames emitting from the stove's eyes. Count Fornak put his other hand into the shaft, as he softly recited the magic spell. 
His hand glowed with a faint blue light. The bone hand slowly fished out a huge ball from the shaft. The light blue flame turned out to be a ball of soul fire. The skeleton summoned by Naomi only had two balls of soul fire the size of walnuts in the eye sockets. And Fonak actually lifted a ball of soul fire as big as a basketball. Amidst the sound of the spell, Count Fonak needed the soul fire as if kneading dough until it was as big as an eyeball. The original light blue flame turned into a bluish purple color. He walked to the skeleton. Put this fire into your eyes. Then he made a second soul fire in the same way and placed it in the eye socket on the other side of the skull. Soldak found that the skeleton still showed no signs of moving at this moment. At this time, Count Fornak looked at Naomi and said to her, If you don't regret it now, you can open your heart. I just strip away a shred of your soul. Naomi didn't speak, but slowly closed her eyes and nodded to Count Fornak. Count Fornak then stretched his fingers to Naomi's forehead and made a vertical wound on her stiff forehead. No blood actually flowed out of the wound. Instead, Count Fornak gathered five fingers together, like he was grabbing something on her forehead. As he gave a soft drink, Soldak clearly saw a wisp of gray energy being drawn out from Naomi's forehead and torn away from Naomi's body. Naomi didn't scream at this moment, but her body was in an extremely twisted state. Her eyeballs were almost squeezed out of her sockets. Her cheeks were collapsed, and her whole head was tilted back, looking like it was broken. Both hands and feet were folded in reverse. That weird look made Thea let out a soft cry and hid in Soldek's arms, not daring to look at it anymore. Count Fonak ignored Naomi at all, but poured the gray aura into the soul fire of the skeleton next to him. As Count Fornak shouted, Wake up! The blue-purple soul fire of the skeleton lying flat on the stone platform burst out with a dazzling brilliance. Then it suddenly sat up from the stone platform and looked around, and then looked at Naomi sitting beside it. Beside, the soul fire kept flickering. While reciting a spell, Count Fonak injected some grudge essence into Naomi's body. He did not stop until Naomi's body calmed down. This resurrection ritual will cause great damage to her body. This method of repairing the body can only speed up her body's transformation into a corpse. But she will have many helpers in the future. Count Fornak said lowly to Serdak said the voice. Why does it look so dumb? It seems to be no different from other skeletons. Thea hid behind Soldak, curiously staring at the skeleton on the stone platform, and asked Count Fornak. It's not that easy. It only has a seed of wisdom planted in its body. It needs a certain opportunity to germinate. Count Fornak continued. Now it is just a skeleton with slightly higher strength than an ordinary skeleton. Skeleton warrior. Soldak walked to Naomi and found Naomi lying on the stone platform. She stared at the sitting skeleton and shed tears. Her stiff face could barely reveal a grin. She couldn't tell. Cry or laugh. Count Fonak looked a little tired. He said to Soldak, The soul stone harvested this time is a huge harvest for me. But the gift given to her as compensation can be considered very sincere. After speaking, Count Fonak smiled self-deprecatingly and said, It's time to say goodbye to you. He turned to look at Naomi and the body floating in midair came to her side, smoothed the wound on her forehead, and continued, Go and enjoy the remaining days. Maybe one day you don't want to live anymore. You can find Dak and ask him to call me out. Then I can smuggle you back to the world of the dead, so that at least you don't need to waiting for the soul attractor by the river sticks. You don't need to step through the forgotten plains full of flowers. You can bring all the memories in front of you to the world of the dead. From the perspective of the undead, this can also be said to be you. Rebirth in a new world. I understand. Thank you. Count Fornak. Naomi's voice was hoarse and had a metallic texture, which was very harsh. Then, Count Fornak stepped into the bloody door that appeared on the wall without looking back. Seeing that Naomi was slowly recovering, although she was a little depressed, she was not in any other condition. Soldak put an envelope on the stone platform and said to her, Then I have to say goodbye. The recent period... I should no longer be in Ritz City. If you come to me in an emergency, you can send the letter to the castle in Ritz City and someone will forward it to me. After saying that, Serdak took Thea and left the abandoned mine overnight. Deep in the mine, Naomi sat next to the skeleton with the soul fire flashing in its eye sockets. Chapter 1273 Good News Just the day before Serdak was about to leave for Benna City, news came from the Ganbu plane that almost made the entire plane boil. There was a five-person adventure group called the Short-Tailed Bear actually in the Ganbu Plain. A rock golem was discovered in the Southern Collapse land. And this adventure group was very lucky to kill the rock golem and find a heart of rock from its core. 
This five-person adventure group sold the Heart of Rock in Bankstown very simply. It is said that the members of this adventure group announced on the spot that the adventure group was officially disbanded. The five members shared the huge sum of money equally. Some members of the team simply went on a trip, while others chose to take the money home. If you save a little money, this you can almost live your whole life without worrying about food and clothing. In just two weeks, the entire adventure group in the Ganbu Plain knew about the appearance of Rock Golem in the collapsed land. So countless adventure groups flocked to the southern region of the Ganbu Plain, trying to become the second short-tailed bear adventure group. Serdak did not expect that such news would come from Banks Town before leaving. When Soldak responded to the letter, he emphasized the need to provide logistical services for these adventure groups and also needed to provide Honkai impact. The survival rules for trying to avoid danger are written on the town's bulletin board. In the end, these adventure groups are asked to look at this matter rationally. There are rock golems hidden deep in the collapsed land. This is an open secret in the Ganbu Plain. However, over the years, the adventure groups who have witnessed the rock golems can probably be counted on one hand. This also means that rocky golems are far rarer than people think. If any adventure group only wants to go to the collapsed land to hunt rock golems, then they are likely to be disappointed. Soldak sat in the study and glued the envelope and told Sia, Tomorrow, send this letter to Makuso City Hall. I also want to go back to Doden Town to see Zigna and Nika. Sia stood next to the desk, put the letter handed over by Soldak into the paper bag, and whispered to Serdak. Soldak stopped writing, raised his head and glanced at Sia across the desk, and then said to her, We need someone here who is responsible for transmitting information. You are the only one who is most suitable for me. So I need you to stay. Although the mermaid lady was a little reluctant, she still nodded obediently. Soldak held the pen, paused and said to Sia, When this expedition is over, I can let you go back to Duodan Town to stay for as long as you want. This was not what Sia wanted. When she heard Soldak say this, she could only lower her head in frustration and said, Okay, I got it. Serdak lowered his head, signed his name on an official letter, and then told Sia, Remember to send me your work diary every week and keep an eye on Ruth City for me. Walking back to the room, Soldak discovered that Hathaway and Beatrice, with four maids, had pushed out almost all the hangers in the cabinet, and the dresses on these hangers were all men's. Hathaway is carefully selecting from these rows of clothes racks, and the maid will put the dress Hathaway selected into the suitcase. He never knew that he actually owned so many clothes. He never cared about what he needed to wear when attending dances. Hathaway had prepared them in advance. Now seeing the hangers filled with brand new dresses. Soldak only then did I realize my luxury. What are you preparing for? Soldak stepped forward and asked gently. Hathaway proudly pulled Soldak. Pointed to the six huge suitcases on the side. And said to Soldak. These are your usual clothes. As well as the dresses for the ball. When meeting other the aristocratic costumes that nobles need are all in complete sets. Each set of gowns, shirts, tie, underwear, pants, socks and leather shoes all match. So don't flip them around randomly to avoid picking up the wrong ones. I know. Serdak said casually as he looked at these boxes with a big head. Hathaway then said, In addition, many of the dresses inside cannot be folded. If they are stored in the box for a long time, they will inevitably have wrinkles. When you arrive in Doden Town, you must remember to take out the dresses inside and hang them in in the closet. Her voice was soft and had a lazy feel to it. Soldak patted his magic pattern structure and said to Hathaway, I think one magic pattern structure is enough. Hathaway shook her head stubbornly and said, If this magic pattern structure is damaged on the battlefield and needs to be repaired, you must have a set of clothes that can be changed. In addition, these dresses are for when you are socializing with nobles. It can only be used. For example, if you attend a dance, if you wear this magic pattern outfit, see who is willing to talk to you. Soldak was almost unable to refute what Hathaway said. So he could only wave his hand and said, Okay, I will bring them all. Do you want to follow me to Belan this time? Hearing Serdak ask this, Beatrice, who was standing aside, looked excited. Hathaway threw a sky blue starry sky dress into the suitcase and then said to Soldak, It's great that I can accompany you to Bena City and visit my parents. The Belan plane is too far for Beatrice and me. A round trip will take at least two months. It might be almost winter when we return to Lit City. We don't want to miss the beautiful ginkgo leaves in Ruth City in autumn. Hearing Hathaway say this, Beatrice was inevitably a little disappointed. 
On the day that Soldak took the earliest magic airship from the airport terminal to Benna City, officials from the entire Ruth City City Hall and members of the House of Representatives were all present to see him off. Serdak did not expect that there would be so many people. As a result, the airport terminal was once congested and traffic became somewhat paralyzed. At this time, the magic airship was already full of people, and it seemed that everyone was waiting for Serdak to finally board the ship. Soldak took Hathaway and Beatrice aboard the magic airship, and the captain waved the flag in the command room and sounded the magic airship's bell. With the sound of, dang, dang, dang bells, the magic pattern arrays on the floating device lit up one after another. And then the floating device roared. And the magic airship slowly rose into the sky. Serdak stood in the luxurious bedroom on the top floor of the ship, through the floor-to-ceiling glass windows. He could clearly see the city of Rich shrinking beneath his feet, in order to prevent other passengers on the same ship from always saluting when they see him. Serdak will almost only appear in the restaurant of the magic airship during lunch and dinner. The rest of the time I'd basically spend in the luxurious cabin reading books and playing chess. It seemed that every time he took the magic airship, it was like giving himself a short vacation. And with his two wives by his side, this kind of life made Serdak feel a little confused between day and night. However, just the day before the magic airship was about to arrive in Benna City, Hathaway actually became inexplicably seasick, and her reaction was so severe that she would vomit almost everything she ate. Even if Soldak used the holy light spell on her several times, it was of no avail. Hathaway lay in bed all day, her face a little pale, and her body very weak. Fortunately, Hathaway only endured it for more than a day, and the magic airship successfully arrived at Benna City. Knowing that Soldak and Hathaway would arrive in Benna City by magic airship today, the magic caravan of Marquis Luther's mansion was waiting under the high tower of the airport terminal early. Serdak had the right to get off the ship first. He walked at the front, followed by two maids supporting Hathaway, followed by Beatrice. After the group walked down the airport tower, Serdak then he saw Butler Kenneth waiting at the exit of the tower and quickly came up to greet him. Butler Kenneth learned that Hathaway might be seasick, causing some physical discomfort. So he asked for some specific details of Hathaway's physical condition. Then he helped Hathaway into the carriage and told the coachman to run slower when he got on the road. After the magic caravan entered the city, it did not take a detour to the military headquarters, but returned directly to the Marquis Mansion. Soldak got off the bus halfway, stood on the roadside, and called a carriage to report to the military headquarters. The Alliance Lord's army set out from Red City two weeks ago and rushed to Benna City along the land. Serdak took the magic airship out this time, two weeks later than the departure date of the Alliance Lord's army. But in fact, Serdak arrived in Benna City earlier than the Alliance Lord's army, and the Alliance Lord's army arrived in Benna City a week later. During this period, Serdak needed to apply to the military department for a garrison camp outside Benna City, and also applied for customs clearance procedures to enter the Belan Plain. There were many trivial matters that needed to be handled by Serdak. His assistancy a state in Ruth City, and Gulitam went overland with the army. Even if he was here, he couldn't actually help. Everything needed to be done. Serdak did it himself. So he couldn't wait to rush to the military headquarters to apply for a temporary military camp. You must know that the Alliance Lord Army that rushed to Benna City this time has a total of 50,000 people. No matter where they are stationed, they will need a large military camp. When Soldak came to the military headquarters, he went to Marquis Luther's office as soon as possible. Marquis Luther's assistant personally came forward to help him solve the subsequent matters. Soldak and Marquis Luther sat in the room all afternoon, chatted all the way, and returned to the Marquis Mansion in the Magic Caravan. Chapter 1274 Meeting the wheels ran over the bluestone slabs. And the wheels wrapped in raw rubber only felt bumps at the joints of the slabs. The roads in the noble quarter are in very good condition. With beautiful hibiscus trees planted on both sides. There are not many pedestrians on both sides of the street. Every street corner is patrolled by knights from the guard camp. They will drive away the vagrants and drunkards wandering on the street. And will also patrol the thieves who often appear here. For these guard camp knights. Thieves who can freely enter and exit the noble estates are basically the ones they cannot afford to offend. Many cities now have these unions. These thieves basically lurk and pick locks. At night, they just need to hide somewhere in the shadows. These guard camp knights are like blind men. Even if they walk in front of thieves with their eyes open, it's also hard to spot them. In aristocratic neighborhoods, you can always see some young men and women in gorgeous clothes riding strong horses and walking under the street trees. 
for the nobles, wearing a tight-fitting light leather armor, a western rapier on the waist, and a top hat with red tassels are the most popular clothing at the moment. There are often gorgeous magic caravans passing by quickly on the road, and Marquis Luther's magic caravan happens to be among them. Marquis Luther was sitting on the front seat, holding a cup of warm black tea, and said to Soldak who was sitting opposite. Before a large-scale dimensional war broke out between the Green Empire and the Dark Legion, it was very common for the Lord Armies to form an alliance to explore unknown areas of the plain. This kind of war to open up the plain requires the Lords to raise a large amount of war preparation materials. The upfront investment in the war is still relatively expensive. However, your entry into the Belland Plain this time is another situation. You are in Invercargill Forest. We already have a territory that is not too small. And now we are just expanding outwards based on this. So we can save a lot of money. In addition, Wilk City in the Belland Plain is fully equipped to expand to the surrounding areas. However, many lords there are senior generals of the Bena Army. Which means that their armies are currently trapped in the Warsaw Plain. This has led to the Belland Plain. The development of the Lynn Plain has almost stagnated in the past five years. You have become the lord of the Belland Plain. Now you are expanding northward to resist the beast tide that you will face in nine years. This reason makes sense. This time you can withstand the financial pressure from the Gonbu Plain and Rith City and boldly plan this war plan to open up a new dimension. Not only is the feasibility very high, but as long as you win, you will gain super high return on profits. As for the military department, there is no resistance at all. In the past two years, the military has twice recruited heavy armored infantry soldiers from the Ganbu Plain. You have carried out all of them to the letter. So no one will stand up to obstruct this operation. After hearing what Marquis Luther said, Soldak nodded repeatedly. No wonder he went to the military headquarters this time to apply for a temporary military camp. When he first saw the application form, the officials in the military headquarters were surprised. But then they signed it readily. He just arrived in Bena City in the morning. And in just one afternoon, he went through the rental procedures for the camp on the outskirts of Bena City. In addition to the relationship with Marquis Luther, there is also a series of recent actions by Soldak, all of which have been well recognized by the military. Marquis Luther put down the teacup in his hand and looked at Soldak with a smile. He felt indescribable satisfaction for the young man in front of him. Soldak's character can be said to be unassuming. He is calm and restrained with a unique rock-solid temperament. Although he lacks the unremittingly sharp momentum of the Bena swordsman, he is better than stability. He sees that up there it's more like the Knights of the North. Marquis Luther once traveled to the North, where he saw the construct Knights of the North Wind Legion. At that time, he was arrogant, carrying two broad-edged swords on his back, and did not take any construct Knight into consideration at all. However, when he set foot on the battlefield in the North and saw the battle between the construct Knights of the North Wind Legion and the barbaric warriors of the Ice, and snow tundra. He realized that the formation formed by the construct swordsman on the battlefield was actually so weak. So this time Serdak is planning to form a constructed knights. This is a very unusual approach in the Bena province. This shows that the noble lord has given up the pride of Bena. But Marquis Luther has no intention of Serdak. The approach is very supportive. He rubbed his forehead. As he got older, his physical condition had not only declined from his peak, but his mental strength was not that strong either. I originally wanted to continue talking about Serdak's plan for this plain war. But at this time I was too lazy to continue asking. And just said, Great Swordsman Chester is currently still in Wilk City in the White Forest Plain. If you need anything, you can contact him directly. You can mobilize the Luther Army's garrison in the White Forest Plain at will. And you can secondment troops from various garrison camps. All military equipment. The support Marquis Luther gave was exactly how he would treat his own son. In fact, if Luther's legion had not involved the interests of other noble lords in Bena City. At this time, Marquis Luther would have wanted to hand over the entire legion to Serdek. I know, Serdek said gratefully. Marquis Luther leaned forward, patted his shoulder with one hand, and said to him, Now that you have your own team, you just need to form a real team of constructed knights. He seemed to remember that Serdek had mentioned the formation of the constructed knights before, and asked, By the way, I heard how your formation of the Construct Knights is going. Serdak did not hide anything and answered honestly. Her squadrons of Constructed Knights have been formed so far. I heard that Serdak has almost formed half of the Constructed Knights. This requires Serdak to have at least 200 Knights with level 1 strength, more than 200 green scale horses, and 200 multiple sets of magic pattern structures. 
This is not a huge wealth that just any noble family can come up with. In just a few years, Serdak grew from a guard camp knight to a plain lord. And he also accumulated such a large amount of wealth in his hands. It's really yours, Marquis Luther praised. The two returned to the Marquis Luther's mansion, Lady Marianne, Hathaway, and Beatrice rarely came out to greet them. Only the housekeeper and a group of servants stood on the steps and saw Marquis Luther get off the carriage. Salute neatly. Marquis Luther knew Lady Marion well. She was the most aristocratic woman, and she was even a bit rigid in this regard. Where's madam? Marquis Luther asked. The butler responded in a low voice. Mrs. Marion and Miss Hathaway are in the small restaurant, waiting for you and Lord Soldek to dine. Although Marquis Luther was a little confused, he said, Oh, let's go directly. At the entrance of the hall, four maids surrounded Marquis Luther, taking off his military uniform and leather armor, and putting on a set of loose robes for him. Serdak followed Marquis Luther, and there were actually four maids who prepared casual clothes for Serdak. Serdak usually liked bloomers and linen shirts, so Hathaway specially customized several sets for him. After changing their clothes, the maid would help them wash their hands and wipe their faces. Then the two of them walked quickly to the small restaurant. They heard the relaxed laughter from Mrs. Marion and Hathaway after the conversation. Mrs. Marion's tone was filled with difficulty concealed joy. When Marquis Luther walked into the small restaurant, Lady Marianne, Hathaway, and Beatrice stood up to greet him. Ferdinand! Mrs. Marion shouted the name of Marquis Luther. I have good news for you. Our baby Hathaway is pregnant. Marquis Luther held his forehead with one hand and was almost knocked unconscious by the good news. In fact, he was looking forward to this good news more than Lady Marion. The main reason was that he needed a reasonable reason to spend more than ten years in the future. Here, slowly hand over the Luther Legion to Serdek. Obviously, in the eyes of Marquis Luther's close allies, the marriage of Soldak and Hathaway alone cannot win the approval of the noble lords behind Luther's army. The most reliable shackle of marriage is to have a blood successor. Bye. In the future, Marquis Luther will also hand over the Luther Legion to Hathaway's unborn child. It doesn't matter whether it's a boy or a girl. He just needs a reason to hand over the Luther army to Serdak. Marquis Luther strode over held Hathaway's head in his hands, let her lean into his arms, patted her back gently with his hands, and said softly, Oh, so you are going to become a girl soon. A mother. This is really good news. Hathaway closed her eyes and smiled gently. When Marquis Luther sat down next to Madame Marion, Soldat quickly walked up, knelt down on one knee in front of Hathaway, held her waist with both hands, and put his head on her belly to listen to the sounds inside. He's still very young. You can't hear anything. Hathaway whispered shyly when she saw that Soldak's posture was a little too intimate. But Soldak raised his head and said to Hathaway very seriously, I can feel the vitality he is constantly exuding in your belly. He is a strong and healthy child. Hathaway could clearly feel the joy in Soldak's heart, which was a kind of excitement and throbbing in her heart after being promoted to a father. So the last trace of worry in her heart also dissipated. The next day, Soldak went to the Dunstan family with a letter of visit to visit Speaker Fred. This must be done before a formal visit. It also shows respect for the other party and prepares the other party. The other party is also very particular about the time when they arrange the reception and meeting. The shorter the meeting time is, the more important it is to the other party. If the meeting time is left after a month, it will basically be the last meeting. Soldak had been to Dunstan Manor more than once. After waiting at the door for a short while, he was invited into a living room by the butler. But what Serdak never expected was that he actually saw Baron Armand de Cuny in the living room. He was instructing several servants to place refreshments and fruit plates on the coffee table in the living room. When Soldak walked into the living room, he just turned around and nodded to the guests who had just entered the room and kept smiling and chatting casually. This man, who even gave up his original surname in order to attach himself to the Dunstan family, is wearing a dress that looks decent. He should be working as a male greeter at the moment. Although this thing seems to be a welcome and send-off, it was a trivial matter in the past. But it was also a very popular thing in the Dunstan family. Because if you can make friends with a few nobles in the process, you can expand your social circle. Baron de Cuny just wanted to smile at Soldak. But when he saw clearly that the person walking in from the outside was Soldak, he couldn't smile at that face. The complex emotions of fear, shock, shame, and resentment bloomed in an instant and then quickly subsided. The housekeeper didn't know about the grudge between Baron de Cuny and Serdak. 
seeing Baron de Cuny froze in place. He thought that Baron de Cuny didn't know Zerdak and didn't know how to address or receive him. So he, he immediately introduced him. Baron de Cuny, this is Count Soldak, a great lord from the plain of Ganbu. Please treat him well. This was already the kindest suggestion. And then he whispered, It seems like someone is visiting the door again. I have to go back there to receive them. You have to treat me well here. But at this time, Baron de Cuny's mind was almost filled with the idea that Cernak had been making waves in Alenza City half a month ago, ruining all his original plans to occupy the magpie's nest. If Cernak hadn't appeared rashly, he would have he won't hide back in the Dunstan family in despair at this time, thinking that the only time Darcy Christie got drunk with him was when he thought he was Count Soldak in front of him. Baron de Cuny wanted to pour the red wine in the cup on his face and stab him with a sword. In stomach, there were still some fantasies emerging in his mind, and he heard the housekeeper whisper beside him, Baron de Cuny, Baron de Cuny, what's wrong with you? Are you feeling uncomfortable somewhere? At this time, Baron de Cuny suddenly came to his senses, then shook his head vigorously, drank the red wine in the glass in one gulp, turned around and walked to the other side of the living room, leaving Serdak and the butler completely dry. The butler's face was full of dark lines, but he was able to put on a smile again and forced out an awkward smile at Soldak. My lord, please forgive him for being so ignorant of etiquette. He may be drunk. After saying that, he asked Soldak to sit down and rest, and asked the maid to bring him a glass of golden cider. Then, he hurriedly chased Baron de Cuny standing at the door of the living room, and then took him outside the house. It seemed that he had found a secluded corner, with his excellent hearing. Soldak clearly heard the butler scolding. If Miss Guy hadn't recommended you to help here, Baron de Cuny, believe it or not, I would have sent you to the back kitchen to manage the vegetable purchasing there. Be energetic, and at least have a friendly and kind smile on your face. Because the noble lords who can sit in this room after handing over the invitation letter are basically distinguished guests who have a personal relationship with the Marquis. If you don't want to do this, ask to leave as soon as possible. Don't wait until you really mess up the matter. By then, you won't even have a chance to do anything. After the butler finished speaking, he hurried forward, leaving Baron de Cuny standing alone in the corner with a look of despair. Chapter 1275 Military Camp Number 19 After giving the letter of visit to the butler, Soldak left Dunstan Manor. Baron Armand de Cuny followed the butler with a false smile on his face, which actually looked so fake. Marquis Fred is the Speaker of the House of Representatives of the Province of Bena, and many guests visit him every day. However, not many nobles were able to meet Speaker Fred as they wished, but Soldak was a guest at Dunstan Manor. This was not as simple as Soldak saving Speaker Fred's life. He also gave Speaker Fred a second spring in his life, which may be the most important thing to Speaker Fred. Soldak did not go too far to embarrass Baron Armand de Cuny. Everyone has his own choice in life, and he only hopes that he can get enough protection from the Dunstan family, because he is likely to suffer revenge from Alenta next. Soldak knows Darcy Christie very well. She is the kind of sassy woman. Although her character has become much calmer now, she is definitely a person with a grudge. Someone who must take revenge. After walking to the gate of the manor and boarding the magic caravan waiting on the roadside, Soldak asked the coachman to take him outside the city. There are 27 military camps, large and small, outside Bena City. Ten of them are military camps prepared for lords from all over the world. Almost half of the plain portals are located in Bena City. So the lords wanted to, to conquer the plain. The lord's private army must also be brought to Bena City. In the past few years, these military camps were filled with armies of lords preparing to go out to various plains almost every month. However, since the Bena Legion was trapped in the Warsaw Plain, there have been several private armies of the great lords of the Bena province. They suffered setbacks in the Plain War. At that time, 11 wealthy families went bankrupt due to the Plain War, including the Goffaro family. However, the Goffaro family was already a wealthy family at that time. Count Gofaro just took out the last bit of his family wealth, tied it to the chariot of the Hymans family in the Bena province, and then smashed his head and blood on the battlefield. That battle became the last straw that crushed the Goffaro family. Therefore, launching a plain war. For the nobles of the Green Empire, victory means everything and failure will probably make them unable to turn over in their lifetime. Marquis Luther spared no effort to support Soldak. In addition to being optimistic about his personal abilities, he also made an in-depth analysis of the plane where he will go on this expedition. Although the unknown area of the plane he explores this time is also likely to be affected by there are some setbacks. 
but they won't pose much of a threat. At most, the legions will be able to withdraw to the south of the Thorny Mountains. And the main enemy Serdek has to face this time is the Ghost Strike Red Ants. The magic caravan was parked at the gate of the military camp, which was about 5 kilometers away from the gate in the southwest of Benna City. The military camp was built on a slope. From a distance, the military camp was surrounded by countless green giant trees. With two doors, in front of the tightly closed large iron gate was a sentry post. Two guard warriors wearing light armor stood beside the large iron gate, holding dark spears in their hands. They looked majestic. Serdak jumped off the carriage and stepped forward. The guard soldier standing at the door performed a military salute to Serdak. Serdak handed a certificate to the guard at the entrance of the military camp. Then the guard said to Serdak, Wait a moment! After saying that, he stepped into the big iron gate. There was a small stable next to the iron gate because it was blocked by the courtyard wall. It wasn't until the guard rode towards the camp that Serdak discovered it. At the stables, not long after, the officer in charge of the military camp hurried over on horseback, and the big iron gate was opened. The officer in charge looked to be middle-aged, and the leather armor on his body was not old, but it could be seen that he was well-maintained. His beard was also trimmed very neatly, and there was a hint of shrewdness in his eyes. The badge on his chest was the Viscount badge, and there was a rectangular metal nameplate next to it, with a line of imperial text engraved on it. Serdak was worried that it would be rude to stare at the badge on his chest. So he did not take a closer look at what was written. Arrow Davidson, the commander of the 19th military camp, pays homage to Count Soldak, the officer in charge said, and gave a military salute to Soldak. Soldak immediately returned a military salute, and then said, Battalion Commander Erlo Davison, I am applying to the military headquarters for a temporary military camp. If it is convenient, can you take me to visit the camp? Of course. I am very willing to serve you. Erlo. Battalion Commander Davidson smiled at Soldak. It can be seen that he is the kind of officer who often communicates and deals with people. He speaks very kindly and does not have any arrogance in him. Then Erlo. Battalion Commander Davidson took Soldak into the military camp surrounded by tree walls. Soldak also changed a horse this time and entered the military camp, passing through the tree wall passage that was nearly 20 meters long. The military camp inside came into Soldak's field of vision. In front of him was a playground covered with lawns. There was also a shooting range on the west side. On the east side was a night training ground, a wooden fence and a charging track for war horses, and a wooden horse at the end. Man, I can see that the infrastructure in this military camp is pretty good. Erlo. Battalion Commander Davidson rode up to a row of barracks. These long rows of barracks were arranged very neatly in the military camp. From the outside, Almost every barracks was locked, and there were seals on them that were almost blurry. This military camp can normally accommodate 80,000 garrison troops. It is no problem to squeeze in 100,000 troops. Erlo, Battalion Commander Davidson immediately stated what Soldak was most concerned about. This military camp was definitely big enough. Moreover, Serdak discovered that except for a guard squadron, there should be no other soldiers in the military camp. This military camp has a total of three canteens which can accommodate 30,000 people eating at the same time. There is also a stable on the north side of the night training ground, which can accommodate about 5,000 war horses. There are a total of 10 wells, but there is no fodder prepared in the military camp. If you have cavalry, it's best to transport the fodder three days before the cavalry arrives at the camp. Erlo, Battalion Commander Davidson introduced. As he spoke, he jumped off his horse nimbly, then randomly selected a barracks took out a bunch of keys from his arms and opened the door. After pushing open the door, countless dust fell from the top of his head, making Erlo. Battalion Commander Davidson's face was covered in dust. Erlo. Battalion Commander Davidson quickly took a step back, took off his helmet with some embarrassment, took out a handkerchief and wiped his face, and then explained, No one has lived here for a long time, but I will clean all the barracks in the camp before your army arrives. When the dust at the door finally cleared, Erlo, only then did Battalion Commander Davidson lead him into the barracks. Sure enough, it's like Erlo. As Battalion Commander Davidson said, the inside of the barracks is also covered with a thick layer of dust. The room is filled with wooden beds on two levels. There are 60 beds in one room, which is enough to accommodate a squadron living in the same room. Inside, Serdak reached out and grabbed the wooden bed and shook it. These wooden beds were made very solidly. 
next Erlo. Battalion Commander Davidson took Soldak to the cafeteria and restaurant again. The cafeteria was also quite complete with pots and stoves, and the long rows of wooden tables were filled with densely packed stools. These things were well kept, but they looked like they had been there for a long time. Not used. Dust everywhere. During the visit, Serdak learned that Erlo. Battalion Commander Davidson is the only officer in charge of Camp Number 19, because for nearly half a month, 50,000 soldiers from the Alliance Lord's Army will stay here. So Soldak feels it is very necessary to communicate with this Erlo. Battalion Commander Davidson builds good relationships. Walking around in a circle, Erlo. Battalion Commander Davidson invited Soldak into his office for tea. This office is in the southwest corner of the camp. It is a single wooden house with simple furniture and a fireplace on one side of the room. Battalion Commander Davidson entered the room, asked Soldak to sit down, and then started busy boiling water to make lemon tea. Finally waited for Erluo. Battalion Commander Davidson brought over two cups of hot lemon tea, and also brought over a delicate silver sugar bowl, and very politely invited Soldak to taste his tea art. Soldak took a sip, but there were no words to praise the lemon tea in his heart. So he said, It tastes good. Then Soldak took out a box. This exquisite ironwood box looked more like a tea tray. He handed the wooden box to Erluo. Battalion Commander Davidson then said, This is the first time we met. We came in a hurry. I only prepared this gift. Erlo. Battalion Commander Davidson did not expect that Serdak would prepare a gift for him. And he was surprised but also looked happy. In terms of title, Serdak is at least Gorlo. Battalion Commander Davidson is first class. And Serdak is a plain lord. So there is no need to give him gifts anyway. So Erlo. Battalion Commander Davidson felt a little uneasy at this time and hesitated whether to accept the gift. My Alliance Lord Army will be stationed here for at least half a month. I would like to ask Battalion Commander Davidson to take more care of it then. Serdak said and stuffed the wooden box into Erlu. In the hands of Battalion Commander Davidson, according to the custom of Bena City, gifts are always opened in person. So Erlo. Battalion Commander Davidson also said, That's what I should do while opening the exquisite iron and wood box. There was a piece of velvet in the box, and on the velvet were ten colorful magic crystals, the four elements of water, fire, wind and earth. Magic crystals have different colors, but their value is the same. Erlo, Battalion Commander Davidson. It seems that he has never received such a valuable gift in his life. He is guarding an almost empty military camp here. He is almost forgotten by the people in the military headquarters. Now there is a lord holding the military headquarters. He borrowed his voucher from the military camp and actually gave him a valuable gift upon meeting him. Erlo. Battalion Commander Davidson said to Soldak in surprise. Your Majesty, this gift is too valuable. I'm also worried that those soldiers from the Gombu Plain are new here. They may not be accustomed to the local environment here in Bena City. Many places need the care of Battalion Commander Davidson, Serdak said frankly. When it comes to management in the camp, Battalion Commander Davidson began to talk. I think the causes of acclimatization are probably the following. Food, drinking water, mosquitoes, and local climate. I think if Lord Earl's Alliance Lord Army has a trade group accompanying the army, there will be no problem with food. I will know the other three items. Ensure that the soldiers have access to the cleanest water source. It is midsummer now, and there are peppermint grasses everywhere on the back mountain that can kill mosquitoes. As long as you collect some every day and put them in the barracks you can effectively drive away mosquitoes. The climate is hot now, so you just need to pay more attention. It's good to prevent heat stroke. Chapter 1276 Happy Cooperation Perhaps it was because of this gift that made Battalion Commander Davidson a little excited. In short, he talked a lot in front of Soldak, and in the end, he felt that accepting 10 magic crystals like this was bound to show his value. His character is somewhat rigid. He has served in the military camp for many years and has recognized the law of Whatever you give will be rewarded. After drinking two cups of lemon tea, Soldak saw the buildings and various military facilities at Camp Number 19 and felt quite satisfied. He originally thought that when the Alliance Lord Army entered the camp, Battalion Commander Davidson could tell the soldiers they have fully opened the camp, including the shooting range and the night training ground. This magic crystal is regarded as one month's venue rental fee. You must know that Serdak's 50,000 Lord Army may have to live here for more than half a month. From the perspective of accommodation fees alone, 10 magic crystals are really nothing. But when he delivered these 10 magic crystals to Battalion Commander Davidson, 
It inevitably made Battalion Commander Davidson think a little too much. Why am I worth so many magic crystals? Battalion Commander Davidson said so many words to Soldak. But he was actually thinking about one thing over and over again in his heart. And Soldak didn't make any other requests before leaving. Just when Soldak was about to leave the camp on horseback, Battalion Commander Davidson stood in front of the horse and couldn't help but said to Soldak, Your Majesty, there are some places in Camp Number 19 that you haven't seen. If, if you have time, I would like to ask you to visit again. Serdak reigned in the horse. Although he was a little surprised, he still agreed. Okay, it just so happens that there is nothing else to do today. Then please come with me. Battalion Commander Davidson got on his horse and led Serdak to the arched material warehouses on the easternmost side of the military camp. Previously, Battalion Commander Davidson introduced to Serdak that these were 400-year-old warehouses. There is not much else to say about the meter-long material warehouse. At that time, when I opened the door of a warehouse, it was also empty inside, with almost nothing else except dust. There are three warehouses left, and Battalion Commander Davidson only said that two of them contained supplies for Camp Number 19 and cannot be opened to the public for the time being. Now, Battalion Commander Davidson brought Soldak to the front of the two warehouses. There were guards guarding the doors which obviously meant that there were some supplies in the warehouses. Battalion Commander Davidson walked over and pushed away the two guards. He took out a bunch of keys from his arms and opened the warehouse door. With a clatter, the thick wooden door of the warehouse was pushed open by Battalion Commander Davidson alone. The hinges of the door had not been greased for a long time, and it made an uncomfortable creaking sound when it was opened. Battalion Commander Davidson and Soldak walked into the warehouse. Soldak found that in addition to being covered with dust, there were indeed many supplies covered with tarpaulin. Battalion Commander Davidson jumped on a pile of wooden boxes and lifted off a large piece of dust-proof tarpaulin, revealing the large wooden boxes stacked inside. He introduced to Soldak. These supplies were left behind by some Lord's armies after they conquered the plain. Some of the supplies were left here because the Lord's army won and the items left in the garrison camp were unwilling to be taken away. The army was defeated in the plain. The whole army was destroyed. And even the people who returned to the garrison camp to collect the remaining supplies did not survive. Camp number 19 has been idle in recent years. And these supplies have been there for several years. Probably the families of those lords don't know that there are still so many supplies here. He smiled at Serdak and then said, Uh-huh. Earl Serdak, since you are going to the Bell and Plain, you can take away whatever you need here. But I only have one condition. You need to pay a little storage fee for any supplies you take away, which can be regarded as a benefit I seek for the soldiers guarding the number 19 garrison camp. Soldak casually opened a corner of the tarpaulin, and there was another neat wooden box inside. Are you just keeping these supplies? Serdak asked casually. Battalion Commander Davidson grinned, with a hint of cunning in his eyes, and said frankly, How can we not? We would have sold out all the things we could sell. Otherwise, we would have bought even the houses in the city with a salary from the military. I can't afford it. Let alone get a wife or something. The rest of this is not what the businessmen outside can afford. And even if I was given a pardon, I wouldn't dare to sell it. Hearing what Battalion Commander Davidson said, Soldak was a little curious about what supplies were inside the wooden box. Soldak completely opened up a tarpaulin. At this time, Battalion Commander Davidson also found a pry bar from the side of the wooden box. With a stick, Serdak gave up and used the broadsword at his waist to cut open the wooden box. As the lid of the wooden box was opened by the crowbar, there were actually some war machines wrapped in oil paper. Serdak opened the oil paper wrapped on it, revealing a crossbow arm covered with fine magic runes. Is this a magic bed crossbow? Serdak asked with his eyes widened. Battalion Commander Davidson nodded and added, There are also magic catapults over there, which are relatively bulky. These things are not only controlled goods in Bena province but also in the Green Empire. No businessman dares to sell them. These materials are traded in the market. So they remain here. Can I take these away? Serdak asked curiously. Of course. You are going to participate in the playing war. And you are qualified to move these materials anywhere. Don't worry about their ownership. After you transport them, there will also be a corresponding entry and exit record here to prove these you brought the supplies in. And we also received a storage fee. Battalion Commander Davidson said to Soldak. Soldak lowered his head and considered it for a moment, then stretched out his hand and smiled at Battalion Commander Davidson and said, Then I wish us a happy cooperation this time. Battalion Commander Davidson stretched out his hand very happily 
and clasped his hands tightly. Happy to work with. Soldek did not hide this from Marquis Luther. And he also asked Marquis Luther whether he should take these and use supplies. The study room was brightly lit. And Soldek sat on the sofa and concentrated on eating the exquisite refreshments in front of him. Marquis Luther thought for a while, raised his head, and said to Soldek, Since the other party is going to give these supplies to you, then you should take them generously. I think he probably doesn't want to cause trouble for himself. And even if there is trouble, it will not affect you. I will help you out in the military department. Trouble. It will only be for the number 19 military camp. So if there are any supplies in there that your lord's army needs, you might as well move them all, and I'll help you get a pass. Soldak swallowed the cake in his mouth and nodded in agreement. Okay. I understand. Although this time you went to the Belland Plain to open up unknown areas. Today is different from the past. Speaking of which, I hope you can develop the Ganbu Plain well. You know what I mean? Right? Marquis Luther said and waved. He waved his hand and asked the butler to pour Soldak another cup of milk tea. Serdak knew the meaning of Marquis Luther's words. It was said that the child in Hathaway's belly would be the successor of the Ganbu Plain. So Marquis Luther hoped that Serdak could be in the plane. In terms of development, we can invest more energy. Serdak smiled and said, I understand. And I already have a comprehensive plan to develop the Ganbu plane. Even if I am not in Ruth City at the moment, this development plan will continue. Before the end of the year, I will probably be able to restore the economic level of Ganbu plane to its pre-war state. Marquis Luther said doubtfully, I have heard about some of the new policies you implemented in Makuso. And I also know that last year you implemented almost a full-scale tax-free policy. I have been worried that your city hall in the Ganbu Plain will collapse because of this. But now it seems that Makuso's development momentum is better than what I saw. Can you be more specific? Soldak took up the topic and said, Although it is tax-free, it also attracted a large number of business groups. The business groups entered Makuso, which not only drove the local economy, but also stimulated the real estate prices of the city's street shops. In fact, after Makuso City fell into ruins, the city hall was the largest owner of the street shops in Makuso City. We sold or rented these shops to businessmen, and the income was more than the previous annual tax revenue. I have never governed a city, and I don't understand much of what you are talking about. But it seems that the results should be pretty good. All of Marquis Luther's achievements in his life have been in the army, and he is not proficient in city management. Otherwise, he would not have let Earl Lake Cushing govern Luther City. Serdak was still somewhat proud of the development of Makuso City. At this time, he said, from the current perspective, the results are still very good, and now the inner city has been restored. In the past, there was a large area outside the Makuso City wall. Slums. These slums are now being systematically transformed. And I also plan to build a wall outside the slums to expand all the slums around Makuso. Looking at the young knight talking eloquently in front of him, Marquis Luther seemed to see his young self continuing to. I thought he was just a knight with the power of the holy light, but I didn't expect that he did a very good job after becoming a commander. I thought that after he became the commander, he could help him get a piece of territory in the Belan Plain and make him a noble lord, but I didn't expect that he would actually go to the Ganbu Plain and take the opportunity to occupy the entire plain. I thought that as a plain lord, he would be hindered by these daily chores but I didn't expect that the two connected cities he ruled were developing rapidly. And on the other hand, he actually had the energy to advance into the Belan Plain. It seems that Soldak can bring some surprises to Marquis Luther every time. Chapter 1277 Pregnancy The 50,000 Alliance Lord's Army from the Ganbu Plain arrived in Benna City on the third day of August. Military mobilizations of this scale seemed to be commonplace in Benna City and did not cause any splash in Benna City. The endless plain wars for many years have filled the hearts of many Bena people with anti-war sentiments. However, these wars are basically invasions of a racial nature, and the Bena people are not allowed to retreat in any way. Therefore, troops still gather in Bena every year, city, and then enter other subplanes through various portals. It's just that in recent years, the size and number of the Lord's armies that went out to the plains are far less than before. Many noble lords lost their battles in the plains one after another which led to the bankruptcy of their families, and finally quietly disappeared from the upper-class society. But few lords can rise quickly due to the Plain War, and the current environment of the entire Green Empire is very bad. The Plain War that broke out between the main legions in various provinces of the Empire, and the Dark Legions of the Abyss forces almost showed a complete defeat. 
I heard that Emperor Charles of the Imperial Capital is planning to move the North Wind Legion stationed on the south bank of the Bin Ma River in the north, and the South Wind Legion stationed on the sea wall of Heiyinzi City, to seal the Demon Passage in the Walla Valley of the Kinda Plain. The Emo Legion mobilized some of its elite troops to concentrate on the rich plains where the war was most intense. Striving to win several victories in a short period of time, and enhance the people of the Green Empire's confidence in the various knights. The Warsaw Plain was originally the back garden of the Busman family. The rich products of the Warsaw Plain have almost pushed the Busman family to the top three of the empire's wealthy nobles in the past few decades. This year happened to be the time when the Evil Ghost Legion entered the Warsaw Plain. In the seventh year of this war, the Busman family has almost been drained of all its wealth in this protracted plain war. This also caused the Bena Legion to be trapped in the quagmire of the war in the Warsaw Plain. If we say two years ago, if Duke Newman could decisively abandon Handenar County in the Warsaw Plain and resolutely lead the Legion to evacuate the Warsaw Plain, he would still be able to escape intact. Possibility. Then at this time, the Bena Legion has no chance of escaping unscathed. The soldiers stationed in Handenar County can only withdraw in batches after the reinforcements from Bena Province arrive. Speaking of which, had it not been for Duke Newman's wrong decision, the province of Bena would probably have been one of the most comfortable provinces among the 97 provinces of the Green Empire. Now the lords of the province of Bena are most worried. The worst thing is that the Dark Legion will suddenly capture a small plane in the Bena province. Under this situation, the noble lords will almost always hold the lord's army in their hands. Even if they spend money to maintain it in their own private territories, they will not easily go out to conquer various plains. One wrong step, and the army may fall into an irreversible situation. The Gombu Plain owned by Serdak is a fully occupied small plain. This kind of plain can more easily control foreign invasion. And it has no strategic significance. So Serdak will mobilize new players from the Gombu Plain. Form a legion and enter the Belan Plain to open up new territory. The Alliance Lord Army of the Gombu Plain will rest in Bena City for about a week. And then officially enter Belan through the portal in the back garden of the Duke's mansion. Serdak got the portal pass on the second day after arriving in Bena City. However, Considering that the Alliance Lord Army has been working hard for nearly a month, the soldiers need to rest for a while, recover their physical strength, adjust their mood, and enter Belen. After the plane, there will no longer be a military camp like Number 19. Gulidam had not seen Serdak for more than a month. This time he rushed to Camp 19 with a large army, grabbed Serdak, and began to talk about him. From what I saw on the road, I could tell that the ogre enjoyed this kind of hiking. During this time, Soldak has been in the warehouse of the number 19 garrison camp, secretly counting the war materials inside. Battalion Commander Davidson was very trustworthy in this matter. It is estimated that the 10 magic crystals played a huge role. Serdak actually counted 147 magic bed crossbows and 6 magic bed crossbows in the two warehouses. If Serdak paid for 10 mobile catapults at the Imperial Army Workshop, these magical weapons would cost Serdak at least 20,000 magic crystals. Now Soldak only needs to spend a management fee and prepare three sets of magic pattern structures for Battalion Commander Davidson of the 19th Garrison Camp. These will cost Soldak almost 500 magic crystals. Then I saw Battalion Commander Davidson and two other warehouse managers stamping a red seal on a parchment warehouse entry list. This was a certificate proving that Serdak transported these ordnance to Garrison Camp Number 19. The inventory list will be issued when the Alliance Lord Army leaves the military camp and then a corresponding inventory list will be issued. In this way, the magic bed crossbow, which originally cost more than 100 magic crystals, is shelved in the number 19 military camp. After a few years, it became the private property of Count Soldak. Although these magic bed crossbows are very valuable, as Battalion Commander Davidson said, they are military-controlled materials. Only big lords with armies are eligible to purchase them. The way to purchase them is to submit an application to the military department and then be approved by the Bena Military Department. Agreed to deploy. In fact, the magic bed crossbows in Duodan Town were deployed by the Military Department. However, there are not many matching giant crossbow arrows and flints in the warehouse. Serdak learned from the merchants, who accompanied the army, that a cheap magic giant crossbow was sold in the Imperial Capital. The cost was only 10 times more expensive than ordinary giant crossbows. However, the power of those magic crossbows was also extraordinary. It was said that armor-piercing arrows could kill the heavily armed Nakma warriors shot them all through. He remembered that there were also some magic crossbows in the supply warehouse in Duodin town. Every time one was shot, it was like throwing out a handful of gold coins. 
An ordinary giant crossbow arrow deployed by the military department costs 5 silver coins each. If it is only 10 times more expensive, that means 50 silver coins each. One gold coin can buy two magic crossbow arrows. It is really cheaper in total. Serdak hoped that the merchant group accompanying the army could rush to the imperial capital immediately and purchase a batch of these magic arrows. In this case, when the Alliance Lord army faces the ghost pattern male ants that are like heavy trucks, they will have the confidence to confront them head-on. Instead of blindly relying on the second-level warriors to rush into the formation and kill them, everything is for plain war. The investment is still worth it. On the evening of August 9th, 50,000 Gampo Plain Alliance Lord's troops officially entered Wilk City in the Belan Plain through the portal in the back garden of the Duke's Mansion in Bina Province. Also entering by Lin's Plain was a huge military merchant group. This time they entered the Belan Plain with the military merchant group and did not bring any horses with them. These ancient Bolai horses pulled the four-wheeled truck to the gate of the back garden of Bina City and were taken out of the city again by the grooms arranged by the merchants. Almost all of the baggage trucks parked outside the Duke's palace were pushed through the portal manually by Lord Army soldiers. The main reason is that horses entering the Belan Plain need to pay a tax of 10% of the horse's own value. In addition, there are many ranches in the White Forest Plain. If a four-wheeled truck enters Wilk City, it is more cost-effective to buy ancient Bolai horses locally than to bring horses from Bina Province into the White Forest Plain. Of course, the prerequisite for doing this is that the merchants must obtain the support of Commander Serdek. What the merchants didn't expect was that the merchants only submitted a briefing to Serdek. And Commander Serdak readily agreed without even talking about the benefits. It is said that Serdak's original words were support all legal tax avoidance by the military merchant groups in the Gombu Plain. Lance and his magician friends arrived in Bena City on August 10th. This time, the Halensa City Magic Guild sent a total of 15 first-turn fire magicians. And the Lut City Magic Guild came. With the support of 13 young magicians, the Alliance Lord Army has now formed a 28-member magician investigation team. On the day they arrived in Bena City, a group of magicians headed by Lance entered the Belan Plain through the portal. Serdak passed through the Void Gate and came to the Lava Mine. In this Lava Mine, Aphrodite owned a residence excavated by a cobalt slave. Only when he came here this time did he find that the residence was actually furnished with some simple furniture. Aphrodite was lying on a wicker chair by the lava pool, still looking extremely lazy. She did not tie up her hair but let her long black and purple hair hang down like a waterfall, revealing the two sharp tips on her head. Of devil horns, she was wearing a loose black dress. When she saw Serdak walking out of the void gate, she just turned her head and smiled at him. Are you organizing such a large-scale army this time to attack the Dark Worm Valley in the north? Aphrodite asked calmly. Soldak sat down next to her and agreed. Yes, I need you to help me on this expedition. Even now. I'm still not sure that I can deal with the queen ant in the Worm Valley. Serdak stretched out his hand and pinched Aphrodite's smooth face. When he was about to lift Aphrodite's skirt, he kissed her very naturally. Unexpectedly, Aphrodite blocked Serdak's mouth with one hand and held down the hand lifting the skirt with the other hand. She protested to Serdak with a slightly red cheek. Stop quickly. Don't mess around. Touch it. Taking advantage of the moment when Serdak paused, Aphrodite stood up slightly put her purple lips to Serdak's ear, panted and whispered to him, You know? Duck. I'm pregnant too. Chapter 1278 Hello by Lin. In Pudong Mountain, the distinction between day and night is not so clear. The sky is filled with thick gray clouds all year round, and the sun cannot shine through the clouds. The air was filled with gray volcanic ash, like patches of goose feather snow, falling one after another. The closer you get to Pudu Mountain, the more volcanic ash will be flying in the air. Of course, it's not every day that volcanic ash falls. Half of the days, only ash clouds can be seen in the sky. The main peak of Pustule Mountain is burning with flames all year round. The main peak is not a huge circular lava pool. It is more like a group of peaks crowded together. There are countless red pustules on the top of each peak, and these hot magma are contained in them. Therefore, the ash cloud on the top of the mountain is reflected red by the crater. Serdak rarely had the opportunity to go out and walk with Aphrodite. It was rare that there was no volcanic ash falling all over the sky. In the distance, a ring of light appeared on the horizon. The top of the peak was like a brilliant neon, making this place always in a state of dusk. Aphrodite climbed to a cliff on the mountainside. Below the cliff was a flowing river of lava. The pungent smell of sulfur filled the air, making Serdak's throat hurt. 
the edges of the viscous magma continue to solidify into black rock sh. L. Only the lava in the central area flows downward like molten iron. Finding a rock to sit down on. Serdak was still in a difficult mood. This is definitely not the union of two humans with different skin colors. In the end, a beautiful little hybrid will be born. This is an interracial union of humans and demons. It is said that children born from the union of humans and elves will become half-elves. Children born from the union of humans and orcs will become half-orcs. And children born from the union of humans and Nanda will become sea monsters living on sparsely populated islands. Some sea monsters are strange. Although extremely ugly, some sirens are extremely beautiful. Sardak still didn't know what the child would look like after the union of humans and demons. A little devil with devil horns on his head, and a pair of wings behind him flashed in his mind. He shook his head vigorously, throwing the image of that hateful little devil away from his mind. What will our children be like in the future? Sardak looked at the sulfur mining camp in the distance with some confusion. There are more than 400 cobalt slaves left here, who are still diligently looking for sulfur by the lava river. However, since all the sulfur nearby has been mined, they have to go further and climb halfway up the mountain to find the sulfur. Search for sulfur next to rivers flowing with hot lava. In recent months, the output of the sulfur mine has been much lower than before. But Serdak has no plans to develop the hidden sulfur mine yet. Aphrodite narrowed her eyes and pursed her lips to smile. She found that Serdak was so funny. She was worried to death. But she was taking care of her own emotions and did not want to show her inner anxiety. Standing there thinking about the future, it really makes people want to rush up and punch him a few times. I hope he can be different from you. You have your advantages, such as kindness, bravery, and sincerity. These advantages indeed make you excellent. But you are the kind of person who is unwilling to fight for yourself. You can only carry a heavy load. You know how to move forward. The path you take is being pushed step by step from behind. I hope he is not like you. He has a pure demon bloodline and is destined to be stronger than you. I hope he will follow his true heart. To chase your dreams. It is best to look more like me. Not necessarily have wings. But it is best to inherit my devil horns. Aphrodite said with a smile. Her smile was lazy and slightly charming. When she wanted to smile. The corners of her mouth were always slightly raised. And her eyes were a little seductive. Aphrodite continued. Did you know? Dak. All the magic power of the demon warrior comes from the two sharp horns on the top of his head. If he has devil horns on his head from the moment he is born, then he will be born a wonderful magician. Serdak suddenly thought of one thing. That is, once his and Aphrodite's child becomes a second level powerhouse, will he side with humans or demons on the battlefield? Thinking of this, Serdak sighed softly and said, I hope he can be more ordinary. But when I thought that it was my child after all, the joy that surged out of the anxiety slowly took over my whole heart. I hope he won't have to go to big battlefields to fight regularly like me in the future. Saldak said slowly. Later, Serdak had a brief meeting with the Red Dragon Izer. When Israel saw Serdak, he complained to him. Serdak was usually so busy that it was becoming more and more difficult to meet him. Life in the Estander Plain was also very boring. It had always been thinking recently. She would have the urge to challenge the big demon in another volcanic territory. If she could drive that big demon away... She would have a lair full of lava and sulfur. Serdak asked it if it had fully mastered the 33 rune languages. Israel hesitated for a long time before giving up the impulsive idea of provoking the big devil. Every time Serdak sees Izer, he can feel the power in his body growing like a volcano. Compared with Izer, Serdak's growth and strength is as slow as it's a snail crawling. Dak, when will you have enough power to kill everyone in Istanbul with me? I can't wait. Every time Israel saw Serdak, she would complain to him like this. I feel that I have made great progress recently. Whether it is the control of power or the growth of mental power, it is already very good. Only when I come to you will I be hit hard. You are a dog with bloodline talent, red dragon, and you have been accumulating power for nearly 800 years. So once you find the right way to advance, your strength will increase by leaps and bounds. Sardak explained to Eser, and then said, But I am different. Ah. I need to lay a solid foundation step by step before I can continue to move forward. The huge head of the red dragon was close to Serdek. And the dark red scales on its cheeks exuded magnificent colors. Every time he breathed, he would exhale a scorching hot air with a sulfurous smell. A huge eye fell on Soldak. When he spoke, the entire treasure chamber shook slightly. I thought about it. There is only a constant. 
Only by fighting can you improve quickly. What did you say just now? Are you planning to go to the Belan Plain to expand territory? Serdak nodded. That's a good idea. Be bolder and take bigger steps. Well, if you need any help, just come to me. Israel said generously to Serdak. After the Alliance Lords of the Gampo Plain arrived in Wilk City, they were completely different from the indifference of the people in Betta City. Almost the entire Wilkes was shocked. In recent years, everyone seems to know that the Belan Plain is worthy of development. This plain is rich and huge. One or two more cities need to be built outside Wilkes City to form a situation of outward expansion. However, it has taken so long it seems that the plain lords will only huddle in Wilkes City. They don't even station in the occupied areas in the north and south. Even the troops stationed in various small towns are usually sent. People seem to have become accustomed to this kind of life. But when the lords of the Ganbu Plain Alliance entered Wilkes City, the residents here suddenly realized that the lords in the plain territory were simply extremely weak, and everyone began to complain crazily about these locals. Lords! Mocked them as a group of babies who could only rest on women's breasts and suck milk, and will never grow up. Then they talked about the air control of the Belan Plain, which is still in the hands of the Pingyu family. The local noble lords never expected that they would be severely scolded and ridiculed by the residents of Wilk City because of the arrival of the Alliance Lord Army from the Ganbu Plain. But when they learned that the commander of this army of lords was Count Soldek, the lords who wanted to say some cruel words suddenly stopped. Although the noble lords of Wilk City have done nothing, they are not a group of fools. The Luther Legion currently controls the northern occupied area of the Belan Plain. Count Soldek, who has a heavy army, is not they can discuss it casually. Of course, Serdak did not want to cause too much dissatisfaction among the local noble lords. So the Alliance Lord's army moved north along the river almost the next day. The merchants accompanying the army were frantically shopping for goods at the Wilk City Horse Market. They purchased nearly 3,000 ancient horses alone. And all the meat needed by the Lord's army this time will be purchased from local ranches. The 50,000 Lord army needs to consume more than 200 yellow sheep every day. A large amount of military supplies are also flowing into the Belan Plain. Since military supplies are controlled by the military department, these do not need to pay the portal customs duties. Along the way, I met some ranchers who would always drive a large group of yellow sheep, load their trucks with cheese and beef jerky, and sell them in front of the temporary camp where the army was stationed. The military camp will basically not receive these ranchers. These transactions are basically handled by the military merchant groups, since they are willing to follow them all the way to solve the logistics and transportation problems for the Lord Army. Serdak also allows them to do so within a reasonable range. Make a fortune. On the third day after arriving in the Belan Plain, Soldak joined Andrew, who came from Doden Town, to pick him up. Andrew came over this time with a team of 240 constructed knights, which was also the biggest trump card in Soldak's hand. These constructed knights rode magic patterned war horses. Each war horse was covered with thick hard insect armor. The sharp spikes on the insect armor looked particularly ferocious. The group of knights looked majestic. When the Alliance Lord Army saw these construct knights coming and going like the wind, the warriors at the front immediately raised their weapons and cheered. Chapter 1279 Dark Priestess Andrew wears a black iron helmet with a horn on his head, and the helmet's mask looks like the face of a demon. He is wearing a second-turn magic pattern structure, with two battle axes on his back. The ancient bolai horse underneath is covered in hard armor, and the two front legs of the war horse have magnificent magic patterns. While running, Dark red ripples would appear every time the war horse's front hooves hit the ground. The powerful aura blooming from the second level strongman mixed with the strong murderous intention accumulated in him, making Andrew look extremely arrogant. The hundreds of construct knights behind Andrew are also majestic, wearing uniform magic pattern constructs, and their helmets all have visors, making this group of construct knights even more mysterious. Andrew came to the front of Serdak, took off his helmet, and hung it on the saddle. He stretched out his hand and held it with Serdak. The two leaned forward and patted each other's shoulders. The army did not stop because of the arrival of Andrew and the constructed knights, and still marched toward Doden town in a mighty manner. Serdak and Andrew followed the army. A group of officers from the Lord's army took the opportunity to gather over. Everyone walked and chatted on horseback. Apparently, they were confident in the victory of this battle because they saw Serdak's construct knight. Everyone was in high spirits and their tone became extremely relaxed when chatting. Some of the officers of these lords' armies were sent by the local lords of the Ganbu Plain, and some were officers of the 13 lords' armies 
that jointly carved up the northern part of the Gonbu Plain with Serdek. Their understanding of Serdek. Limited to the battlefield of the Gonbu Plain. Knowing that there is a big shot standing behind him. Who has been fully supporting him. Now that I see that Serdak has a well-equipped team of constructed knights. I realize that Serdak's true strength is not limited to what they know. Although Serdak is also a second-level powerhouse. Few people around him pay attention to this. They only care more about his noble title. Is he a baron? This count or an earl? But when everyone saw Andrew. They could tell at a glance that he was a powerful second-level man with unabashed envy in his eyes. The two rode side by side, chatting like old friends. Boss, I didn't expect you to return to the Belan Plain with such a huge army so quickly. I thought you would be quiet for a while, Andrew said with a smile to Serdak. Serdak laughed and said, I also want to develop Ruth City and the Gonbu Plain. But now no matter what I do, I need money. So I plan to expand further north and make another fortune by the way. Andrew's eyes lit up. He stared at Soldak and asked him, Are you going to attack the Ghost Strike Red Ants in the Dark Worm Valley? In fact, you should wait until winter before coming here. Otherwise, how can we deal with the poisonous fog swamp in this season? Actually, we are not going to attack the Dark Worm Valley right away, Soldak said. Before solving the Dark Worm Valley, I plan to expand eastward first and incorporate the Three Rivers Plain into my Lord Territory. The warhorse beneath him snorted dissatisfiedly. Only then did Andrew realize that he was a little excited. After calming down a little, he said excitedly, This is a good idea. Recently, our cavalry has been heading east along the hills and mountains. Every patrol will be at the edge of the Three Rivers Plain. Going full circle. Speaking of it, there are many indigenous warriors in the cavalry battalion now. And they know the Three Rivers Plains better. Then Andrew felt that just conquering the Three Rivers Plain seemed a bit unsatisfying. And asked Serdak tentatively, Aren't you going to Anya Swamp? Serdak gently stroked the mane on the war horse's neck. Shook his head and said, Forget it this time. We must give those indigenous tribes who are unwilling to join the Green Empire a living space. Andrew said to Soldak with a hopeful look on his face. Boss, you must let me be the leader of the Vanguard group this time. If I don't go out and do some activities, I feel like my body is going to get rusty. Serdak turned his head towards the Construct Knight and asked curiously, Why didn't you see Samira and Gary Decker? Andrew didn't even raise his head and said casually, They have to accompany Selena on the magic caravan so they are walking a little slowly. You may not know that believers of the Twin Goddess Temple in Duodan Town are now all over Belan, throughout the northern region of the plain. Selina, as the high priest of the Dark Temple, is followed by a large group of believers every time she travels. Every time they go to a town, they will hold a ceremony, so they have to walk slower. Hearing that the followers of the Twin Goddess Temple had spread to the entire northern region of the Belan Plain, Serdak was very surprised and asked, has the Twin Goddess Temple developed so fast in recent times? Speaking of this, Andrew said to Soldak again. At the beginning, not many people knew them. So Nika would often take a group of maids with some knowledge of first aid to go to other towns to treat some patients. Gradually, more and more people came to them for treatment. They were priests in the temple. And gradually the entire northern region knew that there was a temple of two goddesses in Doden Town. And the number of believers increased from that time. Serdak did not expect that they would be so bold and expand the Twin Goddess Temple outwards. Listen to what you said. Although it was Nika who took the maids out to treat illnesses and save people, it seems that the Temple of the Night Goddess is more popular. Serdak asked with some confusion. Andrew nodded again and said with a smile. Of course, the believers developed by the Dawn Temple correspond to the Imperial immigrants from the northern occupied areas, while the believers developed by the Dark Temple are local Aborigines. In terms of number, the local aborigines are obviously more. And they are actually more need help. The two of them were walking and chatting. Vast grassland. The war horse is running wantonly. Under the blue sky. The horses seem to be chasing the distant clouds. I have long heard that there are large pastures in the Belan Plain. But the ancient Bolai horses here are basically supplied directly to the great lords of the Bena province. So the war horses of the Belan Plain are not famous in the Bena province. The ride from Wilk City to Doden took seven days. But the 50,000 alliance lords brought by Serdak were almost all infantry. The legion's large army needed to walk to Doden Town. Even if all the baggage was loaded on the carriage and the infantry advanced lightly. It would still take about 20 days. Time to reach the destination. When the army passed through some ranches. Serdak needed to communicate with the local noble lords in advance. 
But this was just a formality. But no lord would confront Serdak at this time. Even if he didn't want to use the road, he would hold his nose and smile. There's no other reason than this. I can't afford to offend him. No matter which small town they pass along the way, the commanders in the local garrison camps will personally greet Serdak at the intersection. They must chat with Serdak for a few words. And then Serdak will have the opportunity to start his journey again. The commanders are all officers of the Luther Legion. Although their immediate boss is the great swordsman Chester. They also know the identity of Serdak very well. They usually have no chance to contact him. Of course, they need to be in Serdak at this time. He looked familiar in front of Ku. Along the way, Serdak also met some caravans and some scattered adventure groups rushing to Doden Town. It must be said that some people are born with a sensitive sense of smell. Until the scouts in front came back to report that they saw a large group of aborigines coming towards this direction in a mighty convoy. After arriving for only half a day, Serdak saw Selena's gorgeous magic caravan in Doden Town, followed by five armed thunder rhinoceros that looked like small hills. Samira and Gary Decker. The two of you were standing on the platform behind Thunder Rhinoceros. Seeing Serdak riding a horse in the front from a distance, the long-legged Gary Decker couldn't help but jump onto the arrow slot of the magic bed crossbow and wave to Serdak from a distance. A large group of aboriginal herdsmen on the grassland followed the convoy on horseback. The vast crowd seemed to number at least several thousand people. Behind the group there were people driving the sheep. The soldiers of the Alliance Lord Army were surprised enough when they saw the construct knights under Serdak arriving a few days ago. Now they saw thousands of people walking straight over. And they were even more surprised when Serdak came. How powerful is the Bailin plane? Seeing that the two teams were about to collide a few hundred meters away, Soldak raised his hand first to stop the 50,000 strong army. The indigenous herdsmen on Selena's side also stopped one after another. Only a magic caravan continued to drive forward for a while and stopped on the grass between the army and the indigenous people. Samira and Gary Decker were also riding in the Thunder Rhinoceros. Selena walked out of the magic caravan and boarded the Thunder Rhinoceros with a solemn expression under the watchful eyes of Soldak. Back, the aborigines came over one after another. They gathered around the high platform and sat on the ground, as if they were preparing to eat or to listen quietly. Selena stood on the platform behind Thunder Rhino. Her eyes fell on Soldak's face through the crowd. She took a deep look at him and then raised a fur cane in her hand. The aborigines gathered around Thunder Rhino suddenly cheered and then worshipped. Chapter 1280A Speech Serdak rode his horse and looked up at Selena on the Thunder Rhinoceros back platform. She wore a black robe with seven magnificent gems inlaid on the neckline. The robe was embroidered with complicated dark patterns with golden threads. She held a cedar scepter in her hand. The moment she raised the cane, a wave of energy was released all over her body. An aura so powerful that it makes people worship. Countless aboriginal herdsmen gathered spontaneously around the Thunder Rhinoceros. They didn't even pay attention to the troops nearby, as if they were holding a grassland rally. Everyone was waiting quietly for Selena to give a speech, with infinite piety flowing in their eyes. Serdak did not expect that in just over a year, so many followers of the Dark Goddess would develop in the occupied area in the northern part of the Belan Plain, especially since this area was also occupied by the Green Empire. Before the Statue of Liberty abandoned the Imperial people, there were almost no pagans in the Green Empire. Now many faiths have begun to appear in the Green Empire. But the people of the Empire have deep respect for the Statue of Liberty. So many people are naturally repulsive to other faiths. Even if they are abandoned by the Statue of Liberty, they will comfort themselves like this. The goddess must be trapped, looking for a place. The oracle cannot be transmitted to the Roland continent for the time being. Therefore, it is very difficult to develop other temples and beliefs in the Green Empire. But at this moment, something else appeared in Serdak's eyes. These aboriginal herdsmen had begun to gradually accept the dark goddess. Selena stood on the platform holding a scepter in her hand. Although her voice was not loud, her voice seemed to be transmitted to every corner of the pasture. Her voice was soft, like a lover whispering in her ear. When we stand in the sun, everything in our eyes is just an illusion woven by light and shadow. Only when darkness comes, will those illusions and lies turn into an endless night. The messenger of darkness can lead you to conquer those nightmares, and let you see the truest origin of this world. The goddess of liberty has abandoned green. This place can no longer be called a free country. The original illusions and illusions are stripped away in the light and shadow. But what is certain is that the darkness is still there. Look, the official oracle of the dark goddess. That's why we stood in front of you in your most difficult days, and led you to keep moving forward. 
we are constantly looking for ways to change all the inequalities here. Now, when we are hesitant about the road ahead, the dark goddess finally sent down the oracle. The goddess said to me, he is the most trustworthy person for you. He came from Hellanza City in the Bena province. By Lin's Duodan town is not just for the beast tide that only breaks out once every 10 years, but also hopes to help you escape from your current life. Now, our heroes have returned to Bai Lin. Do you want to know what they want to do when they come to Bai Lin? With that said, Selina stood on the high platform, turned around and pointed at Serdek, who was standing at the forefront of the Lord's army, holding the first scepter. Just as Selina finished her last words, all the indigenous herdsmen sitting on the ground stood up and shouted to Selina. Think, Serdak felt that in the Green Empire, those who believed in gods were a group of lunatics. They became extremely crazy both in their hearts and in their bodies. Amid waves of cheers, Serdak bravely climbed onto the wooden platform on the back of the Thunder Rhinoceros. Unexpectedly, Cigna and Nika were squatting at the latter entrance of the wooden platform of Thunder Rhinoceros. Both Cigna and Nika couldn't wait. They were excited when they saw Serdak. Sir Dark pointed at Selina, who was still giving a speech on the platform and asked in a low voice to Zygna and Nika. What does Selina want to do? Zygna rolled her eyes, lay on Soldak's shoulder, and whispered into his ear. She said that she was inspired by the goddess of darkness, and led her believers to find the future of the northern area of the Belan Plain. Serdak chuckled and responded. This topic really sounds like an old bastard. Dak, you should hug me. Zygna protested softly to Soldak. Serdak quickly stretched out his hands held the two saints from the twin goddess temple in his arms and hugged them, and then said, Yes, my dear Signa. Oh, and the beautiful Nika. At this time, Zigna had time to look behind Soldak and asked, Dak, where is Sia? Where did you hide her? Serdak found a place to sit down on the platform and said, She stayed in Rith City. He is not as free as you. He has to do a lot of things for me every day. Obviously. Zygna was a little dissatisfied with Soldak's explanation. And she said, Cut. At this time, Selina had finished her part of the speech. She turned back to look at Soldak and nodded slightly to him. In full view of the public, he was unable to communicate with Selina beyond words. He could only act in accordance with her script. So Soldak strode to the front of the platform, in the occupied area in the northern part of the Belan Plain. Lord Serdak is not widely known, but many have heard of it at least when they were fighting for the territory of Invercargill Forest. He and the alchemist made a fuss in Wilk City. At this time, Soldak stood up, and as expected, someone in the audience recognized him. And then, there was a round of cheers. Serdak said loudly to the aboriginal herdsmen in the audience, I brought 500 knights from Alinsa here. I was originally ordered by the military to garrison here with the Lutheran army. However, during the garrison period, the northern border town encountered an animal tied once every ten years. Fortunately, yes, thanks to everyone's concerted efforts, we successfully withstood this beast tide. Now, I have brought 50,000 Alliance Lord troops and set foot on the land of Balan Plain again, in order to completely solve this problem. These red ant plagues. Of course, one thing that is undeniable is that when we win, part of that land will become my new territory. But for every citizen living in the northern occupied area, this battle will completely solve the disaster in Belan's northern land. And the reason why I came all the way here and led the Lord Army to do this is probably because I was guided by the knight. Yes, Soldak said loudly with an affirmative tone, and then pointed at Selina and said to countless believers in the audience, She has entered my dreams countless times. So I have this idea. The knight is guiding us and will bring decades of peace to this land. After Serdak said this, the believers surrounding Thunder Rhino cheered strongly again. Chapter 1281 Arrival in the Town A paladin praises the knight. If the glory of the Statue of Liberty is still there, the priests will probably open the door of time and space and come to Soldak, and treat him as a heretic and arrest him in the trial court. But now here is not only by Lin, but the Statue of Liberty has abandoned the followers of the Green Empire. At this time, no one cares what kind of belief you have. For the natives of the White Forest Plain, there is essentially no difference between their belief in the Goddess of Liberty the goddess of dawn, or the goddess of night. They just want to make their lives better. Now the goddess of night is spreading her teachings in this land. And he also sent down the gospel, so that believers can banish nightmares every night. Just such a little blessing can make them willing to follow the footsteps of the goddess of the night, and start to try to believe in the night. In particular, 
The believers who believe in the Dark Knight are basically the Aboriginal people in the northern occupied area of the Belan Plain. Everyone will learn from the practices of the Aboriginal people in Doden Town. Only when everyone unites can they make some joint demands to the local noble lords. For example, improving the welfare of herdsmen and improving their lives. If the local noble lords have a tough attitude and are stubborn in their thinking, the priests from the Temple of Night will come over in person and sit down and talk. No matter which world you are in, it only makes sense to speak with a hard fist. Now the high priest of the Twin Goddess Temple suddenly said that under the guidance of the Night Goddess, the hero's return would bring decades of peace to the people here. The indigenous herdsmen surrounding Thunder Rhino were almost excited. Some young aboriginal herdsmen were so excited that they rushed to the military formation of the Alliance Lord Army and expressed their willingness to join the Lord Army in public so that everyone could fight against those ferocious monsters together. This made the lords and armies of the Belan Plain look confused. The battle has not even started yet. So how could so many people be willing to join in? This is a situation that has never happened before in any plain war. When the entire Ganbu Plain was massacred by the H, L demons, people in adversity were not seen to be so brave to join in. Everyone is a little confused. Could it be that the nomads in the Belan Plain have tough folk customs? Serdak simply rejected the offer of these young aboriginal herdsmen to join the army. These aboriginal herdsmen are herdsmen from other lords' territories. If he openly recruits into his army like this, he might be sued by the noble lords of Belan Plain to the House of Representatives of Bina Province. A lawsuit may not do anything to him, but it will definitely affect his future territory expansion plans. You must know that the daily expenses of this army are an astonishing amount. Although each lord currently shares it by themselves, if the lords find that the territory development plan has no profit in the future, then this alliance lord army will soon will be scattered, and no one will trust Serdak from now on. At this time, Serdak needed a victory to give the alliance lords a little more confidence, so he could only stand up and say loudly to the young aboriginal herdsmen in front of him, Everyone, our army comes from the plain of Ganbu. We have no plans to recruit new troops in Balan for the time being. In addition, please believe in the ability of this alliance lord army. We are fully prepared and confident to invade the darkness. Insect Valley clears out ghost pattern red ants. He found a far-fetched reason to reject the enthusiastic young aboriginal herdsman. In fact, in every war, once it involves beliefs and people's aspirations, you will see some crazy supporters. Selena's reception involved a little bit of faith. Of course, she did this to once again expand the influence of the Temple of Night in the northern occupied area and to promote it through Serdak's legion. Of course, Selena was also severely punished by Suldak the Knight. Because once this kind of thing is done too much, the Lord Army of Ganbu Plain may put on the cloak of the Goddess of the Night, which is definitely not what he wants to see. Obviously, Selena also knew that she was in a bit of a wrong. So she responded positively to all of Suldak's unreasonable demands. And she did whatever he asked her to do. It was the next day that Samira and Gary Decker met Serdak. These two beauties covered their faces with hoods. And their long legs were particularly eye-catching as they rode on magic-patterned horses. Although they tried their best to he restrained his aura. But the powerful aura of the second-level powerhouse still shocked the commanders of the Lord Army who gathered around Serdak. The army continued to march towards the town of Doden. But in the next few days, what Serdak didn't expect was that a group of herdsmen along the way actually caught up with their flocks and took the initiative to send their property to the army. This thing surprised the two-headed ogre Gulitum. It turns out that this can still be done. The Lord Army of the Ganbu Plain also fully felt the enthusiasm of the herdsmen of the Belan Plain. Later, the local ranchers were also very passive. They were all nobles who owned large pastures. And this was in the northern occupied area of Belan. People came all the way to clean up the hidden dangers of the beast tide. And the indigenous herdsmen rushed over and took the initiative to send their yellow sheep. If you don't express yourself at all, wouldn't you be looked down upon by the local aborigines? So when the Lord's army passed through some small towns, the ranchers here took the initiative to send the prepared yellow sheep to the army. As for why you chose yellow sheep, because yellow sheep is cheap. The most indispensable thing in the northern part of the white forest plain is the large grassland. A group of sheep can breed without restriction under the protection of the herdsmen and their number can double in just three years. Once a sheep herd reaches a large scale, as long as there is enough pasture, their number growth will be extremely terrifying. Each pasture raises a large number of sheep, and these sheep are usually controlled within a certain number. Once the number exceeds the upper limit, some must be sold or simply killed. Now the small noble lords of various towns would not feel they had lost anything if they sent some sheep to Serdak's lord army. 
The only people who are a little dissatisfied with this are probably the merchants who accompany the army. These logistical supplies are within their scope of supply. Now that people are sending them for free one after another, the food they transport will be unsaleable. On the fourteenth day, when Soldak led the Alliance Lord Army into the Belan Plain, the Lord Army had already walked two-thirds of the way. It would be almost a week before they could reach Doden Town. Selina chose to rush first. Return to Doden Town to deal with town affairs. It has been nearly half a month since the army arrived in the Belan Plain. Serdak began to notice that many adventure groups were catching up from behind. It could be seen that they were also heading to Doden Town. Some adventure groups simply followed the Lord's Army, because the Lord's Army followed by the military merchant group. All kinds of supplies are very convenient. It was probably the news that the Alliance Lord Army entered the Belan Plain that attracted so many adventure groups. Last year at this time, many adventure groups from the Belan Plain made a lot of money here. This time, these adventure groups obviously didn't want to miss this opportunity. At the beginning, there were only a few adventure groups following the army. Serdak just thought that they happened to follow the Lord's army to Doden Town. After walking more than half of the distance, there were more than a hundred adventure groups following the army. There were two to three thousand more people. And Serdak realized that these adventure groups were all here to follow the Lord's army and go to the battlefield to make a fortune. Since there are many adventure groups in the White Forest Plain and they hunt near the bridgehead camp on the north bank of the northern rift valley of the Invercargill Warcraft Forest all year round. They are relatively familiar with the affairs of the Invercargill Forest. Many members of the adventure group with a keen sense of smell have heard about this. After hearing the news, they heard that Lord Serdak was leading his army north. So they gave up their previous trip and ran back, preparing to follow the army to hunt ghost-marked red ants. These adventure groups are like a group of hungry sharks. If they smell the slightest smell of blood, they will search for the smell and find it. Many adventure groups even arrived in Doden Town earlier than the Alliance Lord Army. However, in order to adapt to the life of the army as soon as possible, they came to the merchant groups accompanying the Lord Army. The adventure groups also needed various supplies provided by these merchants. And even they they will also sell some heavy trophies that are inconvenient to transport to these merchants at low prices, such as the hard armor of common red ants. Although ordinary hard armor is not very valuable, it is good if you can sell it for a little money. The Lord's Army finally stepped on the last tail of August and entered the military camp in Duodin Town. Although Serdak has expanded the area of the military camp, the military camp can only accommodate up to 3,000 people. And the current military camp has almost included all the open space between the northern city wall and Doden Town, in order not to affect the lives of the residents of the town. The Lord Legion did not camp by the Doden River in the south of the town. They passed through the North City Gate and rested in the Doden Canyon. The merchant group accompanying the army also set up camp in the Doden Canyon with the Lord Army. These merchants brought a lot of goods which they sold not only to the Lord Army soldiers, but also to the residents of the small town. Many goods are extremely novel to this remote border town. Some magical daily necessities brought by merchants are more popular, as well as various candies. Some are soft and soft, and some are full of various flavors, and some are crystal clear and colorful. Now Doden Town has become a transportation transit point for copper mines and an important entrance for many adventure groups to enter the Invercargill Forest. So it is much more prosperous than before. What's more, there is also a twin goddess temple and a war college. Believers from the northern district often come to Doden Town to worship in the church. There are also other small town residents who have savings at home and send their children to the war academy to learn swordsmanship. Therefore, Doden Town is now much more lively than before. And the shops on the central street are even connected to the gate of the Jean John Academy. Chapter 1282 Duodan Canyon North It is hard to imagine that there are so many believers in the temple of the twin goddess that they have to queue up outside the temple gate. After entering the temple, they will first complete their prayers in the main hall, and then walk around in the garden of the temple, and finally leaving reluctantly, or only in this way. When these believers return to the small town where they live, they can brag to their neighbors about how beautiful the two goddess temples in Doden are. In any case, this temple has now become a must-visit place for many tourists coming to Doden town. Another place that gets a lot of people at night is the grassland on the south bank of the Duodin River. Couples in love almost sit in a row on the grass beside the river. No one shouts. And you can even hear people in the river. The sound of gurgling water means there are so many people. So many that Selena can't even continue to live in the riverside hut. It feels like the Riverview Villas are like animal cages in a zoo. They don't even dare to light the lights at night. All windows have to be covered with white gauze curtains. 
people don't even dare to enjoy the cool air on the terrace. Unless you are not afraid of being watched. So, Selena, who became the acting mayor of Doden Town, moved her family back to a house in the center of the town. The Riverside house was idle this summer. And only Zigna and Nika occasionally came back to stay for a night. The only bakery in Duodan Town has now opened branches in the east, west and south of the town. The taste of baked wheat cakes is not great. But every baked wheat cake is salt and sesame seeds and is freshly baked. The wheat cakes are also very crispy. And each one is still two copper plates, which is much cheaper than buying wheat flour and making it yourself. Probably the existence of such cheap baked wheat cakes is also the reason why Doden Town has gathered a large population. Even some young people in the Warrior Academy go to town every morning to buy baked wheat cakes. Many people can't understand why the town hall has to bear such a financial subsidy. The believers of the Twin Goddess Temple understand this as the goddess's last guarantee to the believers. Ensuring that no matter how poor the people here are, they will have enough money every day. You can always have a piece of toasted wheat cake. This is the first small town run by Soldek. Originally, there was only one main street in the town, which could be seen from south to north at a glance. But now, after just two years, the town is bigger than before. It had to be at least four times larger when it was taken over. And the southern part was almost connected to the War College. There was no room for expansion in the northern part of the town. Unless a house was built outside the northern wall, there are not many workshops in the town. Most of the people's lives here rely on the continuous inflow of materials from the Invercargill Forest, which has led to the employment of local residents. Now some people in the town are beginning to discuss whether you will build a city here. The population in the town is increasing rapidly every month. And the town already has a northern city wall. We only need to plant a city in the southern part of the town. Just use a large outline to define this area as an urban area. Selena was holding a wine glass on the penthouse terrace, with a blush on her face looking at this bustling town with some confusion. Serdak shook his head and said, This place has reached a bottleneck period of development. It is difficult for the population to increase after it reaches a certain upper limit. And the most important thing is that this place is always a garrison camp. I will only be stationed here for four years. At that time, what kind of regiment will the military department send? It is still unknown whether we will be stationed here. Selina put her pointed chin on Soldak's shoulder her body covered in a thin nightgown pressed tightly against Soldek's back, and her lips with a faint smell of alcohol pressed against his ear and said, Is that why you built the iron or refining workshop at the north exit of Duodan Town? Serdak looked in the direction of the north city wall with his bright eyes, casting his gaze into the endless darkness hidden under the night, and answered calmly, Yes, and in fact, from the hilly and mountainous area at the north exit all the way to the north, all the rich the land is my territory. And this iron or refining workshop must be built on my territory. Selina asked curiously. Will you develop the copper mine into a town in the future? Serdak thought for a while, and then said. If necessary, I will. But I hope that the trade center in the northern part of the Belan Plain should be further north. At least where it takes seven days of magic airship sailing to reach it. No matter it is Duodan, it's too close to the town or the copper mines. Although Selina knew that Serdak led the army here this time in order to continue to expand northward. She was still a little surprised when she heard it from his mouth. We are going to expand further north. Soldek nodded. That's inevitable. There are those ghost striped red ants in the north. I close my eyes every day. And sometimes it appears in my dreams that the entire valley is filled with ghost stripes. The scene of red ants. The next time there is an animal infestation. Invercargill Forest will bear the brunt of the red ants first. I never thought that this place would have to be rebuilt again in a few years. Serdak did not stay in the town of Doden for too long, and the Lord's army continued all the way north through the Doden Canyon. Arriving at the northern exit of the Doden Canyon, there is already a part of the boundary monument of the Serdak territory. On a hill at the northern pass, a long steel dragon spreads downward on the gentle slope, like a crouching tower, a steel behemoth on the mountain. Although these furnaces have not been started yet, seven huge chimneys are rising into the sky, and Serdak has already seen the prototype of the steel workshop in Ruth City. He saw Hamlin at the top of a high-supported arch keel column at the construction site. The technical director of the steel workshop had lost weight again. Even his cheekbones were somewhat sunken. And he was also sunburned. He was dark. But his eyes were exceptionally bright. As if he were full of longing for a new life. When I saw him, he was pointing at a worker on the top of the pillar and shouting curses. The worker was so scolded that he did not dare to say a word. It's hard to imagine 
that Hamlin's skinny body can actually burst out with so much energy. Serdak wisely remained silent and did not interfere. After Hamlin finished handling the matter, he accompanied Soldak around the steel workshop and introduced him to the construction progress of the workshop. So, in three months, I need to transport the selected ore powder to you. Serdak stood on the high hill, looked at the steel behemoth in front of him, and asked Hamlin. Hamlin wrinkled his forehead and thought for a moment before saying, It should be a trial run in two and a half months. I need high quality iron ore powder. Soldak still doesn't know what his iron or mine will look like. When he left, he only cleaned up the foundation of the shed. Now he went there just to see how the ore screening and grinding equipment was installed on site. According to according to the news from the dwarf workshop in Bena City, they should have started the final step of debugging in recent days. Okay, I will pay close attention to the progress of the iron ore mine project. Soldak nodded and agreed. It was at times like this that Serdak realized that there were so few available manpower around him. The 50,000 Lord's army didn't even stop at the north exit of Duodan town. They headed eastward along the hills and mountains, bypassing the Thorny Mountains and heading towards the Three Rivers Plain east of the Thorny Mountains. It was on the morning of the third day after entering the hills and mountains that Serdak met the wolf knight Tygo and his partner Bonita, who were returning from the east. Maybe it was because he was living a somewhat comfortable life. During the time that wolf knight Tiger was in Duodan town, his body became stronger. The frost wolf became even more exaggerated. His whole body became round and round. Like pine needles. The silver hair stood upright. Shiny and full of luster. The four claws looked like the paws of a giant bear. And the cavalry horses did not dare to approach it. As for their night team's horses, they performed slightly better. This orc still doesn't like to wear magic patterns. He usually carries this set of dealers in a box on his back. He wears simple leather armor. And his light blue body has countless muscles. At a glance, you can tell that this body is full of energy. Explosive force. The officers of the Alliance Lord Army did not know that Serdak actually had an orc wolf knight under his command. They were stared at by Tago's murderous eyes. And most of the officers did not have the courage to go up and greet the wolf knight. Tiger took out the head of a giant ghost pattern soldier ant from a bag. Grinned at Soldak and said, Boss, this is still very new. When he smiled, his two canine teeth were exposed which was still a bit scary. Serdak approached and asked Tego, How is the situation in the east? The wolf knight said in a deep voice, There are many monsters over there, and they often cross the boundary markers and enter the Invercargill Forest territory. The main purpose of each of our patrols is to chase the footprints of those monsters. Kill them or drive them away. Go out. Serdak nodded and looked at how strong he and Bonita were. So he asked, I think you won't be able to drive them away. As long as the prey you tracked, it will be difficult to escape. Bar! Hee hee! Boss! Bonita and I also want to improve the food occasionally! Wolf Knight smiled innocently and answered honestly. Hearing what the Wolf Knight said, the two-headed ogre standing behind immediately widened his eyes. It turned out that there were such good things in staying in the Bellan Plain. He muttered behind Serdek, saying that no matter what happened this time, no matter what, I have to live in the Bellan Plain for a while. Serdek came up, patted the strong shoulder of the wolf knight, and said to the two-headed ogre, Then you will follow Tago for a short period of time. He is a very good hunter, and will definitely let you eat some. Unusual prey. That's great. Tago, you won't dislike me. The two-headed ogre said to the wolf knight with excitement. Of course not. You came just in time. Recently I found a big guy over there in the Three Rivers Plain. Bonita, and I really have no confidence in catching it. Wolf knight said cheerfully. Chapter 1283 Three Rivers Plain A Breakdown of the Second Level Experts Around Serdek Andrew, Samira, and Guaitam were the first to follow Serdek. Now each of them not only possesses two magic patterns of life, but they have also broken through the shackles of the second rank and become ranked high in the Bena province. Famous Warrior Andrew and Samira seem to represent the top two turned berserkers and demon archers. It's hard to say about the two-headed ogre because there are no other ogres to compare with him here. The special one around Serdak is the succubus Aphrodite. Before her wings were chopped off, her strength was equivalent to that of a peak-level magician. However, after her wings were chopped off, her strength was greatly reduced until Serdak implanted two life magic patterns peeled off from the ghost pattern and queen. The back of the succubus gave the broken-winged succubus a new lease of life. Serdak was even a little confused as to when Aphrodite broke through the second level. Suddenly one day, 
Serdek discovered that her strength had reached the level of a second-level archmage. If she hadn't revealed it at the critical moment, I don't know how long she would have kept it secret. The most mysterious one is Selina. Now she has been promoted to the high priest of the Twin Goddess Temple. Of course, she can also be called a high priest. Blessed by the goddess of the night, she controls part of the basic laws of the night. So it can be said that she controls part of the night. She does not belong to the warrior class. Nor does she belong to the magician. The power she possesses is the divine power obtained through prayer. Therefore, it is difficult for Serdak to say how strong she is. When he was dealing with the young ghost marked ant queens, the fog of war in the dark night seemed to have caused great losses to those ghost marked ant queens who were famous for their mental strength. Now Selina has become even more unfathomable. Sometimes when Serdak wakes up, he will have a strong feeling that the person sleeping next to him is not Selina at all, but a forbidden fruit eater. Goddess of Night. Gary Decker and Wolf Knight Tago joined later. Guns rose as good close combat skills. And she wears heavy armor. Even if a white rock rhino hits her, it will probably be killed. She couldn't shake her too strong. Slender. White legs. While she has absolute defense, she also has a magic gun, which is a weapon that burns magic crystals. After the gun is charged, one shot can blast the white rock rhinoceros with sand holes all over its body. But the range of her shotgun it's not too far. Once it's too far, those gun sands lose their power. Wolf Knight Tego is a ruthless character. He is obviously a blood wolf warrior. But he chooses Tiger as his name. And he also has a good friend, Bonita, who is said to be his wife. However, Serdak was dubious about this and he did not doubt Tego's ability. He just felt that the size difference between the two of them was too big. There are seven second-level experts around Serdek. Eight in total including himself. In the entire Bitta province, it can be said that there are only a handful of noble lords with eight rank two powerhouses around them. All this time, Serdak has never shown off to the outside world. Even the lord army of the Ganbu plain did not know that their lord actually followed so many second-level experts. Now these people except Selina and Aphrodite, are gathered around Serdek. And the powerful aura they possess makes the soldiers in the military camp extremely excited. Andrew is the most arrogant among these second-level experts. He always summons some subordinates in his spare time. Even if they are not his subordinates. Everyone gets together on the training ground to fight with bare hands. And often the result is the best. At the beginning, everyone worked together to chase Andrew and beat him up. And every time Andrew becomes more courageous as he fights. Finally. When everyone was exhausted, Andrew launched a major counterattack to the end. The Lord Army was stationed at the north exit of Doden Canyon. A ten-man magician reconnaissance team took advantage of the night to rise into the starry sky. They flew in groups of two and two, flying toward the east side of Thorny Mountain under the cover of night. Go! The leader of this group of thirty magicians is Lance, a young magician from Halanza City. While the Lord Army was still preparing to march eastward at the mountain pass, the mage reconnaissance team had already rushed into the border of the Three Rivers Plains, due to the large number of monsters that escaped from the Invercargill Monster Forest. They were forced to migrate there, so that the number of monsters on the Three Rivers Plains Warcraft are almost overrun. The Three Rivers Plain was originally filled with many amphibious monsters. Now the monsters from the Invercargill Forest have flooded into the Three Rivers Plain. In the past two years, wars between monsters have continued to break out in the Three Rivers Plain, which has also attracted many adventure groups. Everyone trying to hunt the monsters here. But unfortunately, there are not many adventure groups that can really make a fortune from this. It was not until Serdak came to the edge of the Three Rivers Plain in person that he realized that the factor that restricted Benna's army from entering the Three Rivers Plain was not the difficult roads or the ferocious monsters. But the crisscrossing rivers here. All the land is divided into pieces by rivers. And when the rainy season comes, the entire Three Rivers Plain seems to have become a marsh country. If a bridge is built, I don't know how many bridges will be built to completely connect these lands. In such a harsh environment, the Bena Legion simply ignored this woodland. Now, this vast land has been spotted by Serdek. 50,000 Lords Army is approaching the Three Rivers Plain. 30 magicians are divided into two teams and are constantly scouting the edge of the river bank day and night. It doesn't take long. Lance put the collected maps together and drew a vivid map. Serdak looked at the winding river in front of him. 50,000 troops were camped by the river, and thick smoke soon started to appear not far away, before the Lord's army could settle down by the river. In the evening, the two-headed ogre carried some corpses of monsters in the river and began squatting next to the bonfire 
to complete the final barbecue. The sky gradually darkened, and the three rivers plain gradually revealed its true appearance in the night, with monsters crawling out of the river one after another. These monsters have a face full of fangs, and a pair of sharp claws on the front. The body on the back is like a round snake tail, and the whole body is covered with sharp scales. They crawl out of the water. At that time, his whole body was still wet, and his blood-red eyes were full of hatred. One, two, three, almost everywhere on the river beach, there is an almost split mouth on their ugly heads, and they swallow long snake messages in their mouths, and they also make weird sounds from time to time. The first people to discover these new ghost snakes were two magicians patrolling the sky, and then the alarm sounded throughout the camp. Chapter 1284 Salamander Ghost Snake The Three Rivers Plain is not a wetland, but the water level here is very high in summer, and the three crisscrossing rivers finally converge together, plus some miscellaneous tributaries. This plain located to the east of the Thorny Mountains is like several large the territory is pieced together from fragmented territory. The monsters in the Invercargill Monster Forest were driven to the Three Rivers Plains by the ghost-striped red ants. In fact, their lives were not easy. The original monsters in this land did not welcome these new neighbors. And there were three groups of monsters in the Three Rivers Plains. The group forms a certain force. The large river area immediately adjacent to the hilly and mountainous border is almost completely occupied by the new ghost snake group. These salamander ghost snakes are very aggressive. And there is lightning between their claws and teeth. Every time they pounce, the whole body will be temporarily paralyzed. They are amphibious monsters, and they usually live in large groups. Although they are covered with the body with thin scales is relatively weak, but it is the most ferocious monster in this area. It is the existence of these salamander ghost snakes that completely separates the three rivers plains from the Invercargill Forest. The monsters in the Invercargill Forest can only rush through the dangerous area of the salamander ghost snakes and enter the three rivers plains. Only in the depths can there be some living space. There are a large number of giant swamp crocodiles in the central area of the Three Rivers Plain. These giant crocodiles have rough skin and thick flesh. They are proficient in water magic. But they have no brains. They will sneak into the river when they are attacked. They are not very aggressive. Especially because of their leather. It is relatively valuable and has always been the preferred prey of many adventure groups. But there are many rivers here. And if you want to enter the depths of the Three Rivers Plain, you must rush through the territory of the salamander ghost snake. Many adventure groups are unable to deal with these new ghost snakes. So they stay away from this three rivers plain. The easternmost part of the plain, near the tiger leaping gorge, is occupied by a group of giant red-backed tortoises that have been hiding in the water plants at the bottom of the river for many years. They only crawl out of the water occasionally when they are hungry. And their main food is salamanders. A ghost snake can lie underwater for half a year after eating a full meal. These giant turtles dominate the rivers in the Three Rivers Plain. But because they are at the bottom of deep water basins, few people see them. The skin of the new ghost snake is covered with fine scales the size of a fingernail. After the new ghost snake dies, once these hard scales peel off, the new ghost snake's leather becomes fragile and has no use value. It is the only thing that can be used. The only ones left were teeth and claws. And hunters from local indigenous tribes were willing to use these materials to make bone arrows. Therefore, Apart from an incomplete magic core, the salamander ghost snake has nothing of value at all. Moreover, they are cunning and cruel. They almost always appear in groups by the river. They will quickly hide in the river when they are in danger. They are not easy to hunt. So not many adventure groups are willing to hunt the new ghost snake. On the first night, when the Lord Army arrived at the edge of the Three Rivers Plain, these new ghost snakes were like a group of leeches smelling the smell of blood. They crawled out of the river valley in groups, leaving wet streaks on the grass watermarks. The two magicians responsible for exploring the central area of the Three Rivers Plains rode on magic harpoons and returned to the Lord's Army's camp with the last glow of the setting sun. From a distance, they saw a sparkling scene beside the river. They originally thought it was sparkling waves rising from the river. But when they flew closer, they discovered that a large group of new ghost snakes were sneaking towards the camp. Shoo! A young magician blew the whistle hanging on his chest and a clear and metallic whistle sounded into the camp. In addition, the magician simply tore open a magic scroll, and a fireball spun and formed in his palm. The raging flames kept beating in his palm. The fireball rolled towards the group of newts, ghost snakes, and explodes among the snakes. The explosive flames did not cause any harm to these salamander ghost snakes. Their bodies were covered with a layer of hard dense scale armor. The moment the fireball fell, a layer of ice sh 
L instantly condensed on the armor, and the explosive flames it didn't affect them. It just left a scorched mark on the grass, and several disgusted new ghost snakes jumped high from the grass and sprayed water arrows at the magician who was flying in midair on a magic harpoon. As a result, the two magicians quickly pulled up the handle of the magic pot, and several water arrows were placed next to their boots, exploding the city into an icy fog. Hearing the sound of magic explosions outside the camp, Samira and Andrew were the first to react. They were sitting next to Soldak and were studying how to clean up the magical beasts in the nearby area. When they heard the whistle and explosions outside, Andrew he immediately stood up and rushed outside the tent. Samira also reacted very quickly and followed Andrew. Gary Decker and Wolf Knight Tago quickly followed the two of them. By the time Soldak led a group of officers to the gate of the camp, the scene here was already in chaos. Andrew's body was burning with flames, and he rushed into the group of snakes. Carrie Decker was actually standing next to him. She relied on her heavy armor to block the electric bites of the new ghost snakes, and used the magic shotgun in her hand to continuously blast away the new ghost snakes one after another, shattered, and worked together with Andrew to carve a bloody path in the community. Samira followed behind, using the sky strike bow in her hand to kill the ambushers, who moved as fast as lightning. Just a second before the new ghost snakes pounced on Gary Decker, they were killed by Samira. Mira shot through the head. On the contrary, the powerful Gulitum and Wolf Knight fell behind. They stayed by Serdak's side and did not enter the battlefield immediately. Two new ghost snakes sneaked close to Serdak. Just when he was about to open his mouth and bite, the Wolf Knight cut off his head with a sword in his hand. Blood splashed on the grass, and the Salamander ghost snake collapsed like a puddle of mud. Serdak squatted down slightly reached out and pinched a little bit of the mucus-like skin of the salamander ghost snake. And those fine scales suddenly scattered all over the ground. Is this the most worthless new ghost snake? Serdak asked an indigenous tribe leader. The leader of the indigenous tribe woke up from his sluggish state. The killing scene in front of him made him a little frightened. He never thought that the followers around Lord Serdak would have such strong fighting power. Looking at the kind-faced Lord Soldak, the indigenous chief immediately corrected his attitude and answered him respectfully. Well. It's just because no one in the tribe is willing to hunt them that their tribe has expanded to a terrifying number. Then he added, The monsters in Invercargill Forest are not willing to be enemies of these Rongyuan ghost snakes. Soldak nodded, turned around and ordered Captain Ned Mosby, who was following behind him, Go and prepare the catapult. Since these basilisks are worthless, we will smash them directly this time. Yes, Commander. Commander Ned Mosby saluted Soldak and immediately ordered his subordinates behind him. Go and push out the catapults of the 1st Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. Go and move another 200 barrels of black powder. Chapter 1285 The Beginning of the War Ten catapults were pushed out of the camp one, by one, by a group of heavy armored infantry soldiers. As cartloads of gunpowder barrels were brought down, Commander Ned Mosby quickly arranged the throwing positions of the catapults. These catapults were already in the camp. The installation and debugging were completed. So everything was quickly arranged at the camp gate. As a sharp and piercing whistle sounded at the gate of the military camp, Andrew and Gary Decker, who were located in the center of the battlefield, detonated the fighting spirit accumulated around their bodies. With a blast of air, the two strongmen quickly jumped from the salamander. The ghost snakes retreated, with Gulitum and Wolf Knight Tago behind them. Some new ghost snakes fell one after another on the way to pursue. After Andrew and Gary Decker left the battlefield, Commander Ned Mosby shouted, Let go! Oak barrels were thrown out by catapults, rolling in the sky and falling on the river bank. Amidst the continuous explosions, the salamander ghost snake was blown to pieces. Outside the camp, a row of heavy armored infantry warriors set up heavy shields, forming a shield wall to protect the ten catapults. A group of spearmen wearing light leather armor stood behind the shield warriors, passing their spears through the gaps in the shields. Ribia went out and aimed at the new ghost snakes that rushed up like a wave, his face extremely pale. Everyone had never seen these ghosts before, and they were all frightened by their ferocious faces. A group of salamanders and ghost snakes that were at the forefront had already rushed to the front of the camp. Their speed is extremely fast. They open their huge mouths, swing their shiny snake tails with their teeth and claws, and their bodies fly forward while twisting continuously. The new ghost snakes pounce forward, and the shield warriors hid their bodies behind the tower shield. Unfortunately, these heavily armored shield warriors underestimated the power of these new ghost snakes' attacks. In the torn lightning, the tower shields that formed a shield wall were shattered under the sharp claws, and the shield warriors standing in the front row fell down in rows. 
the spearmen behind them stabbed these salamander ghost snakes through each other and suffered heavy casualties under the attack of the salamander ghost snakes. Seeing that the defenses of the shield warriors in the military formation were as fragile as pieces of paper, Serdak's expression changed drastically. He also somewhat underestimated the terrifying attack power of these monsters in front of him. The defense line of the military formation was torn. Soldak did not dare to hesitate. He immediately put a gothic shield on his right arm and rushed towards the disintegrated military formation. The moment he swung out the shield in his hand, he immediately blocked two salamander ghost snake swoop. The broadsword in his left hand thrust out from under the shield, immediately twisting the abdomens of the two new basilisks to pieces. The two new ghost snakes let out a shrill howl and wanted to fight back against Serdek, but were stopped by Serdek. The shield was waved again, pushing the body of the new ghost snake aside, and five more new ghost snakes surrounded it at the same time. Serdak recited the incantation without hesitation, and the holy light flashed out from the broadsword, forming a beautiful arc of light. The holy light forced the five new ghost snakes back. Gilidim and Gary Decker caught up one after another. The big stick in the hand of the ogre Gilidim knocked away a ghost. Snake. The fireball in Nawar's hand almost covered the face of the new ghost snake. Gary Decker shot out. The magic pattern on the shotgun lit up, and a tongue of flame suddenly appeared from the muzzle, and the two new ghost snakes in front of him were blown away. Lon Nightego rushed up quickly. The wolf knight rode on Bonita's back and kept slashing at these new ghost snakes. Bonita also rushed up and opened its mouth to bite. This frost wolf was bigger than the salamander. The salamander ghost snake is much bigger. It can hold the head of the salamander ghost snake in one bite and bite it into pieces. Serdak can even hear the sound of his chewing. The bones are shattered in the mouth, which makes people feel all over. My joints are a little sore. The four people cut into the area where the defense line of the military formation was torn apart by the new ghost snakes. With the powerful strength of the second level warriors, they stopped these new ghost snakes that rushed forward. The collapsed defense line did not intensify. The first one to react was the magician group. Lance led a team of magicians into the sky quickly and threw magic scrolls at the salamander ghost snake. After these scrolls were unfolded, they formed a star. Another fireball landed in the community of newts and ghost snakes. At this time, Andrew immediately summoned the construct knights who came with the Lord's army. As the gunpowder barrels exploded continuously, the gunpowder barrels were filled with kerosene. After the gunpowder barrels exploded, the kerosene flew out like a goddess scattering flowers. Sparks burned violently on the grass. And some new ghost snakes were also covered in flames. The newts and ghost snakes behind were frightened and hissed. But they all retreated into the river. A large group of new ghost snakes were isolated on the river bank by the flames caused by the explosion of gunpowder barrels. At this moment, a group of construct knights rushed out of the camp. The knights lined up on the river bank, pulling down the cold masks on their faces, holding up the knight's spear in his hand, and colorful halos condensed under the war horse. Piety. Punishment. Concentration. Andrew was riding a horse. Right at the front of the constructed knights, he raised his battle axe and roared, Charge. More than a hundred construct knights, who were temporarily summoned rushed forward along the grassland along the river bank. These magic-patterned horses ran wildly, and from the perspective of explosive power, they seemed to be more stable than the green-scaled horses. Then the knights unceremoniously penetrated the knight's spear into the body of the new ghost snake. The other officers of the Lord's army stared at the scene in front of them with wide eyes. Unexpectedly, the army had just set up camp at the edge of hell in the Three Rivers Plains when they were attacked by a large number of new ghost snakes. They were obviously trying to take advantage of the Lord's army before it could gain a firm foothold. Defeat the Lord's army. It's just that these monsters underestimated the Lord's army's ability to cope. Serdak and his five second-level warriors were like mainstays on the battlefield. Under the attack of a group of construct knights, the salamander ghost snake suffered numerous casualties. The Lord's army passed by. After a hard fight, he managed to withstand the attack of the swarm of newts, ghosts and snakes. The battle lasted until midnight before these newts and ghost snakes could be eliminated from the river. Then they began to clean up the battlefield. Until at dawn, the river bank was in a mess. The headless corpses of newts and ghost snakes were piled on the river bank and burned uniformly. As for those heads that were violently smashed open, it's a pity that not all heads have magic cores. And not all magic cores have magic crystals. On average, seven new ghost snake heads can get one magic core. This kind of newts in terms of combat power alone. The ghost snake is comparable to a second level monster. 
but the value of the salamander ghost snake itself is not even comparable to some precious first turn monsters. Every time after a war, Serdak is the busiest time. There are at least 200 wounded soldiers lying in the field medical center behind the military camp. Nika and a group of temple maids have been treating the wounded soldiers in the medical center early. Serdak's holy light spell continued to fall on the wounded soldiers. And the wounds on the wounded soldiers began to heal at a speed visible to the naked eye. Although this battlefield medical center looks extremely simple. It is the place that attracts the most attention in the entire Lord Legion. Chapter 1286 River After the Salamander Ghost Snake was repelled by the Lord's army, the remaining Salamander Ghost Snakes fled back to the river. Next, the scouts of the Lord Army began to look for a suitable place to build a pontoon along the river bank. These new Ghost Snakes were like two kinds of creatures in the river and on the land. If they were like a group of reckless people on the land, warriors, then they are like a group of assassins, who are proficient in stealth in the river. Their scales are almost completely integrated with the river water. They will only appear for a moment when they release ice arrows. The pontoon bridges built by the Lord Army several times were destroyed by this group of new ghost snakes. At this time, Serdak finally realized what a headache these new ghost snakes were. They were the masters of the rivers in this area. As long as they are not completely eliminated, the Lord Army cannot even think of entering the hinterland of this plain. The magician group led by Lance has been busy exploring the area around the Three Rivers Plains in recent days. They recorded all the landforms they saw in the magic crystal and brought Serdek. Lance did not expect Serdek. Could actually ask their magicians to record every mountain range in detail. These image information were made into maps by Serdak in Serdak's military camp. On this map with accurate images provided by magicians. You can clearly see a Grand Canyon upstream of the river in the Three Rivers Plain. According to Serdak's plan. If you want to enter the hinterland of the Three Rivers Plain. You must completely clean up the community of newts and ghost snakes entrenched near the rivers in the plain. In fact, on the first day, when the Lord Army arrived in the Three Rivers Plain, they experienced a battle with the new ghost snakes and killed hundreds of new ghost snakes. These new ghost snakes always huddled at the bottom of the river, no matter how they were lured. Even though the Lord Army has some perfect people, it will be very difficult to clean up these newts and ghost snakes along the coast. The Lord Army has no Naga warriors, and cannot fight the new ghost snake in the water. After some consideration, Serdak decided to lead the Lord's army up the river and stationed himself next to a valley in front of the Grand Canyon. This valley was only separated from the Grand Canyon by a mountain. The Lord's army was here. After setting up camp, Serdak did not rush to arrange combat missions, but asked all the Lord's troops to rest where they were. In the past few days, he only sent out some scout teams every day to explore the surrounding areas. And at the same time, he also hunted down the magical beasts lurking around. Although the scout team made some gains every day, the Lord Army did not successfully enter the Three Rivers Plain. The merchant group accompanying the army can purchase some Warcraft materials every day, but the quantity is not very large. Some merchants have even begun to complain that tens of thousands of Lord's troops are waiting here. It costs a lot to feed people and horses every day, so it is not a matter of scout teams hunting these Warcraft. What can be compensated is that if no loot is captured, the merchants will not have much income. The adventure group following the military merchant group discovered that this time was a rare opportunity. For this group of adventurers, the border buildings of the Three Rivers Plain were a paradise-like hunting ground, and the riverside was full of newts, ghosts, and snakes. They usually appear in groups. Even if the adventure group discovers them, they will choose to go around because of their large number. But now that they are all hiding at the bottom of the river, the adventure group has some special means to hunt them down one by one. More and more adventure groups have begun to hunt salamanders, ghost snakes and snakes along this river. On the contrary, the Lord Army has done nothing in the past few days. Two days later, the merchants accompanying the army suddenly discovered that a large number of migrant workers had gathered outside the camp. And these migrant workers were basically hired from Plento's town. On the first day, they arrived at the camp. They began to dig branch channels next to the river. They braved the scorching sun from the exit of the Grand Canyon, preparing to dig a drainage canal to the north. In this way, the river water flowing down from the upper reaches can be diverted. Although these migrant workers look a little dark and thin in everything they do, they are very easy to manage. As long as the foreman releases the task to them and takes them to get the tools, they can start working immediately. While the soldiers of the Lord's army were still wondering what these migrant workers could do here, Serdak had already completed the survey of the path of this drainage channel. Subsequently, this group of migrant workers 
and a group of ordinary soldiers began to dig the drainage channel at the same time. This drainage channel with a length of 2 kilometers actually does not require many places to be dug manually. Under the leadership of Tula, this drainage channel was dug in only 7 days. Although many places still need to be dug, it is widened a little, but it can already lead the water of this river into the valley on the other side. In this way, the river is divided into two at the exit of the Grand Canyon. Later, Saldek asked the soldiers and workers to put the stones dug out from the drainage canal into a large barbed wire mesh. The stones were wrapped in barbed wire bags and thrown into the original channel of the river. It took just three days to completely cut off the river, and all the river water was directed into the valley next door along the drainage channel. Due to the cutoff in the downstream river, the water level dropped little by little, gradually revealing the riverbed full of silt. In this way, the newts and ghost snakes that were originally lurking at the bottom of the river were exposed to people's sight again. They originally tried to hide in the soft mud under the riverbed. When the mud on the riverbed was exposed to the scorching sun, the mud cracks began to appear. And these new ghost snakes realized that the situation was not good. They began to crawl out of the mud of the riverbed and fled in all directions. A row of crossbows has been placed on the grass beside the river. What a group of archers have to do is to kill the newts and ghost snakes crawling out of the mud at the bottom of the river. Almost all of them have bodies removed from their bodies. After emerging from the mud, his body was covered in mud and lost all flexibility. So he became the target of a bed crossbow on the river bed. Giant crossbow arrows were shot out one after another, quickly harvesting the lives of the new ghost snake. The other lord armies and adventure groups standing on the shore realized that the war with Warcraft could still be fought like this. The salamander ghost snakes that died tragically at the bottom of the river were picked up by the soldiers and thrown into the four-wheel truck of the business group without any treatment. And then some magic crystals could be harvested from the businessmen. Serdek did not collect the heads of these new ghost snakes this time. These heads were severely broken and they were only primary sacrifices. Once the new ghost snake died, its entire body began to fester rapidly. When the soldiers brought their corpse up, it looked like a slug without any skin, and the surface of its body was covered with sticky mucus. Without the protection of the river, even if these salamander ghost snakes successfully escaped into the grassland by the river, they would not be able to escape being shot by members of the adventure group who swarmed behind them. Suddenly, the garrison camp at the edge of the Grand Canyon was filled with joy. And while the river stopped flowing, the Lord's army quickly built bridge piers with some stones in the river. Preparing to build several stone arch bridges here, the merchant group accompanying the army finally obtained a large amount of cheap materials for the salamander ghost snake, as well as a large number of first-level magic cores. In addition to the salamander ghost snake, the Lord army also harvested some Gamby's devil fish. Immediately afterwards, Andrew led a cavalry regiment of 500 people across the dry river and entered the plain. Chapter 1287 National Hunting Ground The Lord Army behind them rushed into the river bed that was cracked by the sun and used their spears to dig out the new ghost snakes that were hiding deep in the mud and did not dare to climb out. The adventure groups following the military merchant group also came to the river one after another. They looked at the dam on the edge of the Grand Canyon and realized that Serdak was going to dig through all the mud at the bottom of the river this time. Just to be able to deal with these salamanders, the newt, ghost and snake caused a devastating blow. Moreover, this time the Lord's army did not restrict the adventure group's activity area. That is, if the adventure group entered the river bottom to dig through the mud, the Lord's army would not intervene. As for the vanguard of the Lord's army, they have already crossed the river. Under the leadership of Andrew, Samira, and Gary Decker, they have launched a detailed search in the upper, middle and lower reaches of the other side of the river. It is one of the largest gathering places for new ghost snakes. As long as this place is cleaned up, at least one-third of the new ghost snakes in the Three Rivers Plain will be cleared away. Migrant workers in the town of Plentos are building a bridge across this dry river. It goes without saying that the river will still have to be filled with water again in the future. The most rare thing about the Three Rivers Plain is that the land washed out by the Three Rivers is fertile, and the water system is developed for easy irrigation. As long as these Three Rivers can be properly managed, at least tens of thousands of hectares of fertile farmland can be obtained. Therefore, Serdak does not intend to destroy the original water system here. In order to clean up the newts and ghost snakes, Serdak only temporarily changes the course of the river and pours the river water into a low-lying valley. In fact, once the valley is filled with river water, this place in the end, it will only form a lake surrounded by mountains. There are no necessary conditions for a river to form here. This valley has no low-lying outlet. 
Zerdak has asked magicians to scout the entire plane in the past few days. In his plan, a dam needs to be built in the upper reaches of the river. This will not only increase the water storage capacity of the Grand Canyon, but also slow down the abundant summer rainfall here, allowing the downstream floodplain to form a marsh. And he not only just wants to build a dam on this river, but also plans to build dams on the upper reaches of the other two rivers on the plain. Only in this way can the three rivers plain be ensured that it will not be flooded in the rainy season and dry in the dry season. Once these large dams are built, this area will become the most fertile land. Serdak built a dam in the three rivers plain. In addition to these reasons, another reason is that whoever controls the rivers here will be the real owner of this plain. Because there are many rivers in the three rivers plain, adventure groups or troops must wade into this plain. And the three most powerful monsters in the three rivers plain almost all live in the rivers. The new ghost snake, the swamp giant crocodile, the red giant turtle. Among them, the most numerous, ferocious, and difficult to deal with are these new ghost snakes. Not to mention that the adventure group cannot deal with them at ordinary times. Even if Serdak brought an army of 50,000, if the river is not drained before, the lord the army is still helpless against these new ghost snakes. But now, even an ordinary warrior with a spear in his hand can easily kill the new ghost snake stuck in the sun-dried mud after he knows how to deal with him. If the river can be controlled, the combat effectiveness of the swamp crocodile and the red-back turtle will be reduced to a minimum. In fact, among these monsters, Swamp giant crocodiles are not the best monsters to hunt. They are second level monsters. And their individual strength is much stronger than the newt. Ghost snake. But they are also the monsters that Serdak is least worried about. In the eyes of the adventure group, these giant swamp crocodiles are pieces of living magic pattern structures. Yes, the leather of the swamp giant crocodile often appears on the auction house. And it is considered an excellent leather for making primary magic pattern structures. As long as the Lord Army opens the passage into the hinterland of the Three Rivers Plain, those adventure groups will enter this river basin one after another to clean up the swamp giant crocodiles in this area. They will only worry that there are not enough swamp giant crocodiles in these rivers. And they will never there are too many swamp giant crocodiles in the river. Just as Serdak guessed, as the Lord's Legion cavalry crossed the first river, the adventure groups behind them couldn't wait to follow. They want to follow the tail of the cavalry, break through the territory of the new ghost snake, and enter the territory of the swamp giant crocodile. However, there was another tributary blocked in front of everyone. Serdak still followed the same method, cutting off the river at the upper reaches, and then waited for the river to slowly dry up. Many newts and ghost snakes had to follow the receding river water into other river basins. What Serdak didn't expect was that on the three rivers plain, these monsters had very clear territorial divisions. When a group of escaped salamander ghost snakes entered the wetland where the swamp giant crocodile lived, those monsters hiding in the swamp, the group of crocodiles and the deaths actually went out en masse and started a brutal fight against the passing salamanders and ghost snakes. Although the Lord Army cannot deal with these salamander ghost snakes in the river, these thick-skinned swamp crocodiles can kill a salamander ghost snake in almost one bite. An adult swamp giant crocodile can reach eight, turning its body on the spot. The new ghost snake will be torn to pieces by the giant swamp crocodile in an instant. Scratching. Biting and electric attacks are like pieces of paper under the absolute defense and power. The noble lords of Wilk City also knew that this plane was fertile, and it was these new ghost snakes that blocked their army's progress. Originally, they planned to take a look at Lord Soldak's show, but unfortunately before these noble lords could discuss the matter at the ball, the news of the first victory in the Three Rivers Plains had been delivered to the military headquarters in Wilk City. The news had just arrived in Wilkes one night, and the adventure group living in Wilk City was in an uproar. Almost all the adventure groups were preparing to pack, hiring some carriages to go to the northeastern border of the northern occupation zone. And everyone was rushing to the Three Rivers Plain. Get a piece of the pie. In fact, at this time, Serdak's 50,000 Lord Army could only hold the upper reaches of the Three Rivers Plain. An army of 50,000 sounds like a huge number. But when the Lord's Army is scattered over a vast land of almost 30,000 square kilometers, it is no different from a herd of one-horned bison migrating on the vast prairie. And it can easily be overwhelmed. In the wilderness, Andrew, Samira, and Gary Decker led three cavalry battalions and traveled all over the hinterland of the plains. Wherever they passed, boundary markers for the Alliance Lord Army would be erected. Also to announce this to the outside world. Sovereignty over the territory. In fact, Serdak is still looking forward to the arrival of those adventure groups. 
in order to attract more adventure groups. He even deliberately helps these adventure groups and arranges a safe and convenient hunting environment. The military merchant group will also provide these adventure groups with, with sufficient supplies. They will also purchase some Warcraft materials that the adventure group cannot take away. When Belan entered September, there were nearly hundreds of adventure groups in Wilk City entering the Three Rivers Plain on the northeastern border of the Northern Occupation Zone. The following three trade routes can be seen almost everywhere with carriages loaded with goods. Like army ants. They transport countless Warcraft materials from the Three Rivers Plain to Wilkes, and then pass through the portal in Wilk City, shipped to Benes City. Countless giant crocodile leathers are excellent materials for making primary magic pattern structures. In this beautiful autumn, the people of Bena once again felt the eyes of the empire. Countless material dealers flocked to Bena City in order to get as much share of Warcraft leather as possible, in order to prevent disorder in the Belan Plain. The Bena Provincial House of Representatives issued an order at the end of September. The portal in the Belan Plain is under military control. And this autumn is also a nightmare for the giant swamp crocodiles in the Three Rivers Plain. This massive hunting operation did not end with rich harvests. Almost all the adventure groups who first arrived in the Three Rivers Plain made a fortune, which in turn attracted more people. Many adventure groups are coming. If the new ghost snake group here was extinct because Serdak drained all the water in the river, then the swamp giant crocodile here was completely hunted by hundreds of adventure groups. Of course, the largest hunting team here is the half of the constructed knights controlled by Andrew. The 240 constructed knights are the largest bandits in this land. They occupy the best hunting grounds and control the most powerful hunting method and the most convenient logistical supplies. Among the followers around Serdek, the one who benefited the most was the two-headed ogre Gulitum. In just two months, the two-headed ogre almost grew taller, and his body began to change. He has turned into a tan color, and the muscles all over his body have become more and more exaggerated. The power Gulitum now possesses can almost smash the head of a giant swamp crocodile with a stick. As his power surged, Gulitum became a little bloodthirsty, and his mood became a little irritable. It was obvious that there was an imbalance between his own strength and spiritual growth. In order to calm Gulitum down, Serdak restricted his hunting activities and asked him to stay in the camp to follow him to strengthen his mental strength. The Lord's Army camp at the end of September looked more like a large construction site. Not only did a large amount of swamp giant crocodile leather accumulate in the camp, but a large amount of building materials were also stored around the camp. And these building materials were basically used for prepared for the construction of a large dam upstream. Now not only migrant workers from Plento's town gather here, but also migrant workers from several small towns such as Doden Town, Nanta Town, and Jilin Town are almost all building large dams here. The lords from the Ganbu Plain did not expect that just over two months after entering the Belan Plain, Count Soldak would add the most fertile territory on the Belan Plain to his own territory. And the most important thing is that everyone can get a share of it. All the expenses spent on mobilizing the army this time began to show a surplus after the army hunted the local monsters. This means that not only did this expedition cost no money. On the contrary, I made some money. Of course, what the noble lords value is not these, but the rich land on the Three Rivers Plain. In the sky, rock birds keep wandering and flying. Chapter 1288 Visit Not too far from the camp, the military merchant group established a free market there. The free market is filled with a wide variety of products. But the stall owners here are all doing the same thing, which is to purchase Warcraft materials. After these two months of accumulation, the prices of these Warcraft materials on the market have gradually become clearer. Serdak stood on the watchtower at the gate of the camp, looking at the bustling market, and suddenly felt that the taste of leading the Lord's army to the Belan Plain had changed a bit. This Lord's army had now become Sana, the largest hunting group in the plains, has convoys, continuously transporting the trophies back all day long. After a series of sorting, they will flow into the free market not far away. 50,000 Lord armies were scattered across this vast plain, hunting the giant swamp crocodiles here, and creating a huge fortune at an extremely fast speed. Serdak divided half of this wealth with the lords, who were willing to send troops to the Belan Plain with him this time. The retained half was used to build a large dam at the exit of the Grand Canyon. According to Serdak's plan, this large dam will be completed by this time next year. And then we can use this dam to control water resources in the Three Rivers Plain. Although the Lord Army has not yet obtained ownership of this territory. In fact, the application process is only a matter of time. Some noble lords in the Belan Plain are unwilling to admit that such a large area 
as the Three Rivers Plain was so easily occupied by Soldek. They think that he relied on the power of hundreds of adventure groups in Wilk City, and now only it controls half of the Three Rivers Plain. So it does not recognize this territorial expansion in unknown areas. Serdak didn't think it was anything, since the Lord's army had left its footprints here. When this land was finally conquered, his name would definitely be on the boundary monument. The cool wind blew from the watchtower, and Serdak suddenly saw an army holding gorgeous flags appear in the sunset. At dusk, the army slowly came along the river. Some of the knights carrying the flags looked a little listless. The road was a little muddy, and a group of knights didn't look energetic either. Serdak ignored this strange army and turned his attention to the sparkling river. A month ago, there were countless newts and ghost snakes in this river. But now, it is estimated that it is difficult to even find the shadow of a snake. Not far in front of the camp, an arched bridge has been built. The seven piers control each span of the bridge to about 15 meters. Even the bridge deck has been repaired to be very smooth. The army is actually there stopping at the bridge. A middle-aged man dressed in gorgeous aristocratic clothing held a scepter and walked onto the bridge surrounded by a group of guards. The teams passing on both sides of the bridge stopped as a result. Aphrodite wore a mithril mask and sat quietly next to Serdek. In recent times, she can always be seen in the military camps of the Lord Army, and everyone seems to have become accustomed to a mysterious alchemist appearing next to Serdek from time to time. And they have long been accustomed to this. This watchtower can see very far, and Serdek can clearly see that the Zilatish River in front draws an enchanting S-shaped curve on the earth. And the land on both sides is so flat. A caravan was just about to leave, and the four-wheeled wagons were loaded with goods. But at this moment, they had to wait by the roadside to let the honor guard with the gorgeous flag pass first. But the noble expressed his feelings on the bridge and refused to return to the magic caravan for a long time. Soldak looked away impatiently. Aphrodite raised her exquisite mithril mask and asked him, When are you going to go to the Great Rift Valley Bridgehead Camp? Serdak sighed slightly. He also hoped that the territorial certificate here could be issued as soon as possible and then moved to the north of the Great Rift Valley. However, the news sent by the great swordsman of Chester from the Wilk City Military Headquarters did not talk about the ownership of the Three Rivers Plain. Apparently the nobles of Wilk City were still unwilling to admit that even if the plain in front of them was Soldak opened up. Soldak could only shake his head and said, It's too late to wait any longer. The lords in Wilk City still don't admit that we occupy this place. We will leave more traces. His eyes fell on the noble on the bridge at this moment. It seemed that he should be the territorial administration official who came from Wilk City. Aphrodite said nothing more, but changed the subject and asked Serdak, Do you want me to go to Rith City? So you can go see them. Soldak knew that by them, she was referring to Hathaway and Beatrice. After all, Hathaway was a pregnant woman like herself. Serdak didn't talk at this time. He obviously didn't know how to deal with this complicated relationship. What he was thinking was, shouldn't Aphrodite and Hathaway be hostile at this time? Aphrodite had a symbiotic contract with him, and was somewhat sensitive to what he was thinking. So at this time, she put her body close to Serdak and whispered into his ear, Are you worried about me? Serdak hesitated for a moment before asking, If I have to walk such a long way just to see them at this time, would you feel uncomfortable? The face under Aphrodite's mask had an inexplicable smile. And then she said frankly, Listening to what you said, I suddenly found that I really feel a little uncomfortable in my heart. So forget it? Um? Soldak nodded and agreed. Aphrodite rested her head on Serdak's shoulder. Samira stood on the platform of the Thunder Rhinoceros, looking at Aphrodite in great depression. Her pointed ears that looked like an elf were trembling constantly. It was obvious that she was in a bad mood. The other crossbowmen on the platform returned to the camp. The cabin at the back was the dormitory of Samira and Gary Decker. It was more convenient for the two of them to live here. Gary Decker took off her heavy armor from her sweaty body, revealing her toned figure wearing only a small vest. She shook her long black hair, looked in the direction of Samira's gaze, and said, TSK, TSK. Our leader is really not picky about anything. Even the succubus can bite Samira. I think you should try to be more proactive. You can't keep doing this. The half-elf archer was a little irritable, jumped on the bed crossbow in front of him, and sat at the control console refusing to say a word. Just before dark, a delegation from Wilk City slowly stopped at the gate of the camp. The leader was a noble lord from the Bailin Plain. He held a golden cane in his hand, followed by a row of gorgeous honor guards, about 50 people in number, and a motorcade behind him. 
a follower beside him walked up to the guard and shouted to the camp guard, We are from Wilk City and want to see Earl Soldak. As he spoke, he took out a letter of visit from his arms and handed it to the guard at the camp gate. Chapter 1289 Death of Acheson Sardak walked down from the watchtower, and the guards at the camp gate stood up straight and saluted him, strutting directly in front of the noble lord. Sardak said calmly, I am Sardak. Who is your excellency? Wilk City Representative Dirk Acheson. The noble lord holding the golden cane nodded to Sardak. Then he straightened his tie and said to Soldak with a straight face, Count Soldak, you submitted an application for the territory of the Three Rivers Plains to the House of Representatives in Wilk City. After some consideration, the House of Representatives decided to send me. Check here. Soldak nodded and asked the Acheson representative to enter the military camp. The personal guards behind Congressman Acheson immediately followed. A group of people surrounded Congressman Acheson, and they seemed very loud when they entered the military camp. Seeing Soldak's accommodating behavior, Representative Acheson became even more proud. Congressman Acheson has done this kind of work of establishing territory and then negotiating it several times on behalf of the Wilk City House of Representatives. Although the lords who opened up the plains have rebounded every time and have expressed their intention to appeal to the House of Representatives of Bena Province, once this matter enters the process, it can easily become nothing in the end. Moreover, Councillor Acheson felt that he was standing behind the entire Wilk City nobility. He came here to offer an olive branch to Count Soldak, asking him to join the Belan Plain Noble Lords Association. Of course, the price Serdak had to pay was to cede part of the territory of the Three Rivers Plain. Since the lords of the entire Wilk City stood behind him, Councillor Acheson felt that he still had some upper hand when facing Soldak. Walking into the military camp, Senator Acheson found that it was more like a huge material turnover warehouse. With messy materials piled everywhere, and there were almost no Lord's troops in sight. He straightened his waist again, and his expression became even more proud, with that aristocratic pride on his face. At this time, he seemed to have forgotten that the Earl of Serdak in front of him was a Lord with outstanding military exploits. He simply felt that if he could even manage a military camp in a mess, he must not be very good at commanding an army. Perhaps those previous military exploits were not enough. It was Marquis Luther who piled it on him especially after entering the military tent. The place where the sand table was originally placed was actually a model of a Grand Canyon and a dam. Congressman Acheson could not find any military deployment on it. This made Congressman Acheson conclude that certain chances are Grams won't be able to command an army at all. He climbed the steps, sat down on a chair, and glanced around the military tent. He even saw two elf and human beauties in the corner of the military tent. Their straight long legs dazzled him and he felt that Count Serdak was still better than him in terms of aesthetics. Then he thought about it again. Count Soldak married the beloved daughter of Marquis Luther. Naturally, he did not dare to leave these two beauties at home. It would be a good choice to bring them to the military camp. Counselor Acheson glanced at Soldak with some disdain. That strange look made Soldak slightly startled. He couldn't figure out why the Wilk City House of Representatives would send such an arrogant guy to review the newly developed occupied territory. Carrie Decker quickly brought two cups of lemon tea. Senator Acheson looked from her chest to her long legs that were put together without any gaps. His gaze was a little wild, but he immediately retracted his gaze and said to Soldak, After my understanding along the way, I found that you actually only occupied half of the Three Rivers Plain. The remaining area is not yet completely in the hands of your Lord Army. Count Soldak, is that true? Soldak was speechless, thinking that the Wilk City House of Representatives was really testing his bottom line again and again. But faced with this question, Serdak still nodded and replied, It is true that some areas are not fully controlled. When I come here this time, I represent not only the House of Representatives in Wilk City, but also the many nobles in Wilk City. We hope that you can allocate a part of this vast territory to compensate Wilk City. Lords of Wilk City. After all, this has always been the land that the Lords of Wilkes wanted to develop. We have been preparing for so many years, but you were the first to develop it. You should allocate part of the land to compensate weeks for all reasons. Lords of Irk City, what do you think? Congressman Acheson felt that what he said was pretty good. At least, he got his point across. How many do you want? Soldak pinched the corners of his eyes and asked coldly. Counselor Acheson waved his finger and said, Not much. Just give us one third of this land. That's enough. Serdak was speechless. He didn't know what to say to refuse. Samira and Gary Decker, who were sitting in the corner, 
also looked at Congressman Atchison with strange expressions. Soldak thought for a while and decided to give him a step up. So he said to Representative Atchison, Actually, I have a better suggestion. According to the 433 Land Distribution Law, this place will eventually belong to my Lord's Alliance. The territory is only 40%. After all, we are an alliance of lords here. In fact, each lord does not get much territory. In fact, most of the territory belongs to the Bena province and the Green Empire. If Wilk cities the lords really want to own the land here, so they can buy it from the Bena province with gold coins. Counselor Atchison did not expect that Serdak would refuse in disguise. And his face suddenly turned ugly. He asked Serdak with a cold poker face. Aren't you afraid that this hasty decision will make all the lords of Wilk stand against you? Soldak came closer to Representative Atchison. His forehead was almost touching his, staring into his eyes and said, Just as you are not afraid that I will kill you after making these unreasonable demands, of course I will too. Not afraid of making enemies of all the lords of Wilkes. As soon as he finished speaking, Lord Atchison felt a cold sharp knife inserted into his back. The severe pain almost instantly overwhelmed any sense of his body. Representative Atchison pointed to Soldak and said with disbelief, You before the next words were even uttered. Representative Atchison fell straight into the tent. Carrie Decker took the opportunity to pull out the dagger stuck in her back and walk back to the corner as if nothing had happened. She didn't even ask Serdak why he wanted to kill this nobleman. In short, she just walked over and stabbed him to death with the dagger. Counselor. And then retreated to the corner without saying a word. On the contrary, Soldak walked over, rummaged through Representative Atchison's body, and found that he was dead on the spot. He called the guards at the camp door in and told them, Take Representative Atchison out. Leave it to his followers. With that said, Soldak lifted the curtain of the tent, walked outside the tent, and said to the followers of Baron Atchison, When you go back, tell the consul Florian for me, and ask him to send someone with some brains next time. The followers looked frightened and left in a hurry carrying the body of Representative Atchison. Chapter 1290 Fair Judgment the nobles in Wilk City did not expect that Senator Atchison, who was so confident when he set out, was taken home by his followers. But he was lying quietly in the coffin, with his eyes above his eyes. He was carrying two gold coins, and the gorgeous dress he wore was still the same as when he set out. The carriage pulled the heavy coffin into Wilk City, and many nobles came to greet it. The magic caravan did not stop in the city, but drove directly to the portal in Wilk City. Congressman Atchison's family wanted to send his body to Bennis City. They decided to place Congressman Dirk Atchison's coffin at the gate of the House of Representatives and ask Speaker Fred to pay tribute to this matter between nobles. The most just verdict was given for the murder. After all, the other party is the husband of Marquis Luther's favorite daughter Hathaway. And he is currently the most popular noble lord in the Belan Plain. It was he who led the Lord Army to conquer the Belan Plain and was able to almost add the most fertile plain land in the entire Three Rivers Plain to his lord territory in just two months. Of course, if Serdak wanted to swallow up the entire Three Rivers Plain, he would need to hand over land equivalent to twice the area of the Three Rivers Plain to the Bena province and the Green Empire. However, Serdak currently has no plans to lead his army across the Grand Canyon. As for this developed territory, Serdak just wants to get recognition from the Bena province and the Belan Plain. As for how to divide the territory, Serdak still needs to discuss it carefully with other alliance lords. One time, after the members of the Atchison family entered Bena City, they covered Congressman Atchison's coffin with a Bena military flag and then used a four-wheeled flatbed truck to pull it to the square at the gate of the House of Representatives. This move by the Atchison family immediately attracted a large number of onlookers in the square in front of the House of Representatives. Several young people from the Atchison family stood on the high roof of the car, raising their hands high, denounced Earl Soldak's despicable behavior to the onlookers. Due to the upcoming annual Harvest Festival, Bena City has become very lively recently, so there are especially many onlookers. Most of the onlookers were curious. What kind of noble lord could force another noble family to put a coffin with a faint rancid smell on the street and denounce the atrocities of this noble lord to the public? It was only when they heard that the lord these young people in the Atchison family were telling about was none other than Earl Soldak who had recently led the Alliance Lords of the Gombu Plain into the Belan Plain. That some people became aware of it. I began to wonder whether it was internal strife caused by uneven distribution of benefits when reaping the fruits of victory. Because now the entire city of Bena is crowded with businessmen coming from all over the country. Most of them came here to purchase the hides of those giant swamp crocodiles. 
It was the series of territorial expansion actions by Serdak and his alliance Lord Army in the Belan Plain that stirred up the economy of the entire Benis city. Recovery. Now another noble in Wilk City came forward and began to accuse Lord Suldak. And no one found it strange. After all, in Benis City, it is not uncommon for nobles to bite each other. In the afternoon, the square in front of the House of Representatives was finally filled with crowds of onlookers. Speaker Fred, who was busy handling official business in the House of Representatives, finally couldn't stand the noise outside and began to ask his assistants to investigate the situation outside. Baron Armand de Cuny also succeeded in squeezing in with his cleverness. Next to Speaker Reed, he is now just following Speaker Fred's assistant. But even so, it makes a group of young people in the Dunstan family very jealous. The assistant had been with Speaker Fred for several years. He walked out of the House of Representatives and came directly to the square. He first asked the members of the Atchison family about the situation, and then said to the members of the Atchison family, If you want to accuse Count Soldak, you can come to the House of Representatives and go through the normal process. Of course, I will truthfully report this matter to the Speaker. However, it is very irrational for you to gather a crowd here. I hope you can leave as soon as possible. After hearing what Speaker Fred's assistant said, the nobles of the Atchison family certainly did not want to leave like this. Seeing that his words were not very effective, the assistant immediately scolded the nobles of the Atchison family with a sullen face. You can't disrupt public order in Benna City here. What do you want to do by placing the coffin here? Seeing the hesitant expressions of the nobles of the Atchison family, the assistant immediately took the opportunity to say, The duel between nobles is full of uncertainties. I want to know the specific ins and outs of this matter. But we can definitely find a place to sit down and chat. I will listen to your story slowly. When I also hope can any of you use the most objective and true words to describe the scene at that time? The four-wheeled flat carriage carrying the coffin was driven away from the square by the coachman. And then several members of the Atchison family were taken to a conference room in the House of Representatives by the Speaker's assistant. A young man from the Atchison family came forward and told the assistant the general story of what happened. The assistant had met Serdak more than once and knew that Serdak had a good relationship with Speaker Fred. He pondered for a moment before saying, I'm not helping Earl Serdak shirk responsibility. Representative Atchison's reckless approach is obviously provocative. After all, Earl Serdak is the great lord of the Gombu Plain. Seeing that the nobles of the Atchison family still wanted to stand up and defend themselves, the speaker's assistant immediately waved his hand to signal everyone to be quiet, and then said, The House of Representatives will investigate this matter, but I hope that Earl Dirk Atchison can be buried in the cemetery. After some communication, the young nobles of the Atchison family were finally sent away, and the speaker's assistant hurriedly reported the outcome of the matter to Counselor Fred. After listening to the assistant's report, Speaker Fred said to the assistant with a cold face, You need to learn more about this matter. It is impossible for Duck to execute a nobleman for no reason, especially when he is a member of Wilk City. By the way, what's the news from Wilk City? I just heard a few days ago that Earl Suldak has opened up an unknown territory. It is said that the local indigenous people call it the Three Rivers Plain, and recently a large amount of Warcraft materials have been transported from the White Forest Plain. There are it's been a long time since we had this kind of harvest atmosphere. And now the city is crowded with businessmen from all over. The assistant added with a smile. Everyone seems to have forgotten the joyful feeling of frequent victory reports. And the whole city, they're all celebrating it. Speaker Fred nodded slightly, seeming to agree with this. Then he casually asked his assistant. What do you think about by Lin's plane? The assistant immediately replied. According to my understanding... The lords of the Belan Plain were so ugly that they caused Serdak great dissatisfaction. So Serdak took some drastic actions. Speaker Fred snorted, touched the teacup at hand, and said, It's really stupid that a group of sheep are always trying to steal food from the lion's mouth. The assistant quickly took the opportunity to ask, Speaker, how should we respond to this matter? Speaker Fred Dunstan pondered for a moment, waved to his assistant and said, Put this matter off for now. Send a letter to Soldak first and tell him that he needs more achievements to dilute people's views on this matter. New. No. When the assistant heard what Speaker Fred said, he immediately knew what to do. Following behind him, Baron Adman de Cuny secretly wiped the cold sweat from his forehead when he walked out of the Speaker's office. He knew that Soldak had always maintained a good relationship with the Dunstan family. But he did not expect that Sue Erdak is actually so highly regarded by Speaker Fred. After casually killing a Wilk City congressman on the battlefield, Speaker Fred didn't even think of setting up a special investigation team. 
I also need an assistant to deliver a message to Soldek. Baron Armand de Cuny discovered that there was a big gap between nobles and nobles in the upper class society. And Soldak was now obviously among the great lords of the Bena province. And it seemed that Atchison the family matter has no impact on him at all. After walking out of the speaker's office, Baron Armand de Cuny took the opportunity to say to the assistant, The speaker treated Count Soldak really well. The assistant glanced at Armand de Cuny indifferently, and then said, Yes, that Count Soldak is not only a great lord of the Ganbu Plain, but also a second-level strongman. A very remarkable person. Paladin, if you can become a second-level powerhouse, I believe the speaker will also look at you differently. Just this sentence made Baron Armand de Cuny so stunned that he couldn't say a word. Chapter 1291, Move to the Great Rift Valley. The war that broke out on the Belan Plain was like a shot in the arm. When it was injected into the old body of Bena province, it immediately gave the old man who had been sleeping for a long time a new vitality. A large number of adventure groups and mercenary groups gathered on the Three Rivers Plain. Warcraft materials were continuously transported to Bena City through the portal, which also caused many Wilk City nobles, who wanted to speak out to accuse Lord Soldak to shut up. Mouth. The noble lords keenly discovered that the Bena province did not deal with Serdak in any way, and did not even bother to conduct the most basic investigation. Such a plain expansion war not only boosted the economy of Bena province, but also allowed the residents of Bena province to regain their confidence in the lords. The lords also quickly took advantage of this opportunity to express to the people in the territory that the current difficulties are only temporary, as long as everyone persists. The frequent wars in the various plains of Bena province will soon subside. And then, there will be supplies are constantly being transported in from all plains from afar. Everyone will live as generous a life as before. In the large tent of the military camp in the Grand Canyon of the Three Rivers Plain, a group of officers from the Lord's Army were sitting together. An officer from the Ludwig family stood up and said to Soldak, Commander Serdak, if this matter is traced, we lords have already thought about it and will hand over a scapegoat to the Bena province. Serdak was slightly startled. He didn't expect that the officers of the Lord Army were worried about this. Then he stood up and glanced around. Originally, he didn't want to explain this to the officers in front of him. But now he felt that it was very important. I needed to explain it to everyone. So I said, You see, until now, no one from the Lords of Wilk City has dared to stand up and accuse me. This means that they have not received stronger support. So after knowing my attitude, they are likely to give up here. If my guess is correct, the second investigator from the Territory Administration should already be on the way. The officers of the various Lord armies had different expressions on their faces when they heard what Serdek said. But someone immediately took the opportunity to ask, Commander Serdak, what should we do next? Serdak walked to the map of the military tent. Just as he was about to talk about the next battle deployment, he heard someone outside the military tent reporting loudly. Report, Commander Serdak, an urgent letter from the Bena province house of representatives. Serdak strode to the door, took an urgent letter from the guard, tore off the red seal stamped on it, and took out a thin piece of parchment folded in half. His eyes were on the letter paper. He glanced at it, and immediately recited. Notice, Lord Soldak needs to cooperate with the prosecutor sent by the Bena province from now on to investigate the accidental death of Representative Atchison. In view of the tense situation in the Belan Plain, the prosecutor's investigation and verification work will be postponed to Belan. Take place at the end of the Plain War. The officers in the military tent looked at each other, and some couldn't help but said, What does this mean? Do you want us to keep exploring unknown territories in the Belan Plain? Among some flexible officers, someone immediately said, Maybe the higher-ups want to make this victory in the Belan Plain more beautiful. Entering October, the weather gradually gets cooler. Serdak's Lord Army finally occupied most of the Three Rivers Plain. The plains of the northern region are about to usher in winter. Due to the arrival of winter, the giant swamp crocodiles need to dig into deep holes in the ground to hibernate. This type of second-level monster has extremely high body resistance and is not afraid of severe cold. However, the surrounding environment does not allow them to hunt enough food. Therefore, these giant crocodiles will burrow deep into the ground before winter comes and enter a state of self-dormant. Their dormancy can last for a winter or several years. But until now, the Lord Army still cannot deal with the giant Red Ridge Turtles in the southeastern part of the plain, where there are many connected lakes. Unlike hunting swamp giant crocodiles, most adventure groups are not capable of hunting large red-backed giant tortoises so that part of the land can only be visited by the Lord Army. 
no adventure group is willing to cause trouble for the red back giant tortoises. At present, in the Three Rivers Plain, the new ghost snake is almost completely extinct. Most of the swamp giant crocodiles have been cleared by various adventure groups. The surviving swamp giant crocodiles are no longer able to form a dominant position on the plains. Only the red back giant turtles live in some lakeside areas. The territory has not yet been occupied. As Serdak expected, the second territorial administration official, who checked the territory seemed much more honest after arriving at the Grand Canyon camp. As soon as they arrived at the camp, they immediately decided to check the actual scope of the territory. And they worked very quickly. After hurriedly walking around the Three Rivers Plain, they signed their names on the map drawn by Soldek. Immediately after completing the process, the three officials returned to Wilk City. It's as if you might be murdered if you stay one more day. The seal of the Wilk City Territorial Administration is stamped on the map, which means that Wilk City recognizes the legality of the territory occupied by Lord Soldek's army. In the future, this territory will be subject to the 433 Land Distribution Law. There are a total of 17 armies in the Lord Army. So when the land is distributed in the future, 17 lords will also participate in the land distribution. In the future, there will be how much territory is divided according to how much effort is actually exerted. Serdak clearly marked the border on the map. In recent days, some people have begun to want to divide the territory. However, everyone seems to want to compete for the big dams upstream and want to own part of the big dams. But they are unwilling to spend money on infrastructure construction. In the end, everyone finally agreed. We must use all the proceeds from this war on the Three Rivers Plain to support the construction of this large dam. Once this large dam is built, it will immediately change the water network of the Three Rivers Plain. Having control of the dam will control the Three Rivers Plain. In mid-October, Soldak led an army of 50,000 lords to leave the Three Rivers Plain and rush towards the Great Rift Valley in the northern part of the Invercargill Forest. 21 armed thunder rhinoceros walked at the forefront of the lord's army this heavy crossbow regiment was controlled by samira the lord's army was in the middle of the team and behind them were a large number of carriages from the military merchant group now these military merchant groups have grown to over 10,000 people as the giant swamp crocodile burrowed into the ground the adventure group found that there was no longer any oil and water in the three rivers plain Hundreds of adventure groups also followed the army to the bridgehead camp in the Great Rift Valley in the northern part of the Invercargill Forest. When Serdak arrived at the Quoto camp, he found that the camp was at least five times larger than when he originally created it. The buildings in the entire Quoto camp extended infinitely to both sides of the Great Rift Valley. The camp already has very complete military facilities. And after several months of preparation, the Quoto camp has accumulated a large amount of military supplies. Among them, what Serdak is most looking forward to is the giant magic crossbow arrows that he sent to the imperial capital with the military merchant group to purchase. The Green Empire continued to invade the northern part of the White Forest Plain. The birds that dominated the sky in the north began to continuously attack the cattle and sheep in the pastures, and occasionally called some local herdsmen. The worst incident was to attack small businesses in the northern occupied areas. Town. Recently, there have been frequent attacks on business groups and the garrison in the northern occupied area of the Belan Plain has also begun to take strict precautions against these rocks. When the business group walks in the wild, there are also adventure groups following them. By the end of October, the news reached Serdak's ears that an adventure group had ambushed the Pingyo. Chapter 1292 Hunting Season Recently in the Belan Plain, incidents of rock birds attacking herdsmen and livestock have occurred frequently. Recently, news of rock birds attacking residents in small towns has spread. When Serdak arrived at the bridgehead camp in the Great Rift Valley, he discovered that it was not uncommon for humans and rocks to have fierce battles in the wild. These birds are hiding in the high clouds. If it is just an ordinary person, when he looks up at the sky, he can only see black spots as big as match heads in the blue sky. That's the rock that keeps circling overhead. If you still feel that you are so far away from these rocks at this time, even if you fly over, it will take a long time, and they have no chance to attack. If you really want to think this way, then you are completely wrong. In fact, these birds have rich hunting experience. They will fly into the visual blind area behind the head of the prey, fold their wings and dive downward. They fall extremely fast at high altitudes, and their speed can increase to the point where the wind resistance is approximately equal to the acceleration. The moment they pounce down, the rocks will open their wings and adjust the direction of the pounce. At the same time, they have claws like steel hooks, and they are very skilled at grabbing the back of the prey's neck and shoulders. 
and their sharp beaks will also peck hard towards the back of the prey's head, trying to make the prey lose its ability to resist immediately. In the Quoto camp alone, at least dozens of members of the adventure group were attacked by rocks. Of course, there are also garrison troops in the Quoto camp who have been attacked by rocks. The patrol teams now usually have a scout who often checks the sky. It is said that this is specifically to guard against those rocks. As soon as Samira arrived at the Quoto camp, the archers here complained to the former archer captain, saying that they often had to directly face the sneak attacks of rocks on the observation deck, and that they had been made miserable by rocks recently. After all, they usually stand on the watchtower at a high place, and they have a greater chance of being spotted by the birds in the clouds. A camouflaged thunder rhinoceros stood on the hillside, its head facing a fragrant leaf tree, constantly nibbling on the young leaves on the tree. The shelf platform on its back is simply surrounded by a canopy of trees, and these dense leaves blend into the surrounding woods. On a protruding rock wall on the top of the slope, there is also a yellow sheep that is munching grass in the crevices of the cliff. It has a chain tied around its neck. It looks very panicked squatting on the rock and will struggle from time to time, and then made a bleeding sound. This place is at least a few kilometers away from Quoto Camp, which is buried in a sea of yellow and green trees. Without climbing to a high place, it is difficult to see the flags erected high inside the camp. Samira and Gary Decker were lying on the two wicker chairs on the platform, staring at the rock circling above their heads through the gaps between the leaves. And right next to them, there were two birds in front and one behind on the platform. The bed crossbow was set up. The winch had tightened the bow string and two magic crossbow arrows were placed in the grooves of the bed crossbow. When Gary Decker saw the bird swooping down, he immediately jumped to the bed crossbow on the side. However, Samira followed up unhurriedly, sat astride the console, and whispered to Gary Decker, Wait a little longer, and let them fly lower. Samira, can we really hunt those pen birds? Gary Decker asked somewhat unconfidently. Samira squinted her eyes, her gaze almost completely locked on the rock with a few golden feathers and confidently said to Carrie Decker. Don't worry. Carrie Decker. This time, I will what I brought is a gold coin each for the armor-piercing wind arrows. The range of this bed crossbow is not weak. It is said that this guy's feathers are very valuable. Carrie Decker corrected from the side. The most valuable feather is the Thunderbird. And a Thunderbird only has three feathers that contain magic. The light feathers on these birds can only be used as decorations on the hats of noble women. While adjusting the sight, Samira asked Gary Decker. Apart from the magic core, don't they have anything valuable on them? Actually, there are. Look at the military merchants. Even if you give them the shaved bones and sticks, they will definitely pay for it. Gary Decker responded to Samira. Just as she was speaking, Samira's light red eyes suddenly widened a little, and the control handle in her hand suddenly moved back. The mechanism of the magic bed crossbow made a clicking sound. The moment the crossbow arm pulled the bowstring, the crossbow arrow stuck in the groove suddenly flew into the sky. The countless magic patterns on the crossbow shaft also lit up instantly at this time. And a faint air flow surrounded the giant crossbow arrow. The rock bird that swooped down from the air and pounced on the yellow sheep on the top of the mountain also realized the danger at this time. It suddenly spread its wings and wanted to stop in the swooping state. But at such a sudden moment, the giant the crossbow arrow had already penetrated into the pinya's belly. As the magic glow lit up on the bird's belly, the giant crossbow arrow easily penetrated the bird's body. A huge yellow-colored rock fell down and plunged into the bushes not far away. Carrie Decker immediately put the magic shotgun on her shoulder, and without even waiting for Samira's instructions, she jumped from the platform into the woods. Her boots stepped on the branches of the trees, and she jumped through the woods, and soon landed next to the dying bird. The bird's eyes were filled with vigilance and violence, but a giant crossbow was pierced through its body, and the blood pouring out almost dyed all the feathers on its chest and front. Its mouth was sharp and sharp, and it screamed at Gary Decker, and traces of arcs of electricity burst out with the sound. Seeing that the Pingyu still had the power to resist, Gary Decker immediately waved his hand to form a transparent force field shield, blocking the diffuse arc. He used the fingers of his other hand to pull the trigger, and the barrel of the shotgun was countless magic patterns emerged, and a magic beam fell on the punk bird's chest again, shooting out a larger hole where it was originally pierced by the crossbow arrow. The rock wanted to flap its wings and fly up, but was kept in place by Gary Decker's shot. The other two birds that were constantly circling in the sky immediately got into the clouds and did not dare to continue circling at low altitude. They just let out shrill cries one after another. Samira knew that it would be difficult to hunt the two rock birds, 
so she opened the camouflage net covering her head, jumped to Gary Decker with light steps, and the two of them cooperated to chop off the heads of the rock birds, and then laboriously dragged the huge bird body onto the platform on the back of Thunder Rhinoceros. Tonight, Cool Item can have another taste, Samira, who was sitting on the driver's seat of the Thunder Rhino, pulled a long rein and directed the Thunder Rhino down the mountain from a hidden river channel while saying to Gary Decker, Gary Decker picked up a few pears from a nearby tree and threw two to Samira in front of him. At this moment, the mountains and fields are full of red leaves. Walking among the woods, you can see beautiful scenery everywhere. From this mountain ridge, you can just see the toxic mist swamp to the north. The huge swamp surrounds the pillar mountain that rises into the sky in the dark warm valley. The mountain peak penetrates directly into the clouds. From a distance, it looks like a cloud. The winding fairyland and sacred mountains. How long do we have to wait? Gary Decker asked curiously. Samira looked at the scorching sun above her head and saw that the climate here showed no sign of getting colder. So she said, It will probably take at least half a month. We are waiting for the first snow here. Only after the heavy snow. The poisonous only then will the fog in the foggy swamp clear away. There is plenty of sunshine in the forest, which makes people feel very comfortable when it shines on their body. The two of them sat on the back of the thunder rhinoceros, whispering about the ghost-striped red ants in the dark warm valley, and then changed the topic to the rock birds hovering in the sky. These rocks are at least level 2 peak level monsters, and they have powerful flying capabilities. It is not easy to hunt them. Once they move their revenge targets to the vast pastures of the northern occupation area, they will probably be enough to cause headaches for ranchers. As the weather gets cooler, more and more adventure groups gather in Quoto Camp. There were only a few thousand people in the Three Rivers Plain. But when they arrived at the Quoto Camp in the Great Rift Valley, there were at least 10,000 members of the adventure group in this camp. And everyone was almost waiting for the first game in the Balan Plain. Snow. Because that snow means that the hunting season in the Dark Warm Valley has arrived. Chapter 1293 Night Talk at the Iron Mine After the Lord's Army arrived at the Bridgehead Camp, Soldak took the time to go to the Iron Mine in Invercargill Forest. This time, Soldak and Andrew rode together to the Iron Ore Mine, which was not too far away from Quoto Camp, although the Iron Ore Mine had been mining iron ore normally for some time. The area was still very messy. The most obvious thing is that there are all kinds of work sheds, from thatched shacks to exquisite wooden houses. Many places on the hillside are still under planning, and those thatched shacks are also included in the demolition plan. However, the construction speed of the living area has not kept up with the increase in the population of the iron mine. As winter approaches, these dilapidated shacks are even more afraid to be demolished. Since iron ore is much cheaper than copper ore, many buildings here look very rough. Therefore, the environment of newly built iron mines is worse than that of copper mines. Many places are filled with building materials and construction sites are everywhere. What Serdek has seen the most and built in the most timely manner are the light rails on which ore trucks can roll back and forth. With these rails, the mining area and the mineral processing and grinding area of the iron or can be closely connected. This iron mine is home to a large number of young people from indigenous tribes. The copper mine cannot accommodate so many miners. And now almost all of them have come to the iron mine. The work here is not easy. And mining or every day requires a lot of physical strength. But young indigenous people still flock to it. For them, they can earn countless baked wheat cakes in the iron mines. They don't have to worry about ambush by any wild beasts in the jungle. And they don't have to be wary of poisonous insects. Snakes and ants. Here, they just need to dig stones diligently. Drinking wine and eating meat. If there is such a good thing. Naturally we have to be more proactive. The living area of the iron mine is still a low thatched shack at the bottom. It is very simple to build this round shack in the style of an indigenous tribe. You only need to choose a stronger tree. Center it on the big tree and you can quickly build it with branches. But the biggest drawback of this kind of shack is that it cannot withstand wind and snow. To block the wind and snow, the outside of the shack must be covered with a thick layer of moss. This kind of shack is a little damp inside, with black smoke coming out from the exit, and the fire pit is almost close to the door. Serdak found many indigenous women here, still wearing simple furs, squatting in front of the fire pit with their children in their arms to watch the fire. Not far away by the river, a group of girls from an indigenous tribe squatted by the stream to wash clothes. The clear mountain spring water hit the pebbles by the river, making a tinkling sound. Although the autumn mood in the mountains and fields is already very strong, they still dress very coolly. Their skin is not very white, but the light wheat color is full of youthful vitality. 
Soldak did not wait for the person in charge of the iron mine to arrive and walked directly into the mine's canteen, which looked extremely simple. This canteen was a square simple work shed, except for the roof. The surrounding walls were made of wicker. It is woven, and a trace of light can easily shine inside along the gaps. The long tables and chairs in the work shed were all made of simple logs and looked like they had been used for a long time. Serdak ignored them. He walked straight to a large iron pot in the cafeteria. When the kitchen waiter looked stunned, he picked up an iron spoon from the side and put it into the soup pot. He scooped out some of the ingredients at the bottom of the pot and poured it in smoothly. In the soup pot, facing the unknown root vegetables inside, Soldak asked the cook on the side without ambiguity. What are these? Jiayu is found by the indigenous women in the surrounding woods. They like to use it to cook berries. Although the cook didn't know Serdak. He was not stupid. He saw Serdak wearing gorgeous clothes. Needless to say, he was a great nobleman. So he answered very honestly. Serdak frowned and threw aside the spoon in his hand. Seeing Serdak's expression, the cooks in the canteen were even more afraid to come forward and talk to him. Serdak walked directly to the stone platform where the wheat cakes were baked and found that the baked wheat cakes made here were actually like roasted non-meat pies. The meat filling seemed to be some yellow lamb and wild onions. The kind that was roasted and distributed. The fragrance was clearly passed into Soldak's nose. Seeing that there was meat in the prepared dinner, Soldak's expression softened. When the person in charge of the iron or mine came over after hearing the news, Soldak was already sitting at the dining table, sharing a piece of meat pie with Andrew. There was also a bowl of sour potato soup in front of him. Seeing this, the person in charge I almost cried. The cake is not bad, but this wild vegetable soup is too close to the tribal taste. Do you think everyone can drink it? Serdak pushed the soup bowl to the person in charge without raising his head. The person in charge replied calmly. Almost all those who are willing to come to canteen number one are tribal aborigines. For them, this soup is a home-cooked dish that they often drink. Serdak then raised his head, glanced at the person in charge, saw that his face was as normal, and he drank the bowl of sour potato soup in one go, and then nodded. Not bad. He said something carelessly, and then he and Andrew walked out of the simple canteen. I know that time is tight to build the iron or this time. And we have to meet the supply demand for iron or powder from the steel workshop. All other tasks here have to make way for it. But I feel that the most basic living needs of the miners still need to be met. Satisfied? This is very necessary. What are the most basic needs of life? Eating. Sleeping. Work clothes. Anti-smash shoes. Hats. Etc. As Saldek was talking. A group of miners had already finished work. They walked into the workshed covered in dust, chatting and laughing. When they saw the mine director standing at the door accompanied by two big shots, they immediately lowered their talking and laughing voices, and then calmed down. I walked to the dining area in a polite manner, received the meat pie and sour soup, and then sat down from the first row of chairs one by one, still very intoxicated by the meal. Saldek then turned around and walked out of the simple canteen. Under the leadership of the mine director, Soldak walked around the excavation site, or transport truck, and screening and grinding machine. Now the first and second areas of the iron or mine have begun normal excavation, and the third and fourth areas are currently being expanded. The main reason is that the mine car track has not been built yet, and a large amount of or is piled up on site and cannot be transported out. However, Serdak is quite satisfied with being able to manage the iron or mine like this in such a short period of time. For the arrival of the Lord, the young people from the indigenous tribes at the Iron Mine gave Serdak the highest standard of welcome. In the evening, a bonfire ceremony was held. An indigenous tribe leader happened to be at the Iron Mine. So he accompanied Soldak and invited Soldak to taste the fruit wine of the indigenous tribe. He also arranged for two young girls with flowers on their bodies to accompany him. Besides Serdak, the welcome dance in the evening was very lively with everyone singing and dancing. Serdak curiously asked the two beautiful indigenous girls, Are your sweethearts dancing down there? The two indigenous girls were also very upright. When Saldak asked this question, they nodded very generously and pointed to him personally. Serdak patted the shoulders of the two of them and said to them, Go and dance with him. Let me and your clan leader chat here for a while. The two indigenous girls showed surprise on their faces and ran quickly into the crowd around the campfire without hesitation. When the indigenous chief saw Saldak's behavior, he laughed and picked up a glass of slightly sour fruit wine. He stood up and held the glass high, 
and the entire bonfire dance immediately became quiet. Just listen to the indigenous chief say loudly. In the past, we only knew how to collect herbs and hunt wild animals. If the hunters who went out hunted prey and brought them back to the tribe, we would have a good meal. If they could not bring back the prey, then we would eat berries and wild vegetables. If we don't even have berries and wild vegetables, we might go hungry. Now we no longer rely on hunting. And every family can still have an earthen pot which can usually store a little wheat flour. So we can eat delicious wheat cakes every day. Although there are a lot less prey in the jungle. The same dangerous monsters are almost extinct in this jungle. Nearly all the newborn children in the tribe survive. If this continues, the population of the tribe will double in less than 10 years. Who brought us everything we have? The young people of the indigenous tribe shouted at the top of their lungs. Lord Seldak. The indigenous chief continued to speak loudly. Now, Lord Serdek has summoned a large number of Lord armies from other plains to prepare for a war with the ghost-marked red ants in the north so that we don't have to suffer from the bees' tide again. Let us raise a toast together. Here's to a better life tomorrow. The bonfire dance in Invercargill Forest suddenly lit up. Although the berry wine was not very tasty, Serdak was still a little drunk. After the bonfire party, he and Aphrodite were cooling off on the platform of a wooden house. And Andrew's loud snoring came from next door. If the tribe leader hadn't said these toasts, I wouldn't have thought that Cheen came to the Belan Plain and actually made so many changes here. Aphrodite leaned in front of the pillar and looked at the hillside. The bright light smiled at Serdak. Serdak shook his head and said casually, Actually, I just opened up a new territory here. In order to occupy more fertile land and avoid any armed conflict with the local indigenous tribes. I gave them, they set aside some territory belonging to their tribe. In addition, in order to make their wallets fatter. They also built two mines here and hired some young people from the local indigenous people as miners. These are what every noble lord will do. Matter. Those lords are not like you. And they are actually supported by the local indigenous people. Aphrodite turned to solidify Serdak and said with a smile, more lords are thinking about how to manage. How can we squeeze out all the oil from the bones of the indigenous tribes in the rear territory? And how can we limit the strength of the indigenous tribes and reduce their danger? and in order for them to support you. You are even willing to help them grow and develop. Aren't you afraid that when they grow stronger, everyone will unite against you? Aphrodite asked. Serdak replied calmly, There is nothing to worry about. The land of Invercargill Forest is only as big as this one. I find that your vision is different from before. Serdak rubbed his somewhat groggy forehead and asked Aphrodite, Do you have any good ideas for those giant red-back turtles? They usually hide at the bottom of the lake, and the adventure group is powerless hunting, but without management, it cannot be regarded as a pioneering area for the Lord Army. Then what else do you want to do? Plan to hunt them all down? Aphrodite asked. Serdak nodded and replied, Surrender or die. Aphrodite held her slightly bulging belly with a smile and said to Soldak, If you can convince Selena to help you there next spring, maybe my method can do it. Should we wait until next spring? Serdak asked doubtfully. Yes. After the weather gets colder, they will also sleep. It is not a good thing to wake them up in such a cold day. Aphrodite said with a smile. Chapter 1294 The Vast World After learning that Suldak had come to inspect the iron mine, the chiefs of the indigenous tribes in the Invercargill Forest rushed here quickly. Many of the indigenous chiefs wanted to meet and have a private chat with Suldak. Nowadays, iron mines have absorbed a large number of young people from indigenous tribes, and disputes over workers in the mines can no longer be regarded as the main conflict between the tribes. However, as Serdak's Lord Army fought on the Three Rivers Plain, almost the entire Three Rivers Plain was included in the territorial territory. The brilliant achievements displayed by the Lord Army once again gave the chiefs of these indigenous tribes some other ideas. Idea. Under the Empire's universal military recruitment system, the indigenous tribes are now considered people under Serdak's territory. So Serdak has the right to recruit troops from these indigenous tribes. In fact, Serdak's current garrison in the Belan Plain except for the 500 cavalry he brought from the deserted area of Alanza City. The other nearly 2,000 warriors are almost all warriors recruited from the indigenous tribes and local aborigines. This lord's army belongs to the army on the Ganbu Plain. But the chiefs of the indigenous tribes don't care about that. They actually took the initiative to ask Serdek, Look, so many young people in the tribe have not served in the military. You, because of this, Lord Fricargill should expand his private army. For this matter, Serdak thought over and over again for two nights before summoning the tribal chiefs, who came from all over the place. 
he said that it was impossible for him to vacate all the young warriors in the tribe at once. And now that the two mines were hiring, the iron mines would still need a large number of miners. Invercargill Forest does follow the Empire's recruitment system, but it is also limited to tribal young people under the age of 20. Of course, not all of these young people have to join the army, but they join the army in batches within four years to perform military service. Although the Green Empire's universal recruitment system is the obligation and responsibility of all male citizens, Serdak's army implements a series of rewards, punishments, and living allowances. In other words, in Serdak's Lord Army, young indigenous warriors serve for four years. During the annual military service, you will also enjoy the military's living allowance. And there will be some rewards if you participate in the war. Just like the indigenous warriors currently stationed in the military camp in Doden Town, the first group of warriors to join the army will retire in two years. At that time, they will bring home a full set of heavy armor, heavy swords and iris shield. These weapons and equipment will greatly improve the tribe's combat power. If you can accumulate enough merit points in the army, you can not only exchange them for gold coins, but also for precious magic weapons. In fact, these garrison camps in Doden Town and the Great Rift Valley Bridgehead Camp have already begun to implement execution. Now Serdak has only extended this part of the welfare benefits to the entire army. This is why the tribe leaders are so active. The biggest reason to encourage tribal youth to do military service. There are not many ways for the weapons and armor controlled by the imperial military to flow into the indigenous tribes. Especially the sophisticated imperial army standard weapons and equipment. Serdak originally just wanted to inspect the iron mine and stay for two days before going to the copper mine. However, Due to the arrival of tribal chiefs one after another, it was delayed for seven or eight days in a row. In the end, he had to move copper mine trip cancelled. After winter enters the occupied area in the northern part of the Belan Plain, the grasslands are full of desolation. Small towns everywhere are spending the winter. All residents in the towns will stay at home and sit by the fireplace to warm up. However, Duodan town became very lively at this time and a large number of caravans wanted to rent temporary warehouses in Duodin town. Since rocks in the sky frequently attack caravans in the wild, caravans now basically travel in groups. Caravans often have one or several adventure groups or mercenary groups to ensure that rocks attack. Sometimes you can have the power to fight back. This also indirectly caused the caravans to be unwilling to take other remote trade routes and all gathered in Doden town. Originally, Tudin town and Plunto's town, which also belonged to the Spiny Mountain Pass were not far from Duodan town. In order to avoid being unable to rent warehouses in Duodan town, merchants usually use these towns as their strongholds. However, this year they gave up this dangerous approach because of Pingyu. So this winter, almost all the buildings in Doden town, including dog kennels, were rented out by businessmen. Homesteads in Duodan town are currently under the control of the property management department of the town hall. Currently, even in the fringes of the town, Arbitrary residences are not allowed to be built. All residential and commercial buildings are under the unified management of the town hall. If you buy a residential house or warehouse, then it costs money. And this amount of income alone accounts for half of Duodan Town's annual fiscal revenue. In winter, all construction projects in the town stopped. And Selena finally became a little more leisurely. She then handed over the affairs of the town to Mrs. Luna. Then took Zigna and followed the merchant Malacom. The Thunder Rhino Caravan passes through the Doden Gorge and enters Invercargill Forest. Originally, she planned to meet up with Serdak at the Copper Mine. But Serdak was temporarily delayed at the Iron Mine due to something else. Selina had no choice but to take Zigna and continue walking north on the Thunder Rhino until they arrived at the Iron Mine. When I saw Serdak, the first snowflake just fell from the gray sky. Soldak strode out of the wooden house and gave Signa a big hug first. Signa has grown up a lot and is so tall that it almost reaches Suldek's chest. She has a dark brown braid, and her eyebrows already look like Selena's, but her eyes are even more like Selena's. It was bright. She was wearing a fur cloak. The cold north wind mixed with crystal snowflakes always penetrated into people's necks, and Zigna's little nose was red from the cold. Hey, Dark, you've been in the Belan Plain for so long, and you didn't even come to Doden Town to see us. You want us to brave the heavy snow and come here to see you. Zigna complained to Serdak. Serdak smiled and wanted to put his hands under Zigna's armpits and lift her up high. Unexpectedly, Zigna struggled and jumped away and shouted to Soldak, Please don't treat me like a child anymore. 
Nika can help you in the military camp. And Sia is also helping you. But in your case, in the eyes of the earth. What can I do to grow up? Watching Serdak reach out his hand to touch her head lovingly. And whisper beside her ear. The person in charge of the mine, who was accompanying him, immediately knew that the beautiful little girl in front of him should be the princess of Embercargill, who lived in the town of Doden. After calming Zigna's emotions, Serdak hugged Selena, who was standing quietly aside. She was wearing a black priest's robe, and her beautiful eyes looked around without any disturbance. When people looked at her, they could clearly feel the majesty of a god. Selena pressed her face against Saldak's stubbled face, and the two separated immediately. This time she came from Doden Town not just for the things in bed. After becoming the high priest of the twin goddess temple, the level of power she obtained from the night goddess also increased by a level. So she came here this time, came here to join the war. Malakom's Thunder Rhino Caravan brought a large amount of supplies, part of which was to be kept at the Iron Mine, while the other part was military supplies and was to be transported to the Quoto Camp. Selina rushed to the Iron Mine day and night, but was unable to rest for one night in the mine cabin, because the first snow in the Invercargo Forest had already fallen. Soldak climbed directly onto the platform on the back of the Thunder Rhinoceros and moved into the wooden house where Selina lived. The Thunder Rhinoceros business group was slowly forcing their way forward without stopping for a moment. These Thunder Rhinoceros had huge cloth pockets around their mouths. They almost ate while walking, constantly taking in nutrients to offset the huge energy loss in their bodies. Selena looked out of the window with unfocused eyes. At this moment, her mind was completely empty. She could clearly feel that there was another leader in her body. But she could still feel all the feelings of her body very clearly. But she had lost it. Control of the body. Fortunately, she had long been accustomed to the strong mental power coming to her body, just like galloping on the vast grassland, and finally stopped exhausted. She looked at the sky with snowflakes through the glass window and watched. Then she slowly closed her eyes and carefully savored every strong beating of her heart. I thought you would wait another two years. Selena sat up around the sheets, leaned over and poured a cup of lemon tea for Soldak, then leaned against the wall of the wooden house, leaning her head on the window frame and looking out the window. Her back was as soft and shiny as ivory, and her long hair fell down. Her straight nose, slightly raised lips, and pointed chin made her look beautiful. Her eyes fell on Zigna, who was seriously building a snowman outside the window, with a soft smile on her face. Well, the construction of Red City requires a lot of funds. After much thought, I had to bite the bullet and go for these ghost-striped red ants. After finishing speaking, Serdex smiled. He put the teacup on the bedside table and continued. Besides, I don't want their population to continue to expand. I guess the people in the Dark Worm Valley are probably aware of the dangers outside. And they may not continue to do so once every ten years. If she continues to grow the number of beasts every day, she should have accumulated a lot of troops by now. For the safety of Invercargill Forest, this war is imminent. Selina stood up from the bed. No matter how cold the north wind was with snowflakes outside the window, she directly opened the window and leaned her upper body with her bare round shoulders out of the window. The view of the wooden house on Thunder Rhinoceros' back was originally very large. It was open, and she looked at the rolling mountains below her feet. The caravans lined up in a long line on the winding mountain roads between the mountains. Now that I think about it, I still can't believe it. It turns out that such a large piece of land belongs to you, and your territory will extend out of the thorny mountains and include the plains to the east. Therefore, it is natural to eliminate the sources of danger in the north. Selena squinted her eyes and looked into the distance. Her body shivered uncontrollably, and she said to Soldak. Then she couldn't help but think, who could have imagined that after leaving the desolate land of Valencia City, there would be such a vast world outside. Chapter 1295 Prelude to the Battle A heavy snowfall has turned the entire Invercargill forest into a silvery white world. The outside temperature is not that cold this season. The heavy snow only lasted for two days, and melted immediately after being exposed to the sun. Although the poisonous fog swamp is not frozen, the swamp is still full of mud pits. But the poisonous fog that permeates the swamp has begun to gradually dissipate. The Lord's army at the Quoto camp was ready. Serdak and Selina returned to the camp with a Thunder Rhinoceros merchant group transporting supplies. The Lord's army had already begun preparations for the battle. Before that, Serdak also organized I asked some veterans who had participated in the last battle to talk about the details of crossing this swamp. Almost all of the bed crossbows brought from Bena City this time by Soldak have been brought to the bridge camp. 
There is also a row of catapults that can throw oak explosive barrels outside the camp. Those explosive barrels are piled outside the camp. Sardak summoned the Lord Army and held a pre-war mobilization meeting in front of the camp. The main thing was that Sardak was going to announce the reward and punishment system in the army to the Lord Army of the Ganbu Plain. The most important thing was to the exchange rules of the merit exchange list will be explained to the Lord Army. Because killing the ghost marked red ants has high merit rewards. These achievements can be exchanged for gold coins, magic crystals, and weapons and equipment. When Sardak announced these rewards, the Lord Army originally led by Sardak was not surprised. Because everyone had experienced that kind of day. But other Lord Armies have never seen this. When these Lord Armies heard that during the battle, the ghost marked red ants they killed could be exchanged for very good weapons, they felt it was a bit outrageous. In other words, no lord was willing to do such a thing before. Big capital. Before the army set off, three forward battalions led by Andrew, Gulitum, and Wolf Night Tiger took the lead into the poisonous mist swamp. The three armies marched hand in hand in the poisonous fog swamp. Because of the experience of entering the poisonous fog swamp last time, the army encountered almost no trouble entering the poisonous fog swamp this time, and passed through the poisonous fog swamp very smoothly. Hundreds of bed crossbows were easily brought to the swamp. In addition to dozens of catapults, the ghost striped red and seemed to have sensed the danger from the outside world. And almost all of them have withdrawn into the dark worm valley. I don't know if it is because of the mental restraint of the ghost striped ant queen. Even the ghost striped worker ants rarely come out to look for food. In just one week, Serdak led the main force of the Lord's army through the poisonous mist swamp smoothly. This time, Serdak came to the ruins of the previous camp under the stone arch bridge by the lake. There were only some broken tents inside. There were still some supplies that had not arrived and had to be taken away in a hurry. But those supplies had almost turned into garbage. Instead of rebuilding the camp on its original site, Serdak once again built a large-scale camp on a vacant lot. At the same time, the Lord's Army's merchant group and more than 10,000 members of the adventure group also followed behind the army, smoothly passing through the poisonous mist swamp, and set up camp on the beach a few hundred meters away from the lake. The adventure group alliance has experienced the sneak attack tactics of ghost-striped soldier ants. So this time the adventure group moved the loose camp several hundred meters back so as to leave a fighting buffer zone. Immediately afterwards, Serdak kept ordering the army to occupy the huge arched stone bridge in front of him again. A group of ghost pattern soldier ants were guarding the bridge. However, they seemed to know that the Lord's army was in danger and rushed over to fight. They did not retreat. They just guarded the bridge and opened their sharp tentacles to attack. The Lord's army issued a warning. This is the first time that the heavy armored infantry warriors in the Ganbu Plain have seen these ghost patterned red ants. Many warriors are a little distraught when facing these dark red monsters. However, the Lord's army in Serdak's hands was extremely experienced in combat. After Serdak came back from the big battlefield, in addition to harvesting some magic pattern structures, the most important thing was that his fighting philosophy changed. Especially the battle in such a narrow area. Just like fighting against the magic pattern on the mountain road of Blue Bridge Fortress. Clan warriors fight. When he was at Blue Bridge Fortress, he often fought with demon warriors on narrow mountain roads. This kind of battle does not require too many elite warriors. So the first group to rush onto the stone bridge was Andrew and his knight squad. He even only brought two squads of constructed knights, followed by three squads of knights who climbed onto the bridge, a heavy armored infantry squadron. The number of heavy armored infantry soldiers is only 180 heavy armored infantry, and there is a 60-man archer squadron at the end. These are the entire manpower of the Andrew Bridgehead Commando. Andrew stood at the front, with 12 construct knights behind him. After rushing onto the bridge, he was strangled with the ghost pattern soldier ants almost instantly. Arrows continued to fall on the battlefield from behind. But the damage caused by these arrows to the ghost marked red ants was almost minimal. More than a dozen catapults were at the bridge head, constantly throwing some gunpowder barrels onto the bridge. These gunpowder barrels exploded on the bridge deck, causing considerable damage to the ghost striped soldier ants. Some bodies were stained with corpse fire oil. The ghost striped soldier ants could only fall into the lake like dumplings. After these ghost-striped soldier ants fell into the lake, it was almost impossible to land directly, because a large number of adventure group members have gathered on the shore at this moment. They will not let go of any ghost-striped soldier ants easily. Roaring explosions sounded one after another, and the battle began. Since Andrew already had a lot of experience before, he mastered the rhythm of the battle very well this time. 
almost forming perfect linkage with the catapults and crossbowmen behind him. The stone arch bridge was gradually eroded by Andrew, and he was able to capture some stone every day. Bridge. And these ghosts striped red and kept retreating, without any desire to fight. Every day during the battle, the corpses of some ghostly patterned soldier ants were brought back from the stone bridge. Of course, Gulitam and Wolf Knight Tego will alternate with Andrew, taking turns rushing to the stone bridge to kill those ghost marked red ants. The two headed ogre's strength has increased greatly recently, and as long as it stands on the bridge, the ghost marked red ants will not look at other warriors. Although Gulitam almost fights in and out of the ghost marked red ants, it is not possible at all. No giant soldier ants came out to resist its rampage and attack. The corpse of the ghost striped soldier ants is considered the biggest trophy and hundreds of ghost-striped worker ants become everyone's trophies every day. In addition to these ghost-striped red ants, some soldiers were injured during the battle. The soldiers of the logistics team carried the wounded soldiers back to the camp. Nika and her medical team would quickly start treatment. Only those seriously injured would only the dead warrior Serdak would personally treat him. During this time, the adventure group also formed a temporary army, and they began to trap and kill ghost-patterned soldier ants by the lake. For a time, Battlefields were everywhere around the lake. Chapter 1296 The Battle in Early Winter Under the successive attacks of Andrew, Gulitam, and Wolf Nightego, it only took half a month for the Lord's army to cross the stone arch bridge across the lake, drawing on the lessons learned last time. In order to prevent the Lord's army from encountering a large-scale counterattack by the ghost marked red and just after they stepped over the stone arch bridge, the sixty crossbows brought by Serdak this time had just arrived at the stone bridge. The Lord's Army soldiers and arc-shaped fortification was built right at the Stone Arch Bridge, directly protecting the exit of the Stone Arch Bridge. There are at least hundreds of ant nests densely arranged at the foot of the mountain. Some thin and sibilant red figures can be seen at almost every cave entrance. They have been completely frightened by the Lord Army soldiers. And all the ghost-marked red ants are unwilling to do so. Comes out easily. The attack method of the ghost-patterned soldier ants is very simple. They spit acid and pierce the armor of the enemy with their sharp fangs like scimitars. They have dark red hard carapace. Can climb steep walls freely. And are extremely fast. Once the ordinary heavy armored infantry soldiers of the Lord Army leave their bed crossbows. They have no good way to deal with these ghostly patterned soldier ants. Only those construct knights. Almost all of them have a magic weapon. And under Andrew's careful teaching. They have mastered the ability to kill ghost marked soldier ants. So on the stone arch bridge. The main force fighting these ghost pattern soldier ants head on was basically these construct knights. The construct knights were unable to charge on the stone arch bridge. They basically fought on foot. After occupying the stone arch, more than 200 construct knights stood in front of hundreds of ant nests at the foot of the mountain. It seems a bit unsightly. The heavy armored infantry raised their shields and surrounded these ant nests. The ghost striped soldier ants hid in the caves and spit a large amount of acid at the heavy armored infantry regiment outside. For a while, the heavy armored infantry regiment could not get close at all. The ghost marked soldier ants did not dare to climb out of the cave, because there were not only spearmen waiting outside, but also some bed crossbows with bowstrings fully drawn. These magic crossbow arrows purchased by Serdak could easily pierce the ghost marked soldiers. The hard skin of ants. The battle to eliminate the ghost striped red and suddenly came to a stalemate at the entrance of the ant nest. There are hundreds of deep wormholes at the foot of this giant mountain. The heavy armored infantry soldiers of the Lord Army could only surround the entrance of the cave. Because once they lost the support of their ballistae, they would not be able to defeat these ghostly patterned soldier ants. Serdak didn't want the construct knights to rush ahead. Who knew what dangers there might be in the anthill? These half-armed construct knights were his real wealth. Only Andrew relied on his being a second-level strongman. And his body was wrapped in fighting spirit, and he rushed in impulsively. He tried several times, but failed to rush in. Because there are densely packed ghost pattern soldier ants inside. They occupy every inch of the cave. If Andrew wants to rush inside, he can only kill them all the way. There is a time when a second level strongman is exhausted. After his fighting spirit is exhausted, he could only quickly exit the ant nest. Although the Lord's army was unable to rush into the ant nest for a while, the ghost marked red ants were also suppressed by the Lord's army and did not dare to come out of the ant nest. This made Serdak much more calm when making combat deployments. In order to reduce the pressure on the front line of the Lord Army, Serdak allowed the adventure group behind to pass through the Stone Arch Bridge and come to the battlefield here to continue hunting ghost-patterned soldier ants. Facts can prove that the power of the people is infinite. 
these adventurous groups came to the battlefield at the foot of the mountain, bringing with them a variety of hunting methods. Since winter has come, the weather here is getting colder and colder, and white frost has already formed on the rock walls in the early morning. Therefore, when these adventure groups are fighting, in order to fight against the ghost-striped soldier ants spitting acid, they will spray acid into the ant nests, splashing water. In such a cold weather, the ghost-striped soldier ants fighting at the entrance of the cave were all wet. The hypothermia made the movements of the ghost-striped soldier ants at the entrance of the cave become very stiff. In order to maintain a fighting distance, some members of the adventure group fixed hooks and sickles on the tips of five-meter-long night spears. They worked together to extend the long hooks into the hole, looking for a few ghost-patterned soldier ants inside to escape from the cave. After pulling out, the members of the adventure group hiding outside the cave quickly dismembered the ghost-patterned soldier ants. Some adventure groups even prepared hunting nets. These nets are so tough that even the strong ghost-patterned soldier ants cannot break them. Every time they seal the hunting net at the entrance of the cave, they can always capture fresh ghost-patterned soldier ants. In the rear camp, there were suddenly some temporary leather-making workshops and butcher shops that process red and meat. These first shops were basically processing red and meat sausages that were easy to store and carry. And they also purchased soldier ant tusks. The businessman, whose stomach is full of acid, transports some corpses of soldier ants back from the battlefield almost every day. The fresh meat of some ghost-striped red ants is roasted until golden brown, sprinkled with some herbs and salt, and then put on the stall for sale. Soldiers returning from the front line would occasionally eat two skewers of delicious red and meat in front of this street stall. Soldak ordered Andrew to lead a team of constructed knights to patrol the battlefield every day. They must deal with emergencies in a timely manner. For example, a ghost-strike male ant that is bigger than a war elephant suddenly emerges from a certain cave, or some giant ghost-striped soldier ants are ready to rush out of the ant nest and launch a counterattack. Only second-level powerhouses like Andrew, Gulitum, and Wolf Knight Tago are capable of handling these emergencies. At the gate of the Lord's Army's frontline camp, there is a huge notice board. The notice board announces the names of the top 100 soldiers in the military camp, as well as the merit points they currently have. This merit ranking is almost every morning. Things change, and some people's rankings will rise quickly, while some warriors will be injured due to their bravery, only to appear briefly on the merit list, and then quickly be pushed down the rankings by others. On the other side of the gate of the frontline camp, the exchange reward item shown on the merit exchange list almost made the members of the adventure group outside look at them. Especially the magic pattern structure at the top of the list attracted the attention of most people. Whenever this happens, the soldiers in the camp feel like they are on fire. Many people hope that the group leader can put them on the battle list a few more times. In the Lord's Army camp, every day's topic was almost inseparable from achievements. The reason why this place is called the Dark Worm Valley does not refer to this huge mountain, but to the huge space inside the mountain. According to the information obtained by Serdek, if you want to enter the Dark Worm Valley, you must pass through here. Wormhole. But currently, the ghost-patterned soldier ants are blocking the entrance of the cave with their lives, and are fighting against the Lord's army almost every day. And no matter how many ghost-marked soldier ants die, there will be more ghost-marked soldier ants to replace them. Of course, there are also a lot of casualties on the Lord's army every day. After many Lord's army die in battle, they will be cremated that night. Finally, a handful of ashes will be put into a jar and their companions will take them back with their pension. Hometown. As for those soldiers who were injured on the battlefield, they should first be grateful to have saved their lives from the battlefield, because there is no problem with the ghost-striped red and taking prisoners. The losing side on this kind of battlefield will always have to face death. The lucky wounded were almost always rescued by their companions, and they were quickly moved to the rear. The first aid tent that Nika established behind the military camp has now been gradually opened to the members of the adventure group. Of course, a certain medical fee will be charged. And the medical fee will vary according to the severity of the injury. Of course, if you really encounter that kind of serious situation, even if you don't have much money, Nika will treat you. Most of the adventure groups here come from the Green Empire, which believes in the Statue of Liberty. When they saw the ball of light in Nika's hand, they initially thought it was the priests of the Statue of Liberty who had returned. Only when they learned that Nika was the saint of the dawn goddess of the twin goddess temple in Doden Town, did they realize that Nika had returned. The twin goddess temple in Dan Town was actually blessed by the gods. There are many such people in the Green Empire, even if the goddess of liberty leaves with all the priests. There are still many people in the empire who are willing to flatter Lady Liberty. 
hoping that the goddess's blessing will one day return to the Green Empire. But there are not many devout believers in the Statue of Liberty among these adventure groups. The members of the adventure group follow the natural law of survival of the fittest. Therefore, when you encounter the saints from the Twin Goddess Temple treating the wounded in the military camp, not only will you not feel disgusted, but you will also feel that this Twin Goddess Temple is actually blessed by the goddess. This is really good. If you suffer some injuries that cannot heal naturally in the future, then go to the Twin Goddess Temple in Duo Dan Town and seek treatment from this saint. Many injured members of the adventure group will think so. Of course, at this time, Nika never thought that the Dawn Temple would attract some believers from the adventure group because of this operation to eliminate red ants. Soldak took the magicians in the mage group and began to draw the topography outside the Dark Worm Valley in the military camp tent. When Lance's group of mages ventured to investigate around this giant mountain, the magicians who explored the terrain around the giant mountain unexpectedly discovered that there was a huge tunnel leading to the interior of the mountain on the east side of the giant mountain that had not yet been covered by snow. The lava cave is even covered with green moss around the cave entrance. However, after discovering that there were traces of ghost-marked red ants in the cave, the magician who ventured to explore the terrain finally gave up the idea of exploring into the dark cave. In fact, Lance had wanted to see how high this mountain peak that shot straight into the sky was. Unfortunately, the magician flew high into the sky and failed to reach the top of the mountain after penetrating the clouds. Instead, he was almost swooped by pings from all around. Attack! Lance drew the outline of this huge mountain on parchment and explained this huge mountain to Serdek. It is much larger than the Oak Mountain, where Helensa city is located. There is even no comparison between the two. If we really want to describe how big this mountain is, I think it might be bigger than Beta City. It's a bigger circle, Lance explained to Soldak, and it is not surrounded by other mountains connected to it. It is more like a solitary peak standing in the northern part of the Invercargill Forest. Lance stood in front of a hand-drawn mountain peak and used a quill pen to draw a cave gate on the right side. As a magician, he has a very good talent for painting and can vividly show the appearance of the cave. Lance explained to Soldak. There are cliffs all around here. Only between the two stone bridges on the east side is a huge cave. And the entrance of the cave is very high. The entrance is 30 meters high and more than 10 meters wide. To reach the entrance of the cave, you have to at least walk from at the foot of the mountain. We climbed a steep mountain wall nearly 100 meters high. And we still don't know where it leads. Our magician investigator was attacked by a rock and was forced to retreat. Is there any other way to let the army enter the cave? Serdak asked seriously. Lance nodded. Use a quill to draw two curved arcs at the entrance of the cave. And then said, Yes, there are also stone arch bridges like giant tree roots on both sides of the entrance. But these two stone arch bridges are it's very long. If we want to reach the foot of the eastern mountain from our current camp, we have to walk at least 20 kilometers eastward. If we want to go up from the stone arch bridge, we need to continue walking 5 kilometers eastward until we reach the edge of the poisonous fog swamp. Serdak nodded. Lance then smiled and said to Soldak, In this area, it is really dangerous to ride on a magic harpoon to conduct reconnaissance. We magicians have been avoiding those rocks in the past few days and have been going around here. Didn't you find what this mountain looks like? What? Serdak asked. A huge tree stump. Lance replied, then pointed at the huge sketch on the parchment and added to Soldak, a giant tree with roots countless times larger than ordinary tree roots. The stone arch bridges across the lake look like the exposed aerial roots of the tree. And even the texture on the cliffs looks like bark. After hearing what Lance said, Serdak also said, Actually, I have long suspected that this is a world tree that has been dead for a long time and has been completely petrified. In that case, the huge cave that your magicians explored is probably a giant tree cave. That cave can go straight to the heart of the mountain. A bold idea suddenly came to his mind. And he said to Lance, we won't get any advantage by entering the ant nest. We might as well explore the cave. Maybe this is the real entrance to the mountain. He tapped the map with his pen. Serdak felt it was necessary to take a look at this matter in person. In order to mobilize manpower to explore the cave with him. The frontal battlefield situation here must be stabilized. Serdak planned to take Gulitum, Gary Decker and Selena with him to explore the cave. If in danger, Aphrodite can also run out to help by summoning a magic circle. Andrew. Wolf Knight Tiger and Samira will stay on the battlefield here. They are all second-level experts who can exert their full strength on the frontal battlefield. With them here, even if the ghost-marked red ants launch a massive counterattack, 
Andrew also has a way of holding on for a while. Worried that the ghost marked red and tear would take the opportunity to counterattack. Soldak prepared some small gifts for them before leaving. Chapter 1297 Explosion Hula The material manager uncovered a large piece of tarpaulin next to the catapult, revealing the black powder barrels arranged very neatly inside. Stored here are black powder barrels transported from Wall Village. Arranged like a wall, a group of heavily armed soldiers swarmed up, loaded these black powder barrels onto flatbed trucks, and pushed them to the battlefield ahead. Now the battle at the entrance of the ant nest is still going on in full swing. Every day there will be some casualties in the Lord Army. But due to proper handling, they are still within the controllable range. However, the hunting by the adventure group seems a bit messy. Some adventurers are often dragged into the ant nest by the red ants. And finally not even a single bone could be recovered. A strong heavy armored infantry soldier carried a barrel of black powder and strode to the entrance of an ant nest in the core area. The heavy armored infantry soldiers lined up in a shield wall made room for him. And there were spearmen. A slide was set up on the shield wall that was tilted toward the entrance of the cave. The heavy armored infantry soldier placed the black powder barrel on his shoulder on the slide. When everything was ready, the soldier behind lit the fuse of the gunpowder, and the heavy armored soldier immediately let go. The round oak barrel rolled along the slide towards the entrance of the ant nest. Once the heavy black powder barrel started rolling at a speed, it would be difficult to stop even if there were rocks or something underneath. As the black powder barrel rolled into the entrance of the ant nest, the fuse at one end flickered with a magnificent flame. The ghost striped red ants crowded at the entrance of the cave didn't know that what fell from the outside was a barrel of black powder. Seeing the black powder barrel falling, a ghost striped soldier ant immediately bit into the black powder barrel with two scissor-like fangs. The gunpowder barrel was cut to pieces in an instant, and the black powder inside the oak barrel instantly spilled out. The fuse shining with sparks lost its restraints. Swinging back and forth in the wormhole, the sparks hit the sprayed black gunpowder, and the dazzling light and scorching moment when it exploded. The air in the entire wormhole was instantly drained. The flames spread out, and all the ghosts marked red and crowded at the entrance of the hole were engulfed in flames. A carbonized scorch mark formed on the hard armor and countless ghosts marked red and howled in fear and despair. The heavy armored infantry soldiers who were ambushing around the entrance of the cave only felt that a burst of light burst out from the entrance of the cave, and the thick smoke was steaming like a mushroom cloud. The black powder barrel did not explode, but the black powder fully exerted its burning power, almost burning through the hard armor of the ghostly patterned soldier ants at the entrance of the cave. At this time, upon hearing the squad leader's whistle, the soldiers ambushing around the entrance of the cave immediately set up their tower shields again. The squad leader waved to the heavy armored infantry soldier carrying the black powder barrel behind him and motioned for him to carry the black powder barrel to the front. The squad leader lit the fuse of the second black powder barrel and then rolled down the slide again. In the wormhole, the ghost striped soldier ants at the entrance of the cave, whose bodies were covered with burns and bruises, were scrambling to retreat into the cave without even noticing the falling black powder barrel. The entrance to this ant nest is a vertical shaft, about 10 meters deep, and then it is dug parallel to the mountain. It is surrounded by burnt ghost striped soldier ants. 10 seconds later, a muffled sound was heard deep in the wormhole, as a strong stream of smoke was ejected from the hole. The smoke was mixed with some broken limbs of ghost striped red ants, which were scattered around like raindrops. Some red ants with ghost stripes, disturbed by the explosion, crawled out of the hole almost desperately. Their bodies were burning with flames. Some were missing some legs. And they walked crookedly. Although the heavy armored infantry soldiers waiting at the entrance of the cave were also affected by the huge earthquake. They saw the ghost striped red ants crawling like this when he came out. He used a sharp spear to stab the red ant from the mandible into its head. At the foot of the mountain, almost half of the ant nests were experiencing this scene. There were explosions and smoke everywhere. Countless ghost patterned soldier ants were killed and injured. This action of throwing a gunpowder barrel almost dumbfounded the adventure group who was playing soy sauce on the outside. For a long time, from the simplest fireball spell to the fifth level magic meteorite, this kind of explosion damage has never been possible without magicians. They either throw out prepared magic scrolls or simply chant spells to cast magic, starting from the fireball. Techniques. Fireballs. Bursting flames. Firewalls. H, L flames, and volcanoes. Every time fire magicians break through a level, they can cast more powerful fire magic. Although many armies of the Grim Empire are equipped with fire scale bullets, 
The core of this firearm is also a simple magic scroll. The members of the adventure group have always thought that black powder barrels are like exploding flints and can only be used in big battles. But this time, they clearly opened their eyes. It turns out that black powder barrels can be used in this way. This thing is so destructive that most of the ghost pattern soldier and corpses brought back from the battlefield were burned to black. This part of the hard armor can no longer be used. I wonder if they can still be picked out from the broken limbs. How much fresh meat will be produced? Such a battle would cause too much damage on the battlefield. The heads of some ghost pattern soldier ants exploded. And the magic cores inside flew to no one knows where. Just as the ghost striped red ants were forced back into the depths of their caves by the explosion. Some cave entrances began to collapse amidst the explosion. Moreover, these heavy armored infantry soldiers seemed to be artificially controlling the number of cave entrance collapses. Not only did they retain some of the cave entrances used by the adventure group for hunting, but they also selected some wormholes with less deep shafts and slightly tilted angles to preserve them. These preserved cave entrances were prepared for the future general attack. The explosion lasted for a whole day. At dusk, a tank-like ghost striped male and finally crawled out of the cave against the frequent explosions of black powder barrels. There were no agile ghost pattern soldier ants following them. Just as they emerged from the ground, their majestic bodies lifted up countless huge stone slabs. The ghost pattern male ants spurted out a large amount of acid rot from their mouths, immediately disturbing the heavy armored soldiers around them. The infantry soldiers fell on their backs, and some soldiers were even stained with acid. Andrew and Gary Decker saw the ghost striped male ants emerging and immediately rushed to support them. Samira, on the other hand, was sitting on the control panel of a bed crossbow, aiming the giant crossbow arrow at the ghost-marked male ant in the distance. And without hesitation, she pulled the trigger, and the crossbow arrow flew out at an extremely fast speed. Andrew held two axes and jumped high. At the moment when the giant axe struck down in the air, the axe blade streaked across the sky, triggering an arc of electricity to strike down. The electric arc and the battle axe hit the ghost-marked male ant's head at the same time, and the pattern hard armor was suddenly split open with a deep wound by the sharp axe. There are hundreds of wormhole exits on the stone arch bridge, except for some well-located holes that are suitable for fighting ghost-striped red ants. The other wormholes have all been blown up by barrels of black powder. Chapter 1298 Cave Before exploring the eastern cave, Serdak used black gunpowder to blow up nearly half of the entrance to the ant nest, which greatly slowed down the daily fighting intensity of the Lord's army. Although this wave of explosions caused a fierce counterattack by several ghost-marked male ants that were larger than the magic caravan, the battle quickly subsided under the joint efforts of Andrew, Samira, and Wolf Nightego. When the second-level experts faced these huge ghost-marked male ants, the battle was relatively easy. Moreover, these ghost-marked male ants were hunted for the first time this year. Before that, for as long as a year and a half, the ghost-strike male ants never leave the poisonous fog swamp. When the body of the ghost-striped male ant was carried back from the battlefield by a four-wheeled truck, the merchants in the military merchant group were talking about these warcraft materials. Many merchants were running around for it, and some of the military merchant groups were preparing to join forces. No matter how high the cost, they will grab one. However, for these ghost-striped male ants, Serdak's price for selling them to the business group was not high, and only the business groups accompanying the army were eligible to trade. Although these ghost strike male ants are large in size, the hard armor on their bodies is too thick to be practical. The only valuable thing is the magic core in the skull of the ghost strike male ants, which has a high probability of obtaining high level the magic core of the magic crystal. The merchants wanted to purchase the ghost strike male ants. It was said that they wanted to make specimen statues and then transport them back to Bena City. It is said that the noble lords in Bena City like to collect such high level Warcraft specimens. Many noble lords will be very interested in such a third-level peak warcraft. If the body of the ghost-marked male ant is filled with anti-corrosion and moisture-proof materials, it will be hard to the surface of the armor is painted with waterproof varnish. Many wealthy nobles like to place such a high-end monster specimen in the vestibule as a sculpture. After taking out the most valuable magic core inside, Serdak will sell these ghost-marked male ants for three magic crystals each. It immediately aroused a heated discussion among other business groups in the camp and everyone began to think that becoming a business group accompanying the army was really a good thing. In addition to the Lord Army's daily harvest, the adventure group's daily harvest is also uninterrupted. There are also some adventure groups who are lucky enough to hunt giant ghost pattern soldier ants. This kind of monster itself is also very valuable. It is said that on the day of hunting, 
He was bought back by a local businessman in Belan for 20 magic crystals. Right next to the Lord's Army Camp, the military trading company set up a large number of outdoor tents. Just like a large free market. The 11-member adventure group has a record of killing 11 ghost pattern soldier ants in a single time. We are now recruiting a sharpshooter. The 8-person adventure group has the best record of hunting 5 ghost pattern soldier ants. Now we are recruiting 2 mid-level shield warriors with a level 1 or above. They need to have spare parts of the magic pattern structure and a magic shield, which can block the full blow of the ghost pattern soldier ants. Those with combat experience will be given priority. Temporary recruitment information like this was actually posted on the walls on both sides of the military camp. Every day, some new adventure groups arrive at the battlefield, seeing the lively scenes and the trucks carrying the loot. All members of the adventure groups who come here will be so excited that they can't sleep on the first wild night. There are also some adventure groups who, after seeing the exchange merit list on the notice board at the entrance of the military camp, came up with the idea that joining the Lord's Army might not be a bad idea. At this moment, Serdak had already taken Gulitem, Gary Decker and Selina on a journey to explore the East Cave. The four of them, with less than a hundred followers, first rode at the foot of the mountain. We walked all the way around and came to the bottom of the cave on the east side of the giant mountain. Just as Lance described, the cave is actually located between a 100-meter-high cliff. If you want to enter this cave, in addition to climbing the cliff at an almost 90-degree angle, you have to follow the rocks above. Walk all the way east on the arch bridge. Go to the end of the stone arch bridge. Then board the stone arch bridge and walk back, so that you can follow the stone arch bridge to the cliff closest to the cave. In fact, the four people and their entourage also detoured around the stone arch bridge. It took them nearly two days to reach the place closest to the entrance of the cave through the stone arch bridge. However, it was still at least 10 meters away from here to the cave. And there is actually a cliff between the two, with no foothold at all. Looking at Selina riding a white camel and walking side by side with Suldak, Gary Decker felt secretly envious. She walked at the end of the team, with her magic shotgun hanging in the leather bag next to the saddle. She wore a bulky magic pattern structure and rode a unique magic pattern war horse here. Her long black hair was tied into a ponytail, making her look so heroic. The two-headed ogre Gulitem was walking at the front of the team. This guy had killed more than a dozen ghost pattern soldier ants along the way. His temper seemed to be much more irritable than before. Every day Gulitem and the two of them, now Huar, kept talking. They seemed to be arguing about something. But they both had their own opinions. These days, no one has been able to convince the other. There is no road in front of the stone arch bridge at all. If you want to enter the cave, you have to climb the cliff. Although it is not too far. You only need to cross a distance of more than 10 meters. But it is also very dangerous. The stone arch bridge is like a tree root growing out of the stone wall. It has no connection with other places. And the closer it gets to the giant mountain, the stone arch bridge will become extremely thick. Standing on the edge of the stone arch bridge, the two-headed ogre nailware said worriedly, Even if this cave leads to the heart of the mountain, how do you think the Lord's army can cross here? What's so difficult about this? After Gulitem finished speaking, he stepped back a few meters with his brain. After a run-up, the three-meter-tall ogre jumped forward steadily at the place closest to the cave. The strong body jumped up, crossed a distance of more than ten meters, and stepped steadily into the cave. Gulitem turned back to look at the people on the stone bridge and waved vigorously to them. Soldek frowned and said to Gary Decker and Selina beside him, a temporary pontoon bridge may be needed to connect the stone arch bridge with the cave. It is estimated that the soldiers of the Lord Army can pass here. Then he added, Although we can't build a floating bridge now, it's still no problem to connect a rope from here to there. After saying that, he found a thick hemp rope from his magic waist bag and threw the hemp rope towards the two-headed ogre Gulitem. The terrain on the stone arch bridge side is relatively high, and you can easily slip into the cave through pulleys. Serdak nailed the rope to the stone arch bridge, and more than a hundred followers slid into the cave along the rope. Serdak and Selina were almost the last ones to slip into the cave. Only after entering the cave did they find Gully. Temu has already hunted several ghost-striped soldier ants inside, has set up a bonfire, and is preparing to have lunch at the entrance of the cave. Chapter 1299 The Ruins of the World Tree The exploration team finally entered the cave. Serdak found that there were no stalactites at all in the cave. The internal space was much larger than the entrance. And some ghostly patterned soldier, ants could be seen deep in the cave heading this way. From a peak, they seemed to have been frightened by Gulitem 
and were hiding in those hidden stone crevices with no intention of coming out. The light in the depths of the cave seemed a little dim, with only amber luster condensed in some stone crevices. Serdak came closer to take a look. They were some beeswax stones mixed in the stone crevices. This kind of crystal was found in the magic market. It is a kind of magic gem. Serdak used his heavy sword to pry off a palm-sized piece, which looked a bit like amber or citron. There was a faint halo flowing in the gem. Serdak casually released some holy light, which penetrated into the gem very smoothly. Is this a magic gem? Selina followed him and came over to take a look curiously. Serdak nodded and said, Although I don't know what kind of gem it is, it should be of high value and have good magic conductivity and magic amplification. Taking advantage of the rest of the exploration team, Serdak set up an altar and sacrificed the heads of three demon warriors, blessing Golitum, Callie Decker and himself with insight. So even if the light in the cave is dim, it doesn't seem to affect a few of them. And Selina is the waiter of the goddess of the night, with unparalleled affinity in the dark. Serdak walked a few steps into the cave and saw some yellow gem veins in a crack. Just when Serdak was thinking about whether this cave could be a natural gem mine, Selina came up and said to Serdak in an unusually calm voice, this tree of life has been dead for at least nearly 10,000 years, and the entire tree roots have been completely petrified. These yellow crystals were originally the blood in this big tree. Later, these big trees died completely, and the tree blood was also in this big tree. The inside of the tree slowly condenses into crystal. Serdak discovered that Selena's eyes were closed when she said this. There was a faint radiance on her face, and she looked like the great prophet in some temple. These ghost patterned red ants are probably the initiator of this disaster. Then she said, Although the ghost patterned red ants live in the body of the world tree, they have not yet become high level monsters. On the contrary, the entire group is continuously deteriorating. Listening to Selena's talk, Soldak looked at Selena with some confusion. Selena's body trembled slightly. She stopped, and then she opened her eyes, as if she suddenly woke up. When he looked at Soldak again, his eyes were full of tenderness. This proved that the real Selina was back. Seeing Soldak staring at her, her face blushed slightly, and she admitted in a low voice, She just came here. She also told me that this place is the remains of the ancient god of nature. World Tree. She may have been inspired by the ruins here. So she took the opportunity to send down a ray of consciousness, and came to take a look. Selina she followed up, took Serdak's arm, and whispered, And she also reminded us that this world tree has been completely petrified and its body has no value. But these gems should be pretty good. Is this really a world tree? Cernak asked seriously. Yeah. Selena nodded affirmatively. The tree roots alone are bigger than Bena City. I really want to know how tall it is. Cernak said with some emotion, and then added some imagination and said, Do you know? How the magician flew above the clouds and didn't even see the top. Do you think there is a huge umbrella-shaped canopy high in the sky? Or maybe there are still some indigenous people living there. Or how many canopies can be built on that huge canopy? The city in the sky is coming. Selena blinked and said with a smile, If you want to know the answer, you have to try to find it here. While the two were chatting, Gary Decker, who had entered the cave to explore the way, came back carrying a magic shotgun and swinging his long legs. How is the situation inside? Soldak approached and asked. Gary Decker immediately replied, The passage is very long, but there are not many ghost striped red ants here. Then let's continue exploring inside. Soldak said casually. The team continued walking inside and could still see some scattered human skeletons in the cave, some of which were almost reduced to ashes. Many of them were weapons left by local aboriginal hunters, such as bone bows and arrows, spears, and some braids are wrapped in magic crystals. The further you go inside, the more you can feel that the cave seems a little damp. Some of the stone walls are even dripping water continuously forming some basin-sized puddles in the cave. Just next to these stone platforms, you can also find some brown moss, which has a very fishy smell. There were not many ghost-striped red ants encountered along the way. The two-headed ogre's desire to fight was very strong. The ghost-striped soldier ants that he almost saw would be killed by him as long as they ran slower. Smash! Moreover, the ghost-striped soldier ants here are not very strong-willed to resist, and they have never thought about holding on here. They are completely different from the soldier ants at the entrance of the ant nest at the foot of the mountain. The soldier ants there are completely blocking them with their lives. Entering the entrance of the ant nest. As long as Serdak takes one step forward, the ghost-striped soldier ants will take two steps back without any intention of fighting. Did we choose the wrong path? 
They don't care much about this place. Gary Decker whispered his doubts to Soldak. If we walk further inside, I really want to know what is inside. Sardak waved his hand, and after speaking, he led the exploration team to continue exploring the depths of the cave. This cave is actually not that long. Soldak just walked forward for more than 500 meters when he saw a narrow light in front of him. After Gulitam drove away all the ghost-striped soldier ants in the cave, Sardak stood at the exit on the other side of the cave and looked at the scene in front of him. Only then did he realize that the assassin hiding in the belly of the ant had entered the belly of the mountain. What exactly did you see? Although it's a little dark inside, it's not pitch black. It's more like dusk. Sardak stood on the edge of the cliff at the other exit of the cave, looking up at the sky above his head. The sky above his head was a huge circle. It feels like you are in a huge chimney or a semi-open air stadium. The south side is obviously much higher and the north side is lower. This is why the light cannot come in. It is called a dark place. Worm Valley is really apt. Then, Sardak suddenly thought that he might have really entered a huge tree hole, and there was probably only a stump left of this big tree, so he could see the sky above his head. Chapter 1300 The Ruins of World Tree 2 Sardak stood on the edge of the cave. At his feet was a huge space wrapped by a mountain wall. This space had boundaries. The tall cliffs penetrated into the clouds, and were high in the south and low in the north. There are also jagged and sharp peaks on the top. It feels like a fir tree with its heart completely hollowed out and suddenly broken from the root. Sardak was standing just on the east side of the tree hole at the moment, and the huge shadow of the southern mountain wall blocked the entire land. But the dark insect valley in the tree hole is full of giant mushrooms. Each of those colorful mushrooms is more than 20 meters high. The thick umbrella pillars support flower umbrellas with a diameter of more than 10 meters. Those mushroom flower umbrellas, there are also some shimmering dots on the top. This is a world of mushrooms. And almost all the land is covered by lush mushrooms. The two-headed ogre Gulidum almost let out a strange scream. And then he took big steps and jumped forward. His thick body was surrounded by a set of black iron armor of a Nakma warrior. And he held a, a mace-toothed club. Its bulky body did not linger in the air, falling downwards like a black cannonball. And then stepped firmly on a giant mushroom. His waist was completely embedded in the back of the mushroom umbrella. And then he struggled to crawl out of the mushroom umbrella. He stood on the mushroom umbrella with a face of joy, raised his head, and made a peace gesture to Serdek. Serdek didn't expect that there was such a scene on the other side of the cave. Even Guns Rose's Carry Decker stared with wide eyes, looking at the strange world below supported by flower umbrellas. This tree hole is big enough to fit a province-sized city. The only drawback is that this is a place where the sun doesn't shine. I have always heard from the locals that ghost striped red ants live in the dark warm valley. When Serdak first saw this huge mountain, he complained that the locals were really bad at naming it. These ghost striped red ants are obviously hiding in the belly of the giant mountain. Why is the mountain named dark warm valley? Only now do I know that there is actually a cave inside here, and it is surrounded by stone walls nearly a thousand meters high. Gary Decker sighed. This is the place the dark warm valley was originally talking about. It seems that you can't see many ghost-marked red ants. As soon as she finished speaking, as if the ghost-striped red ants were about to refute her words, some ghost-striped worker ants appeared on the surrounding mushroom umbrellas. They used their sharp fangs to cut off the huge mushrooms and then lined them up. The team moved into the anthill. Each ghost-striped worker ant appears to be very orderly. They are arranged in dozens of long lines, even if there are many shortcuts when transporting. These ghost-striped worker Ants will still rush along the actual path. Selena stood on the other side of Serdek, pointed to a group of ghost-striped worker ants at her feet, and said, This is their living area. Look at the mushroom trees. Where Selena pointed, the giant mushroom nearly 20 meters high had been dismembered by a group of ghost-striped worker ants, leaving only half of the umbrella column. Seeing the ogre Gulitum jumping down early, Selena also looked at her feet and asked Serdek, Then how do we get down? Before Soldak could speak, Gary Decker pointed at the broken road on the side of the stone cliff with the magic shotgun in his hand and said, There seems to be a road over there. Before everyone could walk down the zigzag slope on the cliff, the two-headed ogre sitting on the mushroom umbrella was besieged by a group of ghost-striped worker ants. Hundreds of ghost-striped worker ants gathered at the edge of the mushroom umbrella. They were almost crowded together one by one. At the same time, they raised their forelimbs as sharp as spears and slowly approached the two-headed ogre. The only thing that makes it difficult for Gulitum to move on the mushroom umbrella is that the mushroom umbrella is like a harder ice sh. L. 
for the ghost striped worker ants, the load bearing capacity of the umbrella is more than enough. But for ghoul items, say, with every step you take, your thighs sink deeper into it, seeing the two headed ogre trapped in the middle. These ghost striped worker ants scramble to squeeze in, but the person who is more excited than them turned out to be the ogre. He even took out a jar of wasabi sauce from his backpack and prepared to cut off some of the mushroom umbrellas under his feet. Add them to the whole ghost striped worker ants and eat some sashimi. What? Serdak asked more than a hundred followers to guard the entrance of the cave here. This is their retreat. So people should be stationed here to prevent them from finding their way back. In fact, Serdak's concerns are extremely correct. Outside the huge mountain, the magician spent a lot of effort to find the entrance of the cave. But now Serdak is in the heart of the mountain and looks up. Only then did I realize that this stone wall was almost completely devastated. With stone cracks everywhere. If we didn't make some marks at the entrance of the cave first, we might not be able to find the way we came. A black shadow made a low-frequency buzzing sound as it passed by the entrance of the cave. A follower guarding the entrance of the cave suddenly disappeared. This incident immediately caused Zerdak and the others to stop. Gary Decker raised his magic shotgun. Almost at the same time, a black shadow appeared softly again. Gary Decker raised his shotgun and almost without even looking, he fired blindly into the sky. Boom! A flame burst out from the muzzle of the gun and a piece of iron sand spurted out. The black shadow just hit the muzzle of the gun, and countless iron sand smashed its transparent insect wings to pieces. The winged ant tribe, which was slightly larger than an adult, was like a kite with a broken string, towards the bottom of the cliff. Gary Decker quickly hung the shotgun on his waist, then took out the hook from his waist, accurately swung it out, and successfully hooked the winged ant back. At this time, Serdak saw that this ghost-striped red ant was actually a type they had never seen before. They had long and narrow wings on their backs. And each one was only slightly larger than the ghost-striped worker ant. The chest is very strong. And the head is like an enlarged version of a red-headed fly. It had a sharp mouth part that extended almost two feet. And a pair of ridiculously thick hind legs. But now his head was smashed to pieces by Gary Decker. And one of the followers even picked out the dirty magic core from the sticky brain. It seemed that a ghost-striped flying ant had exposed its hiding place and other flying ants also flew over from all directions, blocking Serdek and his party at the entrance of the cave. At this time, some ghost pattern flying ants formed attack formations in the air. The followers behind Serdak also took out repeating crossbows and aimed at the ghost pattern flying ants suspended in the air, with arrows flying everywhere. A thin whispering sound also sounded in the cave behind Serdak. When Serdak turned around, he realized that the cave was already crowded with ghost-striped soldier ants. 